in history. Absolutely phenomenal. And Ace is the champion of the Intel Extreme Masters World Finals. Storm's still not quite done. MC is going to take this fight, though. Three seconds left. Last two rounds of match. It's got to start it well for ESC. And this is a massive move for Zest. But he's not content with just a Nexus kill. He will go down. Seven times we've been in Katowice, as year after year we've witnessed StarCraft II history as players achieved their dreams of becoming world champions. By the end of the day, only one will join them and be inducted into the Hall of Heroes. On the stage is a player who transcended the word foreigner, becoming the first to shatter a 20-year streak of Korean dominance. The two-time world champion, it was Serral. The Warpers, I mean, so barely alive! It actually saves another Colossus and another Colossus! This is absolutely <laughs> insane! The Vipers get pulled, but then pulled back by the Warpers! I felt a great deal of empathy here for Katowice this time around. Over the past four days, we have watched excellent, varied StarCraft, even emotional StarCraft. I'm sure some of you at home have felt that empathy as well. Yesterday, that emotion boiled over into desire and despair as we watched what it really means for all of these players to try and attain themselves a spot in that round of eight and move on forwards to try and call themselves world champion. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day number five. We are crowning a world champion once again here, moving them into the Hall of Heroes here in Katowice. My name is Kyle Aris. Joining me to my left-hand side, I have Wardy and I have Fear Dragon as well. I'm it's, we've been here 11 times. It's been it's been kind of crazy, but once again, we get to crown a world champion on this stage. Wardy, so far, it's been an excellent tournament. We've just had great game after great game. We've had upsets, we've had storylines, we've had our favorites come through. We've had players who didn't look so hot and then they've picked it up again. That's just been a great Katowice. And we've got the best day to come, right? And it's our first time having Katowice, the final day, played with all the round of eight, yes. then the round of four and the grand finals. You know, it's it's nice to have that full build up over the day. It's a big day, and we don't have to be at, um, we don't have to be beholden to CS:GO, which is fantastic as well. We can do what we want. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fear Dragon. I mean, again, it's been the the thing that's really stood out to me is that every single series has delivered different styles, different games, varied strategies, and it's been a pleasure to watch. No, I'm so glad you actually took the words right out of my mouth. We've had so much diversity. Even though yeah. we've had some really, really incredible games throughout this entire week, it's been a lot of really weird series where players just kind of get 
really down and dirty. We have had really long series. We've had incredible macro games, incredible cheese games. It's really been across the board. All right, well, let's take a look at the bracket here then, gentlemen, and get people up to speed at home as to what we have left. We only have eight players remaining, but oh boy, is it a great eight as we have got ourselves returning world champions. We have ourselves some new contenders here to the Katowice stage and an opportunity for someone to be able to raise that trophy at the end of the day. So, Maru, Sola, Ragnarok, Serol, Reina, Oliveira, of course, Time, and Hero and Dark. This is an extremely good top eight with a few wild cards in there as well here, Wardy. You know, it's got all of the favorites, right? If you ask anyone coming in, I feel like 90% of people say a Maru, a Serral, a Reino, Hero, or Dark, right? Those are the five. Yeah, yeah. Those are the five we expect to be here. And then you've got the others. Sola, super good, but he's got his nemesis Maru in this matchup. That's going to be hard for him. Ragnarok surprised us in the group stages. Oliveira has ground his way through here as well. Everyone in this round of eight is exciting. I think all of these matches are very fun. I don't think any of it is truly clear cut. Right, I want to skip over the Marisa Sola match for the moment because, of course, that will be our first match here on the main stage. Let's have a quick kind of delve into Ragnarok Serral. That's a very interesting one here, Fear Dragon, because, of course, it's the returning world champion. He had some rocky times in the group stage, but he's going up against a guy that, for a lot of the time, including Wardy, underestimated him, right? <laughs> really didn't give him a huge amount of credit, even though he got to a GSL Finals, looks fantastic. What are we thinking here for this matchup? I, know, I, I think you said it really, really well. Ragnarok has been that player that I think a lot of the non-Korean scene has really slept on for a really long yeah, time. Yeah. He's shown his ability to just really get up in people's faces, to do things that seem like a lot of, you talk to a lot of the non-Korean Zerg players and they'll kind of say like, yeah, Ragnarok's a strong player, but he also does some kind of weird questionable stuff. But at the end of the day, he's still getting results. He's made it over here. And I actually think he still has that kind of upset potential against a Titan like Cyril. Yeah, definitely so. Your thoughts, Wadi? Yeah, I think that you guys took a look at this event, right? And at the end of the day, Serral has had trouble in ZVZ specifically. This yes. is why he's actually really struggled this event against Korean Zerg players. Now, he stepped it up amazingly when he had to, and he's looked very good ever since then. You know, the last two days, so yesterday, he looked really good against a laser, then against Bjorn. He just needs to keep that form. If he can come in today like he did yesterday, he's absolutely got this. Sure. But he can't falter like he did in the groups. I'm going to stick with you, Wadi. We'll move on to Reyna versus Oliveira. Of course, the previous name, Time, uh, here, going up against him. This is, again, another interesting one. Reyna, back to back to back, finalisting world championships. But Time is looking fantastic at the moment. And I love his TVZ. You know, I know he was very TVT focused during the groups, and I know he lost to Dark and Ragnarok, but he did manage to take down a map of Dark. That's obviously a big thing. And Reyna, we've not seen his ZVT really tested. He played Gumiho, who he dismantled early. He played Spirit. That wasn't much of a challenge. Oliveira can bring the fight in ZVT. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's going to be something to watch for. Uh, we can talk about Hero and Dark later on, because I'm getting word we're just a few minutes out from Maru versus Sola. So let's start focusing in on this. Maru versus Sola, very exciting. I think a lot of people look at Maru as being destined to eventually win Katowice. But when is it going to happen? Does he fall to here in the round of eight, Fear Dragon? I mean, he has been able to make it to, say, semifinals and everything. But like you were saying, he <laughs> really, really does need to actually advance on from the court finals against a really tough opponent and I think a lot of people will sleep on Solar over here. Maru is absolutely favored, don't get me wrong, but Solar is playing the best StarCraft he has in years. Solar has always been a contender and that's always in the early stages of these tournaments, but as we get to later stages, Solar has been getting better and better, actually climactically going into GSL Super Tournament where he actually won. Mm. You know, it's one of these things where I really feel like Sola has a good chance, and I want to believe, but then Mario was the one that always brings it at these tournaments, at least in the round of eight and stuff. Like, he's been to the semifinals, maybe not a finals, but we know he can. We know he's meant to. Sola's the player here who is kind of the underdog, and last year he got to the round of eight, he was looking amazing, faltered and fell against Hero Marine, who played great, but I think Sola should have won that series, right? Mm -hmm. He needs to come in strong. Against Mario, it's tough. It's definitely a mental thing, I think, for Sola as well, because Mario has been a tough cookie to crack for him, but he's not unbeatable. He's taken maps off him, repeatedly while losing the series. Yes. He just needs that extra little push to go over the edge today. I'm a little scared, to be honest, because I feel like the, even the Hero Marine versus Maru series, of course, a different matchup, but it feels like a blip now compared to the Maru we've seen since that series here, Fear Dragon. So I, I am a little scared for Sol. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's going to be scary, but I, I kind of echo a lot of what Wardy was saying, where I think he's capable of it. And mm. while it was, you know, pre patch and everything, Solar did actually do pretty well in the yes, Elite League yes. finals against Maru. I think uh, we were talking about it with Wardy before, where it was a bit of a weird series. It even opened up with Maru trying to do Battle Mech before the patch and everything. But Solar has shown he is capable of beating Maru. Absolutely. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much here. That was the pre show for day number five. This is the championship day. At the end of it, we will crown a world champion. Will it be Maru, maybe, or will it be Solar? Let's find out who moves on into that round of four as we go over to the stage. Thank you very much, Kolaris. It is my pleasure to introduce our first quarterfinal match of the day, which is a rematch of the quarterfinals back at the DreamX Dark of Two Masters Atlanta. Back then, our Korean Zerg just barely lost two to three. Can our GSL Super Tournament champion get revenge on the five-time GSL champion? Please welcome our players. It is Maru and Solar. The Vikings will dance their way above the Nexus, and Classic will not leave because we would be exactly on time. He has so little going on at home, though. Once this stuff gets cleaned up, I'm not sure what he can do. That's it, GG! It is time for the first match of the day, the final day of IAM Karavitsa 2023. My name is Loco, I'm joined here by Pig. Pig, we've got an amazing match coming up. Oh, what a way to start the day, mate. Yeah. I mean, uh, Maru versus Solar, a match which normally you've got to wait for a little while to get one as awesome as this, but a nice way to warm everybody up. It's, of course, the beginning of a long day of StarCraft 2. We've got so many matches today. And this match is uh, going to be a cool way to kick things off. The underdog story there for Sola, seeing if he can punch up and take down Maru. Yeah, no, I, I do believe that Maru indeed is the favorite player in this particular matchup. That being said, historically speaking, he's been winning about two or three times, right? So one out of three series they've played historically has gone in favor of Solar. The most recent one, the Olima League Finals, was indeed a best of seven series, four to three in favor of Solar. And that was only about a month and a half or so ago. So definitely don't sleep on Solar, right? He's one of those players who historically has always yeah, been a little overshadowed by other Zerg players from Korea, like for example, Dark and Rogue, but he's been very good for a very long time. And maybe today he can show up what he, uh, yeah, he's capable of. Indeed, he really has stepped it up a lot and shown that he has the patience to evolve through and have some of the best defensive Zerg versus Terran play in the world. Solar's ability to just stand there and take punch after punch is incredible in this matchup. I like that you mentioned that Oli Moly finals as well, because it may have been an online tournament, but it was an interesting matchup between the two where Maru was getting just manhandled by Solar. Really mm. just rock solid. Maru's aggression couldn't find anything. And then he switched gears and started playing some of the greediest Terran versus Zerg ever, just straight fourth command center, you know, constant bio mine aggression, never any safety precautions, no banshees or anything like that. And Sola took a long time to adjust. He dropped three maps in a row, getting just overrun by just momentum focused bio mine aggression before Sola changed it up and won the series with a big roach push. Mm. So it was kind of interesting to see this dynamic where when Maru was trying hard to get the aggression done, Sola's defense actually shone and just looked so good. Yeah, that is very interesting. I'm curious to see if Solar has still got that series in the back of his head here today, because obviously it wasn't that long ago, but it looks like we are ready to get into our very first map of the final day of this particular tournament. We're crowning a new world champion in StarCraft 2 today. And it could very well be one of the two competitors right here at the first match of the day. Babylon, it's going to be our first map. Indeed it is, and I'm always studying the players' faces when we get those cameras up. Maru and Sol are both looking very calm and focused. I think Maru's main attribute in this head-to-head -head is the unshakableness. No matter what goes wrong, this man could lose 50 Marines to a couple of Banelings, and he won't even blink twice. He'll just keep on playing his A-game. He is, of course, the greatest Terran player in the world, the greatest Korean GSL player of all time, looking for his first World Championship. Give it up for Maru! And 
and his opponent in the top left-hand corner of Babylon. A teammate of Maru, we are looking at Solar's main hatchery. Onside gaming, mm -hmm. getting the, the once again fabled team kill. You know, <laughs> so many times Solar and Maru have run into each other in these round of eights. Yeah, it is what it is, right? When you make deep runs into tournaments at some point, since only one person can win, you're going to have to take down your teammate as well. I'm sure those onside guys are shaking their head go at though and saying, Come on, can it just be the finals for once? <laughs> yeah, can they just avoid nice. each other till the finals, please? I'm indeed expecting Solar to start this series off pretty standardly, like you were talking about already. Yes, he's perfectly capable of playing those roach-based uh, roach pushers, and that is something that he's done many times before. But generally speaking, he likes to go for that macro focus style in the early game, where you just slowly build up, you try to just take all of the punches and eventually overwhelm and swarm your Terran opponent, right? And Maru, yeah, he's a... A big fan of playing that heavy macro style, but honestly, he's one of the most well-rounded players out there, going for a huge variety, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to get very aggressive here in the, in the first game of this series. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think I agree with that sign. Turn the Terran music up as well. I think that's everyone's favorite <laughs> soundtrack, the Wings of Liberty one. Ah, some Zerg support is there as well, of course. And uh, I really do feel that the defensive player Sol is very good. Uh, what's interesting for me is if Maru chooses Widow Mines or Tanks to try to push it, because Babylon's a rather short distance map, some amazing tank positions, and I think Solar's going to need a lot of urgency on breaking the rocks down. Anytime he gets a little bit of room to breathe, start mm. working on these rocks, because you want as many wide open areas as possible, otherwise the Terran is going to take advantage. Ooh, yeah, I was going to say, I think oh. that is in vision range right there of the Reaper, the drone not moving far enough. Oh. And that is, well, it's annoying, but it's a moral victory as well, right? This is one of those starts that you really don't want to have as a Zerk player. It's only a single drone, but it hurts mentally. And speaking of the mental game, this is why I mentioned how Maru is so unflappable at the start of the series, because Solar, on the other hand, is a player who is a bit more emotional. I mean, yeah. he's good at staying calm under pressure for the most part, but Maru is an absolute rock, whereas Solar, we, you know, he has a history here. He has a history against Maru in the World Championship, involving a gigantic nuke ruining a series and, and actually eliminating his chance of going further in that tournament, you know? It was a, a disaster for him a few years ago when that giant nuke from Maru did make a crazy comeback something that weighs on Solar's mind a little bit, not to mention that he was mentioning, hey, Maru is my number one practice partner going into this tournament. He beat me 13 games for every one win that I got. <laughs> I don't know how much he was <laughs> exaggerating, but uh, obviously Solar's warmed up throughout this tournament. We've seen him gain confidence. He came into the tournament really doubting his abilities, and he's just gotten better and better each round. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Maru and uh, Solar, or a lot of interviews rather with these two historically, and Solar, I mean, he's a bit of a memester, right? I mean, it's really <laughs> difficult to judge his words, but I wouldn't be surprised, though, if Maru is indeed the favorite whenever they're playing against each other in practice games. It's going to be that quick triple CC into a Raven opener. A Raven is kind of interesting. Obviously, the unit did get a couple of adjustments recently. It's now a bit cheaper since the new multiplayer balance patch. And apparently, uh, yeah, Maru is bringing it out early here. It's really quite nice for sniping those creep troopers, Built right? so quite fast as well. It really does. And Maru was using Raven a lot pre-patch. Remember, a few months mm -hmm. ago, he loved the Raven opening. I've been waiting for people to play this more. I'm like, come on, it's cheaper, it's more accessible. You can even get a second Raven if you want to. So I think this is a perfect idea to mix things up. Now, it is a little bit vulnerable to uh, like roach pushes and things like that because the Raven isn't that effective at actually fighting. But getting one Raven out, he's gonna add a Liberator behind it and the Marines will take out this Overlord. Overlord sees no cloak upgrading mm -hmm. on that starport. Also spots the third command center. Yeah, you're definitely right. I think most of the time you would still expect the Benshi at this point as the Zerg. The Solar will probably be firing up a couple of uh, Spore Crawlers here momentarily. There's that Raven going across the map. And he's going to be able to get into the main base right there of the Zerg very soon. Very, here in yeah. the middle of the map. Really slow play so far. Let's see how quick Solar pulls. Only one drone, not bad. A little bit of mining time, but the Raven, of course, able to keep doing that over and over again. Uh, quick lair and Baneling Nest, so Baneling Speed will be the main goal for Solar. And that's very important because it's such a short map where Baneling Speed is going to give you the ability to control and, and push back these big Terran armies. Maru's loved his aggressive early mid-game styles, and he almost always starts a series off swinging at the Zerg. Mm -hmm. Maru may be known as the late-game god, but he never goes straight to late-game. It's only once he falls behind or, you know, the, the game calls for him to turtle up that he does it. He's going to keep on swinging 
And he's got four barracks on the way behind this. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a big eight racks uh, follow up where Maru just goes pedal to the metal on the aggression. Yeah, this is exactly the Maru we all know and love. He likes playing that big macro game, but it's very map dependent as well, right? And so far his aggression is working out very nicely in this match. He's going for a lot of additional barracks, like you already pointed out. Solar opting to play that Mutaling Bane style primarily. So the Bane Link speed does start up after the Spire. This does, however, mean that his Evo Chamber upgrades are gonna be a little late, and those Marines are really gonna pack a punch. Very, very late on the upgrades normally. Maru here. I think he already started combat shields. Liberator does go down. You could argue that's the first mistake, but he already uh, delayed a lot of mining time. Mm -hmm. What I like about Maru's camera is you're going to notice this is quite easy viewing compared to the Rainer, Clem, several first Very first little views. scrolling, right? He never scrolls. He has the lowest scroll speed of any pro player in the game, and it's because he doesn't use it that often. You can see when his mouse moves to the edge of the screen, it doesn't move around that much. He's very focused on his camera hotkeys and using his control groups, double tapping to where he needs to be. And I think the biggest skill Maru has is he doesn't panic. He doesn't hit that select all army key in the big crazy situations. He uses it when necessary, but he never panic clumps his army up or, or panic pulls everything in one angle. And it's this calm, methodical flow. That's what makes Maru a beast. I find the color that he's playing with actually quite interesting. So we're obviously casting this game with blue versus red, but in the meantime, uh, Maru's colors are quite a bit darker on his own screen. Either way, the Mutas are coming up. I don't know exactly how much Maru knows about the Spire play. Obviously, that's when that panic can very well come oh, in. Oh, I think he's going to get it if he clicks it. If he commits, he will oh, get wow. it. Wow. That is very nice right here for the Terran player, slowing down the Zerg, and it certainly counts. Now, he hasn't seen that Spire. So these Mutas, they may very well show up unscouted. 1-1 one, one has only just started for a solo. In fact, only Carapace for now. He didn't start the melee. First Marine tank pus uh, push is in position in the north, but this could get shut down really hard if he's got Banelings ready. I don't know how much ground army Solar has. The Mutas are going to rotate around and maybe find some damage. They're going to go in for the counter. Losing the fifth and the fourth base. This is definitely really hurting Solar's production. Yuda's getting into the main base though, and Maru did not know about them until right now. He must have realized, wait a second, where is the entire army of my opponent? He now loses a ton of SCVs inside of the main base. Reinforcing wow. the to deal with this, but I mean, they're trickling out one at a time. There's a missile turret starting up at the third base, but it's not done yet, and more damage will be executed. Oh, there's some medevacs there, but he does pull back for now. More SCVs grabbing one of these medevacs on the way out would be nice, but no, gonna go a Siege tank, even better. Ooh. Big juicy pickups here for Solar. Unfortunately, Solar did not remember to start melee during all the heat and the action. And that means his upgrades are very far behind. On the other hand, Maru didn't start his 2-2. So the upgrade gap is kind of closing as this game gets scrappy, down and dirty. First game of the day, Maru's going to try and counterattack across the map. The Muters are not going to let him do that easily. The lack of fourth base is really hurting Solar at this point, right? Like he's not been mining as much as you normally are in a game like this. Solar, he's gonna have to defend against this massive Terran force that's now in the middle of the map and the siege tanks are getting into really good positions here. If Solar can flank this army, he'll smash it. He might even be able to just go right now from the front. He has large numbers. The tanks are getting deep. Solar can't wait much longer. Those tanks are in range of his ramp. Setting up a surround right now, Solar that is as he tries to collapse on top of this Terran army from multiple angles. A lot of the army coming from the south. There's a huge bio force right there at the bottom of the ramp. Oh. And Siege tank on the right is getting so much damage done. And there was a massive widow mine on the muters that also got a bunch of banelings as well. That is, you can see Solar's face. He knows he's been overwhelmed. Yeah, losing all of those SCVs was too bad, I suppose, but his standing army was still absolutely massive. He got one siege tank as well, right, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah. didn't really matter too much, I guess. He didn't really need it. Well, you know, that map there is a bit shorter, and as a result, even if you take big damage to the muters, Maru showed I can get across that map into position very quickly. I actually think Solar should have engaged a little earlier while Maru was moving forwards, uh, because once he got in that position, I think his units were so well spread out, and uh, the fight went very nicely, of course. Some very good tank targeting on the Banelings. Maru's so mm. focused on that. And, and that one Widow Mine getting there. I didn't even see the Widow Mine burrowed. I don't think Solar did either. I just saw a bunch of Banelings and Mutas take massive damage. And I was like, okay, that, that's going to turn a fight around, mate. Yeah, one problem he also ran into with that big engagement is that he tried setting up a split, but for some reason, the majority of his army came from that one angle. Mm. That fight would have looked a little bit differently, I believe, if he came in from every single side that was possible. 
In the end, Solar takes a bad battle, and uh, well, obviously it came at the cost of the game. That said, though, he also ended up losing that fourth base, not only on the left, but also on the right. And that really ends up hurting the Zerg economy a lot. Just didn't have enough units there. Often you do will see a player overcommit to aggression against someone with mutalisks, and the muters then just crush the army. Maybe you lose the hatchery, mm -hmm. you crush the army, you run across the map, you win the game. We've seen like the likes of Sue do that so many times over the years. I thought that might happen for Solar, but it seems like Maru was so crisp with that attack timing that the Ling Bane wasn't really ready. Obviously opted for the SCV damage. And that is a map on the board for Maru. He's looking very, very calm and focused. It's that energy that he always brings into these series. The next map will be Gressman. And in the top left side of the map, he's had a good start to this series so far. Get your hands together. Make some noise for Maru. And down here in the bottom right hand corner in game number two of this best of five series, we have Solar. Grass Van, in general, a much bigger map. At the very least, it feels significantly bigger. This is the type of map where Maru definitely is capable of playing that mass command center style that we've seen come up quite a bit in this tournament so far as well. Now, interestingly enough, he starts off this game with a low ground wall off, so I'm expecting a second barracks as well. One thing we've seen quite a bit from players like, for example, Bjorn is even a third barracks, hiding somewhere in the main base. Serral, for what it's worth, absolutely shut that down. But we'll see what Maru has got in store for us here. Is he going to stick to just two, or if he's going to yeah. add on a third as well? I think he's much more of a two racks fan. Beyond the YOLO man, he likes mm -hmm. to mix in the three racks that are higher risk. Maru did two racks Reaper twice against Lambo in the only mm -hmm. turn versus Zerg he's played earlier in this, uh, this tournament. And he, he really is just enjoying this opening. Now, this is the map where most people have been playing Battle Mech. We're starting to think of Gressman as the one mech map to the point where it's almost predictable. And that's why I actually like Maru mixing it up, not playing the Battle Mech, which so many players have brought out here. <laughs> Throttles forever sign. Heroes later today. Yeah, yeah he's got to wait a little bit longer. I believe I, that's going to be a fourth faith. best of, uh, of five. I yeah. still have faith in Hero, man. Yeah. I, think, I think he's going to carry that Protoss flag, even when the other Protoss flags have fallen. I hope so as well. That would be a lot of fun for sure. But uh, yeah, so with this build, there is a cheeky four racks that Maru did versus Lambo. That was on, um, I think it was like Babylon or something, or one of the smaller maps. So was that I a doubt he does CC it. Or a double CC? Just, I think it was just one command center behind the, the two barracks, like he goes for now, but then he hides two barracks in the main, and he goes mm. like just one, sti one tech lab, one reactor, and the other two barracks just build marines, and he just does this very surprisingly quick Stim combat ah. shield marine timing with no medevac. So, you know, kind of like a, a twist on the three racks. Uh, I would imagine on this map, probably not as likely. It does look like Solar, much like Serral, is going to expand in the linear fashion along the side of the map. And that's a much less exposed third base to harass. Yeah, that base right there on the right side of the screen, it's very difficult for the Terran to get to, just because the distance is longer as well, right? There's not as many entrances into that third base, and at the same time, it just takes longer for the Terran army to move all the way across the map. It's only a couple of Reapers, by the way, here in total. I think he's only got three, and he's already transitioned right now towards Marines. It's kind of and, interesting, right? And a factory as well, mm -hmm. which makes me wonder if he's going to do like a delayed mech transition off it or something. But off of double unlikely. barracks, that would be very interesting. And definitely not something that Solar would expect. We'll find out here momentarily. The Queen desperately trying to keep her brood alive, but now with the help of uh, the friend from the natural, she'll be okay. That one, barracks, is going to be used to kill an overlord. Is that what we're doing? Yep, yeah, I like it. Third command center on the way behind this as well. And I'm keeping an eye on that production tab because Maru's definitely got a bit of special source coming out mm. of this build. Now, with these spot locations, Maru's uh, add-ons right there on that barracks or on those two barracks are going to be a little bit exposed. Ooh, actually, the Overlord gets away to the next pillar. That is rather interesting. Reapers in the natural in the meantime, though, forcing a lot of lost mining time. And that is really good for the Terran here. Yeah, so circlings, they're better than losing see. drones, though. I, I got to say, oh, OK, there we go. Does get one kill. Uh, yeah, the Zerglings, I guess there's not that many. Okay, there we go, Loco. All right, gonna get a reactor snipe, but oh, Maru's so smart, cancels it at the last second. Just before it goes down and rebuilds, it gets most of a refund. Starport on the back of this as well. But yeah, those structures, those little add-ons, they always spawn right next to the barracks, right? Or the factory or on the starport. And depending on where you spawn, if you would have spawned on the other end of the map, they would have been on the safe end of that wall. 
Sometimes it can be a disaster with that Stimpak research, because that is one of those pivotal upgrades, and if Zerg can deny it repeatedly, it can become an absolute what do you disaster. Reckon, what do you reckon, Loco? You want to see him drop a Baneliness just to blow it up? I, I wouldn't mind it, man. If I, I was playing this, I probably would have already put it down <laughs> or a road for it or something along those lines, because it's just too juicy of a target. Because everything that Terran wants to do pivots on that upgrade. It, it truly does. Losing your stim, especially when it's almost finished, is just so frustrating. Forces you into a super defensive standstill. And uh, right now, Maru, I mean, he's already setting up for the long game. Mm -hmm. Third command center, double engineering bay, all the good things on the way for his economy and a four Hellion drop going to probe across the map. I do feel like Solar's handled things well. And I think he really does have room to get quite far ahead in this game if he can mm -hmm. block this Hellion drop completely. He doesn't know about the Hellions. So you see those uh, couple of Reapers leading the path right here. Well, now Ooh, the Oh, nice spotted. catch. Yeah, that is a really nice catch. Also, because he now sees those Hellions coming in. Okay, so this is no longer going to be a surprise. And I don't suspect that Solar will take a lot of damage. Look at the rally of the Queens getting into the main base. They are ready to defend. Although, well, they need to be in the right place. This is a crazy commitment from Maru. That, that, this is absolutely wild. There's, there's no reason why he should have gone in there. Maru making an uncharacteristic mistake there. And Sola now feeling so good about his position. He's going to be soaring ahead. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who was worried that this series might get out of control after game one, I feel like Sola now is poised to play an overwhelming macro game. Yeah, this early game now going heavily in favor of the Zerg player, who's going to probably fire up the 1-1 upgrades together with the bailing speed. He can take a fourth base much easier than he could in the previous game, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to drone that one up very heavily. Now, our Observer pointed out right there that the Medivacs did not get spotted, so maybe these can get some sort of damage done. But honestly, if he keeps cleaning up the armies that he has been, I mean, I don't really see exactly what Maru can do easily to come back into this. Queen's up, reasonably well positioned, does boost to the right side to try and get out. But good pullbacks by Sola, only losing an Overlord and a couple of Zerglings. So no big cost there as Maru backs away. Heading into eight barracks is Maru. Mm. Oh, it's so popular on this map. That fourth base of Sola is sticking out like a sore thumb, but he's got good creep spread. Maru's had so little map presence. He hasn't really slowed down the creep in the middle. He really wants to get in the middle path and start pushing those tumors back to set up for his game ending push. Usually with this sort of opener from the Terran, we don't see a ton of command centers, maybe after the aggression, right? If Solar manages to shut it down, but Maru is intending on winning this game in a couple of minutes from now. He's finishing up the 1-1 upgrades, he's already got stim pack. Combat shield is not too far behind either. The thing is though, you brought up the creep spread. Nice little run by over here, by the way. But you brought up the creep spread. It's looking excellent. Bailing speed is finishing up too. In theory, Solar should have all of the tools at his disposal to defend this. Yep, equal army supply for both sides. 1-1 one, one upgrades are finished for the Terran, though, and Widow Mines always have the ability to get a big explosion off. Nice transfusers on the Queen's for now, but, uh oh that's a lot of Marine firepower. Yeah, those Widow Mines do detonate here eventually. There's that Spore Crawler in the edge of the main base, moving on over. Wow. Them, dealing a lot of damage to those med effects. Big drop in the main, though. Very nicely done right here by Maru. He uses his units very effectively right there between those mineral fields and those Zerg structures to optimize the amount of damage. Don't lose a med effect on the way out there. High risk, high reward play from Maru here, working that angle. We saw Beyond working that yesterday against Serral as well. It is a good drop path. And Maru does get a decent trade, getting six drones and a bunch of mining time, and most importantly, making Solar feel a little bit panicked. Now, behind this, we do actually have a fourth command center and a second factory, which are basically the tells that Maru wants to play a longer mm. game. You get the second factory, you can have drilling claws, siege tank production, or thaws. You can also go, of course, for a fourth base, which leads into a fifth and a sixth. So not just committing to the big old all-in or anything like that. Yeah. Maru just looking for good trades, and so far, very good marine control and uh, getting, uh, you know, just keeping Solar busy and also slowing down his creep Widow spread. Mine drop over right here on the right side of the map. No oh! reaction out of the Zerg player just yet, and that's going to cost some 12 workers. There's one more Widow Mine in the natural expansion as well, and that one is also not going to connect. <laughs> oh, not yet. Please don't send those drones back to mining Solar. Okay, there we go. Shoots into the drone that pops in the gas geyser. Maru using that multitasking right now. We think of him as a defensive god, but you do sometimes forget just how good he is at harassing his opponents and wearing them down. And he is putting a lot of pressure on. He's now up in supply. He's got an army moving through the north side. Solar's trying to go infestation pit. Hydra's plus two carapace. He's trying to work his way forwards, but he's just spent the last minute rebuilding those drone losses. Mm -hmm. And now this army is going to cause him some more issues. Yeah, and he's been pushing back that 
creep spread on the left side of the map very nicely as well. And that certainly hurts the Zerg here with follow-up aggression. So we have a look right here at the first person of what Solar is looking at. A lot more scrolling compared to Maru. Now he knows there's Widowmine, so he's trying to split up those units. A couple of those Widowmine detonate on the Terran army as well, since of course they deal splash damage. Got Ooh. split zone, good hotkeys. Ah, oh, it was a good cleanup. Watching the first person camera, you go, wow, he just crushed that fight. And then you realize why, of course, the other fight wasn't going as well for him. This is always the case. It's a multitasking battle, Zerg versus Terran. Notice how he hops between, does his injects, and then immediately looks at the top. He has to monitor this fight to make sure he's not baited into any Widow Mines. Trying to put that creep spread down once again because he knows there's going to be big attacks following these as well. Maru, in the meantime, by the way, has got his fourth command center up in that very tricky position right there on the, uh, the left side of the map. This is one of those spots that's quite difficult for the Terran to secure, but once they get it up and running with a planetary fortress, it is really nice to fall back to. Still trying to work this angle. I feel like this is always such a point of contention on this map. Right around that ridge line, the Terran can retreat to, and oh, he actually gets that base. Solar's fifth base snipe down. Bainley's got some good connections, but he's got to watch out for the Widow Mines. Oh, oh yeah, oh, really man. nice connections right there for the Terran player, who's just been, yeah, one step ahead every time with this aggression. Look at him picking up right there, just barely in the nick of time, losing just a single Marine, I believe. And now Solar, I mean, he needs to rebuild his economy, but he's trying to go for Lurkers. Lurkers can shut down this tempo advantage that Maru has been establishing, but he's not really properly there yet. He really needs those Lurker upgrades as well. I agree with you there, Loco. It feels like the Lurkers aren't going to be hitting the scariest timing because tank and ghost production is already well underway. Vipers will help against the tanks, and Lingbane Hydra Viper can take on this army. But because there's still the fear of the Biomine, Solar is, of course, down in supply. He's still trying to catch up on the upgrades. I think the idea of a Ling Run by is always good. Anything you can do to pick Maru's attention away, those Lurkers oh. helping hold on for now. Maru wants to snipe that fifth base once again. Yeah, he's considering stimming into the Lurkers here, but it's a very dangerous decision. You need to make sure that you are very prepared to commit, as he does now finally snipe one of them, but he's forced to back off. Wow, okay, the Vipers have popped in a gathering energy behind this. The sixth base does get, get cancelled. Fifth base almost finished rebuilding. Ling Run by on the left side comes in. But the wall is raised, and the Lings aren't really getting that much done. It looks like maybe a ghost, but no. Nice micro for Maru. The ghost gets out. A few SCVs will fall. But at the end of that, of course, a good trade for uh, for Solar just to pull the army back and distract him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's getting a, a good trade here, getting a couple of goes. I think that's the third one going down. A few SCVs, but most importantly, that pressure has been alleviated, right? It's now no longer right there on top of his fifth hatchery. So that means he can go back to mining. He can start getting those late game upgrades as well. It was looking really, really dangerous right there for Solar momentarily, but... He's crawling his way back into this game right now. And once he finishes up all those late game upgrades, this game is going to look a whole lot better for him. If Solo can deny a base, the fifth base going, that'll be great. But he's still going to deal with these Widow Mine drops. And they are very annoying. Just taking out a few Lings and a drone. This one in the natural does finally get Ooh. shot down. And that's very nice for Solar. But yeah, he's got to get a move on in terms of stopping Maru. Maru is now switching gears to macro. He's going three commands on his. He's building a planetary on the fifth base. These are things that Solar does not want to let get up because he is right now investing into Lurker tech, which is not the greatest tech the longer this game goes. Oh, and that sight blocker working Whoa. against Solar there. At least the one Lurker right there manages to escape, but only for a little while. The Queen's trying to transfuse so many cost-efficient trades here for Maru throughout this game so far. Yeah, look at the resources lost. I mean, honestly, considering the amount of mining they've been doing, the resources lost isn't really even that big yet, but I yeah. think those numbers are going to be pumped up very shortly because Maru is ready to mine out. Well, basically every mineral field he can get his hands on. Oh yeah, he's going to play that methodical game. So many commands, and it's a third factory, four ghosts building at a time. Vehicle weapon upgrade starting, of course. Maru wants to get towards plus three siege tanks, but also plus three blue flame hellbats as the game goes long enough. And uh, we'll see exactly... Oh, 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 oh. fight over here in the middle of the map. He's trying his best to back off once again. EMP on the Viper. Going to make it difficult for Zerk to Oh, oh, Solar's attacking around a corner. This is a really nasty fight for Solar. Oh. He has Banelings coming from the north, but most of those Banelings got shot down, and Solar attacking around a ridgeline. 
That was a big upset there for Solar's army. Maru just smashed through a vastly superior force. The unit's lost time will be way more in his favor now. Yeah, that was a very questionable choice. I think Solar was planning on coming behind right there with more Bane Links, but I think many of them got killed before they ever reached the battlefield. Now suddenly Maru is ready to counterattack. I mean, he wanted to play the long macro game, but he says, yo, if you're gonna give me a bunch of your army, I'll test the waters and see if I can kill another one of your bases. Normally Ghost, maybe not necessarily the best unit that's sniping those expansions, but oh, oh my god, they're trying their best. No, Bane now connecting. That tank on the north is doing great damage as well. I, I think Solar might be able to get up on top of this, but he's gonna have to go for it sooner rather than later. His Lurkers ran off to the north side. Uh, I don't know why the Lurkers wow. didn't join in this fight, Loco. It feels like Solar is getting stretched too thin. That were a lot of ghosts that just went down at the cost of a hatchery, I suppose. A lot of Zerg units as well. I'm not entirely sure what to make of that particular fight. How many ghosts just fell? Where are the lurkers? I saw them run off to the north of the screen. I'm like, okay, there they are. The lurkers yeah. are doing a run by. Yeah. They are getting a denial on a base, but on their own. Ah, a bit unfortunate for Solar to lose a base like that. I mean, he denies the sixth, but he denies it temporarily. This is not the same as blowing up a planetary in 20 SCVs. Solar, he's got good bank, he's still got good money, and he's still going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Maru, but he's got to find a way to swing back. And uh, I think, obviously, Maru and Festers is something Serra likes at this stage of the game. I think for Solar, it's more about sandwiching an army. It's all positioning focus. He's got to get in there from two sides so Maru can't back out of these fights. He is very well upgraded right now, so Zerklings alone should already do pretty well against this planetary fortress. With the support of Banelings and Hydras, however, this expansion will surely pull. Nice move. Yeah, we are now at the phase of the game, though, where Maru has so many command centers available. Look, he just killed one of them. There's one ready to replace. Oh, this. Banelings on the planetary, though, getting quite a few SCVs, but I don't think he's going to be able to finish it off. This might be an overextension. Maru gets in with the oh, repair. Oh, is he going to oh. be able to get that? No, the Hydras tried to retreat at the last possible second, but they don't get it done. In the meantime, though, these lurkers have been working on command centers. There's another burning building, but that one also gets saved. I think Solar's just overextending a little bit. The previous fight where the flank came in too late, that one as well. If he didn't go for the second planetary, waited for more units and kept rotating around, he'd be good. But Maru gets a little bit of moment to rest here, to lick his wounds and rebuild. He's going to counterattack Solar, and Solar going into just Hydra Ling Bane. I think he might be off the lurker production for a while since there are so many ghosts on the map. But uh, we'll see exactly which direction it goes. Six SCVs building at a time for Maru. And uh, he's going to rebuild that economy really quickly. The creep spread is starting to worry me a little bit here for Solar, because Maru is now picking up the pace even more. And it's difficult to really prioritize oh! it. There's a lot of lurkers end up going down right here in the middle of the map. That's all of them. Oh, that is a disaster. Solar not happy with that at all. Maru stumbles upon the jackpot there and is quick to capitalize and now he's back into this position this is Maru's favorite spot on this map he loves working this angle Solar's going to try and attack into it but those tanks they do line up deep oh. they were a bit slow to siege but there's just no links to capitalize yeah amazing target firing right there from our Terran player who's now once again marching across the map with whatever army he's got there's a little bit of a counterattack happening as well over there at the Planetary Fortress, but the Zorklings get cleaned up. Now we're even oh. sniping down the Hydras. Ow, 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 ow. Those ghosts just sniping so many units down. A few of the ghosts go down, but an amazing trade. And Maru's supply is surprisingly close with Solar's, but of course he's got the Mass Orbital Commander, Command Center Binder. He can drop mules for days. Solar, on the other hand, is completely broke. Tactical nuke coming up as well. Maru ready to uh, insult his opponent some more here. Obviously, there's that famous game they played a while ago where the planetary, or sorry, the technical nuke rotter ended up killing everything that the Zerg player had. Very different scenario, of course. Maru is losing a lot of his units, though. It's not like he, yeah, he's not particularly rich. He's got a ton of command centers, that's great, but he doesn't have a bank to immediately replace the units that he's just lost. Solar has beastly macro, he really yeah. does. The, the fact that he's taking so many fights like this bad and still hanging on in terms of the supply is great. It's just that this base is crucial. He can't give this base up, and so he's fighting into a meat grinder. It's such a bad situation for him to fight, and Nuke even trying to get called down. Solar will take the ghost out, cancel the Nuke, drop a parasitic bomb. He's going to have to keep falling back. There's just more tanks, Hellbats, and Ghosts rallying into the fight. And it feels like Maru's reinforce is just too strong. Remember, this is only part of the Terran army. A lot of it's walking across the map. This is everything the Zerg has. Beautiful game right there once again from Maru. Probably did not go entirely the way that he had anticipated there. He was ready to play an even longer game if he needed to. 
But yeah, he saw an opportunity when he grabbed all of those lurkers in the middle of the map. He realized, okay, this is the time. I'm gonna try and attack and win this game right here, right now. And that turned out to be the correct choice. I mean, he's got the highest score of all of our pro gamers for a very good reason. 98 on the defense, and uh, we saw it. The way he, he baits the Zerg into fighting around corners is huge. You know, there's this thing with the way the units path in StarCraft, they clump up like mad when they mm -hmm. go around a ridge or a corner to get at the opponent's army. You always want to be attacking through as wide open a space as possible with those melee units. And uh, he used that four or five different occasions. He was always setting up with his army, kind of snaking around behind the terrain. And the first few tanks might go down, but then they get punished so hard does the Zerg by the other units that do come out. You brought up that killer macro though from Solar, right? I mean, that game, it looked like Maru was winning for like 80% of the time, at least that's what it felt like. But Solar always had enough to actually defend whatever the Terran player was throwing at him. I really feel like this game pivoted heavily in favor of the Terran when those lurkers were found out, just camping in the middle of the map. I think he, he just used them together with an Overseer to like snipe a Widow Mine or something along yeah. those lines. And they were still sitting there. Maru knew it, he found them and he killed them. And that's really what allowed Maru to obtain the victory here. Unfortunate situation for Solar. It's one of those games though where you can't get into your own head all too much. It just seemed that Maru was ever so slightly better. Yep, that is the way Solar's games look as well in this matchup. It often looks like he's just getting beaten up by the Terran opponent for 10, 15 minutes and then he kills them. Yeah. Like, this is actually the way his games go. So, you know, it, it may have looked like Mario was in the driver's seat that whole time. As you said, the critical moments were, of course, when the Zerg counterattacks got completely stuffed. That was the key thing, swapping from offense to defense, something that this player is an absolute master at. He's in the top left side of the Dragon Scales. Can he get the 3-0 clean sweep and go to the semis? It's Maru. And his opponent down right here in the bottom right hand corner of Dragon Skills. He needs your energy. Make some noise for Solar. I don't think he goes down this easily. I don't think Solar goes down 3-0 here. I uh, feel like he's been here many times before in the past. And you know, I actually get a little more worried for him mentally when he's up 2-0 because I mm. feel like he has a pretty high rate of players reversaling him. But I think when he's down in this hard position, he just feels like he's got nothing to lose. And he's like, all right, time to just play the best games I possibly can. Let's just go pedal to the metal. And uh, he already looked pretty damn good in that last game against the T-Rex Reaper opening. Mm -hmm. Maru's doing it again. I, I feel like this gives Solar such a good position. Remember, he shut that Hellion drop down. He was in a an amazing position in that last game. I think he's gonna shut this one down as well. Yeah, it was a relatively small commitment into Reapers at the time, so we'll see how many Maru decides to make this time around. Obviously, with those Reapers being 50 minerals and 50 gas each, you usually will get enough resources to make a command center as well. You can see that on this map on top of that ramp, uh, he really has to get creative with his building positioning, but eventually he's going to be able to start pumping out those Reapers two at a time. Shout out, by the way, to everybody who already showed up for the tournament today. <laughs> <laughs> Love seeing those signs. That's awesome. Well, this map is uh, one which doesn't have as many jumping ledges up and down to hide those Reapers on, so definitely not one where you can scale too far out of control, but if you can maybe deny the third base or just uh, get rid of a few tumors, get rid of some drones and Zerglings, things can go well. I really like the way Solar pulled all of his drones away from the Reaper run by in that last game. Mm -hmm. Took very few losses. Reaper going in right now, ready to harass the Zerg's natural. At this point, it's difficult to tell exactly what you're playing against, but soon he's going to be seeing multiples as well. That link speed starts up, very important upgrade. Third hatchery has already begun building as well. And so far, Maru is just dancing. He knows he's on a timer, but how much damage can he really deal? First Zergling goes down and the Queen comes out and, oh, gets a drone. Oh, so close to losing a Reaper for it. Surviving on three hit points. Nicely done right there by the Terran player. Did he only go two Reapers, by the way? No, there's a third one. I was going to say, that would be crazy. Opening up double barracks only to then go for two Reapers in total. 
Well, the Queen and the Zerglings are waiting right here on the high ground, and they're not going to be able to snipe any of these units. Once again, even though Battle Mech has been pretty popular at this particular tournament so far, we've once more got ourselves that stim pack coming up. I like how we have like a decade worth of establishing the standard in this particular matchup, and then the Terrans are like, you know what? We're going back to making two barracks. There we go, three Reapers, and we'll just make a bunch of random bio units. It's so weird. It's, uh, yeah. It really is going full circle. And uh, Maru, I mean, he's a guy who's a big fan of the, the 2 one, one as well. Mm -hmm. And with the later factory after the third command center, I do think we're just going to see the starport swap around, get some medevacs across the map. And I like his focus on uh, Widow Mines in that last game. I really do feel like the Widow Mines allow you to apply a lot of pressure. On the other hand, I mean, I, I really, I think if Solar was able to resume from replay and, and, and jump back in time to when he first is counterattacking, yeah, those, those planetaries are getting busted by Banelings. We're seeing those Lurkers be used a little bit more carefully, and I do think Maru's going to struggle from that situation. So the, the Widow Mine style, it's something which allows you to put on a lot of pressure, but, um, well, we better talk about the Baneling bust that's coming. Hey, Lurker. Yeah, <laughs> that Baneling nest is uh, a standard structure in this matchup, but normally we don't see it until quite a bit later. Solar is preparing a massive Baneling bust right here in this match, which... This is do or die right now for the Zerg player, right? He does not have another chance. Now, this is a really nice oh. snipe. I was wondering about that Overlord hanging in the middle of the map. He's not going to be able to hit that, I don't think, though, before that Stimpak upgrade finishes up, will he? If he could have surrounded those Marines, that would have been so beautiful. But no, he's not going to be able to get rid of the Stim. He's going to run up that ramp with this Zergling. He, oh. Honestly, ah, this he is might assume that Stimpak is not done yet because the green light cap. Oh, on. he's too far outside. Maru caught with his pants down. And that means the door does not get raised. Banelings are going to walk in, but Maru's got some pretty good focus fire. He's taken down four or five Banelings already, but the Lings are getting the, the surround. Grenades from the Reapers would be fantastic at this point in time as well as the Banelings are trying to hunt down whatever they can. Very good control though here by the Terran player, only losing a handful of SCVs so far. This is very respectable because keep in mind, there's a third CC on the back of this. Oh my lord, Maru, you crisp god of micro. How did you pull off this defense? It's not over yet, though. The wall is being torn down. Those Reapers are so low. Yeah, the Supply Depot, right? That one has to be uh, raised here if he wants to keep all of these units out. Now Solar, though, is really starting to get the damage done. Oh, wait, he's actually down. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's trying got... to get the damage done that he wanted to deal, and this is looking better and better right now for the Zerk player. Look at that Supply Depot attempt every single time. It gets the Knight by the Lings. Yeah, he needs 100 Minerals as well, and he, he couldn't get it now. Oh. He has the Minerals, but the Lings are doing so much. The Bailey's coming in from both sides. The Siege Tank drops on him. Maru dropping the tank, take it out. Bailey's clear the SCVs at the front. The Siege Tank goes down five marines trying to hold on against an onslaught of zerglings solar says i will not go down three zero the zerglings surrounding those last few marines maru's hanging on like a champ but i don't think he's got the numbers 42 scvs have gone down i think in maru's mind right now he's like yeah you're dealing this damage but how many workers do you really have I've got triple command center. Those mules, they mine really quickly and they bring me a lot of money. So if you're doing this push, well, he's not too happy about it, but if you're doing this push off of like 25 drones or so, I actually might have a chance to get back. <laughs> he's going to have to wall up the That's what we're doing. He knows he can't defend the natural Maru. That was the most tilted I've ever seen Maru yeah. look on his face, by the way. And he looked like actually frustrated. That is, that is crazy. Uh, despite that, I, I think this is so clever of him. Solar busts in and he's like, wait, are you serious? <laughs> okay, I can't get up there. He's going to have to just deny the natural and go back to droning. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think it's obviously a massive lead. You can't really reclaim the low ground here. Yeah. Maru's going to just drop three Marines on the low ground while having Marines on the high ground covering them. This but is buildings the, are burning. This is the pro gamer equivalent of flying your CC to the corner of the map, right? I mean, it is going to be incredibly difficult for Maru to come back. But hey, it's the World Championships. You may as well try your best to obtain the victory. And trying he is, but he's losing everything that he's been working on in this game so far. 40 drones at this point. It is critical that Solar gets back to workers because I don't think he's going to be able to bust through those, well, main structures, right? He's not going to be able to kill the factory with Banelings. No, I mean, well, yeah, you, you can, actually, yeah. if you make enough and you've got enough money maybe to, but uh, why not just drone up and get way further ahead while denying the natural? There's no reason to try to headbutt up that ramp. I love the way Maru is methodically microing this, mm -hmm. but uh, it would not be a crazy decision. Is that for Maru nine kills and one Marine right there? He left 10, 10 kills, kills, nine kills, heroes. 10 kills, nine kills. <laughs> that is that is awesome. That's a 28 kill, uh, you know, three Musketeers of, uh, of Terran there. Apparently Dark is one of those. Uh, who knew? <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> one one upgrades being restarted in the main for Maru. And yeah, it would it would not be crazy to just type GG. He's he's no. so far behind. Like I love that he's trying though, right? Yeah. One of the comments we always get as casters is like, why do the players leave the game already? Well, it's because it's very difficult to win the game in the long run. <laughs> oh, the focus fire is so sick! It's so sick, yeah. The heroes ended up going down though. There's still two Marines inside of those medevacs. Now the structures here are gone. He's even planting a bailing there to make sure that he can't land anything in that location either. But yeah, this is Maru just mostly processing the loss, trying to squeeze out a victory. But you must know that it's not possible as Sola gets a point on the board. It's a really good psychological tactic when you are heavily favored, when you're sort of a nemesis to an opponent, to just hang in there and make them really earn every single inch. Mm -hmm. Because they've got so much pressure on their shoulders already. And just making them do a little bit of extra work while you kind of plan out your next series, it costs you nothing. Yeah. But it can actually just pile up the stress and the exhaustion that they're going through, get a bit more adrenaline pumping through their system. They're going to be playing less calm, less organized in the following games. Such a risky move though, right? From Solar. Because there were two moments where those Marines were out on the map when they really shouldn't have been. This is one of the yes. downsides of being a great micro player. You kind of feel like, hey, you know what? I'm going to venture across the map, maybe see if I can get some damage done. When you have four or 500 APM to play with, you kind of get bored just sitting behind your wall, so you get a little bit adventurous. If those Marines would not have gotten surrounded on the ramp, I think this game would have looked very different. 100%. It really very well could have. That wall was raised and five banelings had to be used just to get through the wall, mm -hmm. not to mention how many get focused down on the way up there. A very different game. But you got to remember that Maru's been playing a lot of this build into either three command center, where he likes to still do a light marine pressure, cleaning up overlords and pretending he's going to do a marine pressure. And then he sometimes he does that actual four racks that I was talking about with like yeah. a very committed that stim marine a disaster. Ship. Yeah, so the thing is, I feel like basically Solar said, look, even if you go for the four racks, you're going to come out and I'm going to surround you with the Ling Bane and, and I think I can still take you out. I think he just said there's such a high chance of you with any follow up getting greedy and moving your Marines around the map. I'm going to catch you out. I'm down 0-2. I need to take some risks and some gambles. I love the bravery to make that decision. You've got to take risks to win three games in a row versus Maru. Our next map in this best of five is loading up as we find ourselves on Ancient Sister. And spawning right here in the bottom left hand corner, we have the man who's looked very solid in this series so far. An unfortunate game number three. We are looking at Maru's main command center. <laughs> All right, up here to the right side of Ancient Sister, and also representing Onside Gaming. He's got a point on the board. Let's see if he can get a second one. It's Sola. I feel like Sola's the people's hero, you know? Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's, he's had these moments where he gets nuked or uh, cannon rushed or pylon walled in, and we kind of go, all right, you know, but but he fights back, he fights hard, he never gives up, and... We're never going to let him forget that, right? Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> there have been, like, three occasions, for those of you unfamiliar, where the man took a huge nuke to the face. It's unfortunate. It barely ever happens at this level of play. It's a while ago now. Most but, people uh... don't come back from that, you know? <laughs> that trauma's living in their head rent-free. Sol has managed to move faster. He's had some really good series versus Maru over the last year since, uh, since that happened, and... I think he's uh, definitely looking very focused so far. This map's interesting because there are a lot of rocks that really slow down the push paths, mm -hmm. but it is like Widowmine heaven. Uh, there's just so many ledges and paths, and I feel like every time I watch this map, even in TVP, there's just widow mines that end up scattered all over the map and units running into them. It's great for backstabs as well because there is a lot of room around the edges, and uh, it just has a lot of dynamic options in terms of the strategies that get played out. This map, also known as the Green Map, under the pro gamers. Uh, yeah, that's Apparently what they've been calling they, it. Yeah, yeah, they've been calling it the Green Map. The Green which, Map, which is uh, you know pretty uh, descriptive. I like it. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, fantastic color schemes these days on all of the StarCraft II maps, but the map maker for this particular one was like, no, green. Hey, green, green. That's what I go with. I have been demanding more greenery and it flowers and plants for years. Like. There was, there was season upon season where every single map looked like Antigua's shipyard. You're like, oh, we have some mud and there's some metal bits. And you're like, yeah. oh, wow. This and is, it's very dark this as well. This is really aesthetically pleasing, guys. Wow. Like, <laughs> what happened to beaches and sunshine and forests? Come on. 
Yeah, we don't want to go outside all too often as gamers. We want to experience the outside inside. Anyways, <laughs> the Reaper right now getting across the map gets a little bit of damage done on those Zorklings. Look at that. What's that called? I have no idea. Well, that's, I mean, the cistern is literally under the main base, right? Because that's where all the water is flowing out of. I did never even consider that. Yeah, <laughs> I've been thinking of this as the green map as well, yeah. So that's it. They've both set up their base on the uh, the very valuable fresh water on this map, you know? Oh. So I, I, it's I, a battle for the fresh water supply. Is that what you're saying? 100%. That's there's right. There's a Tastalope running around. There's an Artosalope on the other side of the map as well. Yeah. We'll see it uh, running around skittishly very soon. So we do have a 1-1-1 uh, a one, one, oh, one, one, one rudder opener right here for Maru. That's one barracks, one factory, and then a starboard. And yeah, the double Hellion production is pretty standard, but notice he's building a few extra marines to help deny Overlord scouting. And uh, Maru will be choosing the path of his build soon. This is no quick third command Ooh, center. That second gas is interesting. Did that Reaper scout that by any chance? Or did he try to... Did I think it was just an extractive trick, right? Okay. Just a bit of a supply block mistake there. Solo wanted to squeeze out, I guess, one more queen or drone mm. and uh, went for it. A Vikings on the way behind this as well. More and more Hellions are building. Still no third command center, of course. That usually goes down about 410 with this sort of opening. And the Hellions going to veer around, see if they can get some Tuma snipes. Yeah, well, they should be able to get some if they try to target it down. Instead, they decide to, uh, they decide to continue driving straight into the natural. Oh, good drone surround. Oh. Really good micro by wow. Solo. Wow. Making a very bad situation look pretty dang good right there. Only four workers at the cost of all those Hellions and that Reaper. Not a bad start here at all. He you now also scouts exactly what the follow-up is going to be. I'm telling you, Loco, you know, similar to that Oli Moly series, I feel like whenever Maru's really aggressive, Solar shuts it down and looks really good. But when Maru goes to the late game, that's where he looks like he's on another level. Now, this is a mech transition from here. Ooh. Second factory armor, he goes down. Very exciting. So many players have only been playing battle mech out on Crestman. And I really feel a lot of the maps have enough, enough room for it and could be effective. Now, here's a cool setup. The Viking cleans up the Overlord path. The Medivac comes through to try and drop in the corner of that big main base, which Solop won't see unloading and could do massive damage. The Queen is waiting here to possibly intercept the unit like a Liberator, but she's going to be surprised when a bunch of cars show up that shoot flames at her as they do indeed now unload into oh the main base. My. How many oh. workers can he get? Beautiful oh. evolution change it enough right there from the Zerg, though. He's still hunting down the drones, but he's not getting them, really. Oh, my lord. Wow. Solo with some very good reactions. Once again, only loses four drones. I mean, yeah, it's still a few workers, but for three Hellions, Solar is just on point. And Maru, oh my lord, I don't actually think it's a mech build. No, it's Drilling Claws. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, this is the old school opening where you spam more Widow yeah, Mine this. drops than your opponent has ever seen. The next five minutes of this game is going to be Solar playing Widow Mine Drop Defense Simulator. If he can pass <laughs> this test with flying colors, he should be far ahead. The problem is they just will not stop coming. Maru is going to drop him relentlessly with Widow Mines and go up into bio. The problem with the transition behind this for Maru is your barracks are so late, you have basically no real army until about 10 or 11 minutes. Like, you're completely wide open on, on, on the defense, so he needs to pin Solar at home with the Widow Mine drops. Another problem, Solar's playing Roaches, which yes. already leads into a really strong timing attack. I actually think Solar's playing this game perfectly. Yeah. The only problem with the Roach Ravager army, as he also puts down a Spire, is that the units move around pretty slowly, right? So you need to be in the right place at the right time. And those speedy Widow Mines are going to burrow incredibly quickly. He needs to be there when the units arrive. And at this point, he doesn't really know. He probably assumes this is a standard play. So he does see a Medivac leave right now. There's already one on the right side of the map. Viking here trying to just deny the Overlords. But here comes that very first Medivac drop. Oh, well, at least with Widow Mines in it. Sporkle is going to do good, but oh my gosh, the drones! Oh, wow, 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 wow. Okay, 13 drones going down. Down. Fantastic first wave. Solar there does shoot down the medevac, and he will get rid of that second Widow Mine, though. Nice defense. If he can hold the drone key down, he'll be good. But you know what? Mm -hmm. He's queuing up more roaches. Yeah, he's ready to go on the offense. He also just shut down his own Spire. So even though he was opting to go for Mutas here earlier, no longer going to be the play. There's our second uh, Widow Mine drop inside of the main base. Couple of Widow Mines over there get the night as well. Third base under a lot of harassment. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Going down. One of the Widow Mines didn't burrow in the main as well, actually. So oh. he's got another Widow Mine in the main that could borrow. There we go, 12 SCVs in total do go down. That Widow oh. still just waddling around Maru. Target? Target? Oh, it's just barely out of range, right? Yeah. 
Okay, Solar has taken catastrophic damage, but Maru's army, if we can see the units tab, I think it's about 14 Marines and one tank, Not two even. Marines. That is a very small army. He's pulling back from the third. He's going to put the tanks on the high ground. If you have an Overseer, then it's good, but there's a Viking, which means you can't have an Overseer to spot the high ground. Oh, there it is. If he brings that in and files the tank, it's mm. game over. But if that tank can hold on, maybe, just maybe, Maru can stop this avalanche of Roach Ravager. Yeah, these Roaches and Ravagers are well upgraded as well. They have the speed upgrade too, so they're going to do as much damage as possible. The Overseer does need to come in right now. It'll probably be moving very, very soon. Okay, he's trying to buy layer on the retreat. That Siege tank getting so many shots in. Where's Second the tank. Overseer? The Overseer, I don't think it's on the control group. I think Solo's forgotten about it. There, there we go. go. It's coming in, but the Marines are in front. The tanks are absolutely ravaging this army, Loco. Oh. Only two vials land on the tank. Maru making an amazing hold here, and he shuts that army down. Solar on the camera. You can see he's frustrated, realizing that this is a huge, huge moment. He thought he should have been able to kill Maru here, but Maru with the perfect tank marine positioning, a beautiful SCV pull. I don't know how he lost only eight SCVs. That was absolutely insane right there from Maru. He needed to get a little bit lucky, but he got it as well, right? Those siege tanks dealing so much damage. That Overseer, it provided the high ground vision he needed to actually shoot those corrosive balls at the siege tank. You could see the panic coming in when it initially did not show up, as he indeed ended up misfiling a couple of the tanks as well. There's oh, the wow. siege two. Maru rubbing salt in the wound. That being said, this is still a scary Zerk army. But those two tanks on the high ground, oh my lord, they are just destroying. Oh, and you can see Solar. GG. Take the trophy, what did he say? GG, well played, <laughs> take the trophy instead of me. Graciously saying, all right, buddy, you've absolutely earned this one. Very, very nicely done right here by Maru, who now moves on to the semifinals of I Am Gotta Fits of 2023. The spamming the Widow Mine drops there, such a dynamic and difficult build to play against. And the variations, so good at it. A great way to start off the round of eight and, of course, this finals day. It's going to be a long day, so it's good to have a smooth start there for Maru. Let's hear more about that from Kolaris. Yes, just me. We've got ourselves Maru getting through into that round of four. We did hear from Solar a few days ago, of course. Practice games versus Maru not going so well. 13 and 1 apparently towards Maru. And it seems like we're not seeing too much difference here on the main stage. Wardy, Fear Dragon joining me here for this one. Maru looked awake in this series. He was ready to go, rip roaring right through Solar. Man, I wish when I woke up I looked like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was it was sickening. You know, this first game started off what felt like pretty good for Sola, right? But Maru just says, hey, yeah. man, it's so scary to make meters against me because I will just hit you where it hurts. Meters are maybe not the best at taking those fights. We know that Maru just found monstrous engagements. And I think that was the thing about this entire series. The engagements were just disgustingly good for Maru. Sola really struggled to find a fight that was good for him. And I mean, that game three, I know again ahead of myself on the highlights, but that game sure, three sure. continued defense. Yeah, Maru was dead. But that basically to me said, hey, if you try and attack me at any point in this series, you're not going to win because, well, look how well I'm doing when I'm already dead. Imagine mm -hmm. I actually have like half a hope. So it was just phenomenal phenomenal by Maru. I don't think there's really much else to say. So uh, I said before, just had to punch up a little bit today. Yes. It just wasn't there. No. Yeah. And it really did feel like Solar was doing a good job in that early mid game. It's, it's what you were talking about just now, Wardy, where he was able to defend and deflect a lot of the aggression from Maru, despite Maru putting on a really, really good show, doing a lot of really fa flashy plays here and there. But the engagements at the end, every single time Solar tried to do anything on the counter was a big problem. Anytime Solar was actually doing anything besides this right here, which is like just defending against the ghost, defending against the, uh, the Marine Marauder medevac attacks, he would eventually start taking really bad trades. Yeah, I, I, I was saying to you guys before we just came on, in game two, I've never seen a Terran have as many ghosts just get traded away, enough trades with the snipes, enough trades with the... Ah, just, <laughs> just, it's such a strong understanding of like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing this and you're going to pun be punished eventually here, Wadi. Can you imagine, sorry, I know this doesn't really follow this is ridiculous. Said, but like, if you were, had that depot up and there's five less balance because I had to bust down the depot, yeah, this yeah. isn't even close. Right? No, the series ended not. 15 minutes ago. 
It is ridiculous how good a defense he made from the worst possible situation given this. And he just so. keeps living and keeps living and keeps yeah. making it hard for him to finish the game. And it's draining when you're having to do that against someone like Maru. Yeah, I, if this game had, if this had been a best of seven and this was game three and Maru had won this, I actually, like, I don't know how a player bounces back in game number four. No, you're, I think you're defeated. Solar would have you're actually done. just been defeated. He yeah. would have been mentally defeated and it just would have been over. And we had Widow Mines the video game for a little while here because there was just a lot of them. Eight in total getting dropped across all of this and disruption and so much mining, loads of drones going down. Solar had what? One Hail Mary with the Roach Ravager? Well, you know what it is? It's like, that's what this build comes down to, right? It's can you transition quickly enough off the Widow Mines to survive the counter attack? Because yeah, yeah. the Zerg knows you're weak. The tank positioning is good. They're both on the high ground. He doesn't have the one on the low ground initially, so there's no good initial bios. It takes you so long to get forward. And the, it's just a great position on this map for them. You can't get the Ravagers towards the distance, them without right, yeah, going yeah. through the wall off first. So you're just forced into a bad position. Maybe that's part of why Mari chooses to wouldn't mind drop, because he knows defensively speaking, he can pull off a defense following it. That's a good point. On the ancient system, the topography makes it very difficult to actually make this happen. So uh, we watch the final moments as another pushing comes in. But now by this point, there's a third tank, there's extra Marines, there's everything to go here. Fear Dragon, this just, this bodes Looking at the series, it bodes well for Maru's campaign here in Katowice. Yeah, I mean, his next round that he's going to have to play, he knows that it's going to be another Zerg player. He showed yeah, yeah. what a masterclass Terran versus Zerg player he is, as if he hasn't already so many times before. I, Maru's well, looking indomitable. And bear in mind, if he does get through to the final after beating those Zergs, it's always a Zerg in the final here at Katowice. <laughs> so... It'll be quids in. All right. Well, anyway, gentlemen, let's head over to an interview now. Smix is ready, of course, with the winner, Maru. Thank you very much, Kolaris, and congratulations, Maru. He is moving forward to the semifinals here at the Intel Extreme Masters, Katowice. And Maru, not only is it impressive to see you continue to do this, this is already your fourth time moving forward to the round of four here in Katowice. Tell us what's going through your head right now. 제 조성주 선수 너무 축하드리고요. 어, 이번 4강 진출이 벌써 카토비차에서 네 번째 4강 진출인데 소감 한 마디만 해주세요. 어 결승 간 적이 없어가지고 그다지 좋은 기억은 아닌데 이번에는 뭔가 결승 갈것 같아가지고 어, 최대한 열심히 해보겠습니다. Uh, so he says, honestly, my memories at Katowice are not great because I've never actually been able to make it to the Grand Finals, but I feel really good about my chances about making it to the Grand Finals this time around, so I'm going to make sure to work really, really hard to make that happen. Now, on, on map number three, we saw, we saw Solar come in with his all in, and, and you definitely looked pretty upset. Tell us what was going through your head at that moment, because we did get a great shot of your face, and you definitely looked very upset. Uh, so he says, when it comes to that map, I, I was upset because had my Marines just stayed inside, I would have been fine, but I, I, my Marines went outside of my base, and that's why I, I wasn't able to hold, and so that was really frustrating for me. Uh, and I think it definitely affected my mental, even headed, heading into map number four, but still I was able to refocus and get control, and I think that's why I was able to win map four as well. And I'm curious, speaking of map four, we saw you have uh, the Widow Mine drops, but then we saw that Solar was also going Roaches, knowing he, he was in a position where he had to counter and, and all in as a result of you killing so many drones. Were you worried or, or confident that you would be able to hold? Uh, 
Uh, so he says, uh, absolutely, when I saw the roaches, it, it was worrying because the widow mine drop strategy is, is one where I, I'm supposed to lose if my opponent goes roaches. Honestly, had I not killed as many drones as I had, I don't think I would have been able to win, but I think I was very lucky that I was able to kill as many drones as I did, and I think that's why I was able to win. And now, Maru, you said that you feel really good about your chances of getting to the Grand Finals. It's going to be another Zerg opponent in either Ragnarok or Serral. Who do you think you'll be facing, and who do you prefer to face? Yeah, <laughs> 신인범 선수나 세럴 선수를 만날 건데 그둘 중에서 누가 더 누가 올라올 것 같고 그리고 개인적으로 누가 올라왔으면 좋겠나요? 어 이왕 결승 갈거 그냥 세럴 선수랑 해보고 싶습니다. He says, you know, if I'm gonna go to the grand finals anyway, I want to face Seral. <laughs> But for now, that will be it. Thank you very much, Maru, for taking the time for this interview. He is headed once again to the round of four. This is the Intel Extreme Masters.
Intel Extreme Masters, Katowice, is brought to you by Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We have got one of our roundabout series done, and now we're moving into the next one. And lo and behold, we get to greet the world champion onto the stage for the next one. Aceral is going to go up against Ragnarok in a ZVZ to find out who goes up against Maru here. Joining me, Tasteless and Artosis. They call us the gradient as we go from light to slightly light. <laughs> we're just a big passing color palette Ooh. up here. <laughs> <laughs> and guys, we've got this ZVZ coming up. Tasteless, obviously, yeah. you guys have been kind of really focused Sing in on Ragnarok over at the GSL. He's been doing extremely well for himself, but going up against the world champion, world champion now in a ZVZ, that's tough. Yeah, you know, um, there was an interview that Cyril did after one of the matches that he won that I thought was pretty insightful. He mm. basically said that, you know, ZVZ hasn't changed that much, and it, no matter how good you are at it, you can get tricked early on with certain types of ling aggression Correct, and, yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, you know, Ragnarok is certainly capable of playing like that. Uh, I do think we need to keep cementing in our minds the fact that Ragnarok is just continuing to be a better version of himself every year yeah, uh, yeah. coming into this. I think he might have a shot of taking this, but I think any honest person has to say Cyril is likely to take this. And, and he sort of, when Ragnarok is making those leaps and bounds year by year, he sort of makes it look effortless, even though it's extreme amounts of work, Arto. <laughs> it's like you, you can't get that good without putting in that much work. But yeah, yeah. Ragnarok's I mean, doing well. He's been around for a really long time yeah. playing the Star Leagues in Korea. Like, I remember so many cheesy games from him back in, like, 2015. Uh, but here he is, and he's really improved his macro play. But it Tasteful said that no honest person could say that they don't think Sarah would. Are you calling me a liar, Nick? Because I actually, Ooh. looking at this, <laughs> yes. okay, Ragnarok takes down Dark ZVZ. Yeah, yeah. Who who did Sarah beat ZVZ? Only a laser. He lost a DRG. He lost to Solar. Ragnarok is the strongest Zerg in Korea based on results for the mm -hmm, last mm -hmm. half of this year. So I'm saying that I think Ragnarok is taking this. Okay. So am I a liar? No, give me the conflict. <laughs> give me the conflict. You might be wrong. You're not a liar. <laughs> uh, look, I mean, it, it's possible. I think that uh, a lot of people might underestimate Ragnarok here, but if, if Cyril wins, or sorry, if Cyril does not win, I mean, uh, it will be one of the biggest upsets. He did, so far here, I mean. He, he did mention, obviously he's had a hard time with ZVZ, but he yeah. mentioned in that interview as well that you're referencing, he has a much easier time in ZVZ in best of fives compared to best of threes. So mm. you think this probably plays in his favor? I think so. Okay, okay. Cyril, Ragnarok? Absolutely. Fantastic. I love that we have Divide here at the <laughs> desk. All right, gentlemen, it's time to head over to the stage now for our next round of eight matches. We have Ragnarok and Cyril making their way on. 
Thank you very much, Kolaris. We have the two-time world champ, the current defending champion here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice, facing a player who's had a magical week here at Katowice. Can he make the court of the, the excuse me, the semifinals here in Poland for the very first time in his career? Please welcome on stage, it is Cyril and Ragnarok. He says, don't worry, the Banelings will take out the planetary. You guys take care of each other. There it and is. That is the finishing blow. It's a massive engage. Beyond just was not ready for that. The Banelings breached the natural. It is going to be a showdown between a European Zerg and a Korean Zerg. A world champion and someone who is reaching for the stars here. It is going to be Ragnarok versus Cyril. Yes, it is. And man, this match gets me excited because, you know, if you ask me before the event, I think Cyril will be fine. But the way the results have been this event has got to make Ragnarok a serious contender here. He could pull off a huge upset and maybe set up some revenge in the semi-finals for that GSL final he played. That's a long way off for him right now, but it is absolutely doable. And if nothing else, I actually think we're going to see a lot of trickery and a lot of very cool things across the Zerg versus Zerg. Couldn't agree more. I don't think that there's a single person on the entire planet that predicted what the group stages would have looked like, where Cyril was going to be the one that was not advancing out in first place, much less it looking like he might have been eliminated. And Ragnarok actually being able to top the group it really has been a tipsy-turvy tournament for a lot of these players, but it is really, really a testament to how well Ragnarok has been playing, specifically in those like that ZVZ as well, and how Cyril's been struggling in ZVZ, as everyone has been talking about in that group stage. The one thing I will say is that Cyril turned it on yesterday, right? He came in and you could argue he looked like a completely different player. You know, he, he absolutely dismantled a laser. A laser who was competitive against those other Zergs in the group as well the same ones that Serral lost out to. So Serral can turn it on, Serral can take control. I just feel like if Serral shows up the way he did yesterday, today, mm -hmm. then actually he really is just gonna steamroll through here because he was so good yesterday. And you know, he has that power as well. He has the clutch factor when he gets to really big stages. He is the one that does not kind of have his nerves shattered, really. Mm -hmm. And Ragnarok is limited in those kind of experiences. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have seen times where Cyril goes on to win an entire tournament, especially back in the 2018, 2019 era of Cyril dominance. He would drop games or even sometimes a series in a very odd fashion in the group stages. But suddenly when it hits the playoffs, a different Cyril shows up, a Cyril that is ready to absolutely dominate his opponents. And that is the kind of Cyril that needs to be brought out to ensure he can make it in to the next round, the round that we all expect him to at least make it to. He's the reigning world champion, man. He brought that trophy out on stage so quickly earlier. And he, uh, you know, really is deserving to be on there. Back to back, absolutely possible. Like again, just coming into this, we know Serral's great, right? We expect him to go all the way. It's always an upset whenever someone beats Serral. Mm -hmm. it, it's just crazy to think about just how much of a standing he has amongst the players, amongst us, because he's been there and he's done it all. Yeah, and Ragnarok, I think, still has a bit to prove for himself, but he has been on the up and up. They were talking about how well he's been doing in GSL, how he has been able to just continue to see improvement in performance. And I think he's really turned a lot of heads. He's turned a, changed a lot of minds on terms of how good of a player he has become. And he has really, really showcased that he has earned his spot here in the round of eight. No, he really has. It was uh, really fun to see him finish first in the group plays especially, because mm -hmm. that just is, the groups aren't easy. You know, that's five, you know four different matches, five different matches you have to go through. You have to be good across all of them. He was very solid against players. I thought he might have a little bit more kind of a 50-50 kind of time with. I mean, his only loss was to Clem in a series that Clem did look very confident, very good then. But other than that, Ragnarok has really looked super good. So, yeah, if he can bring it today. I do think when you talk about the course of these games and what we're maybe expecting to see a little bit, right? 
it is that kind of case of aggression is going to be a major part of this. I think a lot of these games could get decided between five and ten minutes, but Serral also has the tendency to say, hey, I like dragging games out if I can. So it's going to be this kind of weird, like, how do we set up? And then does Serral feel as though he can just go kill Ragnarok? Or does he feel like he can draw the game out? It actually could be a very kind of, I guess, versatile best of five. He's used the word versatility a lot this uh, week with the player cards and everything, so. <laughs> no, I think it's well suited, though, as we got all those uh, wonderful cheerfuls out in the crowd. But I totally agree, and I think Peg was actually even saying, Serral sometimes it feels like in ZVZ lately has been prone to be a little bit paranoid about kind of the attacks that could be coming in and sometimes playing overly safe is expecting something and pretty much getting ready for what you were talking about just trying to bring it to the late game but that has backfired for him in some of those zvzs ragnarok is the kind of player though that is willing to actually try and uh, put on the pressure all right we're gonna take a little video here as ragnarok is finishing his setup we'll be right back with this zerg this is zerg Current map pool. Actually, I haven't played a lot, but... What? In the current map pool? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's snow and rock, so there has to be altitude. I would guess this is altitude. I see some uh, ice. Do we have any ice maps? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know this one. 100%. Altitude. I don't know. Uh, is that... Altitude? Oh... Wait a minute. I mean, it's snowy, so I want to say altitude. It's just a big map, like, it's A-L-T-I-T-U-D. Hmm. I see some, uh, I see some snow. I'm going to guess that's altitude. Correct. Right. Altitude. Crest one? No? Let me think about what maps are. Near Humanity is like a city map, right? So it's probably Near Humanity. But uh, before I lock it in, I need to think for a second what the other maps are. It's not Grass when it's not Ancient. It's not Dragon Scales. I'm forgetting one map. I think it's Near Humanity. Near Humanity. Yes! Let's go! Krogio, Dragon Scale? Supernova Man's Club. I've never, I haven't seen it before, but I think it must be Royal Blood, maybe. Neo human? Hmm, that one is probably Neo humanity, if I had to guess, because I see some, some purple. It's the Ewoks. There's only one map that's this dark, is there? There's a, a Dragon Scales, I think, has this. No, I think Babylon has, has this exact color, so my guess is Babylon. Dude, what are these guys? They're like what? Bears? Dragon Scales. No. Can, do I have another guess? I don't remember the other maps now. It cannot be new humanity. Dude, I don't know. Ah, uh, it's Babylon. I don't know, I guess uh, Dragon Scales? Okay. <laughs> Babylon? Okay, that was my other guess. Oh, maybe you don't get so cool. I'm Dragon Scale. Man, I never look for these details on maps. But texture wise, it looks like Babylon. Maybe Royal Blood? I have one more chance, right? Oh, I, I, I can't. It's bad or wrong? They're doing a marine barbecue over there. I'm gonna guess that's Ancient Sister, but I, I'm not sure if I guess. <laughs> oh. We are going to be getting back into it as we are ready, I believe, to move into this best of five quarterfinals match between Ragnarok and Serral. And for those of you who are wondering and have a harder time also identifying those maps, the first map is going to be Dragon Scales. <laughs> yeah, I just wish that in the future to identify the map. We just start in like a corner and we're not actually allowed to start until like 70% of you know, quick check. Mapper could correctly. do that to us. He could actually just remove <laughs> the overlay, zoom in. We could have that. 
Well, let's get this quarterfinal started. In the bottom right-hand side, he is representing Alpha Rex, and he is looking to cause upset here. Looking for his semi-final appearance. This is Ragnarok! And up here at the top left-hand side of the map, the blue Zerg player, the Finnish Phenom on his new team, Basilisk. He is Serral! I don't know about you, Wardy, but when I was meeting a bunch of people yesterday, I met a lot of Serral fans out there. There are a lot of you guys out there. How do you identify a Serral fan? I think I asked them who they were rooting for. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a little I bit see. easier. I see. Yeah. You know, I, I look for the intelligent looking people because you know what? I think I also consider myself a Serral fan and I think he is uh, looking pretty gosh darn strong. But this is, again, we've talked about it a lot before. This is going to be an important victory for him to get and to prove that he is, in fact, still looking pretty solid despite the group stages. Yeah, the group stages were a shaky start. Specifically, the ZVZ did not look great for him, which is making this kind of a worrying match. But like I say, said it once, said it probably twice, maybe three times now. He looked so good <laughs> going into yesterday's game. So that was a big one. We've got the Basilisk signs in the crowd. We've got the Serral fans in the crowd. We've got Rotty's number one fan in the crowd. Wow. I thought that was me, but apparently not. No, man. You've been downgraded. Because you know what? You're not over there hanging out with Roddy right now. <laughs> You're right, I'm not hanging out with Roddy. Can right you really now. be that big of a fan then? <laughs> Maybe not, Fear Dragon. Maybe not. This is a very standard opening. Mm -hmm. uh, just to start things off here, uh, hatch, gas, pool, everyone's at the same timings. There's a slightly faster drone on the way currently for Ragnarok. It's a very minor thing, but that's basically just where we stand. Mm -hmm. Here in the start of game number one, ZVC has a lot of different points at which it can go for that 180 into aggression. And so you've always got to be on your toes because it could be four minutes, you start up a bunch of lings and you start kind of forcing a bit of a ling bane engage or maybe five and a half, you go roachling or something. So all the way throughout this early game, we're just waiting for that one time where somebody diverges away from what the other is doing, breaks the mirror of this matchup and is able to then you know, give us something to really talk about. No, oh, absolutely. I think the two things that are worth mentioning, which is that Cyril again, as Pig was uh, kind of saying before, is a little bit prone to be a bit paranoid about that kind of early aggression coming his way. And Ragnarok has actually been going for a lot of these kind of 14 pools, Pig was also telling me as well. So it's something that we're going to be keeping an eye out for with how Cyril maybe tries to show a little bit of extra respect to what Ragnarok could be throwing at him. So far, it has been, as exactly Wardy was saying, pretty standard openings. We got mirrored builds in terms of bailing nest timings, the third base is coming down, the link counts. Everything looking like they're all totally aligned with each other. Yeah, I think Serral made two more drones, where Ragnarok made like two more sets of Zerglings. And we are going to see Ooh. now the biggest surge of Zerglings here. So it is going to be Serral to become the aggressor. I like it because against the Lazy yesterday, he looked good being the aggressor. And it's so easy to apply pressure in ZVZ without being fully committed, with the ability to kind of build up behind it. And that's often what this Ling Bane phase is. Let's see what Ragnarok does against this. Let's see how prepared he will be. As the first Lings come across the map, and Ragnarok will get ready to morph his first couple of Banes. Main goal here, of course, defend that third base. Yep, can't just rely on defending the choke point at the natural. The Queens are going to be making their way over to the third base for now. Lings for Serral may be surprising Ragnarok in terms of their numbers for a moment, as he does have to back off for a little bit. The Queens getting surrounded with the Bane Lings finish. Warping. Oh! oh! Double detonate, and now that means that the Lings have free access to the Queen. This is really bad right now for Ragnarok. He's lost one Queen, the other one is not injecting, so he's missing so much production, which he needs to have right here. He is fortunate Serral didn't continue with a ton more units, because this could have been bad, but it's still not exactly pretty. One Bailing already set to go. That Bailing of Ragnarok's not going to get to finish here, and I think Serral might just be able to monster mode his way through this first game. Going to be a big detonation. No, the drone slid away, and Serral will try and carve out as much as possible. He should have two more Bailings still arriving. Here they are. What can he do with these? The Queen gets rid of one. The other will go down. It's not going to be too major, but Serral has carved a lead out of this early game scenario. Five workers going down, nothing to sneeze at as it is absolutely going to make a difference when the economies are this early on. It's still going to be an impactful difference. Not to mention, as you were saying, Wardy, the Queen's going down. It delays a lot of Ragnarok's production. The third base for Ragnarok was not able to do almost anything during this time. In the meanwhile, Ragnarok sends his links across the map trying to get a scout, sees that he doesn't really have many opportunities. 
Carapace from Serral, Missiles from Ragnarok. He just wants to go purely into Roaches. Serral more likely to play that more aggressive Roach Ling timing here. Carapace affects the Roaches and the Lings. The Lings in front of Roaches do a lot because it means that your own Roaches aren't taking damage, so it's generally very good for you. Beautiful micro, those Lings get on top of the base. He miscalculated! Low HP Balance will still get cleaned up. He does lose a few more Lings. That was almost perfect for that Bane going in to finish <laughs> off. Just one more hit on each. Those health regeneration picks, man, they are unpredictable. But Cyril managed to get quite a few Lings over here. Going to be able to snag a couple of drones as well. More Banelings coming in to reinforce her Ragnarok. Are going to send Cyril back for a bit. But look at the supply, Wardy. It is 82 to 57. It's been Ling and Baneling skirmishes back and forth. But Cyril has a still a big army lead. Well, it's because he just started up his round of Roaches. And like mentioned, he's hitting this Carapace time. And he is going to go with this Roach and you know Ragnarok's building his own roaches but he didn't have the gas bank that Serral had he's still not mining as much gas as Serral and it's all because of how this early game has panned out he just cannot afford enough roaches so a you're on less roaches and b you're not going to have the link count to protect your roaches this attack should be heavily favored for Serral Ragnarok needs to cancel the lair right now he just did it he needs as many units as possible honestly probably some spine crawls he just can't afford everything he realistically needs he will try and buy time with the counter attack which is nice but Serral is still moving across the map yeah Serral narrowly dodging a situation where those links could have gotten past that wall and at the natural and into the main base. It does seem like Cyril is going to be arriving at Ragnarok's side of the map very shortly. These Banelings are going to be causing some problems for Cyril, making it harder to defend. The Queen is going to go down, but both the Banelings have been taken care of, and Cyril has more than enough to defend and also offend on the other side of the map. Yeah, it's going to be interesting because missiles against Carapace, Roach on Roach is better for the missile player, but Serral will soon have these links showing up, but does he lose too many Roaches before then? He's never really meant to be losing his Roach count here. Here finally comes some of the links. The counterattacks of Ragnarok have done enough to throw Serral off and to really disrupt his plans. Serral says, yeah, this isn't working out. Missile upgrade, let's get that started. Let's go into my own lair. He's not really behind on tech. He did enough to at least reset Ragnarok. But this was a situation where Serral thought, I can win, and he's not been able to close it out. Really great decision-making there from Ragnarok. When you're trying to be the defender, it requires more units than your opponent has, because you need to shut things down while not losing workers. So it really did force Serral to leave quite a few of his lings back at home, and he really wasn't able to engage exactly how you were expecting him to. Yeah, it's actually really a smart play from Ragnarok. It's probably one of the only things he could do to make that Ooh. defense look as easy as it did, as he gets a few drones here with those bail lines. And this is the interesting part, too. Serral now has all of these lings, which are not very useful for your dragon. You know, they're good in the earlier stages, and they're still going to be good for counterattacking, but against a defensive Ragnarok right now, they're kind of dead weight. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to find uses for them while these players are still just on the three base setup just because a natural is pretty easy to just plug up with a handful of units and then you leave your army around the third base and you're pretty much locked down. These links should not be able to get damage done. Maybe once a fourth base or something gets established, you're going to start to see these players get a bit more spread out. But Ragnarok is not thinking about a fourth base at the moment. He's thinking about moving across the map and Cyril should have caught wind of this by now. Yeah, this is where these links obviously do become valuable because they can counterattack, but is going to be army supply he doesn't have here. So as these roaches approach, let's see if Cell can have plus one missiles. Ooh, it's not there just yet, and Cell isn't a concave, so he's going to push Ooh. this back. This is really bad for Ragnarok, as he's going to get caught. Cell with the surround, and Ragnarok's going to get corrosive files potentially out of this game as his supply disappears. And there it is, GG. Cell takes the first game of this best of five. Silencing some of the doubters out there, saying, no, I got a lockdown on the CVZ. I gotta give credit to Ragnarok. I thought he was dead three or four minutes earlier. Mm -hmm. But then he did kind of, I mean, he kind of just went. I think he thought maybe Serral's teching up, but he was also teching up. He built the lair and everything. Weird situation. And then Ragnarok feeling like, maybe I can go a little bit. But yeah, the Lings, which, I mean, it's interesting because he knew the Lings were out there. And then he just didn't really do enough with them. Like, he didn't do enough about them. Like, they counterattacked, and so I was like, oh, but you're moving across. So he brought them back, and Ragnarok just didn't have an answer for that. So, interesting stuff. Serral obviously looking good, just the very early game really set the tone for this one and got us off in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good point as well. It's how do you deal with those lings when you know they're on the other side of the map? Because clearly getting the surround there was a very, very large factor in Serral being able to completely shut down and lock down the W in that game. It would have been a lot more questionable if Ragnarok had been able to get back home, if he's on home turf, if he has the reinforcements coming in a lot faster, he has queens being added in, and even just, you know, a few of his own units there. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because Serral still ends up taking that first game and we are going to be heading into a map number two with Serral leading up the series 1-0.
Absolutely we are. We're going to be heading into Royal Blood here. And again, we already stole straight away in that last game. Just attempts to be aggressive, attempts to take the initiative. I expect that from both these players in this series, which can lead to some weirder scenarios. Expecting more of the same as we head on into our map number two. In the top right-hand side, he's going to be down one game and looking to power up and bring it back from Alpha Rex. This is Ragnarok. And down to the bottom left-hand side of the map, the blue Zerg player from Basilis setting up 1-0. He is Cyril. <laughs> Poor Ragnarok, man. We showed the player intro for Ragnarok, and then we immediately cut to a Cyril <laughs> cheerful. We need one Ragnarok sign in the crowd, please. Yeah, can we? If please, you want to guarantee make, your way on camera, please, please, <laughs> someone make a Ragnarok sign because this guy is actually quite an amazing player. He is a lot of fun to watch, and he has been able to show some really cool aggressive styles, especially in some of those group stage matches and everything. So I'm still waiting to see when Ragnarok is going to be able to put a little bit more of his own pressure, because that last game, Cyril's kind of started the flow of things. Cyril's the one that got aggressive first with the Lings. He had that Roach transition and everything getting on up as well. Yeah, no, Cyril just took control early, and that's one of the big things he did against a laser yesterday as well. He controlled the games from the very early kind of start, and he said, you know, Elias, I know you don't like to build an Evo chamber, and you like to do this thing, you know, a little bit weird here and there. So, uh, yeah, Cyril versus yeah. Rain all they want, okay. <laughs> you guys are evil, you guys want ZVZ? Whew. Yeah, I, I love it. Where every single time we cut back to the crowd, it's just more Cyril signs. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, there's a lot of Cyril fans out there, though. Yes, they're, they're, they really are. I mean, it's very easy to be a fan of Cyril, right? Yeah. It's easy to cheer for a, a, a former champion and potentially a back-to-back -back champion, that for sure. actually reminds me, speaking of Cyril fans, Ravi, did you, did you wish good luck to Cyril today? I did not. You didn't, no. you didn't see um, him? There is apparently a curse that every time I wish a player good luck, they end up immediately bombing out of the event. <laughs> um, this is actually, I, I attribute this to many North American players bombing out of events. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you just talk to all the North Americans and unfortunately they're not being able to hold up too well. Yeah, so if anyone wants to PayPal me money to not wish their favorite pay players good luck, uh, just, you know, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is once again going to be very similar to start things off here. This is not going to be anything too wild early. We are moving towards a third hatchery. Like we saw last game, we kind of got a bit aggressive with Serral. That could be the case here. He could maybe sit back a little bit. Last game, they both went Balin Nest. There is a world where you can build, you know, past the Balin Nest, and you just kind of be a bit more offensive with Lings, and you get Roaches up behind it, and you have a Ling Roach attack in that regard. So, again, so many different pathways that ZVZ can branch off into. As we are going to see several immediately at Bailing Nest. The faster it is, generally, I always feel the safer it is, right? You're not mm -hmm. going to be in worry, you know, any sort of concern. For the most part, this is just super standard. And once again, that's why we see it on both sides of the map. Yeah. Whenever I see kind of safer play, such as a slightly faster Bailing Nest or something like that, I always think back to, oh, you know, that really, really old statistic about game two being one of the most common games for a player to cheese in a best of five or best of seven or even a best of three. So don't hate the idea of having a 1-0 lead and Cyril kind of just playing a little bit safer and kind of getting into his groove because he did look solid as the game was going on as well. But it's curious if Ragnarok is going to feel differently. If he's going to feel like he has to be the one to set the pacing of the series. Yeah, but as well, that's just sort of how Ragnarok likes to play. He likes to be the one that kind of initializes. He likes to be the one that says, hey, play my game a little bit. That's where Ragnarok's been always great. And he's definitely stepped up in the more standard games as well. And that's been, you know, a big part, you know, big part of why he got so much better over the last year. Yeah. Because he's been able to be better in the more standard situations. But in a situation like this, you're down a game. Maybe you do want to kind of lean back into that sort of like, hey, you know, let's kind of go back to where I'm most comfortable as well. He is going to go straight into the plus one missiles while Serral's just building the Roach Roar and two more gases, so two very different ways of getting to a Roach style. And once again, Serral says, I like Carapace. So this is very similar to the last game, just we haven't had the Ling Bane aggression do a lot for Serral in the first few moments. Yeah, those Carapace upgrades usually are an indicator that someone wants to get aggressive because as you were saying, the melee or the missile attack upgrades usually are the preferred upgrade for the longer term. The Carapace upgrades are really effective because they don't just help your Roaches, they also help, say, the Lings in helping survive against your opponent's Roaches, even if they have plus one missile attack. So. Curious to see is Cyril is thinking to get aggressive yet again. He's still firing up a handful of drones here and there, but roaches are starting to turn on out. 
Yeah, the Roach Count is building. Like you say, there is a couple more drones in production. I really feel like I mean, they have to be the last couple, right? If he's going to do something with this Carapace timing. So, mm -hmm. on we go. Old Lords will finish, and then we'll see exactly what he builds into. The thing is, Ragnarok is building Roaches of his own. I'm just not sure the Carapace should be able to be enough for Cell to break through here. But he's got no lair, so he is committed. Like, he needs to do something with this, because he's going to be heavily behind in the tech. Roach speed, potential for Spire is going to be there for Ragnarok if he holds on here. Several's going to be behind if damage isn't done. Yeah, and I'm seeing more Overlords getting started up as well. I, th I believe that Cyril's just going to be turning out non-stop roaches or something from here on out. Just because, well, here come a couple of these gas geysers for Cyril, but it's the Spire that I think you're uh, you're taking a look at there, Rorty. Yeah, because obviously for Ragnarok, it feels as though if he just builds units, he should be okay. Get towards roach speed, hold on with roaches. The Spire is resources, which do not do anything for him right now. And Cyril's attack is definitely going to be ready to go much before that Spire is set. So, yeah, just, just a little unfortunate, because obviously, again, it could be used to help him out against this attack as Cyril is... Still waiting though, man. He's, he's not going yet. His carapace is about to finish. Obviously, the longer we wait, the closer that Spire gets to being a part of this game. And Serral is now going to come through. And now Ragnarok sees this for the first time. So now, what do we do? Do we cancel the Spire? He starts up a Spine Crawler. If you can hold until the Spire finishes, the Mutas can then play cleanup. Ooh. But he's got to hold initially, and he decides no. Cancel the Spire, and let's go from there. Again, using this counter attack to try and buy time. But what a save on the Queen. Oh, that's going to be a big save. And those Lings are starting to get dealt with. No drones really going down. And Serral is not being halted with his attack whatsoever. Comes in with these Roaches. Plus one missile attack versus plus one care. But so also game. coming on in. Yeah, Balin's a very supply efficient, so when similar supplies here, it means it's actually better for Serral. He's gonna go drone hunt, and he's already got a big advantage on the road camp, but will it be enough? Because from the top side, Ragnarok's getting his reinforcements here. Spine crawlers off finishing, starting to join the fight. We've only killed five drones, and Serral is not gonna get a few more, but he's also starting to tech up. He's realizing this isn't going to end the game, and is his tech gonna be in time? Maybe, maybe not, but he is gonna get held off here, and he's still down on drones, and Ragnarok takes a lead in game two. Ragnarok with a magnificent hold there, should now be able to take advantage of things. Uh, we do see a drone. That was a canceled spire. Yeah, the spire end of game canceled. So that is going to be a saving grace there for Serral. A pretty big one because otherwise he would just be losing complete map control. It would be a very awkward situation where Serral has lost both his army supply, his worker supply, and also the tech lead there. But uh, now at least Ragnarok is still going to be able to plant down his spire and still be able to hold on to those other leads to try and see what he can make do with them. Yeah, absolutely. I, it was one of those scenarios where it's like, if you don't cancel the spy and you hold, you're in a way better position. Mm -hmm. But if you don't cancel the spy, you might just die. It's right? all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So he, he was all or nothing. He's still ahead. He's just not maybe as ahead as he could have been. That's fine. The important thing is you lived here. And he's actually going to go across the match as we're watching. Well, Ragnarok's first person view. He's going to jump on these roaches. Morphin Ravagers are several still on the way. He is going to oh. come in, though, with the surround. You can see just how blindsided Ragnarok is. And these links are going to help Serral out to turn this around and stay in this. Ragnarok misjudging this attack and is going to get pushed back. Serral will bounce into a supply lead off this. And that is going to be Ragnarok, well, just not finding what he wanted. However, if he continues to scare Serral into roach link production, that Spire might go unanswered. I mean, I felt like that entire move there was just deja vu from game number one. Yeah. Where it was literally. Ragnarok pushing across the map when there were still a ton of lings around and Serral suddenly getting a massive surround, getting a beautiful engagement and suddenly climbing back ahead in supply. I feel like Serral's just going to go because I think he knows like, hey, why is there no Ravages or anything? Why are you coming? Like, where's your gas? And I think he knows there's very likely something like a Spire on the way. He just kept on building units, and I feel like he's almost ready to just wait for Roach Speed and just commit. Is the problem is the Mutas now? are going to be out in time. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's going to be too late. Now, the Mutas being out doesn't necessarily mean Cyril can't do any attack, because Mutas attack, and they won't be killed, but they also are going to be dealing damage to Roaches very, very slowly. Mutas have been revealed, and we're going to see if Cyril feels like he has to just hunker down now, or if he's, he's going to try go. and get aggressive. Yeah, he, he he didn't do anything. He actually saw the Mutalus with an Overseer, and he did nothing different. He didn't mm. even start spores. His whole plan here is to just force these mutas back onto his roaches. The problem with this is that Ragnarok has enough roaches to buy time himself, and that's going to make it very difficult for Serral to do meaningful damage because he wants to get on top of mineral lines. You can see these mutas going Ravager hunting. Serral will come forward, and this is going to be it. He's got a spine crawler or two to go through as well, remember, as he goes for these roaches, but it's more than these roaches. He needs economic damage at the very least. Great micro there from Ragnarok, not allowing those links to fully surround his roaches. He gets all the way pinned back here. Can 
gets the benefit of that spine crawl, although Muto's continuing to work away at the Roach count. Does Cyril have enough? He is starting to be hit even his supply, and even though it does seem like he's breaking through, remember, more reinforcers are going to be coming out here from the north side for Ragnarok. Cyril continuing to find bits and pieces of damage. He needs more reinforcements. Some more links do arrive. Is it enough? Well, the big thing is he's buying time. He's going into Hydra's behind this, so he'll finally have an answer to the Mutalus once they come across the map. So there is a big positive here for Serral at the end of all of this. He might still be down on drones, but he's given himself at least a chance to fight with the Mutas. If he could have wiped out a mineral line there in full, brilliant. The, what he did was probably bare minimum to still be alive in this game. Hydras have been revealed now, and Ragnarok knows he has to be a bit more careful with that Mutalus control. They're not just going to have free reign completely over the map, but still going to be able to find little bits and pieces of damage there as the Hydras are still growing in numbers. And Ragnarok still knows that there's no easy way for Cyril to move out onto the map freely. He knows that Cyril has to respect the Mutas, so going Overlord hunting is one thing, but also just expanding and taking additional bases, playing a little bit greedy behind this until you know Cyril has enough to attack you is going to be a really good play for Ragnarok. Well, I mean, Cyril can't really attack until he has enough. It's exactly yeah. as you say, right? So, yeah, it's the right move. You have the map control. You can play Greedia. Cyril doesn't even have Hydra speed, so moving on the map seemed extremely unlikely. Yeah, Ragnarok has the lead here in game number two. The only thing he doesn't have going for him is he's playing against Serral. And Serral's pretty clutch, man. We've seen him in ridiculous ZVZ scenarios of the past, especially ones like this where he's likely the player that has to hunker down, play a bit slower, just maybe tech up a bit, and just try and slowly grab his way back into this game. Ragnarok is just building a ton of roaches, though. He wants to make a killing move. He says, hey, if you're building so many Hydras, are they really going to withstand a massive Roach Ravager attack? It's going to be a very good question. We'll be finding out very shortly because Ragnarok's more or less max. He doesn't have much else to wait on. I'm not even convinced he'll go for plus one carapace before attacking because he's already got plus two missiles versus one one. I feel like it's good enough for him to just get moving. That's true. It's uh, going to be a good question of whether or not it's going to be beneficial for him to have waited for plus one carapace, but he's going to go regardless. Like you were saying, Wardy, Muta's going to try and actually just buy a little bit of time and also distract Cyril a bit, force him to spend some actions on the other side as the engagement breaks out, but Kroza Biles are going to be landing on a handful of the Hydras. Is this going to be a good enough fight for Ragnarok, though? No, because the Mutas aren't doing anything. They're just sat off to the side being absolutely AFK, and they are going to walk, go pick off an Overseer. Ragnarok, you're losing the main fight, buddy. You need everything you can get. He's in full-on retreat mode, and maybe Serral can't chase him down, but it's a fight that keeps Serral in this, and maybe a chance for Serral to take a look at a fourth base now. Oh, such a rough fight there for Ragnarok. Drops a lot of supply during the fight, and now, that whole timing that we were talking about of Cyril needing to build up to the correct number of Hydras so that he can safely move out onto the map to feel confident about it, he's hit it! He can move across the map, he can get aggressive now. Cyril's all in though, right? Because he's still not looking for a fourth base, he still doesn't believe he can do enough. I think against five meters maybe he could, but he seems to think he just has to keep spamming units and going into this position. He feels like he has to attack in, he's not starting plus two missiles. So Serral is looking to end this game. I'm still not convinced you can do that. It's very different being the defender like he was in the last fight to being the aggressor pushing up these ramps and into Ragnarok. He's going to spread out. It's going to be a massive arc from Serral. He's going to come from two sides, but let's see if Ragnarok can hold on. Serral's coming in from the left and the right, and Ragnarok is holding that high ground. He's dodging corrosive vials left and right. Serral going to be doing the same with a lot of his hydras, but eats some corrosive vials on the left-hand side. He's starting to have his roach lines thinned out, and Ragnarok has too much. GG takes the second game and ties up the series one to one. Yeah, Serral was dancing with those files, but it was just not going to be enough. And like we said, he was all in. He never looked towards the fourth base. I do feel like he had an option after that last fight to put a fourth base down. Yes, there's Mutas, but it's not an overwhelming amount of Mutas. You know, when you talk about Mutas control in a game, we're thinking more than 10. And we never got past that number of 10, and there was a couple dying off. I know it's not great for Serral, and it doesn't feel like a good situation, so he obviously feels like he has to go. But maybe that was an alternative option that he could have actually just slowed things down a little bit here. So, interesting game though. I think uh, Serral was really kind of hard stuck on the idea of, hey, I'm gonna like go with this Roach Link Carapace attack, mm -hmm. and it just never felt like it. Like it felt like it might work because the Spire went down, but then he didn't hit when Carapace finished. It hit a little bit after that. Ragnarok had time to cancel the Spire, build spines. It just didn't feel like that attack had really everything it needed to, to really hit at its strongest point from Serral initially. You could definitely get the sense that for both players, like you were talking about with Serral, not really hitting the exact crisp, precise timing that we know he's all capable, we all know he's capable of, 
but also even Ragnarok kind of doing those counterattacks at kind of odd times, getting surrounded by the Lings, and just kind of finding himself in awkward situations where he was giving Serral opportunities to come back in the game. It's not even necessarily to say that I think that they're doing massive, massive misplays, but it was very clear that both of those players was having a hard time reading the exact state of the game. It's scrappy, it's messy, that's what ZVZ is often all about. It's all tied up and we're heading to a game three here in the quarterfinals of the World Championship at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Grezvan is our next map and this map has truly delivered us like so many great games throughout this tournament. It has been the standout map of the event. It's been the most picked map of the event, I believe as well. Very excited to get this one underway as we head into game three. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be starting up in the top left-hand side of the map, on top of the red Zerg player from Alpha X. He is Ragnarok. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have got the reigning world champion representing his new team, Basilisk. Give it up, make some noise for Zero. I'm with you, Ordi. This map has been fantastic this entire event. I mean, it's been so much fun to see so many long-term macro games, I feel like, break out on this map. A lot of the split map situations. How do you feel about it for ZVZ, though? Not really sure. I feel like it's, it's kind of become one of these maps where a lot of standard stuff works. It's big, but not like rushing across the map big. Like, everywhere feels accessible, especially as you expand toward each other sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I want a 10 pool. Oh boy. Is that going to be a double extractor into a spawning pool? A double extractor spawning pool just for the fun. Or oh, you kill two of your drones, man. I feel like that's the. That's a, that's the a Ragnarok sign! Ragnarok sign! We see you! Let's yes. go. We did that for you, Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they did that, but. They, you know. they did that. We, we wanted it, though. We, we did want it, though. That is very true. Uh, yeah, looks like a pretty normal openings, by the way, from everything on both of these players' sides. But uh, you were kind of talking about Grezvan and CVZ. I, yeah. Yeah. In my mind, when I think of Grezvan, I think of kind of longer term macro games. I feel like it's hard for a map to really guarantee that in CVZ. Yes. It could possibly happen because I think, you know, if you get to that stage, it, the problem isn't with the map, it's with ZVZ. It's mm -hmm. just hard to get both players at a point where one of them feels like they can transition to Lurkers. Because it's not like you're just like, oh, guys, hey, by the way, it's 11 minutes, let's build our Lurker dens now, right? <laughs> Someone has to feel like they can get to Lurkers, and then the other player has to feel like they need to go to Lurkers instead of killing the it's other like guy going to Lurkers. dilemma. <laughs> exactly, right? So it's kind of an awkward situation that's why we see zvz not really developing there a lot of the time a lot of the time if it goes very late it's actually like muters forcing someone to defend like if several had taken a fourth base and played defense last game for example and ragnar kept building muters then you can maybe see a later game split map scenario it's interesting and i feel like ragnar's not gonna really want to let the game go there and there's a lot you can do to then not let the game go there so i do still then you know turn to the other side of grezvan it's not like the longest of maps, right? You can attack across. It does have a lot of space and attack paths, especially to maybe send run buys on. That's something that Ragnarok loves so far too. So basically, Fear Dragon, what I'm trying to summarize is that this map could really see a bit of anything from ZVZ. <laughs> That's going to be a beautiful aspect of ZVZ or a harrowing aspect, especially if you're a Zerg player on the ladder. But I can't believe Serral didn't put his queen on the third base to match the split screen observer view. That's very rude, Serral. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't anyone inform Serral that we were doing that? Can we please... Serral is 258. We're meant to have a queen for the split screen. Hello. <laughs> can, can we get a pause to inform Serral and make sure he's following his production crews? Yeah. Well, we do have uh, our usual stuff, the Banley Nest, the hatcheries are gonna be finishing on up, but I'm really curious how you felt about the idea of Ragnarok going for those mutas. I know that Serral decided to get pedal to the metal aggression and stuff with the carapace upgrade and everything, but I feel like mutas have still been a pretty strong thing to go for in ZVZ, and Ragnarok, I think, does a really good job with them as well. Yeah, he really wanted to get to those mutas. It was definitely something he wanted to explore in that game, not just, you know, initially, and then he canceled the spy, but then he was straight away after he's like, oh, let's still go for the spire again now that I've held on. So, yeah, mutas are fun, but they are volatile, right? If you do hit the timing a little bit more nicely, I do think you can die going mutas, and your, uh, your scouting has to be absolutely spot on because if you don't know you're being attacked and you don't have the preparation ready, if you're not ready to cancel that Spire, 
you can just die. And we saw that in the group mm -hmm. stages with like a laser DR, uh, solo DRG, right? Where solo like, you know, DRG canceled 100% Spire, <laughs> but like a few seconds earlier could have made the difference and stuff. So yeah, yeah muters are very good once you get there and you're safely there. And they're great if you're ahead and you want to keep a lead going into a longer game. It just is a bit of a risk every time, especially when both these players are so good at reading when you are weak and when they can punish you. I think it's really well put. And I do want to make a quick note that Serral, for once, the first time in this best of five series in game number three is going to be going for a missile attack upgrade, not a carapace upgrade. And that is going to be a good sign that Serral is not looking to put pedal to the metal immediately. It's still possible, but it seems less likely than with the carapace upgrade. Yeah, it's the first time we've seen Serral do something different in this series, right? It's been Carapace two out of two games so far. Now here comes the bit of diversity from him. And he's just a bit behind on everything, right? He's down some drones, he's down on missile time, he's down on the lair. So Ragnarok just having a little bit more efficient build to get to this point. And even going to be a little bit of the aggressor right now as these couple of Bailings try and come up. They'll not really find a chance to do too much. I mean, obviously hitting those Bailings to cancel one. Not the biggest of deals. I mean, minor fights, it's just the fact that that supply is really looking good for Ragnarok. And like I say, every way, he's still on his spine, though. I think he's worried about what's coming his way. Yeah, I mean, it is going to be interesting because there are some roaches out there for Serral, and he was kind of doing that move out there. So maybe yeah. the spine crawler would have been helpful. It looks like the spine crawler, I believe, is going to finish up. Yep. Nope. Oh, wow. Very last second cancel there. <laughs> he was just waiting for as long as possible to confirm, hey, you're not Ling roaching me, right? Just double check. Mm -hmm. And immediately now he's like, oh, roach on roach. Hello. Back to my friend, the Spire. So there we he go. clearly knows how he wants to go about this. And Serral going to scout it almost immediately this time. That's a massive catch and it's information he wasn't playing with last game. I also love that the position for this is actually exactly Serral doing exactly what I was hoping he would do. Just send the Overseer to the top left because it's going to be so easy to double check and confirm the Spire did not get canceled. There's no change in plans later on. That Overseer can sit there very, very safely and just check back in every so often. Yeah, absolutely. It's... Uh... Yeah, it's actually a great map for that. It's actually arguably a bad spy position because yeah. of it, right? Because you are basically allowing him to freely scout you repeatedly. So mm -hmm. it's one of those minor little adjustments and minor little kind of perfections. But yeah, that spy maybe could have been somewhere else. Not to necessarily stop it being scouted first, but stopping the rescout on it. Yeah, absolutely. Hydrogen on the way for Serral, so that is going to be his response. He does not want to try playing Muta versus Muta with a belated, or sorry, a, a late Muta list uh, spire himself. And, Evo Chamber going to be actually researching. Uh, looks like Carapace upgrade. Doesn't seem like it's been scouted. Yeah, just going to go double Evo. He's really going to just power up on kind of Roach Hydra. What Ragnarok is doing is he's completely ignoring the fact that he built a spy and he's just spamming Roaches, maybe hoping to catch Serral building too many Hydras. I think the thing is, Serral's not going to build Hydras unless he sees Mutas. Instead, he's just going to keep building Roaches, which is the right call, because by building Hydras, he would put himself in trouble to this attack. Instead, I think he's going to be pretty well prepared. Ragnarok does run up here. A little bit of an army supply lead, but Serral has that defender's advantage. Let's see if it'll be enough for Serral as he tries to hold on. He's got his queens in this fight as well. Any bit of extra damage can go a long way as Ragnarok trying to dive on one side and sway this in his favor. And Ragnarok actually seemed to make a bit of progress. Remember, he's also got some reinforcements that have been streaming across the map, as they are going to be making a big appearance over here. Serral's starting to get overwhelmed. The overwhelming numbers are starting to compound and snowball further and further in Ragnarok's favor. So many of these roaches for Ragnarok are very low on hit points, though, and as more reinforcements pop out here for Cyril, it seems like Ragnarok stopped reinforcing. Yeah, but he's got muters, that's why, because he wasn't building roaches anymore. He's going for the muters, and now Cyril's like, this is when you've built them. He had not built any of his hydras yet. The Sporkrawls were not built, but he had a hydra den. He didn't think he'd need to worry about this. He's now sending his own roaches across the map, but Ragnarok is building his own roaches. It's a beautiful one-two punch from Ragnarok. It is a top-tier move, and it is working beautifully in this game, putting him heavily ahead against several. Does Ragnarok have enough roaches to sway the roaches back? It looks like yes, and now the Muta's getting free pickings, free killings here. I know, this is a really unfortunate situation for Cyril as he knows he is just going to be bleeding out more and ro more roaches as he was already down in army supply. Even the Hydras are getting picked off as they're popping on out. Finally, a Spore Caller finishes to protect them, but what is there left to protect? Right, this game, I think, is over Fear Dragon, right? I mean, these Muta's have so much control, and the follow-up is now Cyril is trying to make Hydras. Ragnarok's already rebuilt Roaches, so he's going to come in and overwhelm him in yet another way. And Ragnarok is just constantly a move ahead of Serral in this game. He was a little bit better on the initial build that gave him the ability to do this. And it's just been, like I say, Serral always trying to play from like a move behind. Yeah, it really does feel like exactly that. That Serral is continuously just kind of 
One step behind his opponent, Ragnarok is already anticipating Cyril's moves and making the extra steps to just anticipate and counter them. Ragnarok has such a stellar lead now, not only in income, not only in army supply, but I mean, he's very soon, if he wins this game, he's gonna have a lead in the series as well. Oh yeah, man, he is more or less a map away right now from being in the semifinals because this one is very good for him. I doesn't matter how well you play from here as Serral, like you just can't deal with the fact that you're well, behind in a bunch of units. Mm -hmm. He does have an upgrade lead, 2-1 against just plus one. So that is something for Serral. He's got the Hydras to dish out some damage, but he doesn't have his own Corrodes of Vials to try and force his opponent to dodge around as much. He has one Ravager, and that's the issue. These Hydras have to kite back. They're losing damaging time, and Ragnarok just has way too much. Here are the Muters just to say goodbye to you, Serral. In game three, Ragnarok is in a 2-1 lead, and he is so close to those semifinals. He can feel it. He can taste it the further he will have ever made it at IEM Katowice. He's already made it further than I think anyone would have expected, including maybe even himself. But now he is on the verge of not even just making it to the, you know, the semifinals. He would potentially be making it to the semifinals over the previous champion. Yeah, I mean, taking down Serral is no easy feat, especially in the best of five, where Serral has a lot of room to adapt. He still has to win one more game, and that won't be easy. But the way he played there, because he just got that little bit ahead early, he used that to his advantage, and then, like I say, Serral had the scout on the Spire. It was Ragnarok's trickery, not using the Spire, then choosing when to use the Spire when Serral was a little bit on the run. It was, again, just that knock-on effect of one thing to the other that allowed him to just take full advantage there. It was very cool. Very, very tough spot now. Serral needs to bust out his A game. He needs to bust out his S game at this point because it is down to the wire. It is going to be moving on to map number four. He was talking about how he felt more comfortable, like you were saying, playing in a best of five. Well, if this was a best of three, it would have been over now. Ragnarok would have won. But because it's a best of five, Serral has a little bit more leeway. This is the time to prove it. This is the time to prove that the best of five is gonna be different for him and a different experience for him than the best of three. You know what it is as well? I feel like this is why I've got to just say, though, Serral is a clutch player. He's been down before. He will hold on. He will drag it all the way if he has to. You know, he knows it's five maps, right? He says, you have to beat me in three of them. It's not guaranteed just yet. As we get ourselves ready for map number four, no breaks needed as these two are ready to keep on ZVZ in it up. Ragnarok leads over Serral in the quarterfinals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice this year. Ancient Cistern gonna be loading on up here. This is gonna be do or die again for Jonas Satala. Can he pull it out or is he gonna be in some trouble? We are heading in. We're gonna be starting down here in the bottom left-hand side of the map on top of the red Zerg player ready to slay a god. He is your reckoning. He is Alpha X's Ragnarok. He is 12 to him, by the way. <laughs> All right, in the top right-hand side, it's time to make some noise because it might be your last chance if this 12 pool works against him from Basilisk in the upper right. It's Serral! No drum call, surely, right? No, no. Real? That would be so scary. I haven't actually seen that for a bit now. No. It, it just, it's so microbial against, and I just feel like Serral would be somewhat ready for it, even if it's not been popular lately. He goes 16 hatchery here. We got an extra drone and we'll start to work his way towards everything else in this game number four. The pool is gonna finish. The lings will be able to start. Ragnarok, are we sending the drone down to that low ground for a hatchery in the next few moments? This is where we're about to find out, Fear Dragon. It's not moving, man. The it's drones not. are coming. 270, 280, 300 minerals. Still the no drones drone are heading coming. There. Okay, here's the first three drones. They're gonna be the spine crawls. The rest of the drones are gonna get ready to back them up. And here we are, the drones are on the way and Ragnarok wants to cheese his way into the semis. Now you have to really pay attention. Where are the overlords? These are newer maps that these players have had time to adjust to get uh, used to where the overlord scouting patterns are. This overlord is not gonna get a single whiff of these drones moving across the map for a bit. Finally, this next uh, Overlord is going to be able to catch wind of this, and Serral and Ragnarok both see each other. 
Yeah, this is important for Serral. Gives him a little bit of mental heads up. And he's going to go for the wall off. This is big. He can't get the spine crawls in a position where they're walled against the bottom side ledge. And they can't also be able to hit the low ground and the high ground at the same time. These spines up here are way easier to deny in this upcoming micro wall. So Serral, it's an investment of money. But he's going to see that as a worthwhile one. As now he goes to buy in time. And again, he'll get ready to fight those spines soon. He's going to come forward with the drops. He catches the lings. A little bit of a surround. Now his own lings are coming. And Serral is going to go on the offense with his defense. He started firing down the northmost spine crawler while the drones and the lings chase after Serral. First spine crawler has been canceled. Second spine crawler being worked on. It gets canceled as well. The third spine crawler is going to be the last remaining hope here as the queen pops on out. Serral is overwhelming Ragnarok and the spine crawler is going to go down. GG Serral takes us to an ace match. You can't do this against Serral. You know, he's too good at micro. He figured it out. He saw it. He has a response we've not seen this for so long and his response was pitch perfect because if those spines go up across that bottom ledge of the creep the wall of the kind of high ground to low ground protects them you can't surround them as easily you can't guarantee the kills that's where it gets really weird and Serral, it's also that kind of time you buy because by going all the way north to build the spines four five extra seconds of just you know before the spines are built it gives you extra time and that's everything you need in this scenario yeah, Serral just set it up perfectly. And was this pool actually on the bottom side as well? I didn't see, but like, it was part of the wall, no? Uh, that part I actually yeah. missed. I, I don't actually know about it's that. It's even but... crazier, because that would have been a preemptive play as well. That, that would be pretty incredible. And it really just goes to show you how well thought out everything is here. How Serral is ready, how experienced he is with not only just past builds and everything, but in clutch situations, being in this spot, he knows how to get the Ws. He knows how to get the wins when it really matters, when it really counts, and he prevents himself from elimination, elimination in these kind of events time and time again. It was just such a solid defense, man. It was absolutely pitch perfect. You couldn't have done it any better. He made Ragnar, you know, he made, it's one of these kind of times where people who haven't seen this before, like, is Ragnar just trolling? Like, <laughs> why, why does he think this can work? But it can work. We've seen it yeah. work plenty of times. It was just the perfect defense from Serral. He is not going to be unrattled here in this series. And now we get to go to a final game, a game five to decide it all on altitude. Big map to wrap things up in this quarterfinal in the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Once again, one final time, this best of five. We're going to be starting down here in the bottom left-hand side of the map, on top of the red Zerg player from Alpha X. Give him your energy. He is Ragnarok. In the top right, he is the 12th pool denier. He is your reigning world champion. He is from Basilisk, and he wants to take this all the way once again. It is Serral. He wants to lift that up one more time later today. That trophy. He yeah. wants it, man. You know he does. Begrudgingly had to give it back up at the beginning of the day to say, all right, it's going to be a new champion. But maybe it's just going to be the new champion is the same as the old champion. That's what Serral is hoping for. That's what he's been working for. That's what he's been fighting for. But Ragnarok, man, if he... I think at this point, you're not thinking about the championship. You're thinking about just beating the player in front of you. That's where all of your focus is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. you just got to go one match at a time, of course. I mean, you talk about after this. The winner of this plays Maru in the semifinals. <laughs> Whoever wins here is not going to have an easy time. I mean, Maru looked like he was absolutely, as James said, he was awake today. And I don't think he's going to fall asleep between now and his semifinal. No, I, I definitely don't think so. You know, it's fun. It's fun and reasonable for Ragnarok to not be thinking too far ahead. But imagine if Ragnarok could pull something like that off. If he's able to beat Serral here, goes on, finds the magic against a player like Maru, that would truly be the god run right there. Yeah. I mean, that you can't deny. If Ragnarok goes all the way and wins this, he's like, you, know, you can't be like, oh, you had an easy bracket because his first match is Serral, then yeah. Maru. Absolutely ridiculous section of the bracket in all honesty is. This early game, we're back to just kind of being pretty nonchalant about the first two minutes. It's hatch gas pool. No one's really taking the edge over the other. The Queens and Lings start now. And in the next 30 seconds, we start to see if there will be any diversity on a bailing nest or anything. So just going to see that. Obviously, Link speed first. Bailing nest perhaps after. As I do, there is the Link speed on both sides. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, another thing to keep an eye out for is we've kind of had a weird best of five so far. Serral did go for the Carapace upgrade attacks in two of the four games we've seen so far. 
But one of those games, we didn't really get to see what Cyril wanted to do because, you know, there was a, a spine crawler rush <laughs> instead. Kind of hits a little bit faster than you're going for the plus one carapace upgrade. So I am curious. Altitude is not the most normal of maps. When you're talking about ladder practice and everything, this is a map that a lot of people have vetoed and everything. This is a map that you don't necessarily get to play as many practice games on unless you're really actively trying to get some practice on it. Ragnarok just going to hit that little edge of a couple of drones once again. Cyril just a couple of extra links here. So little things. And it was little things that I really felt like kicked game number three into motion in Ragnarok's favor. So they are the kind of things we might be able to bring back up later. But Cyril re-equalizing the drone count. And again, these are minor adjustments early. I mean, do you see Ragnarok actually going to go for a few more links? Looks like he might be the aggressor, but there's Cyril making some links. Mm -hmm. So it's just back and forth, a cat and mouse game of who's going to make more. Yeah, I think this is kind of the Ling versus Ling aggression that we're pretty used to at this point. Does seem like Cyril has a few more Lings in production, actually, as he starts up a couple more. And this is going to get a little bit more aggressive on Cyril's side, but you can see he still makes some drums behind it. It is just going to be about trying to say, I have a handful more. Let's see if that's enough to break you and actually get additional damage done so I can get ahead in the macro game. Cool scout from Ragnarok gets into the main. Maybe he doesn't see behind, but I don't think he needs to see much more. He's aware that Cyril just playing a bit of Ling Bane. Here we go as we get into this attack. Cyril on the offensive, and he's going to get good bailing connections there. Is now we're going to see the Queen going down as well. The Balings do finish on the left side. Ragnarok didn't detonate, so Cyril gets to micro against them. He's making the absolute most of this. Loses his bailing, but now he's going to be able to get another Queen. And again, injects might be an issue here for Ragnarok. This is very, very uh, reminiscent of game number one. It really is, but that Queen does manage to survive thanks to the reinforcing Ling's popping out there for Ragnarok. Ragnarok also canceled. Handful of these Banelings. Another Baneling gets canceled. Another Baneling gets canceled there. Ragnarok managing to make a pretty solid hold over here against the light aggression from Cyril. Yeah, that was <laughs> a little bit confused with the first person beyond who were in Cyril's Ooh. picture, but uh, hard to keep track of a little bit at times as the Roach Roar now going down to Cyril. Just insta Roach Roar and Carapace going to be Ragnarok's play this time. Big map, so if you want to play Ling Roach, there's just so much preparation time for the opponent defensively. Yeah, this is going to be pretty interesting. And uh, cheeky, cheeky, Cyril sending some Banelings around and morphing them in. Not going to get scouted either, despite Ragnarok actually trying to scout for this. But this is going to be funny. The Evo Chamber is going to be a good bit later here for Cyril as well. So even if he was going to go for his own Carapace upgrade, or if he goes for a Missile Attack upgrade, it is going to be finishing up a lot later than the Carapace upgrade there for Ragnarok. That's going to give Ragnarok a nice window where Cyril should have zero upgrades. Here come the Banes. It's going to go two for two. I think both are happy with this. They just want to keep nullifying the potential of offense here. And Cyril has a couple of his own Banes coming from the other side. They're not going to get any rare Ragnarok. Saw them coming from a mile away. Really nothing achieved with this Whoa. one. Two more Banes do come forward. He gets three drones. That is something. Cyril's up 10 workers because Ragnarok has been focused on Roaches and he's preparing for this Ling Roach attack. Cyril will just be purely on Roach production. He needs to stop building drones. He may even need to get a spine crawler started as we get defensive here on altitude. I, I think that Cyril may have identified. No. Oh, okay, oh, he's starting up Cyril. a little. I was about to say he he has the evil chamber, but he hasn't actually started anything with it. So I thought maybe he had identified that there was going to be something coming. But starting up the lair, starting up more drones. This is going to be such a dangerous spot. These lings finally scout out and see what he's going to be up against. And Cyril needs non-stop unit production. He's just coming out of a supply bug. He starts up another drone. Cyril just keeps what? on building work. I mean, Ragnarok starts a lair. He's not coming across the map with any roaches. Is Ragnarok feeling as though he's almost figured out and just not going to go? Like, his own lair's on the way. He's still building roaches, though. I don't know if you're right. I feel like Ragnarok should be hitting right now, and if he was, I'd be terrified for Cyril, but he's just not there across the map. I'm 100% with you. He's up. 30 army supply right now and a carapace upgrade. Still building roaches. Did he just cancel? He must have just canceled his lair because it started later. So mm. now he's just going to double down for it. I feel like he's almost just maybe trying to make Cyril misread it, but Cyril already had a misread. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is just getting a little bit crazy as Cyril continues to scout out with these Zerglings. He's still behind on army supply, but it's getting to that point where he's going to have a big eco advantage so he can start to swarm out units if he just doesn't get overwhelmed on the first attack. Here is Ragnarok, Ling's Roaches still yet to begin moving on this large map. Looks like this now might be the time. Cyril has Balin's ready to counter, still Ling's scouting as he works his way around the center here, and he's on his way to, again, missiles, road speed, all of these probably not going to come into play, but he just needs units, but that army supply gap is closing in. Here are the Balings forcing Ragnarok to look the other way. Three more drones, and Cyril just needs to hold with a 10 army supply deficit. Yeah, also knocks out some larvae over there, though, but we see the roaches moving on forward, maybe being able to cancel a couple of these Balings that are still morphing over here for Cyril. Cyril fishes a massive swarm of these Balings. They are not able to find good, good connections on the roaches, but they do manage to find some connections 
protection by his opponent's Baneling. Ragnarok comes swarming on forward. The Ling surrounding the Queens, and Ragnarok doesn't seem like he's going to be able to overwhelm. It's not enough, man. I mean, we've got more roaches on the way from Cell. He just needs to get the reinforcements out. Cell's shaking his head, though. I mean, Ragnarok doesn't really have too much love here. Is Cell really going to go out? He says, yes, he is. He's up in supply, Cell. Don't leave too soon. No, he's going to go out. He says, GG, Ragnarok is going to take it. I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of Cell supply was ahead in workers, but he had a fair amount of roaches. And it really felt like Cell was on his last kind of few roaches that just maybe survived. I don't know, Ravi. That was kind of crazy, no? The entire was, game. I didn't think wild. Ragnarok had the timing. Wow, well, I, I won't lie. I was confused as heck there. A very, very close game there. And Ragnarok defeats Cell, defeats the former I am Katowice champion. An absolutely stunning result, making his furthest run in the tournament so far. Phenomenal. This man should feel so proud of himself right now. Absolutely crazy, man. I mean, just it, the nerve to like not go and not go when it's definitely past the normal timing, but you're kind of trying to play the trickery and trying to catch your opponent off guard. Just kept it there for long enough. Let's see what that ZVZ craziness was thought of on the desk with James and the rest. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Yes, Ragnarok brings the end of Asgard. A Norse god is gone here as he moves on into that semi-final. We've got Tasteless and Artosis to talk about this one. 3-2 in the end. Maybe a, little, a few question marks here and there for me towards the end as well. I guess a lot of supply was tied up with units being created in the, ha in the, in the eggs themselves. But Serral taps out here and Ragnarok advances. You know, um, it, it's a surprising Ooh. result. It is a, completely changing the whole direction of this World Finals. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was quite the game, like, uh, or quite the series. You know, I think that there was a lot of smart moves on both sides, like Serral with those plus one carapace builds in the first couple games, you know, kind of setting the tone so that he can do what he wants in later games. But uh, it feels like Ragnarok just played very solidly. Uh, you know, I honestly, I really even liked his crazy 12 pool spine rush. Like that was a good time yep, to yeah, use something yeah. like that. It didn't work, but like Ragnarok's here to play, man. Like he is, he's bringing out really intelligent planning for series. Yeah. Aside from game number one, where I feel like Ragnarok got absolutely kind of blindsided by that wraparound. I mm -hmm. mean, he already was behind anyway, right? But there was things about Ragnarok that he was doing in this series, Tasteless, where he's like messing around with the timings of what he's doing. The, the Spire being added on, eventually going into Mutalist later on in the series and stuff like that, weird timings. I think it threw a, a, a little spanner in the works there against Cyril. Yeah, he does seem to know how to bob and weave um, yeah, yeah. With, with the tech, you know. A um, couple years ago, it seemed like a lot of ZVZ really came down to, uh, you know, really getting uh, total control of the map and, and, and harass it in different locations. But I think Ragnarok showing that, you know, he really knows how to mix things up and throw uh, off his opponent. And remember, I mean, in that interview that Cyril had, he said, you know, it, it's a tough matchup because you, you can get thrown off by tricky plays. And he was struggling with that. And uh, clearly that is uh, what his downfall is in this event. And uh, eventually he was able to kind of crash through what we saw here and uh, those mutalisks as they come along. This is a, kind of the exact thing I was on about Atosis, right? Just mm -hmm. kind of delaying the mutalisks for just a little bit, uh, committing to those roaches, and the second wave was an absolute killer there for Serral in the end to fall behind. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of funny how that like game three was played where it was like mutalisks, but then he went back into roaches and just produced those knowing his opponent has to go hydras. We were talking, you know, out back that we thought like it's better to stay on mutas, but mm -hmm. Ragnarok definitely brought his own little style into here, right? Yeah. Like he, he definitely made it confusing oh. and yeah, this the I triple. The evil this was yeah, so sick, was awesome. dude. Yeah. Just to make him arc around like that. Yeah. Um, that buys so much time. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, that was a, it was one of those moments that you will never forget that specific play right mm -hmm. there. That was such a cool thing to see. Um, you know, this was a, a very varied uh, ZVZ. I mean, we saw both players really trying to outmaneuver each other in all the different forks in the road that you can have at a ZVZ. Yeah, definitely so. I mean, they were asking whether or not the spawning pool was intentional during the cast as well, or they're remembering where it was positioned. It's clearly, yes, on a map like that, you have to be aware that that is a strategy that can come out. And here we are, the final moments of this game. Okay, watch this closely. Hopefully it kind of plays towards the end here, because Serral, yes, okay, he's trying to fight against this. Eventually, Ragnarok does have a lot of roaches here at Artosis, mm -hmm. but 
I don't think it's all as clean cut here. <laughs> I, I would. I mean, it's the World Championships. I wouldn't GG out. Yeah, I mean, there's still roaches being made and everything. But I mean, if Serral's leaving, he knows he's dead. He wants to win this tournament guess, so, so yeah. badly. It's so close at the end. But the GG well played. Good luck came out. And that's it. This is kind of, it's a funny place that we're at right now in StarCraft 2 where the absolute top players in the world are no longer really afraid of the other races. They're afraid of the mirror because of the different mind games that exist. Yeah. We've seen it with Serral. That's been his weakness in this tournament. We've seen it with Maru. That's been his weakness in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Definitely so. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Time to head on over to the stage. Ragnarok makes it to the round of four and gets his rematch against Maru. That is exciting. Exciting indeed, and with the man himself, Ragnarok, congratulations. Phenomenal, phenomenal performance. Taking down the current reigning champion, Serral, to move forward to the round of four. You have been to Katowice, this is your fifth time, but this is your first time making it to the semifinals. How much more satisfying is it to do so, taking down the reigning world champion? <laughs> 어 이제 카토비치에 벌써 다섯 번이나 어, 왔었는데 어, 올해 처음으로 4강 진출도 너무 좋은데 그것도 작년에 우승자를 꺾고 올라간 소감 한마디만 해주세요. 어, 사실 제가 저그 전에 약해서 어, 그리고 세라 선수가 너무 잘해가지고 질줄 알았는데 마음 편하게 했고 그리고 뭔가 오늘 해보니까 이길 수 있을 거라는 생각이 들더라고요. 그래서 어 뭔가 제가 원래 좋아하는 전략이 아닌 약간 좀 꼬아서 상대방을 좀 흔드는 그런 플레이를 많이 했는데 그게 좀 먹혀서 이긴 것 같아요. Uh, so he says, when it comes to my ZVZ, uh, I, I actually feel like it's, it's not a matchup I'm very good at. And also I know Serral is such an amazing player. So I actually thought that I would lose. Uh, and I was kind of accepting that. That being said, Throughout all of the games, I just played with a very comfortable mindset. Um, and I think my preparation actually worked out perfectly because instead of the strategies I think I would have normally done, I tried to prepare specific tricky builds that would throw my opponent off guard. And I think that actually translated really, really well. And that's why I was able to take the win at the very, very end. And Ragnarok, you talk about tricky builds, we certainly saw a lot of those. I wanted to specifically ask about map four, the, the spine crawler rush. It sounds like you had prepared that in advance, but I just want to confirm: was that a decision you made in the moment, or did you plan that beforehand? 이제 사 세트 그 치즈를 그럼 원래 계획대로 한 건가요? 아니면 그 순간적으로 선택한 건가요? 어, 제, 제가 이제 어 이번 라운드에 이제 아니 그러니까 24강에서 령우 형이랑 했을 때. 영우 형이 저한테 썼던 빌드. 근데 저는 운 좋게 막았다고 생각을 하고 뭔가 세라이 선수한테는 뭔가 통하지 않을까라는 생각을 했는데 근데 의식을 완전 하고 있더라고요. 그래서 오히려 제가 좀 꼬아서 했으면 좋았을 텐데 너무 똑같이 한게 팬인 것 같아요. Uh, so he says actually in the round of 24, this is actually a strategy that Dark used against me, and I think I, I was able to block it, but I felt like I was very lucky in, in, in blocking it. Uh, so I decided to use it against Serral, but I, I feel like maybe I, I, I did it one-to-one -to, -one to what Dark did a little too much, because I, it felt like as I, as I came to do the rush, uh, he seemed totally prepared, like he was expecting it. Uh, so yeah, it was unfortunate that it wasn't able to work out, and now the last map uh, I want to ask because you you seemed calm but it was definitely a bold decision uh, to go for the the carapace roach play and it, it worked very very well did you have any concerns at all or were you confident that you would be able to take the win yeah. 초반에 세라 선수의 저글링 러시를 쉽게 막아서 원래 그렇게 막고 제가 이제 러시 가는 척 하면은 이제 상대방이 일벌레를 많이 못 찍는 상황이 많이 나오는데 그래서 방어 러시라면 웬만하면 뚫리는 상황이 많이 나오거든요. 근데 확실히 세라 선수가 기본기가 너무 좋아서 저글링으로 계속 서치를 하니까 제가 언제 나가야 될지 모르겠는 거예요. 그래서 
오히려 좀 꼬아서 늦게 나갔더니 이게 더 좋았던 것 같아요. Uh, so he says, uh, with, with the fifth map, uh, I think it, it started out really well because I was able to block Serral's early, early aggressive lings. Uh, and then I knew the way that this would play out is that once I countered, he would be in a situation where he wouldn't have a lot of larva. Uh, and, and so I, usually this is a situation where it should work out really, really well for me. But Serral is, of course, a player with such strong fundamentals. He's just an amazing player. And I think as the game played on, I ended up delaying uh, pushing out. Uh, but in the end, it still worked out very, very well for me. So I'm very, very happy about that. And my last but not least question for you. In the round of four, you are playing Maru. Uh, and I know you have a painful memory of the GSL Grand Finals last year. I know back then the score was 4-0. Can we see a different scoreline today? Yeah. <laughs> 뭐 세라 이렇게 있었는데 전부 다 이제 복수를 한 어, 하는 시즌이더라고요 이번이 그래서 왠지 또 성주랑 하면은 복수할 수 있을 것 같고요 그리고 만약에 복수를 못 하더라도 어, 사실 세라 마루전을 기대한 분들이 워낙 많을 거 아니에요 그래서 그거에 좀 못지 않게 열심히 해서 어, 좋은 경기 했으면 좋겠습니다. So he says, when I look at the players that I had to defeat at this event to get where I am today, it's a lot of players that actually knocked me out <laughs> in the past uh, with, with very, and they're all phenomenal players. It's, it's players like Need, Dark, Cure, now, and now Serral. It's all players that I've lost to before. But I was able to successfully get revenge. So now I'm thinking maybe this is a trend that I keep going and maybe I can use this opportunity in the round of four to get revenge on Maru as well. But even if I'm not able to get revenge on Maru, I know that there are so many fans that were looking forward to seeing Maru play Serral. And I, I want to repay the expectation that they had of seeing that great game. So I'll make sure, at the very least, to show some amazing games. But for now, congratulations once again to Ragnarok for making the round of four here at the, here at the Intel Stream Masters Katowice.
passion <laughs> share your passion wherever whenever yes. gaming is a lifestyle get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. <clears throat> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. And a big shout out and thank you to two of our sponsors here, as we have Intel, of course, always joining us here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. And you know what, Monster? I'm really enjoying having a few monsters here and there at the moment. So thank you very much for joining us here, too, for the Intel Extreme Masters. Right, no smart intros for me from this one. We will be crowning ourselves a new world champion, but we have to talk about this, Roddy, because this was uh, shocking, to say the least. Yes, shocking in many ways. The result is shocking, obviously, that's one thing, but the way that that final game played out, and of course, like it's hard to follow all the actions because we only watch it from the observer point of view. There's a little bit of first person as well, which makes it extra confusing, but all five of us in the green were like, no, no, like we, th we thought it was there. <laughs> yeah. and as long as there is any sort of discussion, like it doesn't really matter, right? If so, people are obviously talking about right now, did Cero leave too early? This is game five of the World Championships, the biggest tournament of the year. His title defense is on the line. Mm -hmm. If there is a 1% chance, you want to battle for that 1%. But I think it's quite obvious that Yona thought it was a whole lot worse yes, than yes. what it actually was. Doesn't mean that he won a le uh, that he left a one game. No, no, no. Nobody's saying that no. Cero was winning the game. But what everybody would have loved to see is Cero use that 30 drone advantage that he has. Let the drones fight. Let them soak up some damage. Yeah, it's yeah. altitude. It's a big map. There is no lair. It will never be fast roaches coming to the It'll other side of the map. Time. Like Ragnarok was as committed as he possibly could have been. And it was close. And as long as there's room for discussion, obviously we're going to discuss about it too. Oh, yeah, because yeah. yeah. I would have loved to see another at least 45 seconds of that game to see how that would have played out. So I should never be speechless, James, and I guess <laughs> I'm not because I have a lot to say about it, but heartbreak for sure. Anything to add, Pig? Just, uh, yeah, the one thing you look for in those scenarios where the real spiral happens is the army supply. The army supply, there was only a four army supply advantage. So definitely, if you buy time for some of those roaches to pop out, you've always got the chance to fight back into it. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen, for your opinions. Of course, the internet's ablaze with the discussion, but I have yeah. to side with you, Roddy, in terms of you try and fight for it. But if there is a 1% chance, you fight yes. for it. And I think it was bigger than 1%. Let's just put it like <laughs> yeah, that. I'm definitely. not saying that Sarah was yeah. winning. He's totally yeah. fine, and he, w he left the one game, but there was more than a 1% chance there. Yeah. All right, let's talk about our next game coming up here. Our third round of eight match, Reyna going up against Oliveira, AKA Time. Mm -hmm. Pig, your thoughts coming into this matchup? Because both players have looked pretty fantastic here throughout the tournament so far. Everybody's been sleeping on Oliveira from the start uh, of the tournament. I think after that previous round dominating Hero Marine, people are starting to wake up a little bit and say, hey, okay, maybe we should be paying a little bit more attention. Uh, he's been fantastic. And especially his TVT, I mean, he made an incredible comeback mm -hmm. versus Clem. He looked great in his TVP, but playing Terran versus Zerg is difficult, and playing Terran versus Reyna is even yeah. more difficult. Very much so. <laughs> I mean, 5-0 and zero at the moment, it, or was he was in his groups here, mm -hmm. was Reyna currently the only undefeated player here at the tournament. Yep, obviously the finalist of last year, the champion of two years ago, the BlizzCon champion, or, or a BlizzCon finalist of three years ago. Reyna did not win BlizzCon. No. Reyna looks in shape, man, and I think about this series, it's like, time his TVT has been absolutely fantastic. Is that the only thing Time can do? Oliveira? Obviously, no. Like, Time is damn good in all three matchups. But what makes him a strong TVZ player is normally the speed, yep. the yep. dropping, the multitasking. But his opponent 
pretty damn good in uh, defending yes. multi-prong harass and being all over the place. Even all the other pro gamers rated Raynor the fastest player in the tournament. So stylistically, it's a bit of a nightmare matchup for Oliveira because it's not that Oliveira is not on the level of Raynor. It's just that what makes Oliveira great makes Raynor even better. Mm, yeah, he's <laughs> he's a speed demon yeah. when it comes to this matchup as well. Gentlemen, I guess I'll get final thoughts, uh, maybe even predictions. Uh, we'll start with you, Pig. Yeah, I think Oliveira is very capable of taking a map. Uh, so I, I do think it's probably going to be a 3-1 to Rainer. However, if Oliveira can dig deep into his pockets, pull out some mech, really mm. pull out some variability, maybe one of those Gumiho 2-port BC builds, there is the chance for the upset. But I'm definitely favoring Rainer 3-1. Ronnie? Favoring Rainer as well. I think 3-1 is an excellent prediction. But there is definitely hope for Oliveira and all the Terran fans out there. If he wins the first game in kind of a unique way, whether it's Battle Mac or something else, crazy aggressive, an Adrax of three base, you know, pull out a big game special, then there is a chance that this is going to be a very explosive and interesting series. But I think winning the first game is kind of key for Oliveira. All right. Thanks, boys. We've already eliminated one world champion. Will we be elim eliminating another one? We'll find out. Let's head over to the stage. Thank you very, very much, Kolaris. Upon making it to the playoffs here at Katowice for the very first time in his career, our Terran players shared with us that it felt like a dream come true. Can he keep the dream alive as he faces a Zerg Titan, the 2021 world champion? Please welcome on stage, Oliveira and Rainer. <laughs> Stim was actually a little bit slow there. Uh, he does finally end up getting it, and I don't think he's going to like it. No. Yeah. Here we go. And Oliveira looking for his ticket into the quarterfinals. SCVs are pulled again from Hira Marie, but GG, and Oliveira is a quarterfinalist. Another match where a world champion is going up against an upstart, a player who is already making one of their deepest runs in Katowice yet. This is going to be a stellar ZVT and definitely one to keep an eye out for. I'm Fear Dragon joined by Zombie Dub here. And we are getting ready to move into our second quarterfinal match. That's right. It could be reminiscent of what we just saw. A world champion falling to a player who makes it to the farthest so far and is looking to make it even farther than that. Or we could have Rainer now eyeing that championship trophy in a way that he could not previously when he still had to worry about Cyril. Yeah, I do think there are different circumstances as we move into this one. Cyril, we were looking at the group stages and how he had faltered a lot in this matchup. How he was struggling, it seemed like, against a lot of those Korean Zergs. Rainer has looked strong this event. He has basically only really dropped the two maps in those group stages. He was doing really, really well. And in the meanwhile, Oliveira is the one who I think has actually been struggling a little bit more in this particular matchup during the group stage. Yes, uh, that's the best way to put it, right? Rainer is actually the best performing player of Katowice. We can just say that, actually. You may um, it, yeah, it's the, you can't argue that there's like numbers that are like factual there. <laughs> but anyways, the um, <clears throat> that, that makes him the best player coming into this. Oliveira had a little bit more trouble, as you were pointing out in his groups and does that mean that Rainer is default going to get the championship trophy because he did the best in groups no but it does mean that he's absolutely on fire and we know that Rainer uh, when he's on fire can do very well even when he's a little cool honestly he somehow digs deep and brings it back so you're really up against everything that makes a world champion a world champion the tenacity the speed the build order choices the knowledge of the the, the game uh, even the confident attitude right and the especially the ability uh, to come back has been shown greatly from Rainer, even earning a bit of a nickname as the comeback kid. So it's like time, even if he does have something, sorry, Oliveira, even if he does have something early on planned, a little bit tricky, a little bit of an edge early on, I'm not really sure he can keep it, man. I think it's going to be a really, really tough match for him. There is a reason for all the things that you just cited that Rainer has made it to the last two grand finals of IEM Katowice and actually yep. ended up winning one of those between 2022 and 2021, being crowned the champion in 2021. But I think the one thing that Rainer will absolutely love from this event is that the 2021 year, yep. it was a weird year for everyone. And that was the year that 
and I am Kadavice was online. Mm -hmm. I think having the offline finals victory, being able to do it in front of the crowd, I think it would mean a lot to him. That's actually, I think, exactly what is on his mind. In fact, uh, doing a, a little bit of research beforehand, he did tell another commentator that's here, uh, he, his uh, eyes are on the trophy. Anything less is a failure, is a direct quote from Rainer. He is <laughs> eyeing it, he knows he can grab it, um, and it now looks like an even uh, better chance with the bracket shaping with the way that it does. Uh, but don't underestimate Oliver. We can talk a lot about Rainer and why we expect him to do well. It even feels like occasionally we've glossed over him because he has just been doing well a little bit in the background. It's like, oh, it's expected, whatever. Oliveira, he is the underdog, absolutely freaking lootly, and he needs to prove right here, right now, that he can actually continue on, he can continue his run, bettering his Katowice a placement and continuing to surprise us all. Yep, we're going to be seeing whether or not Oliveira can punch up or will he get knocked out as we are going to be getting ready. It looks like the first map has been picked and it is Altitude, actually. Hmm, all right. Well, Altitude's uh, been a bit of a controversial map. Apparently not really well liked even when it was being kind of chosen uh, during the map pool. And because it is so large, you have a lot of the, uh, well, the nons are especially saying we don't really want to play on it. Uh, for TVZ, I mean, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Maybe time can get some of that map control early on, but then actually keep that map control just works out differently in a matchup of this compared to versus Protoss, who also, you know, has to send a unit out to that Zelnaga, right? Uh, Zergs, of course, they won the Zelnaga, but they also have creep, right? And Rainer is placing fast with that creep. So I don't know, actually. Time, maybe he doesn't mind this map so much, but we are definitely looking at him now, not just as their stature goes up against each other, right? but also picking the first map altitude. It's even making me believe he's more of an underdog, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also gonna just, uh, you know, head off some of the people who are concerned that we keep calling him time. He literally signs his name as yeah. time still. <laughs> so I think he's okay with either thing. We'll try and stick with one, but do forgive us if we uh, change it up every so often. Let's get started though, guys. We're starting this best of five, our second quarterfinals match. We're gonna be moving into the bottom left-hand side of the map, Altitude, on top of Kaizy Gaming's very own Red Zerg player, it's Rainer. In the top right, to teammates also on Kai Z Gaming, the best performing Chinese player in a long time. He is the Blue Terran Oliveira. Yeah, I believe it was a discussion in the green room yesterday. We were kind of turning to each other and saying, has a Chinese player ever made it this far in IEM Katowice before? And we couldn't think of any real players that have actually made it this far. He's really been a trendsetter for what is possible from that kind of Chinese StarCraft scene, and it's been great to see. It's been fantastic, as we do have a command center first coming down. Uh, we're definitely heading into the macro game. Um, so we'll definitely dive into that when we see some a little bit more. <laughs> Rainer, his rap album. Yeah, well, when are we going to get that, man? Um, yeah, it's going to be difficult for Oliveira, but I think he is already coming in with a plan with that command center first. I mean, obviously trying to think that I'm going to be able to get away with this as well, which he's absolutely correct. Rainer, a little, little wary of perhaps like a two racks or even an SCV actually hiding there. Mm -hmm. It'd be very obnoxious if they actually get a bunker down. Uh, okay, he's going to double check. He's really going to check for two racks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The Zolnuggle Watchtower just gives you so much vision. Why not? It's a, a short little trip over and... Seems like Rainer really just, I think whenever I see a player that is scouting this adamantly, I guess a player that isn't necessarily known for being the, I cheese my opponents every single best of five or every single best of three in game one kind of player. Whenever I see that, I usually just think, okay, the player that's scouting around feels really confident that they can just give up a little bit of economic mining time. They can yeah. play a lot safer because they are really confident that if it goes late, they will still garner advantages. Yeah, and I think that Rainer is is probably correct in that assessment that he can take a, the tiniest of hits early on and be better for it. Uh, and even if the opponent is doing something insanely greedy, like a 3cc before a factory, uh, that he might still be able to actually win the macro game. Uh, Oliver is not being that greedy, guys. He is going up to a factory after the command center is done. Uh, what are they nibbling on already? I hear the nibble. I think it was the uh, rocks, yeah. Oh, OK. Or the pilots. Plates. The pilots. I, I actually, you know, <laughs> until this moment, I know I'm like the 99% useless facts guy. I actually thought they were pilots. Are you? 
Are you trolling me right now? No, like... not. I, I really did think that they were pilots. <laughs> I think I've actually been misreading it for 10 years. The building Pilates. Fear Dragon's like, the that building sounds Pilates. right. <laughs> well, you know what? Is sometimes you want to get a little exercise before the match starts. You go work on the Pilates, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well, okay. I'm starting to doubt that you've been around for 13 years, even though I knew you, like... <laughs> Leave that long. <laughs> All right. Uh, anywho, so uh, Rainer, continuing along your train of thought, right, which is that he's going to be willing to take a little bit of a hit economically to make sure he doesn't lose out uh, to anything surprising. Going for that Overlord speed. Uh, we have a couple of, of months at a time, basically, with this group that's really popular for all the Zergs or for one Zerg, and then, like, everyone just mixes and matches, and then he goes into never being made. Uh, I do think this is because uh, Oliveira is the underdog, and Raynor knows how good of a macro player he is, but also because if it is going to be something tricky, I absolutely believe it is going to be a mid-game thing. I don't think Oliveira is necessarily going to be depending on a two racks or a three racks or a four racks SCV pool or something like that. Definitely about the mid-game, and we do have a Fusion Core on the way. Yep, Fusion Core and second Starport. This is going to get a pretty action packed, but not for a little bit, just because it is going to take time, because that fusion core usually going to be used for a battle cruiser, and that battle cruiser takes a long time to build zombie grub, and during that time, I think that this overlord is going to have a lot of time. Both of them are going to have a lot of time to scout out everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, you've seen it. I mean, yeah, you see the second star port is probably, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, he's, he's literally seen everything. Oh, so yeah, <laughs> I see it now. There we go. No, he is, uh, he's going to see everything. Rainer, I mean, imagine getting Overlord speed and then not actually seeing the Fusion Core or Second Star Port. The Second Star Port uh, was already a bit of a tell anyway. So Oliveira, he probably was really hoping, because it is not that popular, that Overlord speed comes into play, that he'll be able to get away with this cheeky build. Uh, I believe, actually, Gumiho had some success with this exact type, with the Command Center opener first. Uh, no scout, very, very greedy. Uh, one of the dangerous things that you would be attacked beforehand, again, Oliveira, there kind of gambling I'm not going to be but then still wanted to gamble and also not being scouted so his plans they've kind of been ruined honestly like they can still go into a macro game for sure but Rainer is going to tackle these battle cruisers no problem and then already be planning on how he's going to kill Oliveira. So when you know that this is coming this early on before the battle cruiser I mean when the battle cruiser is basically starting what are the kinds of things that as a Zerg player you want to just make sure you have prepared to deal with them? I mean, a lot of queens. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> it seems to be covered there. <laughs> yeah. Earlier on, it's the queens, right? And then you also want to make sure that your creep spread is all between your bases so you didn't skip on the uh, skip on the third... Or not the third creep tumor. The creep tumor between the main and the natural. Natural on the third, which Rainer did not. Uh, so the queens go around. They track it. They build spore crawlers to help out as well. Then they get that spire. You know there's probably... Most likely, they're going to be going to even more than two battle cruisers, but even with just two, that's already a dangerous number. And then also make sure the Spire isn't sniped, I suppose. Like, that is also a concern. Teleport number one comes in, just goes for an Overlord, grabs it, but now Rainer knows to reposition his Queens. Yeah, a little bit of a supply block there actually unlocked, so Oliveira already finding a little bit of damage. Also manages to cancel an Extractor, going for some Creep Tumors. All very light bits of damage here and there so far, so Oliveira hasn't really unlocked the true potential of those Battle Cruisers, but he hasn't really committed super far with the Battle Cruisers either. They're taking some chip damage. That's, yeah, that's it's true. Again, this is not just end of the world because he's been scouted, but it, it's just my concern is that Rainer, because he knows, okay, I have enough to defend, I'm, I'm, I am defending, he can focus on his macro, all right? There's not going to be a hiccup. There's not going to be a weird moment where he's like, oh, okay, I'm messing up here. He's going to be able to focus on his macro. When he does that, I think he can actually even go up to a very sharp attack timing. It's a big map, though, so he might not choose to do that. Uh, so, you know, back when Battle Mech and Battle Cruiser openers were extremely popular, we did have uh, Corruptors and Roaches, basically. Mm -hmm. Good old mix right? Just attack across the map. I wonder if Rainer could actually size up for that, basically. Corruptor's coming up first, of course, because the battle cruisers are getting larger in number. They're taking out the queens, actually, and perhaps those Corruptors just a few seconds too late, but keep in mind, these battle cruisers cannot escape. Well, that one can, actually, but the other one cannot. Yeah, the one that just teleported in is going to be stuck around here, and that is the one that's actually the lowest on hit points right now as well. Still, these Corruptors are having a hard time gather, uh, gathering into large enough numbers to take on the battle cruisers. Battle cruiser number one does end up falling. I believe the other two battle cruisers teleport in a bit later. Do they have their cooldown? Oh, oh, one is off of cooldown. Yeah. Um, hello? Ooh, or maybe oh. that, was it not that one? 
Okay, well, this one now is off of cooldown. I think the other one was off of cooldown. Ah, that's a, that's a bit of a bummer. I mean, there was one brief moment where it did look like Rainer had just basically underestimated. He knew about the Battlecruiser opener. We know that for a fact. He knew about the continued Battlecruisers afterwards with an Overseer. We know that for a fact. Yet he did lose all of those queens. The timing almost worked out for Oliveira to start more of a snowball. But now that Rainer hasn't let that snowball crush him, now it's his turn to actually get across the map, start going after the production line. Well placed Ooh. with a mine. I like that decision there from Oliveira. But Rainer now has the Terran player on the back foot. Yep, Roach is actually going to be bullying those Hellions outside of the third base. The Battlecruisers are going to have an easy time dealing with the Roaches, but the Corruptors are there in high numbers. They can't really take those on. Even the Orbital Command lifting actually may have, I mean, is lose either way. If the yeah. Roaches are on the ground, the Corruptors are in the air. It seems like it's going to be in trouble no matter what. Yeah, exactly. There's actually no saving this. In fact, there might not be any salvaging this game. Oliveira tried to do a little bit of a topsy-turvy mid-game tactic, but Rainer choosing the right opener, choosing to go for that safety overlord speed, just do everything that was going to happen. Rainer giving a little fist bump there. That good old first game jab just shuts things down. Oliveira not able to make things work, and it all comes back to a strategic decision that Rainer made, which was game number one on altitude. He went for Overlord speed. He scouted out exactly what Oliveira was doing at the, from the very get-go. Yeah, and I gotta expect just having altitude in the map pool, Rainer was, was already thinking, there's no way you're just gonna play 3cc, like eight racks all in or something on this <laughs> map, right? So again, just everything kind of added for that not to be a very promising start for Oliveira, to be honest, as far as the map choice, the beginning of the series, going up against the previous world champion, like all that good stuff, right? Uh, but then of course, in the actual game, having his very much wanting to be a surprise build scouted. Once that happens, you are relying on them to underestimate, which was kind of close. Those queens dying was like, everyone got a little nervous. Uh, but even then, the corruptor numbers coming out was good enough. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then you're just not going to have a very good time in that game. But I do want to say, roll it all together. That just kind of sucked for Oliveira. Mm -hmm. All right, let's agree with that. Maybe you can kind of like get it out of a system now, you know? Yeah. It's the map gone. You've, you've gotten kind of used to StarCraft again as you face this really intimidating uh, Zerg player. Maybe as we go into Dragon Scales, Oliveira can rely on something not as tricky, because he does have good mechanics, he does have scary pushes, and I would love to see him actually bring it back now. I'm 100% with you on that. I think that Oliveira, so far, the series has gone kind of as I think many people feared it would go, who are rooting and hoping for some great, really close StarCraft games. But like you were saying, that first game, the way it ended and the reason why it ended is something you can kind of shake off a little bit more easily because it's not like you were just getting outplayed for 20 minutes. It was, ah, oh, shoot, he saw this coming. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, uh, we do have Dragon Scales now underway for game two. In the bottom right, taking that first map swiftly, we have the Red Zerg for Kaizy Gaming, Rainer. And over here on the top left-hand side of the map, the blue Terran player also from Kaizy Gaming, he is Oliveira. And I do want to take this time as we watch again, no cheeses, no super weirdness happening, uh, just a barracks coming down first. I want to take this time to really highlight what Oliveira has done and can do, his potential in this matchup, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm almost already, as a caster, willing, willing to just be like, well, Game number one, hardly even counts. Of course it does. Rainer already has a lead, like it does. But Oliveira, when I think of how I've been impressed by him in the past, his run in Montreal, right? The first time that we started saying, oh my God, this kid might actually have some of the best TVZ of the non-Koreans. Um, and then Clem kind of dominated, to be fair, but still, <laughs> uh, he was extremely aggressive. He was able to make those kind of scrappy pushes really work out. His APM is quite high. A lot of people cheering for Rainer there. Um, and he can actually multitask very well. He can push really well. He can build up to a push and use it effectively. Maybe not as much as Maru. Like, we can't go that high, but still. So on Dragon Scales, even like what Byun was doing versus Lambo, if he did that, I would actually have a lot of hope in Oliveira. Yeah. So that's what I want to see. I want to see the Oliveira that made us all wonder, oh, is he actually the second best Terran? in the, the non-Korean scene or the best Terran non-Korean scene that was happening about four or five years ago. I think it was really well summed up. Uh, I can't remember who was saying this during the Hugh Marine versus Oliveira series that effectively 
The things that make Big Gabe really scary is a lot of time his strategic decision making and things like that. And that is not what made Oliveira really scary. Like you yeah. said, it was a lot of his mechanics, it was his execution. That last game, that was a strategic decision that was trying to go off the beaten path, go yep. for like this kind of two battle cruiser or two starboard battle cruiser opening and everything. But Oliveira still has yet to kind of show his biggest strength and really lean into that, which is kind of his raw mechanics. The only little caveat I'll put on that, Zombie Grub, as we do see the Reaper just doing his usual little harassment here, is that, uh, well, Rainer's really good at that too. Yeah, the desk really did sum it up well. Shout out to Roddy, right? Like, yeah. summing it up as basically what makes Oliveira good, it makes Rainer a bit better, is, is pretty much spot on. But I just still believe that Oliveira, in theory, could have given us a very, very close 3 0. Just thinking ahead here, where every single game was like a tug of war. I would have absolutely believed that. That first game wasn't it, because again, it was a bit of a trickier build. Now, with the 3cc opener, right into those Hellenes, very basic macro Terran, this is where we get to see can. Oliveira with his new placement in Katowice, right? He's gotten this far in the Global Championships. He's clearly playing very well. Can he actually match Rainer's speed and tenacity in the tug of war of TVZ? I would love to say that he can. If he's really feeling, if he was really on point today, I think he could. Yeah. And this is just going to be the true test because it's not even just doing it in a random online tournament at home, kind of in your PJs, feeling comfortable. You're doing it on the stage. You're doing it in the quarterfinals of the largest StarCraft event of the year. This is already the furthest you've ever made it. You know that nerves are gonna be a bit of a factor here. This is gonna be pressure on the line. Can Oliveira show up and turn it on when it counts, when it matters? Yeah. It would also be technically the first time that he's defeated Rainer, I believe. Yeah, in a uh, best of three plus, I think yes, he's 0 and yes. 5. Yeah, exactly. A couple of uh, best of ones happened earlier for Nation Wars, but yeah, it's uh, but it, it does seem to be a new and improved Oliveira. It is certainly a new patch and new maps to work through. And we would usually say that typically Terrans can abuse some of the new maps quite well, but at this point, we're about actually a month into the pro gamers mm -hmm. packs on the new map, so it's it's not quite like that. Uh, however, still, there might be some trickiness with the tank spots, the Wood of Mine drops, something along those lines. We really do have a very basic TVZ. Rainer's been scouting. Oliveira has been prepping his build. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually really does get me excited for all the reasons we were talking about, though, Zombie Road, because I think in a lot of ways, this could be the game if this sets up to just be a kind of normal mechanics versus mechanics execution-based game. This could be the game that really also decides and sets into both Rainer and Oliveira's minds. Who is going to be, or how competitive is Oliveira really going to be with Rainer? Yeah, yeah, that first one you just really couldn't say too much about the potential competition. Yeah. Once it was scouted. Um, notably, of course, uh, kind of touching on that, Rainer did not go for a lot of the, well, certainly didn't go for overload speed, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think he is a little more concerned about what could happen here in more of that macro sense. So he got a good enough scout to note the 3cc. Like, he does know the build order now, but the point is he didn't actually hurt his economy more so, like in the last game. I think he was expecting something tricky on altitude. Here, he actually is thinking, well, if Oliveira gets a really pumped up 3cc build. I should be kind of scared of that. Like, I do have to respect that. So I, I think we're getting a little bit here of that for Rainer. His lair finishes up, his baneling nest is already done. Um, and he is, again, continuing to scout. I think he actually knows what's happening, but these upgrades for Oliveira are going to be way farther ahead than Rainer's. Yep, gonna be very, very mindful of that when we see some of these skirmishes begin to start here and there. We are in the first person point of view of Oliveira as he's dealing with these lings that Rainer is throwing around. Something that, uh, well, Rainer used to actually be, I feel like more well known last year and the year before for his ling control and his kind of backstabs and stuff. Well, I think he's still quite good at it. It does seem like Rainer's also okay with just being a little bit more chill and defensive with his lings lately. I mean, you know, I talked about how Rainer, I think, is respecting Oliveira a bit more, and I'm gonna stick with that even more so. His drone count's really not impressive, right? Like, yeah. he did, okay, well, this run by is gonna be kind of brutal. Can't quite squeeze through, but it Sorry. does eventually <laughs> be able to. Yeah. Uh, there it is. We end up seeing a handful of the Marines did die at the front. But at the same time, Oliver is going to try to get some counter damage done on the other side of the map. Marines are able to churn through those lings very, very easily. But the Queens are going to be holding strong for a bit well. until they run out of Transfuse energy, though. Ooh, yeah, that was a, that was a little bit too close for comfort. Ooh. Uh, sorry, guys, we were talking about something that wasn't on the first person view, but there was a run by that did demand all of Aero's attention. He was able to handle it. Seven SCVs went down. That could have been worse. That could have been the Lings getting through and him messing up on the
the front lines, you know, letting a meta back get sniped uh, prematurely type of situation. So, yeah, now we've summed that up. Rainer did almost not have enough queens, but <laughs> he really <laughs> did. Uh, pushes that back, and now we have a few more drones on the way, which, again, it's not an impressive economy right now for Rainer. He's staying kind of su suppressed on that economy, knowing that the aggression of Oliveira is very, very good, and it is continuing to be good here. Yep. Lings and Banlings coming on forward. There's not a lot of creep over here. The Widowmine, oh my god, that Widowmine took so long to fire. It does manage to snag a couple of Banlings there, but Banlings on the other side of the map look like they snag some SCVs and also soften up the rest, so Rainer continuously firing back with these counterattacks. One thing that Oliveira does do, even with a 3cc build that Rainer might have been wary of, is add Hellbats a little bit earlier. Now, this comes down with a normal armory timing, to be fair, but the point is, including just a handful of Hellbats can actually really throw off the Zerg's supposed perfect defense. The Ling run by once again, catching Oliveira a little off guard. He's trying his best to both defend and harass, but it's not quite finding success or a lot of success on either side. Oh man, those Lings also are chasing after those SCPs on the other side of the map. It looks like the Widowmines are able to clean those up as we do see at the same time that attack from Oliveira was also trying to get some good damage on. Two Lings managed to survive to the Widowmine hits. I was actually a little bit worried there as well that the Widowmines are going to friendly fire the SCBs, but well, more Widowmines are, are going to be burrowing uh -oh. over here, but uh, okay, friendly fire some uh -oh. of the SCBs, and here we go. Bailey's come in to clean up the job. Oh, the SCBs, even some of them are coming back to work at the third. That was a bad idea. 20 SEVs go down. Rainer is holding against what is a, a very small force on the other side of the map. All of there is micro and his heart out, man. Yeah. But Rainer's not really going to think this is ever going to snowball too bad. So he is getting these run buys across the map. By the way, Oliveira has no time and no army to try and focus on the creep spread denial. Rainer is about to get a creep tumor on Oliveira's third. Ay, ay, ay. That is. Scary. It is, you know, I really have to commend Oliveira because I think there are so many Zerg players that would have faltered to this. It is incredible that Oliveira was keeping these medevacs alive during so many of these attacks. Finally, we're going to start to see two of them have now fallen, but he was doing that while also burrowing Widowmines back at home, while also reinforcing, while also trying to get everything in place to defend and... During all of that, somehow, Raider did everything <laughs> and also spread creep. Yeah, the things really, like, boosted as they got to the third CC. Oh, oh this could be. I mean, it, it feels like it's it. Like, we look at the supply, though, and it doesn't feel all that bad. Raynor's just, like, presence mm -hmm. is kind of enveloping Oliveira right now. He is just, he's, the creep spread in particular is very scary, but look at this, actually. Widow Mine's yeah. causing problems, Liberator causing problems. Part of the reason that Rainer is not just snowballed in that supply is how Ooh. good Oliveira is at trying to always have something of his own happen. Widow Mine's not gonna get a second shot. Yeah. And it's going to be a little bit rough because it seemed like it was going to be a big potential. There were a lot of drones at that base and maybe something could happen. It looks like two workers eventually end up falling there. But it does seem like, ironically enough, Oliveira is starting to run out of time as he is up against the ropes. He's trying to find damage, but the damage that he's finding is with little bits of harassment that don't either actually help with pushing back the creep, which is another important thing he's going to need <laughs> if he ever wants to do a proper push out. That's, that's so scary, right? He's going to have the Zerg player so much vision at this point. Um, and then so much to work with. Oh, nice bailing snipes right there. Perhaps Oliveira can handle this run by as he picks up the SCVs now, however, vulnerable. They might get taken down. Rainer with 2 2 as well, finally finishing up Contango a little bit more of these Marines. But Oliveira is so darn good about always having something of his own on the map. At least gets 10 drones. He's going to be able to clean up this Ling run by. The SCVs were successfully pulled despite being under defended for a while. And the command center is a real champ right now, man. I don't know how much damage is actually soaked up in exchange to save some SCVs. TVs, but, you know, that commander also deserves a little nod there. No, absolutely. It, it's, it's so unfortunate because I feel like Oliver is playing so well right now. It's just that Rainer is better in the ways that Oliver is. As Roddy had said at the desk, as you were saying before, it is really, really tough because Rainer is playing so fast and it's kind of out competing how unbelievably fast Oliver oh, is as well. Oh no. Oh no, there was a tank there, but that wasn't enough to stop all of these banelings. 16 SEVs go down, but you know that tank survived, the Marine survived. I guess I could say that that was a decent amount of army supply, but the problem is Oliveira, even if he was ahead in army supply, as you had previously mentioned, how do you actually get on the map, man? As soon as you step literally forward from your own third command center, Rainer knows. All right, and he could actually pounce on your still unseached siege tank on your own side of the map. Yeah, I mean, 
Imagine how scary it is going to be if Rainer ever finds a few extra actions during all of this aggression and defense to even spread a few creep tubers to the edges, the far left and right edges of the map, so you can see medevacs coming and dropping. It shuts down the drops as well in the Liberators. Yeah, yeah, you see Oliveira, you know, you, you look at a bunch of queens all alone, and you think, oh, this is my chance. Not one has that many queens. Not yeah. one has that many chance fuses. So uh, going to be forced to back away even from that. Oliveira, uh, at one point, the, the worker counts really were even maybe favorable, but Rainer was still actually mining more. Rainer now at 88 drones. Now that is a comfortable Zerg. He is totally fine on the economy. Oliveira is the one struggling to keep up, has not been able to really move on from 3CC, not even up to the amount of production that would make this like a, what we'd call like a true all-in. All I can fit in is Marines, a couple of splash damage units, and his upgrades. And his upgrades are very important. Mm -hmm. Oliveira, he's going for a push out. This is gonna need to be a bit of a miracle punch. And oh, the families connect with quite a few of the Marines. And you know what? Even if Raynor didn't clean up this army entirely, he just needed to do good enough. Ooh, this ooh, was, ooh. I mean, well, that's a good trade there for Oliveira, but all of the tanks are gone. The reinforcement line you see on the minimap is not really coming. This is effectively just a, what? A little bit more than a double medevac drop? Yeah, that's actually what it is, despite so many medevacs being available. And of course, that's not all of Rainer's army. He does have the Ling run by, as we know that he always does. Tank on a high ground is even sometimes injuring their own SCVs. The Bailing snipes from time have been so darn cool. He still continued to do that, that picture in picture. He is actually taking all the Bailings, hoping that his upgrades can push through. He's about to have plus three. It looks like it'll finish as the Lings all dissipate. And has Rainer underestimated this attack from Oliveira? That's a good question. The Queens are going to try and hold the line for a little bit, even transfusing the Overseer, but they are just so many queens with so much energy <laughs> zombie even with the focus fire from plus three weapon marines it seems like the queens are buying time here we go. for the here old we go. reinforcements are coming Ruby. reinforcements are coming the palings aren't quite done there's not even that many of them could he actually focus fire this down does Oliveira have a chance at this game the tank siege is up the wood is guarding it the palings are all gone Rainer tries to go for a run by once again but I think he needs everything back at home right here right now here comes the, the swamp rally and does Oliveira does he have enough to stand his ground he might the bailings where are they Rainer has to pull back Rainer losing ground right now he needs some orphans and families but he's morphing him in right in front of the Marines the Marines starting to sim themselves to death but they know there is a timer he's oh! gonna stop the bailing that zombie grub oh my god I think Oliveira might be doing it he's so overstimmed but he is gunning for Rainer in game number two the last few bailings are gonna be sniped there's what? only three left over the full surround is he gonna Two few seconds late. I don't know, man. Rainer, he's got more queens. He's got more lings. He's rebuilding the bailing nest. The upgrade's still favorable for Oliveira, but his Marines were injured. His medevacs are almost out of juice. He's forced to return home. It seemed like he was so close. The snowball was going more and more. But as soon as Rainer is given a few seconds to breathe, the bailing nest is going to refinish. The lings are flooding on out. Rainer's still on 76 workers, and he can replenish that army, whereas Oliveira could not. He he seemed so close, Zombie Grub, to Dude. making his way through, to momentum making his way through. No, that almost worked. That was so close to working. One more Baneling gets sniped, and I think he can snipe the two that finish. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Like that surround on the ramp from Rainer literally stopped. It was a physical blocker from the Marines trying to jump on the rest of the Banelings. And then they would have had the high ground, right? They would have taken advantage mm -hmm. of that. I don't know if that actually ends the game, though, of course. Like, the like to calm down as we watch Rainer now just jump up in supply because Raynor did have so many bases. He would have still had lings and queens flooding through. I'm not sure that Oliveira could have done it, but man, that was exciting. It oh. was very exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm just imagining the scenarios and possibilities as Marines are going to be forced to pick up and head over to the main base. You know, what if he is able to get into the main base? What if he snipes the spawning pool and delays even more production? But at the end of the day, Oliveira is still just going to be looking for damage wherever he can find it. He finds a spine crawler and a handful of drones into these queens. He's still doing a great job just <laughs> trying to find pickoffs wherever he can. But he's still down about 60, 70 supply, and he finally taps out. GG, oh. Rainer goes up 2-0, but man, did this man have to fight. Yeah, uh, that was, that was, thank goodness, that was actually what we were talking about, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Oliveira kind of proving our point. How close that got. Now, did it really have to be that close? Honestly, no. Again, as we all calm down, take a breath. Whew. Um, Rainer was throwing away a lot of links. 
right? He yeah. was running into Marines on equal upgrades initially, but still running into very unfavorable scenarios. His Queens were actually pulled uh, hindsight 2020 a little bit late, right? So if they were there from the very get go, I also don't think that's a problem. And uh, as such, he probably did not have to make it that close. If he just calmly built Banelings on the backside, as well as continue doing his run buys. Uh, but that was the problem, is that he took a couple of bad fights, the Queens were a little late, the Banelings couldn't form in enough numbers to really push that back entirely, and that's why I got close. Yeah. I think one of my favorite things in StarCraft to talk about is that there is speed, but it's actually a lot easier to be fast when you're the aggressor rather than the defender. Because when you're the aggressor, you're attacking when you feel like you have the free time, the free APM, the free cycles to be aggressive into micro. When you're defending, you're reacting when your opponent feels that way. Well, guys, we're going to be giving these players a little bit more time to recuperate, as I think everyone needs a little bit more time to recuperate after that game. We're going to be back with the finale and the conclusion of this series right after the break.
are back and ready to move into the next game. Everyone's had a few minutes to just kind of breathe after that last game. Oliveira can kind of soak in and be like, all right, I feel like I got really close with that. Let's see what we can do. Rainer had some time to be like, all right, let's make sure that never happens again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Oh, that was too close for comfort <clears throat> for Rainer. Now we move on to Neo Humanity has what could be the last uh, map. I do have, I think, a lot of thoughts for this one. Last game was sick. This one could be a bit different, sick in a different way. Let's get into it, guys. On the bottom right, now up 2-0. He is the Red Zerg for Kaizy Gaming, Rainer. And up here at the top left-hand side of the map, the Blue Terran player who has been outboxing his way to try and find vulnerabilities in his opponent from Kaizy Gaming as well. He is Oliveira. Okay, so I thought I might have uh, an idea, some thoughts about this map, right? Looking at the best of as it's been played currently, um, Oliveira did a trickster build on game one, Altitude, a map that we just don't actually see all that often. Mm -hmm. um, and a map that is difficult to play a macro game on uh, in any matchup, really. Then game number two, we move on to a map that's a bit shorter. It uh, definitely has showcased a lot of even two base all ins. Hey. Hey, we, I, I love that someone crossed out hey. Sarah on Red Oliveira. Let's I, go. I think I know why she really likes Rainer, but. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's uh, Ray God is good. Um, the. <laughs> Oh, the signs keep on coming, man. Yeah. Pizza man. Yeah. yeah Swarm we trust. There we go. All Appreciate right, Zombie Guard, finish your point. <laughs> no, I was like, wait, no, I had a point. Uh, hold on. Talking about the maps. So you're talking yeah. about game number one, map so, number two. So, se second map, right? A lot of two base all in on that map, just very aggressive, and that's what Oliveira uh, didn't do a two base all in, but he made sure to emphasize that aggression, just nonstop aggression, nonstop action. Neo Humanity could be where Oliveira tries to take advantage of its defensive features. All right. Mm. So it is kind of been talked about as a map that's very good for turtling. Um, and the Zerg players even kind of been a little frustrated at times against it. We saw that in the Clem series versus Dark. Uh, even played very defensive when he found out that Dark was going into, into Roaches for a while. I feel like Oliveira could do the same thing. I feel like his plans for the best of five when he looked at the maps and what had happened could be excellent. The problem is just the mechanical execution. Rainer is just so good at that. Yeah, it truly is. And while the later half of that second game from Oliveira was incredibly impressive, Rainer was outplaying Oliveira speed-wise and just execution-wise in the first half of the game. It is the reason why Rainer was up to such a magnificent lead. This is, uh, a Reaper is getting a little bit more damage done on those drones than sometimes we see, but it is gonna eventually get forced back, but mm -hmm. yeah. Another 3cc build from Oliveira. Um, so it, it could just be the same thing as last game, of course. I don't want to say I know what Oliveira's planning ahead of time. But if he did end up using this as a map to be more defensive on, I think it would make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not more sense, but a lot of sense. If he tried to do the same thing he did last game, thinking that he was awfully close, right? And all he had to do was stop a couple more run buys. All he had to do was collect his Marines a little faster. Something along those lines. That would also make sense to me. Yeah. Um, because even though it was kind of a scenario where it got close when it shouldn't have, I'm talking about some of the moments beforehand. I think Oliveira could have done a better job in that department as well and actually been able to play the rest of his series. But uh, obviously that, that didn't happen. So many of the run bys hurt. And it, was, it was quite a painful game where he really had to turn it on. Uh, but it could happen if he can save the third base a bit more, if he can actually get a direct push across the map a little bit better, mm -hmm. then we might have his idea of a nice mid-game actually flourish. Yeah, it's both exciting, but also really tough when you, one of the potential solutions that you think of is, I need to just play faster, better, stronger. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, there's the strategic decision making that you, sometimes you can make of, ah, I will make this adjustment in the next game with leaving units in a particular location or the unit composition or the build order. But when it's, I need to, I'm going to play faster, I'm gonna be more focused. It's not always as simple or easy to just make that adjustment. But if Oliveira feels like that game was a really, really good way to warm up and to get into his groove, and now he can really truly hit his stride to really focus up and actually compete with Rainer again, I think that could very well be a nice way to approach the game. 
Could be. Well, Rainer's the one changing it up right now. Roachhorn is on the way. His overlord got into the main base. And they did scout. It was a 3cc build. It also saw that the starport was building with a tech lab on it. Uh, very few Terrans are, are actually going into Ravens, even though that was a possibility with the new patch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he just confirmed right there that it was, in fact, a Banshee. But no cloak, unless we've been blinded somehow like no cloak right <laughs> yeah. usually if it's no cloak one banshee I, I call that a safety banshee right so it could help me if you are going to attack me if it comes with surprise roaches he's going into two without cloak uh okay. and that's a bit more surprising yeah i mean I, I guess two banshees is still good for one-shotting workers so even if your opponent yeah, maybe yeah. would have detection and effectively two banshees can still get some nice work done so i don't hate the idea of it and we'll see again it's going to come down a little bit to execution as hellion banshee uh, openings oftentimes do yeah i still uh still wonder though because it just it, i mean cloak is an extra 100 100 maybe it does streamline the build and as you said still gets the possibility of sniping drones and it still also, of course, has the possibility of helping to defend, but that it actually seems to be a bit of his plan. So he's using the Banshees currently. Uh, well, without Cloak, they are going to struggle against Ooh. Yeah. yeah, Even without a lair from Raynor. <clears throat> well, or Overseer, sorry. He does have a lair. He's actually going to Mutas. So did we just cancel the Roachhorn straight up? Which I actually think is fine. Yeah, okay, it was there. Thank you. Thank you, Observer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he made a family that's instead. It's actually going to Aspire. So Spire play has kind of fallen out of the meta in general for TBZ, right? But I do think some of the Zergs were noting some of the maps could be Spire-based. I, I wasn't thinking Neo Humanity, actually, but I, I could see how maybe this works out. Mm -hmm. So Oliver using his Banshees to kind of guard some of the attack paths, also making sure to take the Zel Nagas. That seems to be one of the Zergs gripes about this map is like the Zelnagas are so powerful at cutting off the edges, the, the potential counterattack avenues. Mutas, what they're really good at is going to be taking that map control, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, Brainer might actually be looking to really pile on uh, some pressure, uh, but then also make sure to take care of all of the avenues of attack. If uh, Oliveira goes into an 8 racks, though, is that actually what he's doing? He's on a 4cc, right? Yeah, he's going yeah. into 8 racks. Generally, you don't really want Mutas against that. So, uh, yeah. I don't know, man. Eight racks, a very powerful, straightforward, aggressive kind of style. And Buda's really good for not engaging and forcing yeah. your opponent to not engage. So it is going to be a big question of whether or not Raynor can really take advantage of those Mutas or how much actually he's even going to invest in the Mutas once he realizes what's going to be heading his way. Yeah, well, he just got that scout, right? So did he let the Spire... F like, I'm constantly questioning this. So the Spire's done, uh, and he is going to make Mutas. I feel like you can't just, like, stop it at 99%. But as you pointed out, they're very difficult to use in a straight-up engagement. Sometimes they can be helpful. But perhaps if Raynor was thinking, hey, he could use this opportunity to be very defensive, very long macro game, Mutas are going to be great there, he might now be trying to basically scramble at the last second and say, okay, well, now I have to make this work against an 8 racks. Not saying that it can't work. I think it could, it just might be very troublesome as Oliveira prepares to really pressure and then pressure and then pressure and then pressure. Yeah. Plus one, plus one is about halfway done here for Rainer, and Oliver is already out on the map, so he's looking to actually start the aggression pretty shortly, but during the aggression, depending on how long these kind of trades end up going, it seems like Raynor may be finishing up an upgrade during the midst of all this, but he's actually going to be trying to buy some time with the Link counterattacks, with the Mutas moving across the map at the same time that this push moves forward on his base. Yeah, this is this is already not looking as, as expected, but I guess this is Raynor's only choice, going for the humongous run by, and it was a large run by, lots of Links and the Mutas. The Banshees alone could not stop 19 SCDs from falling. All of their already rather dedicated with this 8 going to be even more dedicated, but can Raynor actually hold back at home? Yeah, he is having some trouble. He is pulling back a lot of those links. He's going to be looking to go for a surround, looking at the mini-map. We do see that these units are getting closer, closer to the hatchery. The Banley's getting ready to move in. The flank comes in from the links. The Banley's come piling on forward, and they are going to find a couple of But Oliveira splits a little bit too Woo! well and takes the game. A fist bump in the air. He puts one on the board. You can't help but be happy that he gets a game, right? I'm honestly not cheering for either one to complete this series. I wanted more games is all, man. Oliveira. Okay, I actually think that was kind of in a way a trick, right? It all kind of can collect together as I can be the observer in my god eyes and all that. I think maybe what wanted to happen, all right? Just like, hear me out for a second. <laughs> Oliveira playing strategically very well, mechanically very well. That was a nice uh, end game battle. But uh, 
we had a map that was known for its offensive properties. Rainer wanted to do something aggressive with the Roachworn, perhaps, saw that it was a Banshee and said, never mind, I'm not going to do that. Still was thinking perhaps very defensive-minded because it was a 3cc, and then said, I'm going to go ahead and take map control and take an aggressive stance against a guy who's going to turtle and he's not going to expect it. Scouts the eight racks and says, oh crap, <laughs> like that's not going to work out. I need to do something drastic to try and make this a really weird game. Mm -hmm. But the eight racks is just so powerful. When you go for mutas, you can't engage directly. You also have later upgrades. And just the way that Oliver was able to get across the map as easily as he did into that position already made it a very almost borderline impossible hold. We could see, of course, that Rainer could not. Yeah. Execution-wise, Oliver did a great job also handling the Ling flank that came in to try and ensure Bailings would be able to get good connections to pick off those tanks, but it wasn't enough. And now, because of that, we get to move into a game number four between these two players. Rainer is still at match point. He is still one game away from moving on to the semifinals. But Oliver is going to have to pull out some really, really phenomenal play to take back two additional games before he's able to move on. And I'm so giddy about this. I'm so excited what this could actually hold. Gresfon has had some amazing games. Let's get hype crowd. Let's get into it. Bottom right, we do have the Red Zerg once again for Kai Z Gaming. It is Raider! Guys, if you want to see a game number five, send this man up here in the top left-hand side. Your energy. Make the ground shake beneath his feet from Kaizy Gaming. He is Oliveira. Fantastic. Just playing out of the best of from Oliveira. I'm going to stick with that. Rainer showing his uh, mechanical prowess. Uh, of course, as a Zerg, going to be reacting more often. And even though he did try to take the reins of that last game, it basically was like stepping into uh, two rakes back to back. Like, oops, oops, it just didn't work out for him very well. Thanks again, fans, for coming along and being such a great crowd. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention um, about that strategy is that the two Banshees without Cloak, I think they might have been literally only to stop run buys. Right? Uh. So they positioned themselves on the attack paths initially, so they would find a lot of the things that would have been surprising, like a roach attack, I suppose. But then later on, he only parked them around his third. That would have stopped 20 lings uh, and, you know, like five sex bailings or, or something that was a non dedicated run by. Mm -hmm. And that would have been brilliant. He would have been locked up nice and tight. It was a bigger run by. That's the only reason it got a bit topsy turvy. Yeah. Uh, especially when you have Mutas finally also added into that run by as yeah. well. Yeah, Makes it a lot harder for those banshees to survive. Imagine if they had had Cloak Zombie Growth, then they could have survived against the Mutas too. No, but that is still going to be a, an important W on the board for Oliveira because of all the little decisions he was making like that. So we're going to see as we move on to Gresvon, you're talking about how this has just been a stellar map. It is constantly delivered series after series with great games. A lot of the games I feel like we've been seeing on this map also have been long macro games. So dare I hope, Zombie Grub, dare I hope we'll move into a long macro game. Well, that's what we haven't seen. It's what I mm -hmm. thought might happen on Neo Humanity. I think Rainer thought the same thing, but it didn't happen. So we had a cheesy kind of hope this is a surprise strategy. We had very aggressive, uh, shorter map use. And then we had that basically again. He just was able to actually do with the rest of his build. He actually got up to the eight racks, is something he couldn't really do on our second map. But um, now, Gressvon, he could be aggressive again because we have the, the third problem for Zergs. We've pointed this out a couple of times uh, with this matchup in this tournament. There's just a really nice tank spot to push around where the, the Reaper is patrolling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice tank spot. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, Zergs are, once they figure out that's what a Terran is going to do, they react to it. That's, that's, that's how they work, right? And yeah. they've been doing really well taking that into account and setting up the surrounds and, and whatever else you have to do. So, I don't know. I think Oliveira... He might just be saying my aggression is working. So he might not actually ever go for like a fast fourth base. And I think I'd be okay with that. I do love Oliveira's late game too. I think he has some really sick games with it. But uh, especially with how that last game went, I just I wouldn't depend on that last game again, right? I actually don't <laughs> think Rainer's ever gonna go mute us again. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt something like that as well, especially at least not in that manner for sure, just because 
it certainly cost him. It certainly cost him in that game, and it goes to show that Oliver is not afraid to get immediately up in Rainer's face if he tries to make those kind of transitions. We do have a Liberator opening coming on out here from Oliver, so definitely keeping things fresh. Yeah, yeah, we got to theory talk for a while because once again, it is a 3cc versus just a Rainer building up macro-wise. Uh, but we have a Roach Warren again. Okay, so yeah, I don't think Spire necessarily, but again, if it does become obvious, perhaps it's going to go into a later game or that Oliver is not going to punish him for it, then maybe we could see it. But no, right now, let's talk about the Roach Warren. That is still going to get him some early game control. And now that it isn't a Banshee opener, uh, it could actually get him a lot of damage done too. He's going to see the Starport without an add-on and be, I think, pretty happy about that. Plus the third CC, and he'll be even happier then. Yeah. Overlord also gets a scout out on that Liberator, so we're going to see Rainer probably have a few extra defenses set up with those Queen positionings and whatnot to ensure that he can uh, deal with the Liberator. But Overlord, seeing everything, like you said, is going to be an important scout to just ensure that he knows he's not going to be up against something absolutely wild yeah. in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, going for Roaches, if he sees him across the map, they could do some damage. But just in general, going for Roaches, he does also kind of safeguard himself against some of the um, <clears throat> Hellbat pushes. Also, again, I, I pointed out how Oliveira sometimes adds Hellbats into his mid-game 3cc pushes, so it's not all lane or very dedicated. That would also help. And just in general, Roaches do give you that mid-game control, where usually we'd say TDZ, um, Terrans get mid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe Zergs get late or something along those lines. Roaches kind of turn that a little bit. And Rainer also just displaying another style as well could throw Oliver off. Yeah, I, I, you love to see it. And Rainer still, despite how Oliver has been able to punch back a bit, both with that last game and even the end of the second game, Rainer is still up a game. He still has an opportunity to kind of play around and try something, throw Oliveira a kind of different type of curveball and see whether or not he's able to actually strike back at it or not. Yeah. Yeah, okay, interesting here. Rainer. Uh, he initially got Burrow. Maybe that was just a misclick. <laughs> it might be something really crazy, but... Nope, he showed the Roaches. Oliveira now knows about it. Um, I'm not sure Oliveira was skipping tanks to begin with, uh, but if he wasn't, then he's already building that tank count, which is exactly what you would want. Rainer's not going to be going for a super aggressive 1-1 one, one Roach, but you still got to be wary of the amount of Roaches that can appear on your side of the map as a Terran. Mm -hmm. now, we see the Infestation Pit. Oliveira is going to really want to be keen on checking if this is going to get like a mass army really quickly, or yeah, if it's gonna go up to uh, Infestors or Hive Technology. I think Rainer Let's appreciate the Hive. Uh, first move out here from Oliveira. Yeah, first move out as we see that Infestation Pit finishing on up. So we'll get to see what uh, Rainer's doing in the production tab. In the meanwhile, Creep Tumor's being picked off. The Hellions continue to poke away at that hatchery, just seeing, all right. Skate, see if we can find some of the drones transferring. Uh -huh. The Marines going to be stemming forward to snipe off two of the Queens. A lot of the Marines end up going down over there, but I mean, two Queens is not bad. Yeah, and there's that hive as expected. We have uh, all of there also able to scout that. So the Liberator, pretty much a success. Nice distraction. One, two punch, three drones. Actually, I want to say kind of good against Rainer. <laughs> usually pretty on, uh, on point about it. Uh, not if it just dies there, though. Yeah. Oh, body pop? Oh, no, he's going to go for the drones, actually. <laughs> Hellions are like, see you later, Queens. Ooh. We know the drones are a little unguarded, and they, in fact, they were. Six of them go down for the remnants of Hellions. I'd take that. Yeah. You know, six drones, I think, in combination with the two drones that the Liberator uh, killed, or I think that's actually total between the two. So that's a little bit of good damage, but Rainer is still getting up to his very, very comfortable number of 90 workers. His 1-1 one, one upgrades are also going to be finishing up in a matter of seconds, and he should be tying that up, and we'll see. Hopefully, he'll be starting up that 2-2 uh, two, two upgrades very, very shortly as well. Yep, should be. All right, we do have ourselves a late game. We do. Nice Fantastic, Gressman. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, 4th CC is on the way for Oliveira. Uh, probably just going to have most of his army reinforced there, right? Stay defensive and then use two, two drops, two, two, uh, to control the creep spread, control Rainer a little bit, determine exactly what his technology goal is. Is it Massling, Baneling, Roach, Ravager, Viper? That was a mouthful. Uh, could we see Lurkers? Uh, of course, we know that it's not true. And I'll, oh, well, I was wrong, actually. Oliveira is going to do a push. Um, hmm. Okay. How about a weirdly timed push? Yeah, that, that doesn't look like a Terran army, okay. you know? Okay. Uh. That's, that's not how you want the attack to go. Two tanks go down for absolutely nothing almost. Uh, we see the rest of the Marines pick up into the medevac. 
it was such a weirdly timed push because it was in the middle, like before 2 2, where any of the kind of like armory upgrades or anything finish up. There's not really any kind of like key indi indicator or key timing he's hitting here, right? Yeah, I just gotta say, I think it's a bit confusing. I do think it's been a story, uh, not a very good one though, so we don't highlight it, of Terran mm. being overly aggressive versus Roaches. I kind of felt like that was it too. Because it's one thing to try and pressure on the front lines and then do a drop or just say like, hey, I'm pressuring you. And another to bring your tanks. Mm. Once you bring your tanks, you really are looking for a really big push. That's yeah. an anchor right there. It's not going to be able to escape very easily. Yeah, usually when you bring your tanks, you're committed because the tanks are sieged up. In that case, it was unfortunate because the tanks weren't sieged up and they still yeah. got sniped off. They weren't able to get into the medevacs or anything in time. So I was going to put them in an awkward spot. These Marines are going to continue to try and find some free pickoffs here on creep tumors wherever they can. This is the uncommitted attacks and stuff that you were talking about. But with the siege and count reset, does that mean that Raynor probably feels a bit more confident in saying, I know that you're probably not going to be able to launch a massive attack for at least another minute or two, kind of just get to have free reign? It could. Um, I like. Here's the thing about someone being aggressive against what Rainer is doing. It might just surprise him. Yeah. He might keep thinking, well, you should be defensive. Like, you should be on the other side of the map. I shouldn't be the one that has free reign can, to control the battles. But the Oliveira keeps pushing. So Rainer may be caught a little bit off guard. Once again, no bailings being a severe problem. Oliveira, he's got 2-2. Two, two. He's pushing across the map. His fourth command center is settled. Even a drop being set up as well. And Rainer really needs to be careful about letting the Terran army siege in this low ground. Yeah, Terran army is getting closer and closer, and he's staying outside the range of the siege shanks with his army, but now the siege shanks are getting siege up on that low ground. The drones are actually just going to get obliterated over there. There's, they were not evacuated out in time. Here comes Rainer, though. He's coming on forward. The Vipers also have energy for those blinding clouds. A couple of them thrown down, but uh, Oliver has way too much over here. This was domination. Rainer, even with some technology to help him out, is, I think just kind of misread the, the, the pacing, you know, like <laughs> the cadence almost of all Oliveira, he was not prepared to stop him from getting this particularly abusive position, and he certainly wasn't really prepared to take the best engagement possible, not coming in from different angles. This actually, this could be the stepping stone to the end of the game, right? I don't want to call it right here, right now, but Oliveira definitely delivering a very good blow. Uh, Rainer's going to try and find some reinforcements as they're moving across the map to try and buy himself a little bit of time, trying to go for pickoffs and just segmenting Oliveira's attention around. He's able to find a couple of these siege tanks on the reinforcements map, but the Liberator continuing to pick off workers. Rainer's actually fallen, not just a lot of hatcheries, he's down to 62 workers as well. Yeah, that's not very comforting. He's also been behind an upgrade, and that will continue to be the story as uh, Oliveira's 3-3 hits about halfway point. The Lings have done more damage than they should. That was really not that run big of a run by, but okay, there we go. Finally, collecting the right amount of units there for Oliveira, who also continues to be aggressive with harassment. He did read that he has to evacuate, and I think that was a great read. Mm -hmm. He kind of lost momentum there with the run by doing a bit of damage. He knows that Rainer had time to rebuild an army, so he goes back on the defense. Uh, this kind of feels like it's becoming a bit of a do-or-die situation for Rainer as he took so much damage on the other side of the map. He's pulling and abducting two of these sea shanks, so that's a good set of pickoffs here. He did manage to reestablish, uh, I think, no, he hasn't reestablished any of the hatcheries that he lost, but he is at least establishing new bases in the top, right? I guess he was on a lower work account in the first place, so it's uh, gonna take some time to replenish the workers to actually then build the bases to take advantage of them. Yeah, uh, the only thing I think Oliveira could have done to even further that uh, particular blow was, was do a drop, uh, as there are a couple of bases that are vulnerable. He tries, actually, as I speak about it, and then, of course, it's been a while, Rainer has the presence of mind to be like, okay, need to prepare for this, so uh, drops now are not gonna be as effective. Oh, okay, so Rainer is going to hold. He's gonna recover, he's gonna start his upgrades. Oliveira, though, he was in a great position behind that attack. You know, his fourth wasn't even a planet, so he didn't even catch that. He leaves it as an orbital. That'll stop it from helping out defensively, but he could lift it against Banelings. It's giving him mules, it's giving him scans. It shows confidence. Mm -hmm. And I actually like when Terrans do it on this map, because that is often where they can also be pushing from. So in a way, they're already kind of defending their base. Yeah. Do you feel like we want to see any kind of transition points here from Raynor? He has the Viper, so he has some of that hive tech involved, uh -huh. but it is still just Ling, Roach, Ravager, and a couple of Banelings. Well, I think less Roach, right? You don't, like, Roaches kind of suck. Yeah. So That's a lot of his army right now. Yeah, he probably wants to get rid of those, either turn them into Ravagers or just use them as a run by. Mm -hmm. But I don't mind, like, I don't think he needs to go into Lurkers and Ultras and Brute Lords. Uh, perhaps if the game continues going this way. But Oliveira, 
with the macro was already on his way to Ghost. Right now, I think he needs an okay number of Ghosts, nothing extreme, mm -hmm. but really just to add to his army, get the EMPs and a couple of cheeky snipes. Yeah, a couple of cheeky snipes can definitely help out as it works versus pretty much every Zerg unit out there. <laughs> All pretty biological. But uh, we are going to be seeing a drop overlord Ooh. started up here. Six or five of them from Rainer. He's also going to be trying to push back this Terran force, ensuring that there are no easy bases to establish. But I am very curious to see where this is going to be going. I like this as the kind of bad units drop, <laughs> the approaches in particular. Like, I actually think this is great. A Nidus Swarm is no guarantee, especially as it's been done for a year plus at this point. Terrans are kind of good at, at figuring out when it's time, when it's like, oh, it's a late game. I guess we're going to do Nidus Swarm. Oh, I'm a Zerg. But now it's overload drops. And those you can't really stop just because you find it and you have one unit on top of it, right? So I, I like this addition in this tournament, really. I feel like he's been seeing it more and more in Katowice. And it seems like Oliveira also seems to like it because he's getting up the missile turrets as this drop is heading his way. We'll see if those are going to actually be able to make much of a difference, though, because those overlords, they're, they're pretty tanky, actually. Ooh. They can probably unload at least a handful of these, if not a majority of the units here first. Yeah, I like the idea of missile turrets, but with that many overlords, it's not going to stop them. That might even been more for like anti-overlord like spotters, but either way it's gonna work out. One Viper did die prior to this engagement. There's another one going down actually. It's only one more left over. Rainer gonna try and break the front lines. This is not all of Oliver's army, but it is going to send him back further from the line that was drawn here. Yeah, even though you can look at this and say this probably wasn't a cost-efficient trade for Rainer, he is pushing Oliver back like you were saying. He is preventing him oh. to take additional bases and oh, the ghost, okay. Cloak, personal cloaking is going to save the day for those ghosts, but uh, does get a little bit dangerous if you get them too far out there. Looks like the drops also did manage to get cleaned up over there. Rainer able to take a bit of an economic advantage. If you can see that reflected a bit in the mineral income, but he is spending a lot of his gas having to remake a lot of those units he was losing. Yeah, about a thousand more minerals a minute, I believe, is what those errors mean. Ling run by, very effective, but is pure Ling when you know that tanks are basically what's trying to stop them. So getting a couple of tanks, getting into the SCV line is nice. It's a good old fashioned late game TVZ on Gresfon. Both players trying to take the map. Both players trying to find some harassment. Although Oliveira, <laughs> a little, little less so right now. He is really quite much more so focusing on continuing the leapfrog. If he gets this space as a planetary, mm -hmm. Rainer's going to be sweating. Yep. And uh, Rainer's making this as difficult as possible. This overall or this command center really having a hard time landing. Ultra is going to be backing up these banelings as the siege tank line is going to get obliterated. But here come out the snipes. One of the ultras ends up falling. Another ultra gets low, but the banelings chasing after these ghosts. The ghosts can take a lot of banelings, but <laughs> there are just so many of them. They almost end up dying, but they don't quite. Yeah, that split the last second was really nice. That stopped about three or four ghosts from dying on their last hit point. Uh, Chaos in the main base, as you can see, was also distracting all of their he is starting to struggle, guys. Rainer has built up that Zerg economy. That Zerg presence on the map is relentless in his aggression. Oliver's attempt to take, I guess this would be like a sixth or something like that, has not been successful, and it's starting to actually hurt him. Mm -hmm. I'm actually looking at the map, Zombie Grab, and this is the thing about Gresman, is if the Zerg is expanding as fast as Rainer did, if the Zerg is able to mine at the rate that Rainer has, I mean, he's already mining from all the bases he was supposed to take. He's taking now the base that's actually rather close to Oliveira. I'm actually starting to wonder if he's just going to be able to take one more base in a mined out map situation than Oliveira will. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's a good thing to remember as we start to run out of bases. We're not quite there yet, mm -hmm. but something to keep in mind, especially if Oliveira does keep holding on. Oliveira can't really figure out how to deal with these overlord drops, by the way. There's no way to just completely shut them down. Uh, and we'll think about that in a second as we do have more aggression from Rainer. Yep. These banelings are going to be coming on in. Blinding Cloud's also thrown down on top of one of the siege tanks. The Ultra is getting in on top of all these units. The Ghosts are so far behind. They are finally here to throw out a couple of those snipes. Two Ultralists go immediately pop. Yeah, that actually wasn't good at all, really. You know, we're looking at Rainer's Mineral Bank. That's fine, man. Mm -hmm. The Gas Bank is not. Uh, the Ultras coming through here at the last second all alone are going to get easily sniped. That's not a big deal. And Oliveira uh, finally, again, <laughs> cleaning up his main base. He's been really insistent on upgrades. So he's got 332 and is working on plus three. Uh, I believe he's actually got all of his commands that are upgrades as well. So Oliveira is set up very nicely for the late game. For Rainer, it is about worrying about the Remax, the Banelings, uh, the Ultras, the Gas units, right? Yeah. Our wonderful observer, Mapu, also showing us that there are a lot of gas guys just not taken, actually, right now Good for point. Rainer. So 
he is hurting on the gas tank. I think it's a really good point that he has 92 workers. He can afford to probably take more of those gas geysers. I don't want to fault him too much because he has been continuously throwing out these kind of attacks and his attention may be in these kind of locations, but that may come back to haunt him because the earlier you can mine those bases out, it also makes it less of a point of contention that, oh no, if you lose this ground, it's not as bad a big of a deal if it's already mined out. Yeah, exactly. We'll talk more about that in a second. Rainer is just trying to find an opening with all of these Ling Baneling Ultra attacks. The Ghost running once again, gonna go for a little split. He is so good at splitting the Banelings. Even if they kill the Ghost, if they kill one Ghost at a time, it's really not efficient. And Oliveira does dip down in supply, but stops the Lings from reaching his main base, making it so that he can hopefully get back on his front line but this is the trick, man. Oliveira cannot get settled on this base that Rainer is attacking. That is pretty much what Rainer feels like is pinning a lot of his entire points and hopes on this game for, is that he's denying that base. If Oliveira is able to get up that base, then a, suddenly a lot of the inefficient trades that Rainer has been going for are going to start making a lot less sense. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to touch on the gas, right? Very purposefully, Zergs will stay on a lower gas count because they wanted just to have that big mineral income. They were going to be remaxing very quickly on almost mm -hmm. pure Ling Baneling. This guy had two extra macro hatcheries very early on in this game. But it can be you know, all too easy to forget that I want that comfortable bank too, or straight up forget to get gas geysers. Terran do the same thing. <laughs> it looks like Rainer is, is balancing that quite correctly as that continues to grow another attack from Rainer here. Yeah, but this time the Orbital Command is not forced to pick up. It's actually turning into a or uh, planetary fortress, excuse me. But the Lings on the other side are able to get some good damage on the Liberator, plus these Blue Flame Hellions trying to work away at the Lings, but the Supply Depot wall is going to at least get busted. Another one of these bases does get dislodged, so Rainer not denying the fresh base, but he is causing havoc in other locations. And that pulls the attention and the army away from the front. That is what Rainer is taking advantage of every single time. That planetary, it has taken forever to actually become a planetary. It finally fulfilled its life stream, and then it died. Mm -hmm. Very sad. But that is going to be another leapfrog attempt from Oliveira. Yeah. Oliveira now sitting at 150 or 160-ish supply. Still has a little bit of a bank and can still probably start remaking a lot of those units he was just losing after the rounds of production start to finish on up. But taking those new bases is still going to be something that he really, really wants to be able to do these links. Barely being able to sneak around that one siege tank, just going after the free damage they can find. A single supply depot, a single unguarded siege tank. Whatever Rainer can find, he is going to try and go for just to cause havoc for yeah. Oliveira. Exactly. It's really unfortunate that Oliveira couldn't get a higher Hellbat count, because I think that would have really helped him on some of these run buys. Well, another one of these massive, massive attacks comes swinging on forward, denying a lot of these SCVs from mining, but it's an orbital command this time. So this time the command center doesn't die. A lot of SCVs do, but I mean, Oliver can actually replace those. That time Rainer was kind of leading with mostly Banelings, which, you know, are easy enough to concave away from, well, easy for these guys, concave away from your tank's focus fire. So that wasn't really going to reach too far forward, but he also was maybe expecting that to be a planetary. And it's like, well, there's nothing yeah. to explode on it lifted. <laughs> yeah. It does make me kind of wonder if there's going to be any sort of, you know, unit composition switch up for some ah, yes. of these attacks because of that. Liberator <laughs> not able to get the damage done. It seems to run right on the spore. That was uh, unfortunate. I'm familiar with that Liberator plan that just like shift to it somewhere. Yeah. I don't care where. It's kind of on a base. <laughs> Terran players can't convince me. I know you don't micro your Liberators. <laughs> you guys aren't Clem. Yeah, it's uh, difficult, but he gets another one immediately on there because he does. He has to continue harassing. Rainer is looking to really hit the point of the Ling run buys, but here is a difference. Oliveira finally got those Hellbats up. Now, Hellbats is part of your main army. I'm not necessarily convinced of, but we're not here to technically theorycraft. But as far as helping tanks deal with particularly Ling, only Ling run buys, they're perfect for it. Mm -hmm. No, I actually really like that as a, a kind of response to exactly what Rainer's been Ooh. going for. Now, this little Blue Flame Hellion run by is going to be one thing, but this attack is once again going to be coming on in. Uh. The Aliens try to zone out the Ghost, but they don't actually do a very good job of it. And most of the SCVs survive a massive kind of loss of units, supply of everything for Rainer. Yeah, well, that was the same thing, but even kind of worse, yeah. right? That was even more Banelings that were off creep, not particularly near anything. So, Ooh. of course, Oliveira was going to split, was going to defend. The hatchery already low from all the Viper juicing up on it. And Rainer might be in more trouble than he ever 
never anticipated in this game. Yeah, it's definitely becoming pretty troublesome. A couple of these ghosts are going to get picked off inside the main base of Oliveira. I do want to note the engineering base did go down, so if he ever wants to make a planetary fortress again, he will need to remake those. But yeah, yeah, yeah. he doesn't need to right now because he was able to defend and establish that fresh base. Finally, at long last, in fact, he even fired back and took out one of the bases of Raynor. Yeah, and I love his use of blue flame run buys too. Like, why not? Especially mm -hmm. if he just realized he can defend uh, with the Hellbats and have extra Hellions. Like, yeah, absolutely. Rainer's also insisting on the Overlord drop, so these two really are trying to find everything from each other, right? The drone harassment, the building harassment. It's annoying for both sides, 100%. And this is uh, reminiscent of the second game, but in a larger scale where both players make sure to have something else. They're not just defending whatever their opponent's doing, mm -hmm. they're also doing something. Yeah, I think the concern is Rainer is dropping further and further in supply. He's been taking less efficient engagements, and he doesn't have a bank anymore, Zombie Grub. No, no, and once again, a, a, a big problem with the gas bank. Broodlords are coming out, guys, but only four of them is not particularly impressive. You know, if you get four against someone who's purely dependent on uh, Archons in a different matchup, well, <laughs> they can actually be pretty good, but no, not against someone who already has snipes. Broodlords are a bit faster, but uh, Broodlings are a bit worse. I, I just, in general, I'm not sure how this transition is going to really help Rainer. I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure what he's planning on doing with those Broodlords. This is going to be really tough. Uh, there is a big Ling attack on the south side, and most of the units for Oliveira are not really around this area. But, oh my god, these Blue Flame Hellions. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Massacre <laughs> drones, massacre Lings. Rainer is dropping heavily in supply. He is already kind of looking like he might actually be up against a hard wall. Yeah, the Blue Flame Hellbats are kicking ass as far as defense and the drone harassment goes. They are making me a believer in this. Oliveira also adding on a couple of Thors, realizing, I guess, how this game is going, adding on more technology. He made sure to rebuild the engineering base, too, so no worries about that planetary. Oliveira is just, he's doing so darn well. Every time that Rainer thought that he was in a comfortable position, and I would agree with it, he <laughs> tried to end the game, and he maybe even got close, but Oliveira just kept hanging on. Yeah, uh, just a few too many attempts there from Rainer to break that one base inefficiently, and it's finally come back all the way around and kind of, you know, bitten him in the butt. It seems like Oliveira, for the first time in a long time, is able to do some additional counter-aggression on the south side of the map. <laughs> He's been able to do a little bit on the north, but oh my god, those resources lost Zombie Grub. Yeah, I, uh, I wish we had checked earlier. That's our bad, actually, for not calling for it. But, you know, earlier on, it might have been a little bit smaller of a difference. Now it's insane. After all those banelings are thrown away, too, Rainer is at this point. So for about... 10 minutes of this game, Ling run by were genius. They were amazing. The drops, fantastic. Now, they just kind of feel a little more desperate. They're so effective, of course. We see two tanks taken out, but it's because he really has no other option. He kind of has to do the same thing while using whatever gas he accrues, which is very slow, to try and build what looks like the ultimate Broodlord army. It just, it's so slow going that it doesn't feel very scary. It's a Broodlord army versus a Terran player that is already on Mass Ghost, like you were saying, but has also been adding on all of these Thors. It seems like it's gonna be a very, very difficult engagement. Oliver even has a bit of a bank built up. He has better yeah. mining, just so many things are going better. All these lings are also dying for almost nothing. Yeah, uh, Rainer, I think he's kind of out of ideas. His idea, sorry, currently is to go for one big punch, mm -hmm. the biggest, best Zerg army possible. Again, so slow going, couldn't really think about it. Now the Brood Lord count is a little bit scarier. Nice snipe on the Viper, <laughs> definitely the high uh, target priority. EMP attempt as well on the Infestors. Rainer was trying to go for the perfect late game army. He's not there yet, guys. He's also down 50 supply. Yeah, the EMP also hit one of the Infestors of the two, so that's actually a lot less energy available for even fungal growths, neural parasites, what have you. Brutal's <laughs> actually getting taken out by not only the Thors, but the Ghosts and the Liberators, and there it is, GG. Oliveira brings us to an ace match. Oh, well done, Oliveira. So excited for that, as he should be. He is showing such brilliance in the matchup. The strategies for each individual map I was already impressed by. Then, after getting what you could argue is a bit of a strategic win on Neo Humanity, if you really wanted to boil down to that, the trickery kind of that, that Rainer almost did by himself. Okay, he gets that one. What about a game that's just about pure mechanics? A late game TVZ. Does Oliveira win that one? According to the beginning of all of all of this, the beginning of this best of five, to all of us, no, he doesn't win the mechanical battle because Rainer is better in that regard, even though Oliveira is great. And now we question, 
is Oliveira actually the better macro mechanical player? Honestly, Zombiegraf, the only way I can sum up the way that this series has gone is it is momentum. It is a pendulum that has been swinging slowly all the way from game number one where Rainer absolutely smacked Oliveira down in the first game strategically. And slowly but surely, game number two, Rainer looked better, but Oliveira was fighting back. Gradually, Rainer still ends up winning that, but we head into game number three, and Oliveira is just continuing to play better and better and leading up to game number four, where we tie it up two to two. Yeah, and that last game too, it's kind of forgot that initially it was Oliveira's first push out that really made you wonder if Rainer couldn't handle it. But then Rainer did. Rainer was doing mm -hmm. that thing where he looked a bit on, on the edge and then he comes back and he even looks dominant afterwards. And you go, oh, you no, know, it's no problem. Rainer's doing the Rainer thing. Uh, no, apparently not. Could not figure out how to break Oliveira's defense, uh, especially, I think in particular, when the blue flame really started to work out. I think before that, when the Hellions were still Hellions, they were still being rallied, they couldn't transform and just stick, like stay. Mm -hmm. That's where Rainer looked like he was about to snowball. But once those Hellbats started to help out all the siege units, it just felt like Rainer couldn't really get the best fights. Then he wanted to go to super aggressive A move off of creep into a Terran that was clearly well sieged and ready to go. And then just his backup plan um, was too late and also maybe wasn't even really something he believed in. Because if he believed in a perfect Broodlord, Infester, Viper, whatever army, why didn't he do it back when he had a huge bank and a lot of momentum, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's different reasons for that. I want to be clear. Sometimes mm -hmm. the, the Zergs do want to wait till the game does shrink a little bit more, where it's more of, you know, we're fighting for these two bases, let's go. Uh, but just in general, I think Raynor was surprised by just how much he could not kill the guy, however yeah. way you want to put it. I think it's a really, really great way of phrasing it. And uh, it gives me some concerns for game number five for both sides, because I think that still Rainer has shown that his early game can still be pretty strong, that kind of early mid game as well. But Oliveira has been turning it up notch after notch. Have we finally hit 10 or is there an 11? We head into Babylon for game number five, the deciding map to see who is gonna move on to the semifinals, Zombie Grub. Yes, indeed. We didn't expect to get this far, but here it is. Babylon for the deciding map. We know that you guys love him, but you got to cheer for him now, man. He's about to let this go. Or can he become, once again, that comeback kid, that comeback king? In the top left for Kaizy Gaming, he is Raider! Down here at the bottom right-hand side of the map, we have our blue Terran player. I know a lot of you guys were fans of Rainer before this series, but I hope a lot of you are fans of this young man now. From Kaizy Gaming, he is Oliveira. This could be the story of the upsets. Already in the groups, we had a couple of surprising results. We thought maybe things would be easier to read as we headed into not just the playoff bracket, but also the best of fives, where we determine, uh, I guess we, we often say, is where the better player will really win. Mm -hmm. Best of one, anything can happen. Best of three, there's still a couple of question marks. Best of five, no. If you win this one, you are the better player, at least for that tournament. Yeah. It has been a fascinating event so far. 2023, year of Hearthstone. Oh, Believe yeah. It. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on board. I'm on board. Yeah. You know. uh, we also saw Hearthstone talking to Rainer, of course, yeah. during that uh, little break there. He's like, okay, dude, Broodlords are great against Archon. like, <laughs> He's a Terran player. <laughs> Get out of here, mate. No, it actually, honestly, like, I mean, I, I have not been in the position of, of ever being, you know, a coach. Um, of course, I've been coached, but um, I wonder if he just kind of went and was like, "Hey, what do you what do you think? You know, like, can you can you kind of explain to me what's happening?" Because Rainer was definitely gesturing, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> like Terran was basically like the me and with the hands up. Um, and then he just kind of like talks him and like kind of calms him down. I think that's all really sometimes a person needs in a competitive environment is just to someone to say like hey you got this like mm -hmm. tell me what, what's the problem what do you think you're going to do about it um because certainly i don't think harson thinks he has the, the answer to what has been yeah. happening here because really in a long game like that there is no one particular answer i think it's a really good point and sometimes exactly what you're saying even if it is talking about some of the strategy as okay that drone getting really low on hit points but rainer will defend as he does 
Um, but yeah, sometimes in these situations, it is just about calming down. Even someone of the caliber of the experience, such as Rainer, you can get stressed out in these situations. You can feel the pressure of being in this situation where you were supposed to win 3-0 potentially, mm. and then suddenly your opponent starts reverse sweeping you. All of the momentum has effectively left you right beneath your feet. Yeah. You're kind of figuring out, okay, how do I reset? And yeah, having a coach or someone to talk to like that can sometimes be the most helpful thing in the world. Absolutely. And of course, even with our own cast, right? We've gone from saying, Oliveira, sorry, man, you're the underdog. We're gonna just talk about how Rainer's a global champion. Yeah. Now it's like, well, Rainer needs someone to help him. <laughs> he needs to be calmed down. That is a really, really fascinating way to look at it, but you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. Uh, she's, so, a, she's out of line, but she's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we see uh, Rainer got a scout, right? Now that's a sometimes disturbing scout for the Terran who might have wanted, and you know, you hope you never get scouted, of course, in, in any game of StarCraft. Uh, but then also, too, that it's it's too late for them to swap their builds. I, I don't think Rainer is going to bet his game five on a Roach attack, even if it theoretically would make sense, though. Mm -hmm. I just I just don't. I Especially because there's still that chance that Oliveira goes for Banshees and specifically looks for the push, which is a big one. Yeah, I think Rainer is just going to say, okay, I know it's not that cheeky. Mm -hmm. I'm going to super macro. And uh, I think that will be fine, but we haven't even really touched on the maps or talk about the situation yeah. so much. Babylon, uh, one of the shorter maps in the map pool, I think Oliveira would generally be happy about this being his final map. Yeah, it's really interesting because I mostly agree with you on that, and Terran players should usually like when the maps are a little bit smaller. But I, I think kind of interestingly, one thing that was scary about that last game was that Oliveira did such a great job in the big split map situation on Gresvin. In some ways, I actually like the idea that Rainer can kind of guarantee, like, it's not going to look like Gresvin. I get Like, you. it's going to be very difficult to look like Gresvin. No, you're right, actually. That's a good point. And, you know, smaller maps, it kind of goes down to momentum stays really hard to the person who has it. If it flips, it flips really hard. So, yeah, if Rainer thinks that he can get into the position where he was last game, uh, where he was just, you know, he was very fine on economy, he was throwing down units, uh, wave after wave, Maybe that would, with the shorter distance, the different map terrain, would actually work this time. But this is all theory crafting. Right now, we have Oliveira going for actually Cloak <laughs> this time. So he even might be a little more aggressive with these Banshees, just initially. I don't think you really expect too much from Banshees, honestly, against the Pro Zergs. But they, do, they definitely do uh, safeguard you. And then Rainer, um, they actually made a decent amount of Lings. Yeah. Huh. They started Ling production fairly early on as well. Maybe just being extra cautious about the Hellions, making sure that they don't do it too much. I mean, we do have to go back to the very beginning of this series to actually talk about how Rainer was really respecting the potential of Oliveira to put on that early pressure, and he was cutting drones even at the very beginning of this series. Can we get another check on what Rainer has scouted in the main base? As we see the Banshees, they're gonna actually micro this and maybe take it out. Interesting. Now we saw the tech lab and the, and the, the fact that it is Banshees. See, I would expect Banelings to be formed at this stage for, for Zergs when they are expecting something a little bit earlier, basically, in an attack. Um, but that was full committal to a 1-1-1 is, is how I'm oh, going to put dude. that. The barracks aren't going to be down particularly fast. The Queen was in trouble. As I said, the Banshees were going to be a little more aggressive. They went right towards the fourth base, too, which I think is a really good move. Still want to keep them alive. They're great for later spotters, but they're actually finding some damage. They're making yeah. Rainer scramble a bit. I mean, it's not even just the six workers. He actually managed to get a cancel on the fourth, which I think only just recently restarted. So it took a while to actually get that going again. Really, really nicely done. Uh, this is, I mean, you were talking about before, you don't expect too much damage from Banshees, usually against the Pro Zergs. This is a lot more damage than you'd expect. Yeah, absolutely. It lasted a long time, too, literally from mm -hmm. bottom left to top left uh, of Babylon. So, you know, it doesn't seem like it's all that big of a deal, and it's kind of not. I think a lot of other things in this game will determine what's really happening, but that, I would be very happy uh, if I was Oliveira. I'd, I'd ex <laughs> that was more than I would expect. Uh, but anyways, the Banshees will return home, so that's also a really good point about it. The Hellions are here. The Armory is going to finish for the upgrades, of course, but that also means that Oliveira's first attack is going to come with Hellbats. Yes, it is. 
and he is going to be hitting in from the south side where that hatchery was cancelled recently and only just recently finished. Link counterattack is going to be able to snag, I think, a building command center? It, it got cancelled. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's actually not a super big deal. All there is clearly planning ahead for these run buys. Two Banshees, once again helping, also a tank on the high ground. Really nice. It means that there's no, there's not two tanks here, though. That, that is something to point out. Only one, but super safe with all the Hellbats surrounding it. Oh, yes. It is going to be very difficult to try and get any kind of backstab on that. Banelings are going to be somewhat on creep. They're half on creep, but they don't have Baneling speed. So Oliver has a lot of time to react, pulls back up into the Medivacs, unloads again, sims forward to try and get some chip damage on that hatchery. To snipe up any Banelings, good uh -oh, target fire. Uh -oh, uh -oh. Covering down all of the Banelings except for one. Here come the rest of them, though. Yeah, that's uh, still no Banelings speed. Now, that's enough Banelings, and I'm not sure you can actually target fire that, but time is going to try. Oh, Barrel with the Banelings snipes. Thinks he can actually do this. Ew, that was very, very close, but not only two left over. Absolutely, Rainer is in trouble. That hatchery in more trouble than he expected with the tank so far away, not actually, you know, hitting stuff at those Marines. Rainer might have thought that he had this, but Rainer now in trouble as the Hellbats even decide that they can come forward. Unbelievable. Hydras are going to be also joining the fray. They're going to be able to help push back the Medivacs as well. We're seeing reinforcements come in as the two Banshees and a lot of Marines are making their way across the map. More Sea Shanks also come to reinforce. Rainer is on the back foot. He's evacuating the drones, but Oliver is not going for the base. He is oh. going straight up to the third. Oh, it's not over yet, but man, if Oliver does this, the year of upsets, both of our global champions for Katowice out of the equation. Can it be done? Rainer is scrambling. He's on his back foot. He's trying to defend. The Bailey numbers do not look that great. The creep is still there, but where is the Zerg army? It's not coming in from any particular angle either, and actually the Hydras are kind of blocking the Banelings. They're not doing so hot as far as Zerg goes. Help your buddies out, man. And Raider needs to think of something else here. Ooh, Siege Tanks all on Siege as the Lings were looking to go for a potential counterattack or some sort of flank. It looks like it's going to be a counterattack. He's going to try and divert the attention of Oliveira. Oliveira is taking this a little bit slower, but the reinforcements are coming in in waves. They're not just rallying straight across the map. Oh! Marines, though, it looks like Rainer effective with the counterattack swing. He diverts the attention of Oliveira, gets some beautiful Baneling connections. No, that's exactly what it was. He just was distracted. The Banelings got those connections desperately needed for Rainer, who really needed to get this monkey off his back, man. He's got Hive on the way. His upgrades are going to be abysmal in just three seconds. Rainer holds you guys, but the game is certainly not over. Yeah, 2-2 two -two is going to finish up here for Oliveira, but Rainer's own 2-2 two -two is not too far behind. During all of this, I want to note is that Rainer somehow also still, despite how scary it looked, got up to around 87 workers, now up to 92 workers. He has hit, he's, okay, I was going to say he's hit that magical drone number, but he's still adding on three more. So Rainer is going to be in a very comfortable economic position as long as he can reestablish any of those bases that he was losing before. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, that's uh, the, really when the dust finally settles, Rainer does have uh, a playground. You know, he's got something to work with. A uh, creep spread is continuing to the middle of the map. Still worrisome on some of the attack points to the bottom left, but Oliveira, he's actually not going to go to the bottom left. He's going to the top right, going to abuse one of those angles for the tanks there. Picks up his drop, of course, and now we get ourselves into a, yet another late game. But as you were saying, a very different map for it. Yeah, very, very different map in terms of the layout and how the engagements can actually shake out. And you were talking about how it's just a smaller map as well. We are going to be seeing Rainer trying to hit in on the south side with Ling, Bane, Ling, Hydra. And north side, we got Ling, Bane, Ling, Hydra to help defend as well. Ooh, 3-3 is already on the way. Oliveira has such a nice economy, but so does Rainer if he can hold yet again. Without that creep spread, though, it is going to be difficult. The tank's going to get some nasty shots on the Ling Baneling as Liberators do bypass the spores. And they're getting a lot of drones, certainly denying the mining in the bottom left. Rainer is trying to soak up, uh, I think, some juice on Vipers before he really wants to engage, but he doesn't really have so much of a surround. Oh, yes, he does, actually. He's got the other attack going. The tanks are not siege. He's going to pull the trigger. He's going to try and get Oliveira to back away once again, and it looks like we effective even without the Vipers. Yeah, gets a full what? cleanup on that north side, but the reinforcements come in from the south, and Rainer is going to be running a little bit lighter on Banelings. He still has enough to work with for now, but still needs to replenish a lot of the Lings also that were dying before. Even the Vipers, they have energy, but they need to get into the right spot. There's an abduct on a siege tank, a critical move. And one thing Oliver is not doing is transitioning. He is just pure pedal to the metal for Marine Tank, and he's hoping those upgrades will finally kick in. They are dangerously close to doing so as he's gotten rid of the creep spread, and now he has the high ground. Rainer identifies that he cannot hold right here. He's already lost so many drones. He's going to have to give up a base. He is scrambling to hold on to this game, to hold on to his Katowice run, but Oliver is supply. He's looking so good at this matchup, and when 3-3 kicks in, that supply is going to dominate.
Oliveira is seeming to get so much momentum in his favor, but he's gonna have to defend these units. Siege Tank does get picked off. Blind Cloud also thrown down. Oliveira stims forward. He's gonna use that stim to just clean up creep spread as much as possible. Continue to push Rainer back. Rainer is down. Almost 40 supply, and Oliveira is on his front door. Oliveira. Oh, he's coming in. He saw Ragnarok doing. He's like, I could do it too, man. I know I can. The play here, the best of five setup was beautiful. The marine pressure, the micro was so fantastic. And the way that he plays this matchup out is superior today. Rainer has one more chance to hold, but his army supply is not looking good. Rainer is running out of time. He is running out of units. He's running out of bailings, and it's getting more and more desperate. Oliver is doing so much better in resources lost right now. And he's being so patient about this. Look at this spread of Terran. He is being so patient. I don't know what Rainer is thinking he's gonna do against this. He could try and go around the map, but then that's when Oliveira would pull the trigger and just go ahead and, and go after his bases, right? His reinforcements points. That's not really gonna work out here. He is just trying to figure this out. No doubt trying to really use all of his brain power to think, how in the world can I make this better? We see the collapse of rocks <laughs> on Babylon actually used, guys. Brilliant there from Oliveira. I was like, hey, I could actually cut off another attack point. I'm not gonna get surrounded at all here. Even gonna see Jeff Liberator on it to just slow down the high just a little bit. It's not going to do too much. It does get picked off there, but it buys himself a little bit of time. The rocks are still there and still technically defended for a bit. Yeah, I think Rainer might regret not being able to kill those rocks earlier on, but that's the thing. He couldn't get around to it. Mm -hmm. Oliveira's pressure has been very consistent, and Rainer knows that he is in a lot of trouble. Going to go for a run by, but look at the reinforcements for Oliveira. They're going to be able to intercept this with the superior upgrades as well. Rainer knows that he's running out of chances. He's running out of options. There's no Hail Mary here. He's going to try and get to Lurker but Oliver can absolutely get to Ghost. That necessarily won't be uh, a deal breaker for Oliver's push. Rainer just lost its fifth base. Oliver is ahead on bases against a Zerg player. This is getting more and more dire as the game goes on. Rainer about to potentially be eliminated. Can this be the knockout punch from Oliveira? The abducts come forward on the sea shakes. A lot of them unseed. Is this enough here from Rainer? Oliveira, he's taking care of most of the blings and the bailings. He's charging on forward. He's done it, man. Rainer knows that he's sinking back in his chair. Oliveira, 180 supply, moving in to Rainer's reinforcement line. Rainer doesn't want to give up. It's his last chance in Katowice. He wanted to lift the trophy in front of a crowd, but yet again, he is going to be denied. Oliver, he is doing it. We can see it in Rainer's face. We can see it in the hatchery going down. We can see it in the Marines tearing apart the base of Rainer. He will not be denied. His time has come, and he is ready to move on to the semifinal, sitting up now 70 supply over his opponent. It would have to be one colossal throw, honestly, if Oliver is going to let this one out of his hands. <laughs> yeah. just, that's the best way to put it, right? And Rainer, he, th he thinks there's a 1% chance he's going to try, but here come the ghosts, and that is when he knows for a fact the Lurk transition is not going to work. There's no other options, Rainer. The Lings aren't even able to take care of tanks that are relatively undefended. That is going to be it. Oliveira is going to move on in IEM Katowice. A semi-finals appearance from our young Chinese Terran player. An unbelievable performance, shutting up all of the haters, shutting up all of the doubters, showing that he truly is one of the best StarCraft II players in the world right now. Absolutely, top four. He can't even believe it. He said it yesterday in his interview that he just it doesn't feel real. He can't believe he's already made it this far and he just made it farther. He actually came back from a 2-0 deficit. He stuck to his build plan he stuck to what he knew he was good at, and then he showed us that he is actually better than Rainer. We have to flip the script for that one. But let's go ahead and send it to the desk so they can talk more about this brilliant TVZ. Absolutely unbelievable. I wanted to make a where is the Zerkabal joke now, but this was the series of Oliveira's Times Life. This is him moving on to the round of four. Pig, Roddy with me here to talk about this one. I. 
I'm feeling a little bit emotional right now, Roddy. <laughs> this was an amazing game coming out from time. Emotional for various reasons. You see the happiness on time's side, you see the heartbreak on Rainer's side, but holy smokes. We can forever <laughs> stop talking about that series that Oliveira played against Serral many years ago. We always <laughs> bring that one up. It's like, oh, that was a really good series. Yes. This was the best best of five of this man's life. Not just a reverse sweep, but he got so close to winning that second game. One bailing prevents him from winning that second game. Oh. And to then be mentally strong enough to keep it together, play an amazing game three, four, and five. Holy smokes, man, a standing ovation. We all wonder why the hell did he change his name? Well, apparently time was good, but Oliveira is a whole lot better. Yeah. Fantastic. He evolved. I mean, I actually completely forgot about that one bailing because of game four. How much game four stuck in my mind the way it did, Pig? Just talk to me about the series. It was magical. The first game, he went in there. He did a clever strategy. Reyna hard counted it, shut him down. Super one-sided. That is a terrible way psychologically yes. to start a series. The second map, things were not going well. He no. was so, so down. And he did uh, just an amazing multi-prong. That beautiful Marine push that got right up into the base. And he was, like you said, one baneling away from actually getting that game. You lose those two games in a row, surely your spirit's broken, you're crushed, yeah. you're going to give up. Apparently not. I, I mean, the way that series started made those last three games even more perfect. The defense on Gresfin, thousands of Zerglings going down for Constantly. Absolute. The Ling drops, there's 14 Ling drops in his main. He defended them perfectly. Roddy, Roddy, you, how many Lings was it that he lost on that game? Close to 1,100, I believe. <laughs> on game three, I think oh close to 1,100 Zerglings died. Uh, or no, that was on Grass 1, that is. Yeah, not that's what you're talking about, yeah. But it's what Pig said, man. Like, first game, you kind of get bobbed. You're like, okay, I had a build, LT2, difficult map. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Then second game, it's not going well, but out of nowhere, because he was just controlling his units up to perfection he gives himself a chance he gets so close you can see the finish line and one bailing shuts down your dreams to then have the mental strength to still be in the series <laughs> yeah. down 0-2 against the guy that's an overwhelming favorite according to all the stats and all the experts uh, that is uh, actually fantastic. I, that is by far and away the best thing that he has done in his already impressive Starcraft 2 career. Yes, yes. But this is so big, man. Not just for t uh, for Oliver our time, but it's this big for the entire Chinese scene. Definitely so. I I am at the point where I'm like, this is shaping up to be one of my favorite tournaments of all time. The games keep delivering. It is absolutely awesome. Thanks, guys. We're going to actually head on over to the stage now. We need to hear from Time. He's moving on to the round of four. Thank you very, very much, Kolaris, and congratulations, Oliveira. It's uh, amazing to see your journey. You told me that this was like a dream come true to make it to the playoffs. How does it feel to keep your dream alive and make it to the round of four for the first time here in Katowice? I mean, I still feel not true, you know? Like, like you and yesterday, I lose to Ragnarok with uh, I lose to Ragnarok 0-2. Uh, uh, I think maybe I'm finished. I should go home. Yeah, I should change my flight to back home. But yeah, like, I just tell me, yeah, it's like dream, my dream. I think there's nothing more beautiful than that. And in watching this series, it was so great to watch because you had such phenomenal play, such great control and micro. Even on map number two, you were very, very behind. We thought it was all but over, but you almost came back. You, you almost attacked and, and almost made Rainer sweat. Tell us, what were you thinking in map two? I mean, he's really fast because like I hear he always play with climb. And like when I'm behind, I just see any countdown. And I just micro game like before we practice, and I still can win. Just calm down. Well, when you were down 0 and 2, and you're looking at the rest of the games, you had to win three maps in a row. How were you able to stay calm? I know you knew you had to calm down, but that's a very hard thing to do. Not only did you stay calm, you showed perfect control in in, in the late game when it got there. You showed perfect control. How are you able to do that? I mean, like when I lose zero two, and I just I go to it and just tell me, it doesn't matter when or lose, and I love Starcraft too, and I enjoy this game, I enjoy this stage, and I just say, just play like you practice. And I'm done. 
I know you're happy about the round of four, but there's one thing that's better than the round of four, and that is the grand finals. Uh, but in order to get there, you play either hero or dark. What are your thoughts on hero or dark? I mean, I already semi-final, right? So I don't care. <laughs> I don't care who I come. Love that answer for now. Congratulations once again to Oliveira. He is through to the round of four here at Katowice. Thank <laughs> you. 
Intel Extreme Masters, Katowice, is brought to you by Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. Welcome back, wall to wall amazing games, and we're not even halfway done with the final day here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. My name's Kalaris, your host. I, I need to still catch my breath after what we've just witnessed. I've got Pig, I've got Fear Dragon here. A quick thought from you, Fear Dragon. This was just, what a series. This was magical. It's just a, it's just been a strange day, James. Yeah. I don't know how to feel about both Raynor and Cyril being knocked out before we get to the finals. It oh, feels really yeah. weird, but at the same time, I'm in incredibly hyped that we had two underdogs who did it who have been so hyped with their play yeah it's been it's been really good and i don't think it's going to slow down any time soon let's move on to our next match because i don't think we have too much time before we even get to it it is going to be hero going up against dark here are the remaining protoss player here pig and for all intents and purposes a lot of people a lot of pundits are rating him as one of the big favorites to make it all the way to that final and maybe even win it Absolutely. Uh, even before the tournament started, you know, I've been feeling it for Hero. You add some new maps, some little changes to the balance here in there. And of course, you factor in that he is the Chaos Master. He's a guy who loves mm. new environments with lots of chances for his creativity to thrive. He's been dominating the online circuit lately, with the exception of Beyond getting the better of him. But of course, Beyond's out of the tournament, so he's lucky. He doesn't have to worry about that anymore. But other than that, Hero has just been smashing. He's so damned good. And I feel like he's really excited for this one because the last map pool was meant to be hard against a lot of those Terran pushes and he had an amazing finals at Atlanta versus Bunny where yes, he really pulled yes. out all the stops to survive and win that four to three and I think it's that tournament attitude and experience that puts him in really good stead here. Fear Dragon, your thoughts coming in? Uh, it's such an interesting one because as Pig was saying, like there's a nice history and stuff, especially between these two players, especially for Dark coming into this event. But for me, I think the two things that really come to mind were one, his series versus Creator yesterday, where he had a very action-packed series. He came out in the end, but as everyone remembers, that was in no way a dominant series from Dark. That was a very close series. It was extremely hectic, and I think one of the uh, one of the recurring themes also was that Dark seemed like he was not always playing 
perfectly, which, of course, Definitely we don't not. expect anyone to play perfectly. It's it's an unfair <laughs> expectation, but it did seem like Dark was playing less than he would normally play. And yeah. he goes yeah. up against the what's considered the best Protoss player in the world right now. Yeah, that series was a bit of an emotional roller coaster pick uh, for, for yeah. us watching, for Dark eventually being able to get the victory. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts for Dark coming well, in? Well, I really like the way I was, was chatting to it with Roddy earlier, uh, and he was like, you know, Dark's really good at dragging his opponent down to his level and then beating them there. <laughs> like, like, he can play the a messy fight. game. You think this isn't perfect, but he drags them into this weird place and he's so experienced in the scrappy games, which is why he's able to perform well. Problem here, Hero's even scrappier than Dark is. You drag him into a dark, weird mud wrestle he's match. He's okay with this. He's just like, okay, yeah. no worries, dude. Hero loves chaotic situations. He's very good at it. Between these two, you get uh, games where when Hero is winning, it's a lot of fainting, getting Dark on the, the defensive, and then transitioning into the macro game while Dark's paranoid and stuck on Roach Hydra. On the other yeah, hand, yeah. when Dark beats Hero, it's about Nidus Worms sneaking into his main base and Link Queen popping out. Scary. It's about the old five minute Link Bane bust. <laughs> Dark does a lot of classical wins he's been using for a while, but he's a master of disguising them. This is all about Hero figuring out when those all-ins are coming. Mm -hmm. If he can block them, he should be the favorite to win this match. Thank you, boys. Now time to go to our final round of eight match, and then we move on to those round of fours. Are we going to have more upsets? I mean, is it even an upset if Hero or Dark wins this? I'm not sure, but let's get to it here. The final round of eight. For our final round of eight, James, we have an amazing set of two players with a whopping 15 titles between them. They have won everything there is to win, from BlizzCon to GSLs to SSLs to Intel Extreme Masters. The list does not stop, and yet it is this trophy that eludes the both of them. For our Protoss and Zerg player, which one of them will be moving forward to play Oliveira in the semifinals? Please welcome on stage, it is Hero and Dark! For now, the Hydra's coming forward, but Hero's army is melting everything. Creator is devastated, and it seems that it will be Dark who's moving into the quarterfinals to meet his teammate Hero. It is time for our final quarterfinals here at IEM Katowice 2023, and what a game we've got coming up. Hero facing off against Dark in a best of five series. My name is Loco, I'm joined here by Rotterdam. Roddy, what do you think of this? The final quarterfinals to determine our top four this edition of the Intel Extreme Masters 2023. And what a round of quarterfinals has it been so far. We kick the day off with Maru winning against Solar. People, like, yeah, kind of expected that. Pretty crazy upset with Ragnarok getting the best of Sarah on the ZVZ. And then we just had Oliveira playing legitimately the best best of five of his career. A reverse sweep. I almost want to say it doesn't get much better than that, but I hope that these two guys from Dragon Phoenix Gaming can give us another amazing best of five. And I do feel on paper, obviously, there's a lot of reasons to get very excited over this. Not just because Hero is the last Protoss in the tournament. Not just because Dark has won pretty much everything that he could have ever won in his career besides this tournament. But also just stylistically, man, both these guys like to be aggressive. They like to attack. So I'm pretty damn excited. Over the last couple of months, a lot of the players have been trying their best to hide their strategies. Guys like Raynor, guys like Serral, well, players you've seen in this tournament, they have not been showing a whole lot of their games. Not these two, however. Both Hero and Dark have been participating in a lot of the online tournaments, and they've played against each other quite literally dozens of times. They've played against each other so many times that Dark even mentioned that he's kind of scared of playing against Hero because they know each other so damn well. You know what's ultra cool after that previous series? It is now 100% confirmed that we will have a new IEM champion. Mm. Somebody will be lifting that IEM trophy that has never lifted the IEM trophy before. Uh, I mean, that's, it's going to that's be an crazy. amazing moment for one of these five players that is still left in this tournament. Now we will figure out who is going to be the final four. In the bottom left side, we are looking at the main base of the best Brodos player in the world. There is very little debate about that. Representing Dragon Phoenix Gaming, Katowice, make some noise for your hero.
We've got a quick little request here from Dark for a pause. I'm assuming we'll find out what that is all about in just a moment. Probably one of his settings that needs adjusting. Either way, this is going to be a very exciting match of StarCraft 2. Dark has been showing a lot of proxy hatcheries, not only in the online cups, but also in this particular tournament. He's been playing a lot of macro, a lot of timing attacks, and, well, hero. I mean, if I want to make a list of all the builds he's been playing over the last couple of months, I think I, uh, I don't have enough pieces of paper at home, man. He's been playing so many different styles and strategies. I think this is going to be an absolute banger. A lot of them do go back to being aggressive. Hero is just incredibly good in finding some damage in the early game, and he takes it from there. I do believe that we are good to continue. So go ahead, Loco, and introduce <laughs> your fellow Zerg nerd. Spotting right here in the top right hand corner of Royal Blood. That's map number one in this best of five series. Make some noise for Dark. A very messy performance yesterday in the round of 12, but a nail-binding one, and one that he did still manage to close out in the end. But basically, Zerklings, even though there were mm -hmm. Archons and Colossus, and of course, he had a couple Ravages and Roaches in the mix, but it was mostly the plus three links, sniping every single Nexus at a uh, just all-out counter-attack assault. And before Creator realized it, he lost every single main base, and Dark knew it. At that point, he had it in the back, because there was nothing that Creator could have done anymore. But don't think we're going to see another game quite like that, but there is a good chance that we will see Dark counterattacking quite a bit throughout this series, because Heroes is such an in-your-face kind of protos that it's often hard to fight his army straight up, because Hero knows his timings very well. But obviously, because he puts all of his eggs into the attacks, he's often quite vulnerable at home, and I'm very curious to see if Dark can exploit that. Hero, of course, has been watching those games as well, and he probably thinks of himself as uh, a little bit better than Mr. Creator overall. I've got a feeling that if Dark plays the way that he did yesterday against Creator, that Hero is looking at that series and he's like, you know what? I've got a very real chance at taking down Dark in a best of five series. There were a couple of uncharacteristic errors, a lot of overlords that came up. I think that in order to beat Hero here, Dark is gonna have to play a little bit tighter than he showed yesterday. Yeah, I think that Dark knows that as well, but he's also such a tournament veteran that he will just look at it in the end of the day. It doesn't really matter. Nobody remembers my games in the end of the day in the round of 12, or how close it was, or whether or not I played perfect StarCraft. That man only wants one thing, and that is to lift the trophy at the end of his journey, and he has done that before. He lifted the BlizzCon trophy, so I, I think he can get over it as long as he can get the job done today. And it's obviously a brand new day. Maybe maybe he just wasn't quite feeling it yesterday. Mm -hmm. There is a chance, obviously, all of these pro gamers are human. Some of them have pretty much only amazing days, but even a guy like Dark is allowed to have an off day, and I guess the real champs still get the job done, even on the off days. Standard openers here from both players. Hero opting to go for that Stargate that he's been playing so well over the last couple of years. He's been favoring a lot of Oracle play, especially then transitioning towards both the Twilight Council and the Forge is his most common follow-up. I'm assuming that's probably what we'll see right here in game number one of this series. Yeah, there's the Oracle coming up. Sometimes he sticks around on one Oracle, sometimes he goes two, but he goes all the way up to like six. I'm personally a big fan of the uh, the Mass Oracle style, but if I were to make a guess, I think he's probably going to stick to about two or three. Yeah, it's very situational, but there are some moments where if the Zerg is just trying to break you with a lot of units on a relatively weak economy, that you can indeed just keep on building Oracles. If you've invested in that Stargate early on, you may as well, because the Queen's making their way to the other side of the map. Not something we see every single game on this map pool, because A, the maps are a lot bigger, B, uh, Queens need creep right now to drop transfuse, so you just see that a little bit less. And hey, if there's no NTI, you may as well just crank out a few more oracles. You know what's kind of funny is that I had a little chitty chat with Hero before the bracket was announced. And I was like, so Hero, what are we hoping for? He obviously won his group, so he got seated directly into the quarterfinals. I was like, hoping for a Zerk, and he's like, Mm. He's like, I want TVT bracket. I was like, huh? <laughs> I was like, oh, the winner of Hero Marine against Oliveira. He's like, yeah, 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 that's the one I want. Well, it's not quite the one he got, but hey, if he wins this series, he will still go up against one of those two players. So I'm sure that he's looking at that as well. It's like, all right, let's just get this best of five done. He is obviously known to be an incredibly strong PvZ player. Now, maybe some of the things that he's gone up against over the last few weeks on the new patch, on the new maps, have put a little bit of fear in his own mind as well. He dropped the series against Saro in the group stage, but well, that doesn't matter because he's in the playoffs and his dream is still alive and he doesn't have to worry about Saro anymore. 
First couple of oracles, or right, first couple of oracles rather, finally getting into the opponent's main base. How many drones will they kill? Three so far. There's another oracle coming on the back of this as well. A couple of adepts are ready to start pressuring. This is a very normal early game for the Zerg versus Protoss matchup. That being said though, how much damage can Hero really deal? Yesterday in the games that Dark played, we saw 20 something workers going down to relatively conventional aggression. This is already Oracle number four, by the yes. way. You mentioned the four Oracle, but yeah, there are two Oracles chilling behind the main base. There's an Oracle kind of protecting these adepts that I do believe have tried to get some damage done, but they went for the defensive shade instead. But Oracle number three grabs a couple of drones, and Oracle number four is about to pop on the other side of the map. So maybe Hero feels, maybe he's analyzed the games of Dark yesterday, and he mm -hmm. says, I feel like you don't respect the Oracles enough. And yes, I can go with my trademark double oracle and go into blink stalkers but i can also just try to keep on being active keep on being annoying with these oracles and this damage is absolutely starting to add up i think we're looking at 12 drone kills or so throughout the game that's eight at this point so mm -hmm. i guess the timer didn't reset yet but hey every single oracle is still alive and the adepts did not sacrifice themselves no, you're absolutely right. This is one of those things where if those oracles can stick around, they can be so valuable as well in the mid game. And they kill a couple more. Now, sadly for him, he does end up losing one. I think one is at least acceptable, but he really doesn't want to lose any more than this. The follow up is going to be his beloved Blink Stalker into the plus one ground weapons, whereas Dark right now is going into the Bailing Nest as well as plus one melee. He's really forced to defend a little bit better than this, though, right? Because this is already a lot of damage. Don't lose another Oracle, though. Yeah, and that stasis didn't go off, so that was good. Maybe he listened to you, Loco, and he's like, mm -hmm. you know what? I am going to try to clean it up. But yeah, I think so far, Dark taking a little more damage than he is supposed to take. Getting one Oracle kill is awesome, but he has now lost up to 14 drones. The good news, though, is that he does have that fourth hatchery up. And this is obviously something that Hero is going to take a look at. And what's very cool, I suppose, when you take a look at the minimap, you can see that Hero is expanding forward. But when most Protoss mm. players go up to four bases on this map, they're either going to stay at the bottom or they'll take the triangle or they take the triangle then the left side or triangle and the third base that Hero took. But Hero takes the base in the center and he said it in one of the video segments that we showed you guys throughout this tournament where he's like, mm, 100 on offense, not too much on defense. But basically in Hero's mind, if he's forced to defend, he's already losing. So he mm. just always wants to be the aggressor because he's a believer of the best defense is a strong offense. Uh, one of the Oracles caught off guard. It is gonna end up going down right there. That is a little bit unfortunate, but we're already kind of past the Oracle phase. It's nice to have them around, especially when the Ravager pushes hit the battlefield, but I don't think it's gonna be the end of the world. And Dark now, it's got the fourth hatch, go ahead. No, it's important for Hero that the next Next oh. minute or so in this game is going to go well, though, because Dark is up to 84 drones, four bases, a hive on the way. These are the kind of pushes and pokes that Hero really needs to get a lot done with. And even if he doesn't end the game or he's not able to get Dark out of there, he needs to make sure that he maintains the majority of these stalkers, that he keeps them alive and ideally snipes a couple of queens, a hatchery and a few drones. He does get the hatch without, honestly, too many issues. Yeah, the adepts get cleaned up very easily. They were sacrificed right there so those uh, stalkers could get the job done. Okay, there's uh, going to be a couple of those stasis wards just to be annoying, but a good amount of damage so far. Here's the counterattack now, coming up from Dark. He wants to see if he can potentially trade out a base for a base, and he may very well get his wish. Recall is going to be used right here, so units are going to come in for the defense. It's just two oracles, whereas Whoa. the stalkers are just going straight to the natural. Yeah, but that means that, you, that means you cannot recall the stalkers anymore either, so Hero is just fully sending it. He feels he's got the army to win the game. He needs to keep that war prism alive at all costs. Seems like the sport crawler went down. Sport crawler siege up oh. in the high ground, but this Brodel's army wow. will not get cleaned up. And just like that, Hero takes the 1-0 lead. This boy is decisive, Loco. Yeah, and that was with losing those two oracles as well. Imagine that those were still alive right there to zap away at a bunch of those Zerklings. There's a reason why the man has scored a full 100 out of 100 on the offense. He's just incredibly good at it, right? This was a build that he's been playing. At least when you look at the broad strokes, he's been playing this build for probably about a year right now, maybe even longer than that, but he makes small deviations here and there. He looked at the amount of damage that he did. He looked at exactly what Dark was doing. Dark decided to go for a pretty quick fourth base, quick macro hatchery as well. 
Guess that Hero looked at that, he's like, yo, if you're making all of that, you won't have enough army. Dark was a greedy boy, because Dark lost, I think, 16 drones at one point against the Adepts and the Oracles, yet he's still firing up a hive, he's still cruising at 84 drones, and obviously that would be great for Dark if Hero decides to just sit back, slow down the game, then Dark is able to get away with all of that, and Dark actually has a pretty nice entry into the late game. But Hero, with his Oracles in the main base, when he dropped the Stasis Traps, he's like, huh, Infestation Pit, Hive, all right, that means that I don't have to worry all that much because there is only so much stuff that you as a Zerg can theoretically have after going up to four bases, firing up a hive, losing that amount of drones and making mostly Zerglings. And Hero was right. Fantastic game right there to start things off for our Protoss player. The last Protoss player in this tournament, but luckily for all the Protoss fans out there, he's considered to be the best Protoss player in the world for quite some time right now. Dark having an unfortunate start in that particular game. It's just a couple things here and there, right? He decided to play greedy after losing quite a bit in the early game. He needs to make sure he doesn't take that damage in the first place. Yep, and Dark will know that too. It's easier said than done though. You mm -hmm. can play 20, 30, 40 games against great Protoss players and feel like, oh, my defense against Oracles is pretty good. But then you go up against the likes of Hero and your Queens will be just a touch out of position. But that is all that Hero needs. Just sweep in there and get a couple of drones. Let's see how game two plays out on Altitude, the biggest map we currently have in our map pool. Bottom left side, taking the one all lead with some oracles and a lot of blinky boys. Dragon Phoenix Gaming's hero. And the opponent all the way in the opposite corner of the map, looking pretty solid in game number one, but he certainly needs your energy. Make some noise for Dark. We mentioned it a couple of times yesterday, even though Dark got the W of a creator, it wasn't the best Dark we've ever seen. It wasn't the cleanest performance. Eventually, it is very important for him to, to just get a clean game on the board. I think Dark came in as one of the favorites to win the entire event. And if he wasn't one of your top four favorites, he was without a doubt one of your top eight favorites. Like you always expect this man to make quarterfinals. He's done that four years in a row. But at this point, he really needs a convincing game, a clean game where he snipes oracles, where he's on top of adapts, where he doesn't lose more than two or three drones against these multiple oracles, enters the mid game, completely overruns his opponent. Not just a win, but a convincing win. The win that gives you a lot of confidence <laughs> leading into the next games as well. Because at this point, it's been a while that we've seen a flawless performance out of Dark. No, you're definitely on point. The thing is, right, Hero did not play a style that is tricky. He doesn't necessarily play a game in the previous one that we just now saw, where he's trying to catch the opponent off guard. He opened up in the most conventional way possible, and he'll be happy to play that way in any game of this particular best of five. He'll probably bust out the strategy at least a couple more times with maybe a few small deviations here and there. Sometimes he goes for two Oracles, sometimes for four, sometimes he goes for two Adepts, sometimes he doesn't. There's a lot of varieties, of a lot of small changes he can make to this style, but broadly speaking, I expect him to do a lot of the similar builds again, especially on a map as big as this one. Yeah, there it is. But, but the Oracles are just kind of the start. Like, the real question for Dark is mm -hmm. what is coming after that? Is it Stalkers? Yes, well, okay, how many gases are you using with the Stalkers? Because do I have to worry about High Templars and Storm? Do I have to worry about Archons? Are you staying low on gas? We're getting a lot of gateways and they're going to try to overrun me with Stalker Zealot? Or is he going back to that double Robo Robo Bay after the Stargate that we've seen a couple of times from Hero as well? And these these things can just be very tricky as a Zerg to find out. So the first three, four minutes, they may look the same, but mm -hmm. after that, Hero has like 10 different ways to follow it up. No, for sure, yeah. He likes to go for a couple of those uh, Twilight varieties as well. We've even seen him go for some Glaive the Depths after mm -hmm. those Oracles too. Maybe not necessarily the most popular build right now in the current meta, but Hero is capable of playing it all, right? And it's really difficult for Zerk at this point to figure out exactly what it is they're playing against. I mean, yeah, you can go for Overlord Speed and figure it out, but Overlord Speed is pretty expensive. You can sacrifice another Overlord as well, but that also is not free. So a lot of Zerk players opt to, yeah, mostly to scout the gases at the third base, maybe try and get a glimpse of a structure here and there. It's very difficult for Dark to figure it out, but 
He needs to play a very clean, I want to say first five, six, seven minutes in this particular match. I'm curious to see if Dark is willing to bust out the Roach, Nidus, Queen, Swarm host again. I think if he wants mm. to do it in this best of five, I would almost say that this is a perfect map for it. It's going to be very hard for Hero to really find where those Nidus networks are popping on his side of the map. And I think there is a lot of potential in the Locust Wave, whether it's the first or the second, or we just keep on spamming it for a while. Dark did it yesterday in game one against Creator, and he didn't necessarily get got as much done as I think he was hoping for, but he did end up winning that game in the end. And I have the feeling if he wants to do it in this best of five, this is a perfect map for it. Okay, he's once again preparing himself for the multi-pronged aggression that Hero is going to throw at him. It's once more gonna be at least three oracles. Uh, let's see how much damage Hero can deal. Queens this time around in the right place at the right time. They're gonna cycle around though, those Oracles to watch the third base. Okay, three drones, but quite a bit of damage right there on the Oracle too. Queen comes in from the main base. I actually don't mind this at all for Dark. Dealing that much damage to those two Oracles for four drones, I think it's pretty acceptable. Yeah, acceptable is what it is. Like, I think four is kind of where you draw the yeah. line where you're like, okay, I'm absolutely still in it. I have nothing to worry about. But I think by the time you lose four drones, you would much rather just kill one Oracle and have the other Oracle full on HP. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, he did some damage on these two Oracles, but they are nowhere near dying. So it's acceptable, it's playable, but Dark needs to start doing even better than this already. The death count is a little bit higher than it was in the previous game, or at least they're all together this time around. I'm not quite sure what the link count is at. The Queens, it's important that the Queens don't get all baited as the Shade gets cancelled. And, well, in the end, it's two drones falling. There are 16 links out. This is nice, by the way, for Hero, just flying around with these oracles here. Yeah, he's going to snipe the drone, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a drone moving on over, trying to get that fourth base done. Well, I said that, and of course, right as I did, the oracles decided to leave that position. But he was hunting for it. He knows the timing at which Dark likes to take a fourth base. And, uh, well, I guess this already means that Dark was ever so slightly delayed right there in the earlier stages of the game. If all three oracles activate Pulsar Beam and get on top of a Morphing Head, Tree, you can definitely get a cancel on it, and Creep mm -hmm. was not connected all the way to that base. So I'm the feeling that if Hero really wanted to, he oh. would have been able to get one cancel on it, but he decided to play it safe. We're looking at the work counts though. We're now six minutes into a game, and the work count is that even. Any Protoss player will be more than happy with that. Normally, it goes around like four minutes, 20 seconds, four minutes, 30 seconds. That's kind of when the work counts are even. And after that, Zerk is supposed to take the work lead for quite some time. And only once the four bases are fully saturated, that's when the Protoss is catching up in the work account. This right now does not look pretty for Dark. He's down mm -hmm. five workers. And the only thing he's got really going for himself is the fact that he's got a quick plus one melee. But how much is he going to get done with plus one melee when the Oracle count is still at three and they have plenty of energy. Yeah, he gets shut down over here as well as he tries to harass that Protoss third base. One problem here for Dark as well is that he started up the lair at a relatively normal timing, but the Bailing Nest is pretty far behind. He now goes for an Infestation Pit as well, so I assume he wants to go for that Ling Bane style, but it is a little bit dicey, especially since he didn't send in an Overseer Scout. He doesn't really know exactly what it is he's playing against. It's gonna be that Robo Bay play that you were talking about, and in this case, it could even be Colossus. Yep, absolutely. I think that would go pretty well with the rest of the army. It seems that Dark just wants to go into another quick hive, and he's like, hey man, my links were so amazing yesterday against Creator, why not just do this all over again? Hero does not want to randomly lose oracles, because these oracles are going to be good against Zerg links. For the rest of the game, no matter how well these links are upgraded, having three oracles with energy is great. There is our hive, by the way, 7 minutes and 30 seconds, that is quick. Archon Drop has some potential here, because the only unit that Dark currently has are mm -hmm. the Zerg Things. Of course, there's a little bit of Queen support too. First unit out of the Robo Bay now, or as soon as the Robo Bay finishes up, is the Disruptor, by the way. I think I'm with you where I would have preferred to see a Colossus, but a single Disruptor, I guess, is never bad. Hero gets off a great scout. I can honestly think the Dark is playing a very risky game. And if yes. Hero just gets up to, you know, 170 supply and marches to the other side of the map, I'm not sure how Dark is ever going to defend with just Links and Queens and maybe a couple Bane Links. This Roach Warren is incredibly late, quite literally like three minutes later than what we normally see. Oracle's once again trying to be annoying, but they do get denied. Zerkling's here getting a bit of damage done, they thought, but then, well, <laughs> the Warp Prism showed up. 
This is definitely a very greedy game. Up until this point, we've just had Zerklings and a couple of Banelings. There's a Roach Warren done right now, but no Roach upgrades. There's no Hydra Den, there's no Lurker Den. There's a high finishing up. He can obviously make units that are gonna be amazing. However, will they be done before this attack from Hero goes across the map? A couple of Lings are gonna try to buy some time, but there are too many Zealots, some static defenses. The Banelings are coming in from the top left side. It's kind of weird by Hero, because the Archon and the Prism is on the left side. But right now, Hero has obviously a lot of potential in this War Prism, in these Archons, and he's just looking for free damage by the looks of it. Since he went up to four bases, he doesn't feel that he's too committed. And he's like, I'm not going to lose to a four base dog with Beautiful. Lings and Banes. Uh, these these Banelings will blow up a pile and maybe a couple of probes go down, but Dark honestly needs a whole lot more than he's been getting so far. He is now heading into Ultras, but it's gonna take a little while. Before these Ultras, he had a disrupt us, got oh. to run it though. We do fire a couple of Novas, and the Novas are able to buy some time, but hey, getting three disruptors like this is a pretty sick call. It seems that the War Prism went down on the other side of the map as well. Hero has made this very messy, very scrappy and hard on himself. Now the War Prism just flying <laughs> home, so he just left two Archons behind yeah. apparently. But there's a lot of chaos on the map, right? Yeah. So I guess he accidentally forgot about it. It's working out pretty well so far for Dark, but I'm with you. This is very, very greedy. Uh, Ultras are going to be good once they're done, but they need more upgrades. Chitinous Plating is uh, an essential upgrade here. So how in the world is he going to fight this army if Hero decides to put all of his eggs in one basket? It really comes down to the Banelings. Can the Banelings get great, great connections with the Zealots? Well, a couple of them work quite good, but there's still a few yeah. Archons remaining. But here comes the Swarm. That's a lot of Zerglings. A couple Stasis traps go down, though. Disruptors show up as well. Well, trailing from behind. Dark doesn't have too many battle units here. He needs a couple of extra links to show up, or he needs his stasis to run out. But right now, it feels like it's taking forever before these links can fight again. These Archons are getting so much value. The stasis is going to run off very, very, sh very, very shortly, but there's already so much damage done right here by this Protoss army. What a curious little attack here. Ultras are coming up, but there's already a mothership on the production tab as well, as he once again shut down all of these links. Most of the queens have this disappeared and that means that this war prism can just reign supreme can save every single arc on one ultra does show up and i'm afraid it's a day late and a dollar short the disruptors didn't have a great impact in this game but it wasn't about the disruptors it's a couple zealots it's a couple archons that is getting the job done and it just seems that dark is trying to get away with stuff he's not able to get away with even though i gotta say that was an insanely good stasis trap by a hero because if all of these links were able to just surround and go to town on these archons there's actually a chance that Dark does hold, and then it does become a good game for him. So that stasis was monstrous. Man, yeah, now Dark is just in all sorts of trouble, and it just feels that even though Hero didn't have the best game, not the cleanest game, Hero is getting the job done here. This Ultralisk rush is cool, right? In theory, it could work really quite well, but Hero is already one step ahead of him as he's transitioning towards that Skytel's army. Now, Ultras can still be good against that army as well, but uh, I'm not 100% sure if, I or if I'm convinced by the strategy that Dark decided to go for in this particular match. Either way though, four base economy right now for our Protoss player. Dark struggling to keep three bases up and running. Now he sees the first carrier. He'll soon see the mothership as well. Yeah, he doesn't have anything that shoots up. GG is cold as Hero wins the second game in this best of five series as well. I, mean, I love how safe Hero played that in the end. He's like, I'm gonna mm -hmm. go for a recall just in case. He's probably been watching these games from yesterday. Yeah. He sees a couple of links and he's like, just in case. And it's like, no, that was actually the only links that were out there. So Stasis. I Sport, for instance. Yeah, I think the Archons uh, or the, the Zealots alone with a little, tiny little Zealot warp in and one or two cannons would have been enough to deal with that counterattack. But Hero probably looked at his own production tab and said, I've got a mothership on the way, I've got a couple carriers on the way. There is no need for me to keep on attacking. I've already done the damage that I was looking for. And obviously he was right. He won. Dark just gave up. He said, there is no way that I can make something of this game. And we're getting ready for game three. I do generally wonder indeed how that fight would have played out without the stasis trap, because Archons are fantastic against Lynx until Lynx can get full surrounds. And if the Archons are kind of surrounded one by one, then Lynx are actually not even that terrible against Archons, because they can nibble through them quite quickly. Uh, but that stasis was incredibly big. Yeah. The fact that uh, Hero thought about it, he's like, okay, the battle is probably going to take place over here. He had to obviously start up those stasis wards before the Zerklings arrived. And yeah, he, uh, he definitely prepared incredibly well right there, reading his opponent like a book.
Dark now needs to win three maps in a row to move on to the semi-finals of I Am Katowice, and Hero seems to be on fire. One strategy that Dark has been fond of over the last couple of months is the proxy hatch, but are you really gonna bring out a proxy hatch at this stage in the tournament when your well your tournament life is on the line? Perhaps, because maybe the macro games it is not quite working out. We'll have an answer to that question real soon as we have loaded into Neo Humanity. In the top left side, the man who has taken the 2-0 lead, honestly without too many issues so far. One map away from making it into the semi-finals of IM Katowice 2023. Give your love to Hero. That's a lot of love. That is a lot of love. And the opponents finding right here in the bottom right hand corner of Neo Humanity. Currently 2 0 behind. Make some noise for Dar. Quite a lot of noise. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I actually wonder how that game would have played out as well if we would have built Colossus instead of Disruptors. Yeah. Because Those Disruptors did very little. Right? Yeah, and then they even got surrounded, obviously, and yeah, they were able to buy some time, get a couple of shots up. One Disruptor came in from the back, connected with a couple of uh, Zerglings, but like I don't even think that Hero had the best Zealot splits against Banelings, because that's uh, there's a few things that I get really excited over. I think it's very difficult as a Protoss, especially on Creep, to spread your Zealots properly, because you don't want to only run with your zealots because if the zealots are running they are not fighting so you kind of want to make sure that they are still dealing damage and they fight but the moment you make them attack move they all clump up so i was like how is he going to do it is he going to use some hold position and he kind of just ran them back and forth and the bayonet connections were honestly quite big but uh, even that was not enough and if we think of a game like StarCraft 2, there's obviously errors that we see. Sometimes a player makes an error because the other guy is playing really well and he's forcing him to make a mistake. But Dark had a pretty gnarly supply block in that previous game at 142, 142. Started building 8, 9 overlords at once. Uh, it's just... Hero's playing good, but Dark is not bringing his A game yet and he really needs to step it up. Otherwise, this will be the end of his IEM Katowice 2023. Yeah. I am a little bit confused by the Roach Warren timing in that game as well. We saw a Hive coming up right around the same time as the Roach Warren went down. I guess that Dark looked at his opponent's army, he's like, just Zerklings and Banelings aren't gonna cut it. A lot of Zergs lately have been fond of playing Hydras, but Dark just skipped all of that tech and he decided to go straight into Ultra Play, which, I mean, I guess can work out, but I'm not 100% convinced that that was necessarily the best play. It can absolutely work out against a Protoss player that's respecting you too much, is too timid to move out, yeah, right? Yeah, but and not like, against Hero. Yeah, but Hero is the guy that's in your face all the time. So to cut that many corners against a guy like Hero, and it indeed just felt to me, that road run, to answer your question, it felt to me that Dark was second-guessing himself, where he's like, yeah. I want to get up to a quick hive, I want to get Ultras out, but I can probably not survive on only Lings and Banes. And then but, he kind of tries. Yeah, but I'm really going to try work. anyway, but I should probably get a road run. It, it was just all over the place, and we know that on this level, this deep into the tournament against the best Protoss player in the world. You cannot be second-guessing yourself. You need clean build orders that make sense. The Queen right there sleeping on the job for just a little bit as it is a Depth comes in and it's just being an absolute nuisance. Getting a drone here would be really nice. Ooh, probably could have gotten it if you decided to target it down. Either way though, not a bad beginning right here for Hero as he's now also shooting away at that Overlord. Should not be able to kill it all the way, but at the very least he's gonna be able to push it back. And this is one of those small deviations, right, that we talk about. Hero just always mixing it up just a bit, even when he's playing the build order that looks very similar to uh, yeah, what he's already been playing. They're playing uh, a little bit of uh, a game called Catch the Overlord where the Overlord is going back and forth and back and forth, but eventually he can only lose. It's not a very good game. If I play this game, I've got 700 minerals in the bank. <laughs> yeah. man. Like, I really don't like That's this game. That's the way Zerk wins, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like this game at all, Loco. <laughs> Some people might be a bit confused on why would Hero go for the Oracles every single game. Isn't it predictable? It can be predictable, but certain strategies in StarCraft 2 just come down to execution, as the crowd apparently really appreciated the effort of killing that Overlord. I'm glad you guys are getting excited. <laughs> Hero likes this opening for very reasons. Number one, it's very safe against all ins. Number two, it's going to give you a lot of scouting information on the other side of the map. And number three, there is potential to deal damage like we've seen every single game so far with Pulsar Beam. So it's not so much that this is his strategy, it's more that this is the opening and he's going to take it from there. And this opening makes sense for all the reasons I just mentioned. Okay, getting a couple of drone kills so far in that main base. Adepts once again are ready to move forward. Zerklings are going to be a necessity here in order to clean all of this up. 
It's just queens alone are going to be uh, a little bit too... Ooh. Yeah, I thought for a second he was going to commit there. Yeah, there um, are a couple cute spots there, actually. Yeah, there are some cool spots between the mineral fields mm -hmm. and all that, but... I think that's uh, a little too ambitious here. Yep. I think that's the kind of stuff that you go for if you feel like you're the underdog or you need to do something crazy as a Protoss. But Hero has probably been feeling pretty good about this series after watching Dark against Creator yesterday. And he's got to be feeling even better right now after the first two games. So for Hero, there is no need to roll the dice and try to get rid of units early on in, in the hopes and dreams of dealing some damage. Like, no, he's just going to play it very calm, very safe, very conservative for the beginning. Control the game and get up to the point where he gets comfortable with these terrifying Protoss armies. Couple of adepts right there got killed on the right side of the map. And speaking of playing safe though, Dark is really playing very safe in this game as well. He's only at 49 workers right now. Well, as I say that, he finishes up another round of drones. But he's been playing it pretty conservatively. He's not really been losing too much. Stasis Ward should also be denied quite easily. Queen over there on the right side taking a lot of damage. But, ooh, the drone's actually body blocking her. She is nice. not gonna go down. Very nice control right there by Dark as he also kills one of the oracles in the process. That was honestly high level play from both for a while where yep. Hero drops the Stasis on the left side and felt there was an opening with the oracles on the right side. But Dark read him like a book there and he realized which queen he needed to transfuse immediately, microed it back towards the Spore Crawler and got enough hits off to get an Oracle. Finally, something that kind of goes dark his way in the early game as he's firing up a couple of roaches. There is the infestation pit. I was wondering about roaches yeah. and swarm holes in the previous game. Well, we didn't see it on Altitude. I'm pretty certain we're going to see it here on Neo Humanity because roaches into a very quick hive. It's possible, but very unlikely with the way that Dark has been playing. I don't see Hydra dead. I don't think he likes the Lurker style all that much. Brute Lords if he really wants to, I suppose, yeah. but I do think Swarmos are the most likely option here. Swarmos with Anitis. And don't forget about these gold minerals, by the way, on the right side. That is a great spot. Like, if you take a look at Heroes Natural real quick, lovely Observer Mapu, you can get a couple of uh, Nidus networks up there, and that would be very annoying mm -hmm. to deal with if Hero didn't mind that out yet, uh, or if Hero doesn't have a way to get units over there very quickly. Hero actually already going into double Colossus production here. That is quite interesting. I don't think... Oh, did he just end up losing an Oracle there? I the guess second one of the game. Yeah. Um, what I was going to bring up, though, is that the Oracles, I mean, they're important. They're actually super important against Swarmhouse play. We can yeah. talk about them for a little while longer, even though we've already talked about Oracles for a long time. But Colossus is quite a strong option here as well. I wonder what Hero is assuming here. Maybe he's thinking, okay, it could be that Link Bane style once again. The Roach Warren will probably not be spotted here with its current positioning. He definitely did not see the Infestation Pit. So I'm curious to see how Hero is going to approach the defense here as the first 11 Swarm Host are hitting the battlefield. Yeah, losing both Oracles against this build specifically, the yep. Dark is going for is honestly a nightmare scenario. This one observer that our observer hey, is showing us is key, by the way, because this can actually be a very big deal in this game, because that can give Hero the information that Surtis Nidus networks are going up, that Hero is not, uh, or that Dark is not aware of yet, that Hero knows it. War Prism flying on the right side, but I think at this point, Hero does not need to be aggressive. Hero needs to focus on the defense, something he does not enjoy doing, but here come the first swarm most and that natural is very exposed there is barely any firepower here for hero at the moment Swarm host flying on over. Colossus actually very exposed, and one of them falls right away. Now, Colossi are very good at killing the Locust, but look at the amount of probes that fall in the process here as well. This first wave is super critical. Now, keep in mind, with Swarm host, they are going to be on cooldown for quite a while, and that means that for now, Dark doesn't have that much firepower in his army. While those Locusts are on cooldown, he is vulnerable, and that is something that Hero can try and exploit. Yeah, it feels that Hero just wants to attack immediately. Hero really has no chill. Ever. I don't think there's a single Protoss out there that loses 13 probes and a Colossus is like, now I should attack. <laughs> dark is maxed out, you know, he's not attacking into a weak Dark. And there is sometimes indeed that tiny window where you, where the Swarmos are not able to fire and not a wave of Locusts. But this honestly feels all very ambitious by Hero. I think that Dark has the right tools to deal with this army. Is it going to be easy for Dark? No. He needs to be careful with his Locusts. He needs to make sure that the Locusts and the Roaches are fighting at the same time. And as long as he can get that done, he should be fine. Nice movement right here, though, by the Protoss player, forcing that massive Locust wave. 
Keep in mind that cooldown is once again going to be active. Please Whoa. keep the pluses alive. No, okay, he's now starting to juggle them backwards using the War Prism. I think if he didn't lose that Colossus, that would have been quite sweet, but... Yes, exactly. It was all indeed pretty well done by Hero, but he accidentally picked up a Stalker by the looks of it. And because he had a Stalker in the War Prism, there was no space for that other Colossus to hop in. So Hero could have had four Colossi. Instead, he only has two. And Colossus are already not all that great against Roaches. He is still going to try again because this is just what Hero does. But there are a lot of Roaches in the mix. Couple of Ravages as well. And Dark, where are the Swarmos at this point? When do we have another wave of Locusts to work with. Yeah, he wanted to be aggressive yeah. with them, but Dark realizes he's going to need them defensively. He should run again as soon as he sees the Locust, and that's what he decides to do. I don't mind this back and forth here for Hero so much, especially if he can force an overextension with, for example, that one Stasis Ward that we see set up. Then again, though, Dark has been maxed out here for a while, right? He's got a good amount of money in the bank. He can replace this quite easily. Ooh. Aggressive blink forward as he catches all of the Roaches and Ravagers off guard. A couple of Swarm Hoes caught in the middle of that as well. And those Colossi, man, they're not dealing a ton of damage, but they're doing quite a bit. Double forward bling by Hero. The man is a mad lad. The best defense is truly offense by the looks of it. Triple forward bling on top of the Queens, on top of the Roaches, on top of the Ravagers. Wow. And the Swarm Hoes were not able to help out this time around. Dark has a lot of supply Oh in the my bank. god, he just forced the land right there on all of the Locust as well. Yeah, that's obviously a bit of a mistake by Dark, right? It's obviously a great play by Hero, but yeah. that's not really supposed to happen. Dark had a lot of units coming in from different angles. The Colossus are taking a lot of damage, but Hero is so good in protecting these guys with the forward blinks. Dark is in all sorts of trouble. It seems that Dark is IEM Katowice Dreams will end here. And Hero makes it into the semi-finals of this this World Championship. And in a dominating fashion as well, winning 3-0 over the man who's considered to be the best Korean Zerg player, one of the very best in the world. Honestly, you're already this series that didn't even look particularly close. Fantastic play right there from Hero. I think the best game for Dark was the third game, and I actually think that he was doing perfectly fine, but right when mm -hmm. Dark put in all the Swarmos in the Nidus to get aggressive again on the other side of the map, Hero said, you thought I went home, mate? <laughs> and he immediately just went for the forward link. Dark realizes he needs to bring the Swarmos back home, but he lost a lot of units. And he did have like 20 plus Roaches in production, but they all showed up a little bit too late. Hero, the Protoss hero, makes it into the semi-finals, and I am curious to see what Kolaris and the boys at the desk have to say about that. Thank you, lads. Yes, a powerful performance from our primary Protoss here in the round of eight. We have him moving through into that round of four now, not only smashing down another Zerg, but finding himself now going up against time in that round of four. Here in the ESL Cinematic Universe, we only need one hero, Pig, and it's Hero. What a lad. What a guy. He's really cool. We need a hero. Yeah, um, no, he's smashed. <laughs> that was the most one-sided series uh, in terms of just utter domination that we've seen today, really. Mm. That was beautiful play by Hero, and I really was impressed by that last game where a lot of players would have been thrown off, but uh, of course it all started here early on, and Interesting to see, Dark came out with a very special mass Zergling build. He had his eyes set on getting to Ultralisks eventually. Yeah. And I actually would have loved to see him go Infestors instead of Banelings against the Stalker style here. Uh, but unfortunately for him, he was a bit too greedy. Going up to 85 workers after all the harassment damage he'd taken, left himself wide open. And of course, when Hero smells blood in the water, mate, it's a feeding frenzy. Yeah. yeah. How are we supposed to surround this as well? It's not, it's not possible. It's not possible. Yeah, this is where it gets really <laughs> tough. I mean, this is where you start seeing the value of Oracle. Goals. It's just, just, I think it was really tough to watch because a lot of the part for the series, Dark would seem like he was getting into a decent-ish spot and then Hero just kind of like roll over him. Yeah, well, I mean, you talk about the power the of stasis. oracles, the stasis, the stasis wards. These could, these decided this fight. Like this could have easily been, well, potentially been a cleanup here, Pig, but absolutely not. Locking this down, yeah. what a play. That, that stasis, it was like the ultimate force field. You know, force yeah. fields you can break, stasis trapped units you <laughs> cannot. Uh, I do like the choice of hero to swap into Archon Zealot. You're playing a big wide open map. You've already seen your opponent going mass Zergling and perhaps a little bit too predictable for Dark. I really do feel that the Archons here counter this unit uh, composition very hard. Mm. And that's why I would have loved to see instead of the Baneling Nest, in this case, the Roach Warren 
in mm -hmm. case you see the Zealot Archon Comp and just make as many Roaches or Ravages as you need defensively. I think this was a very clever strategy, of course, as we go into the final game of the series yeah. and a great first wave of the Locusts, but an unnecessarily large commitment from Dark. He went for 14 Swarm Hosts and a Nidus Worm yeah. and eight Queens and 65 Drones, and that just doesn't leave you enough supply in the Roach Ravager to defend this. I feel like it was the desperation button almost. Like, if you're in command of the series and you do it, yeah, okay, maybe you can start dictating the pace, but it felt like he wasn't dictating the pace at all here, Fear Dragon. No, it's exactly to your point. It felt like there was a point where Dark had killed the Colossus and like a bunch of those probes with this first wave of Locust. His hive was finishing up and he was creating four more Swarm Hose. I'm like, your hive just finished. Like, don't you want to do anything else with that supply? And it was kind of surprising how much he just doubled down on it. Vipers would have been an absolute hard counter to the mm. Colossus. Blinding Cloud's also fantastic. Uh, or Fungal Growth to catch the Stalkers and hold them in position. But mm. at the end of the day, I think it's just too many Swarm Hosts. Mm. <laughs> That's like a prescription or something. <laughs> fungal Growth. Look, if you have a topical Protoss problem, don't forget to apply Fungal Growth liberally twice a day and everything will get better. <laughs> I hate everything about this, but <laughs> thanks very much, boys. All right, let's hear from our last member going into the round of four is, of course, Hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm here with Hero after he qualifies and moves forward to the round of four here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Hero, congratulations. You're moving forward to the semifinals. It's been four years since you were able to do so. The last time was 2019 here at Katowice. How does it feel to finally be back in the top four? 아, 김준호 선수 너무 축하드리고요. 4강 진출을 이제 4년, 4년 만에를 하셨는데 마지막에 이제 2019년도에 갔었는데 어, 4년 만에 진출한 소감 한마디만 해주세요. 어, 일단 19년도 카토비치 이후로 제가 이런 상위, 어, 결산 대회에서 성적을 낸 적이 없어요. 그래가지고 저는 딱 여기까지인 선수구나 생각을 하고 그냥 항상 임했던 것 같아요, 대회를 해도. 이번에도 크게 기대가 없었는데 어, 오늘 제 생각과는 다르게 너무 게임이 잘 풀리고 잘 돼서 다행인 것 같고 어, 제 생각을 깬것 같아가지고 너무 기분이 좋습니다. So he says, uh, last time I was here in Katowice in 2019, uh, after that Katowice, I, I was never able to make it. Uh, far in an international event ever after that. I thought to myself, maybe maybe this is just my limitation as a player, and I had sort of been resigned to that fact. Uh, and, but today, I, am, I honestly feel so happy with this result. It definitely wasn't what I was expecting, and, I, and I'm happy about it because it's making me start to change my mind about the thought that I had before, where maybe I, I couldn't ever have success on an international premiere event, so I'm very, very happy about that. And Hero, I'm wondering if some of that stress that you felt ahead of this round of eight was because it was specifically Dark. Uh, yesterday when we spoke to Dark, he said that you guys play together a lot, both, both competitively but also in practice, and that he's sick of playing you and he doesn't want to play anymore. I'm curious if that was part of why you weren't looking forward to today. 일단 어, 가장 예, 예상을 안 했다고 했는데 어제 박영우 선수와 인터뷰를 했을 때 김준호 선수를 자주 만나기도 하고 연, 연습도 자주 하고 그래가지고 진짜 만난 걸 지겹다고 했었는데 김준호 선수도 혹시 똑같은 기분이었나요? 어 일단은 연습 파트너다 보니까 아무래도 서로의 스타일 잘 알고 어, 상대방이 얼마나 잘하는지 알기 때문에 너무 만나기 싫었는데 이번에 만나게 돼서 어, 결과는 이렇게 됐지만 제가 운이 좋아서 이겼다고 생각하고 어, 항상 힘든 상대인 것 같아요, 오늘. So he says, for sure, because he's my practice partner, you get to know the other player very, very well. It's not just their style, but you also know exactly how strong of a player that they are. Uh, and, and so I definitely felt the same. And specifically with Dark, I also always just think it's a, he's a really tricky player to play against. So I think despite the result being a 3-0, I think really luck was on my side today. And that's why I was able to win. And I need to ask about that last map because there was a situation where his swarm host killed 13 probes and your Colossus uh, was looking kind of scary. What was going through your head at that time? 
이제 마지막 경기에서 어, 그 군단 숙주 때문에 거신도 떨어지고 프로브도 13개나 죽었는데 그 순간에 무슨 생각을 했나? 어 일단은 제가 상대방이 군숙 할것 같아가지고 맵도 그렇고 그래서 거신을 오랜만에 꺼내 드렸는데 생각보다 수비가 좋진 않았어요. 근데 제가 어차피 공격 갈 거였고 그 프로브 잡힌다고 병력 나오는 데는 지장이 없다고 판단했기 때문에 공격에 좀더 혼을 담았던 것 같아요. So he says because it was neo humanity, I had a feeling that he'd be going swarm host, and that's why I specifically prepared Colossus. Uh, it, but that being said, I don't feel like I defended as well as I could have. But I wasn't worried about it because just because my defense wasn't perfect, it, had, it has nothing to do with the uh, offensive units I was pulling out. And I knew I was going to go and attack him after that anyway. Uh, so I, I decided, okay, let me just really focus on, on the offensive here. And, and that's why I think things were able to work out and I was able to get the win. And last but not least, you are going to be playing Oliveira in the round of four. When I spoke to you backstage, you told me that Oliveira is the hardest practicing player that you've seen. What are your thoughts on going up against him? 4강에서 이제 타임 선수를 만날 건데 어, 선수들 중에서 가장 열심히 하는 선수라고 했었잖아요. 어, 만나는 기분이 어떠세요? 어, 일단은 령우랑도 동일하게 타임 선수랑도 제가 연습을 굉장히 많이 하거든요. 근데 아이디를 바꾸고 나서 이게 딴 사람이 됐더라고요. <웃음> 그래가지고 인정하는 테란 중에 한 명이고 이번에 기세가 너무 무섭다고 생각하고 그 기세에 휘말리면 안될것 같다고 생각합니다. So he says, just like Dark, actually, Oliveira is also my practice partner. <웃음> Uh, so he's, he's definitely someone I know very well. Uh, that being said, I noticed that along with his name change from time to Oliveira, he's also become a brand new player. <laughs> uh, he's, he's become a Terran player that I definitely acknowledge and respect tremendously. So I'm not going to take this lightly at all, and I'll do my absolute hardest in going up against him. But for now, congratulations once again, Hero, on making it to the top four here at Katowice for the first time in four years.
Gaming.com. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. Solar, dead. Serral, dead. Rainer, this is, this is grim. Rainer, dead. Dark. Dead. The Zerg Cabal in shambles here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. We're in the round of four. To my left hand side, Wardy and Fear Dragon. And now we only have one Zerg left. What happened, Wardy? Four Zergs lost in a row. Unprecedented news. Unprecedented scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it wasn't really that ridiculous. I was like, you know, some upsets, right? You know, time can play well, Vera can play well. But then to actually put all the results together, it's like, man, that is actually a wild yeah. day. Obviously, one of them was a ZVZ sure, but it was several that lost in a ZVZ. So, yeah, absolutely ridiculous day of StarCraft games and results. Yeah, it's been an amazing tournament so far. I, hands down, easily one of my favorite already. Fear Dragon, let's start focusing here on Maru versus Ragnarok. It's a fixture which... It's happened recently, and I think it lives in a lot of people's memories quite clearly, it's fair to see. Um, what are we thinking, Fear Dragon? Yeah, the kind of fixture here that uh, you're talking to and alluding to, James, is that Marwood Ragnarok played not that long ago in GSL, and it was a really really one-sided 4-0. Yes, it was. It was a bit painful to watch. And even just if you look at their overall series score against each other, it's 22-1 and one in favor of Maru. And you might think, ah, well, you know, he took a game. Maybe some of them are close. Overall, across their entire history, Ragnarok has only ever taken seven maps against Maru mm. across 23 series. Wadi? Well, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Zerg Cabal are now all in on Ragnarok. <laughs> yes, Ooh. they are. They've been connected by the hive mind for the last hour or two. Yeah, and they're, yeah. they're, they're feeding him all the information he needs. Mm -hmm. We'll see if it's enough, James. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. It, it's going to be really difficult. I think Ragnarok is showing up better, but like you can look back at that GSL and say, until you met Maru, he looked like a better Ragnarok. He yes, looked like yes. an improved Agreed. player. So what, is he going to just do the same, like hit Maru, and that's why it just dismantles? Solo looked great event this event until he hit Maru. Maru just has that effect on players, and yeah, I, I do feel as if if Maru plays like he played earlier, it's going to be rough for Ragnarok. There's a little sense of destiny in the air at the moment, where it's for years and years and years, Maru did not get himself to a grand final in Katowice. It was the one that's kind of got away from him. He's won five GSLs. He's won everything else. It does feel like this might be Maru's year here, Fear Dragon. It really is. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. If I think if you give this tournament bracket Actually, forget the tournament bracket. If you give this top four to any StarCraft fan mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you say, predict the winner, I think people would just say Maru. Before this tournament, to before yeah. today, I think anyone would have done that. Gentlemen, all right, let's get to it here. Our players are ready. We don't have much time to actually be able to head on over to them. It's a round of four now. It really starts adding up in terms of prize pool, in terms of prestige, and trying to crown yourself the world champion. Let's head over to the stage. Indeed, thank you, James. You guys covered this at the desk, but our Korean Zerg player has blazed a path of utter destroying and just a carnage of bodies behind him and the likes of Neeb, Dark, Serral, and Cure getting revenge on all of them successfully. But can he continue that going up against the five-time GSL champion? Please welcome on stage, it's Ragnarok and Maru.
up against Ragnarok here in the semi-finals. The first spot in the grand finals will be decided in a best of five match. It's Zerg versus Terran. And these two are no strangers to each other. No, they are not. Unfortunately, I think Ragnarok would rather be a stranger tomorrow. And then uh, we won't be thinking about the last time these two met, which was a dominating victory for Maru. Uh, Ragnarok, though, having one of the best tournaments of his career. Well, yet again, as the desk said, a lot of them stop at Maru. Let's see if he can change the narrative. Showing up in the best form he has ever at Katowice. Ragnarok is giving hope for his fans. But of course, at the same time, Maru is looking for this elusive trophy. A world championship is something that he's never held. He's gotten so close so many times. And if you look back over the last years, the number of three twos to Zerg players that have stopped him here in the semifinals. Reyna, three, two. Rogue, twice, stopping him three to two in the semifinals. He does not want that to happen again. And you could argue this is his best chance yet to make it to the finals. You could more than argue. It does seem like the road has led clearly to the finals for Maru. And then maybe that'll be a little bit more difficult. But Ragnarok, you know, bless him, right? He, he acknowledged that people were looking forward to Maru versus Serral. He did. And I just love that he did that. He's such a great guy. He's such a great player. And he said, I'm going to try and bring the best games to you guys. I'm going to make it up to you. And you're going to... I think you guys are going to cheer for Ragnarok, hopefully, after he does that. I would love it. I would absolutely love it. I think he's got strategies. I think he can show mechanical prowess. Sometimes that does end up being his downfall, but he has to bring his A game, his S tier game, to the CVT. Working in his favor is that Maru, of course, played Sola earlier today and did have a few moments where it looked like Sola could have taken control of that matchup. But great defense for Maru and some uh, slightly botched engagements, perhaps by Sola, did lead to Terran victory. Let's see if that tail can change. Because when we get this shot, we hear that music. It means the players are getting into the map. And that is, of course, exciting. The series will be kicking off on Babylon. That's right, it's Maru's map pick to start things off. Of course, if you can take your opponent's map off them, it is a huge momentum swing in your favor. But this man's gonna be sitting pretty. The shortest rush distance in the pool. Fantastic tank positions all about. Let's put your hands together for the man in the top left side of this semi-finals. Representing Onside Gaming, it is Maru. And in the bottom right of Babylon, looking to change history, looking to advance forward into the finals of Katowice, he is the Blue Zerg for Alpha X Ragnarok. Such a tricky player, Ragnarok. One who really uh, has had so much success off roach aggression and odd timings and interesting ways of really cutting out his opponent's ability to dictate the pace of the game and then getting way ahead and, and swarming them over in kind of the late mid game with the masses of banelings ragnarok if he gets a lead we know what he'll do and it's all going to be about shoving banelings into planetary fortresses wiping them out and not letting that terran keep up an equal number of bases that does seem to be what he missed out on, though, when they last faced, was actually being able to throw Maru off totally and completely. There's no doubt that Ragnarok, uh, better than most, most likely than most Zerg, throw out some cheeses, throw out some ways very early on to try and gain control over the game, where Zerg is usually more so uh, supposed to be reacting, supposed to be prepping for whatever their opponent was doing, but it just did not work against Maru. It's a new day, it's a new tournament, it's a new format as well. Of course, we all know GSL, uh, a lot of prep goes into that. It's one of the reasons that Maru certainly uh, is repeat, 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 repeat champion of GSL. <laughs> um, but these long, grueling days uh, tend to be where he does falter. Uh, the last few Katowice's in this day has been longer than all the previous ones. A long day at the end of a long tournament. Definitely something that weighs on the players. Maru likes that GSL format where he's playing in his home city, goes in, plays a match, and then gets to go back and prepare for the next one usually. Uh, definitely excels in that. But here, long form tournament, just back to back matches. Very minimal time to prepare for the next one. It's all about your ability to just float through them. Ragnarok did go pool first. He's got a third hatchery and a quickling speed on the way. So Ragnarok likely to try maybe a small Ling Flood. But four Lings have gone across the side of the map for now. Oh, losing a drone, a great start for Maru. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, for Maru, so he, it looks like he's going to go into a third CC, actually. So no second gas on the field quite yet. Um, see if he is going to play it safe, at least, with getting some Banshees. It is shorter 
rush distance on this map wouldn't be insane at all for Ragnarok to throw down a Roach Warren, uh, of course, with the hopes of having Maro surprised by it. Those four Lings are going to be looking for the Reaper Snipe. Ling Speed is about to kick in. The Reaper is down here. The Lings are nearby. Ragnarok's really trying to hide those. And there we go. When the Queen pushes this Reaper back, the Lings will be waiting on the low ground, potentially to clean it up. But as it goes through for a Snipe, another drone in the sights of that Reaper. Good Ooh. catch on the Spore trick there for Ragnarok. Keeps it alive. But my gosh, the Reaper's getting out of there. Already small psychological victories for Maru. As his extra command center comes in, extra barracks going down. Yep. Looks like he wants to go into that bio play. So this could be extremely weak to something aggressive early on, but Maro trusting his Reaper scouting, uh, believing that Ragnarok will not do anything aggressive in the early game, and he's right about that. He is absolutely right, so no Banshee necessary. Yes, that can give you some uh, benefit later on, but we don't have to talk about that. The point of this, this streamlined build right into that second barracks, is that you are going to be able to get to Marines, Medivacs very, very quickly, all the upgrades you would like. Not stopping building his Hellion production, though, not yet anyways. He is going to swap that off, but he wasn't the most greedy you could be with this opener with only uh, two Hellions, I think, is literally the greediest thing you could do. He meant to be quite far ahead in workers as a Zerg versus Terran, yet they've been dead even with Maru even in the lead for a lot of this early game. Big supply block there for Ragnarok as well. The nerves potentially showing in the semi-final match. Gonna need to brush that elf and move on forwards to keep up with Maru. Otherwise, he's just gonna have more stuff when the fighting starts. And right now, Maru's Hellions poking forwards, looking to slow down the creep spread. And Urubu there caught in the middle of the action. Save him. Beat him. There is actually a curse. If you shoot that guy on purpose, you do lose the game. Yeah. Some say it's just reading tea leaves, but I've seen it happen at least twice, Zombie Grub, at least twice. At least once for this tournament, actually. Thought here I'm sacrificing him, but ended up losing <laughs> out. Mm. Uh, no, it's actually a very, very basic ZVT. More macro-oriented than I was actually giving, uh, well, Ragnarok credit for, to be honest. But Ragnarok's going to try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Maru's multitasking macro defense late game setup, which uh, <laughs> is, uh, well, basically the best in the entire world. Yeah, Maru's playing kind of vanilla. He's not doing anything too fancy, but Ragnarok's the one who hasn't been hitting that economy as fast as he potentially could. He scouts the third command center, starts his lair, but that is by no means a quick lair. Five minutes, ten. That means Baneling Speed is minutes and minutes away, as is Evolution Chambers not even started. 1-1 one, one has begun for Maru. So Ragnarok are simply a little behind the curve on the early stage buildup. But if he can shut down the first pressures from Maru, he'll be good. He hasn't taken any big damage. I think it was only like one or two drones that have gone down. One to the Reaper, one to the Hellions poking in. And he's going to go for the fourth base up here in the corner of the map. I do really like that. Keep in mind, that's where Reyna went for the fourth. And remember that tank position that Oliveira abused. That looked really brutal. That's true. Uh, flip the positions, of course, and, and that's exactly what happened. So. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not that the tank is necessarily what abuses that as much as it does cover the Marines' retreat and allows them uh, to consistently pressure. Well, looking at this pressure, it's not going so hot. The Hellions, oh, actually, three of them do survive. Uh, for sure, only it would be one. And in fact, it was oh. a huge distraction that we even fell for. Those medivacs are boosting across the map right wow. into the main base. Easy peasy. 16 drones go down. The spawning pool now in Maru's sights. And Ragnarok is like, yeah, that just happened. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, as I was saying, he's already a little behind on the openings. And, and now after 16 drones go down, it's smooth sailing for Maru. A nice, easy game yeah, to, to kind of warm up for this series so far. One where Ragnarok now needs to dig deep, and he's got to bring out a Hail Mary. Whether he goes Baru Banelings or a big giant backstab, he's going to have to catch Maru off guard. Maybe look for a perfect sandwich or something like that. But uh, definitely, he needs something spicy to get back in this one. Yeah, I'm not sure what it uh, what it can be, you know? You talk about comeback units, comeback strategies for the Zerg, and it really is, uh, you know, burrowed banelings, fungals not even really, especially with this composition. And then otherwise, yeah, a big surround even might not cut it. Even if he does manage to get a big surround, catch Maru off guard, Maru always has the option of at least evacuating with whatever can get into those medivacs, so it should never be just game over because of that. Gosh, he's so accurate. I mean, to some of you, it might look blazing fast, and yet he's so much more methodical. He just never misclicks than any other pro gamer. For Maru, and look at that, even deselects the siege tank there. Wow, pre-sieges it. He's got Hellbats guarding the tank, Marines spreading, putting extra workers on gas behind it. I love this first-person view. Just gives me such an appreciation of how quick he is. Ling Runby is on his third base, and he does stim his units down from his rally point. A few SCVs will fall, but he sees no more units on the defense, and he decides, okay, well, guess what? If you commit your links to a run, 
run by it, you can't defend your third base. Yeah, we got 10 Bane Links forming, guys, but that's not going to take care of everything. Oh, but we do have actually more Bane Links here. Maru, he handles the run by fine, though. Only a couple of SCDs went down. Back of the focus in the front lines. Again, even if he has some trouble with the Bane Link count, he could always pick up, he could always leave, or he could try and slip every single Bane Link down and just win the game right here, right now. Standing their ground in the face of the, uh, the Bane Links and just blasting him down before they even get into reach. Beautiful play, and now at a 50 supply advantage. 76 workers for 60, telling us that, yes, some SCVs may have been damaged in the run by, but very few actually went down. And he's going to be cleaning up those Banelings as well. Maru far ahead in this game. Now adding Marauder's 8 Barrack second factory. But this push here, this pack of Marines and tanks, completely unanswered. And of course, Ragnarok just does not have the numbers to keep up. Now, another run by attempt to at least throw Maru off. But that is not happening. Doesn't even really need the slight Banelings at this point. That was just all that was left over. The Marines concave, the Marines dive in on that hatchery. And that is going to be game number one. Maru making it look easy. Straightforward style, one that was maybe open to aggression from the opponent, but the scouting was good, the pressure was fantastic, and he was ahead at every stage of that game. The dominant performance that we expected to kick things off. It just, 16 Marines on the main, man. You have nothing there to defend. They instantly grab the drones. That's going to make it impossible for most Zergs to make a comeback off of. And I guess it, it just really maybe had to do with Ragnarok not being able to see exactly what the follow-up was to 3CC. Because you can figure out the 3CC off a couple of things, even supply depots at the front, the amount of Hellions, four, not six. Um, but then actually knowing what the follow-up is, I mean, that is a little more in question. And if you do know for a fact they're going to go for the two medivac drop. You don't exactly know where it is. And even if you find it on the way over, they could hold and then come back when you aren't expecting it. it. It is tricky, but it's not supposed to be just that one action quick game. That's gonna be one that Ragnarok really has to shake off quick. It's the most momentous moment of Ragnarok's career. Being in the top four of a world championship is something that he has never experienced before. And of course, being a big underdog, it's easy to tunnel vision. The adrenaline can spike up, and when that happens, you do tend to hyper-focus on certain things, lose track of your minimap. He's gonna have to take a deep breath, reset, and try to smooth things out for map number two, because this man in the bottom left, he is absolutely unflappable. Let's put our hands together for the Red Terran player. It's Maru. And hopefully able to shake off game number one quick. He's got the rest of the series to play out. If he wants to move on to the finals, he's got to get everything straight and narrow. Really just do better in that early game. In the top right, we do have the Blue Zerg, Ragnarok. He's going 14 overlord. Very interesting. Normally you see a 13 overlord, but uh, Ragnarok with a slightly different opening here. No extractor trick? No extractor trick. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a little different. Yeah, normally, uh, yeah, could just be a sign of him doing things uh, a little bit nervously there, but uh, we'll see exactly if he continues forwards or not. Cistern is his map pick. Remember that last map, not the worst one to lose because it is, of course, the Terran's choice. We've got a lot of Zerg supporters out there mm -hmm. and some, some Terran ones coming in on the left side as well, of course. <laughs> of course. Hard to keep the Maru supporters out. Uh, they are, of course, uh, everywhere in the world at this point. He has led, really, all of the Terran hopes since 2018, even in times when there was a lot of Terran players struggling, Maru was the one guy that stood out and he just said, hey, yeah. it doesn't matter what everyone else is struggling with as a Terran player, I'm still winning tournaments. Yeah, he has been that shining light that, uh, well, then became almost an impossible to reach uh, journey. Just you couldn't actually get to play like Maru. Maru was the only one doing it. Some of the Terrans started to catch up, started to learn as well what made him so unique. And they have uh, tried to replicate everything about Maru's play, but there's only so much you can do. So he still remains the top Terran in the world and is looking to get to those finals to accomplish his own uh, destiny, perhaps. Claris brought that up. Actually win that global championship, something that you feel, if you ask him that you think Maru's won one, people might be like, oh yeah, didn't he? Like, when, didn't that happen? No, actually. Mm. But he's also looking to be the first Terran in the finals since 2017, I believe. Wow, TY? Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right, TY. For stats, uh, yep, $100,000 one off some beautiful tank raven pushes if memory serves. But uh, this is, of course, that would be huge to get back up there. Maru is going to be coming in with that Reaper. It's interesting to see the way he uh, has that little towel as well on his mouse. Not sure how long he's been using that for, but he was adjusting that in the early game, kind of 
getting it uh, stabilized. I, I look at that and I think that can't be good for your accuracy. And then I look at him never make a single misclick and I'm like, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be doing it. You know, he used to wear, wear wristbands, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was a little time there where he was doing that. I guess he just found that this was easier to work with. I'm not sure. But as you said, he's obviously very precise with it. So this time around, we did not have a 3cc build. Um, I mean, really, with the map order, I would not have been shocked if it was the reverse. He chose the last map, the shorter one, more aggressive, to do something on two bases. Hmm. Uh, no, he chooses Ancient Cistern, but a larger map is going to go up to, OK, yeah. double starboard. I was like, is that a third cast? I was like, what is that for? I, I feel like this, Gumio did it. Oliveira did it, now Maru's doing it. Is, are we just going to see 2 Fort BC as a, a normal part of the meta now? This is a very uh, committed build order. Yes. Ragnarok does have an Overlord in the back. If that sees the third gas, it would be a big tell, but Maru knows it's there. And he's going to build a Viking, and I would expect a fusion court to come down. Now, mm. wouldn't it be mad if it was like, no, 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 it's just double starport speed bench. <laughs> he's like... Well, that would be really weird. Um, now, that's that's interesting. So I believe Oliver and Gumio, when they do this build, it is off the command center first. Like, I think both of them do it that way. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you, it is a really tight build. Avoiding two battle cruises is insane on the cost themselves. Even the supply cost is really big. Did he forget his fusion core? No, it it's actually wheels. two port banshee. Are you kidding me? Nice. I was going to say, I don't know if you can afford it in the way that this has played out. He was still producing Hellions <laughs> as well. And no, actually, he could not have the two banshees instead and their speed upgrade on the way. So this should be also going into some battle mech. Maru bringing out a battle mech build order, blocking the Zergling scouts as well very nicely. Ragnarok has a Roach Warren, which will help him out against oh. the Hellions. And wow. Yeah, didn't see the gas. May have spotted the workers returning gas, but uh, just going Roaches for now, which is very safe. And if Ragnarok can get an Overseer or a Zergling in, anything to see those Banshees ahead of time will be good. He's building Spore Crawlers, so it's not like he's going to take massive damage from the early Banshees. It's more when there's four, five, six of them, they start just darting around and picking off your Queens. So, of course, Ragnarok will need to get up some anti-air. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, players uh, think Corruptors and Muters are really bad at dealing with the Banshees because they're so fast they can scoot away, yeah. and those units don't serve much other purpose. However, in this scenario, when it's two-port Banshee, I think it's totally valid to go Muters. Yes, absolutely. If somebody tries this and then dies immediately, absolutely. If they go fast enough Muters, it can work. Uh, but that's not exactly what Ragnarok is thinking. So he is instead going for a lot of Roach Ling. He's going to be heading with nothing that shoots off uh, oh. across the map. I get someone who's making everything that shoots down. Uh, it just is not a good recipe for a great TDZ. <laughs> Maru's build order is super weird, but it happens to be one of the best possible things against what Ragnarok's doing. He's going to hide his Banshees to the last possible second because he wants Ragnarok to overcommit. And then five Banshees are going to fly out and ruin Ragnarok's day. Keep an eye on Ragnarok's camera. When he sees these Banshees, Ooh. he is going to be very unhappy because this is such bad luck. Oh, here it comes, guys. Watch the camera. Watch the camera. That is a lot of Banshees. So far, no reaction, but I, he's got to be reacting in his brain in his head right now. Like, this is a disaster. He's got to deal with all these Banshees for the rest of the game. Of course, Maru is going to have all the time in the world, all the safety in the world back at home to perfect his macro, where Ragnarok's going to be trying desperately to get a fourth, and then his creep spread out, his queen's alive. A Ling run by looking to buy sometimes, also caught by the Hellions. This could just not be more perfect for Maru. Maru is cleaning this map up right now. The Banshee's gonna get over to that side. And without that Spore Crawler between the bases, already all the Transus is gone. One Queen goes down, the Spore could get picked off as well. Maru, for some reason, pulls away there. I would have liked it to clean that Spore up and maintain position outside the oh. base. Oh, it's a barbecue! Yeah, the Lings can't even get us around. There's too many of them are already dead. So now the Hellions will be involved in barbecuing up the drones, perhaps. The Spore even going to be targeted. You just have enough Banshees to do so. Uh, and not even gonna lose that Banshee. The Queen is like, I'll go get it, and uh, well, you don't actually have detection, so no. <laughs> Deadly, disgusting, and a dreadful position to find yourself in. Ragnarok's build choice would have been perfect if Maru played the same as he did in game yes. one. But here, a complete switch up of styles, and it feels like he's one step ahead on the strategies. Ragnarok being caught flat-footed, and it's not because he's a bad player, it's literally because the build order just is so perfect for Maru to set up for that next stage. He can now swap into ground back Cyclones, upgrades, Blue Flame, Magfield, and he can expand all over the map. Ragnarok is just mm -hmm. licking his wounds and trying to survive. I like to say that there really aren't that many hard build order counters in StarCraft 2. Fortunately, just as much goes into a game. It just can't be that simple, but this was awfully close to it. Maru would have to mess up big time to let this game go, and I'm going to say it actually all revolved around that single Ling. If indeed it 
had seen guys on the geyser, as Peg had suggested, then he might have been a little wary. He might have said, okay, I need to check that again. But as our observer pointed out, he didn't get anywhere close to that refinery that was actually mining. And so Ragnarok had no idea. He was hoping for that third CC, maybe a Banshee or two, but they're gonna be across the map, would be an okay scenario. Instead, it is all this and more. Ragnarok Spire about to finish. He's going to be going for air units. Will it be Corruptors or will it be Mutalisks? We'll find out shortly. Mutalisks on the way. They shoot up and shoot down. They're a bit quicker as well. So a very good choice. And you know what? Ragnarok's doing a good job of stabilizing with the Queens to help support. He's got some roaches on the ground, but now the Cyclone Hellions here. He's got to hold that roach key down. Uh, oh, he's trying to keep building more Mutas. That's interesting. Maybe mm. thinking of going for the old school Muta Zergling style against this. Oh my gosh, the spores just keep disappearing. And yeah, the problem would be that if the Banshees have to be taken care of by any amount of Mutas, then it's it's not as massive as it might seem. Uh, Bowdecru or Bowdecruisers, the Cyclones, a little better against them as well. All right, so the Mutas reveal themselves. They are going to chase down the Banshees. The Banshees outrun the Overseer is usually the problem. Oh. So eventually some of them will be able to get away. In fact, they do. Coming back home, helping... Uh, uh, out the Cyclones, able to come back and do that. And it looks like they have fully retreated from the third orc. Well, they got the job done, didn't they? So yeah, they came back. Roaches are on the way. The double Evo chamber finally going down. Ragnarok trying to recover here. I do think Infestors might be the best comeback unit in this scenario. Not super reliable, but Pathogen Glands and, and Fungal can catch the Cyclones and the Batches. And Neural, of course, can turn games around at just about any point against Mech. It's not super high percentage, but you've got to go for a bit of a gamble if you're in Ragnarok's shoes. Well, that's a very good point. I mean, that could actually work out, but so far, no Infestation Pit. So far, no Infestors being made. Just a lot of Roach Ravager. Uh, now here, all right, so the Banshee, not exactly doing a whole lot anymore. They get caught by the Queens. You see now Ragnarok's point of view. He's also very, very fast. Uh, Muters are getting corralled. And well, hey, Lings are actually going to the third base. Is oh. Morrow starting to get split a little bit here? Can the Muters survive? Some of them will go down. The Lings are at that third base, currently dealing a decent amount of damage. 20 SEVs going down, guys. That's actually a lot done there. Ragnarok getting his scramble. And remember, we thought Ragnarok was going to be tilted on the camera early, but he didn't react at all. Terrible build situation, didn't react. We now see the first person view, looks super calm. He's playing his heart out right now and actually fighting back against Maru. I think if he had gotten more of a surprise, it's possible the Cyclones would not have had enough room to back away. That is one of their weaknesses, but it wasn't as Maru was still running around. Maru collected his forces. He got on top of that choke at the very least. He pulls back his Cyclones, and they have gotten so many lock-ons. This will not wow. snowball in the way that Ragnarok was hoping. Impressive hold for Maru there. Spotted it, pulled back the Banshees, do so much damage. And not only that, the way he morphed the Hellbats, got on top of those Ravages and really did a lot of damage as they were trying to chase the Cyclones down. A desperate ditch push there for Ragnarok, but not able to close the gap. And now he's got a few Mutalists poking around. He's trying to defend the counter swing from Maru. Sporkrilla does shoot down one of the Banshees, but five of those left and a pack of Cyclones with a few Hellions. Link's going around, but look like they want to get a flank on this. Mm, just go for the run by, which uh, might be successful. The Banshees are coming back home, so they may be able to take care of that. Mute is now all but one dead, so don't have to worry about that too much anymore. I guess it can sometimes be very difficult to end the game with this particular composition, but it does feel like Maru, the one problem would have been being severely distracted. The Mute is on one side, the Ling's on another. The Cyclone suddenly up against a wall would have been disastrous against Ragnarok's big push. But instead, they weren't up against the wall. They could micro. And now that Ragnarok's big push idea has failed, he is going for that comeback unit. He is going for the Infestors. But is it too late? Hives on the way as well. So no doubt Vipers with the Ducks and Parasitic Bombs will come in later. Hydras and then Lurkers. Nice units that can scale well against this battle map composition, especially pre-Ghost Tech. Biles, they can force Maru to move back, but they never really land against such fast units. The Cyclone's a nightmare to deal with. Normally the answer to Cyclones is to flank them, to come around, sandwich them from two sides, take away their mobility. But my gosh, what a commanding style from Maru. The hatchery in the top goes down to the Banshees. The Cyclones are picking off units all over the shop. The Roach Ravager Link coming in. A desperate attempt to get forward. The Vikings even killing Overseers here. Ragnarok is up against the wall with no room to breathe. And Maru is leaning on his chest, trying to push those last bits of life out of this Zerg. Ragnarok trying to fight back, but a hatchery he goes down as well on the other side and this fight he just doesn't have enough to defend <laughs> that was his main 
base going down. The Banshees never stop being produced. We even have Maru moving on just in case this alone does not work. And it looks like it will be cleaned up, but don't, don't, it's, it's nothing actually. Maru's got more supplies. Still got the Banshees. He's moving on to Ghosts. There's going to be so many more options past this point for Maru than there will ever be for Ragnarok. Doesn't feel good getting two port Banshee'd by anyone. Kind of feels like they're toying with you a little bit. But this was legitimately just a well-executed build, finding the perfect situation. And Maru, not a drop of sweat to be seen. Absolutely no stress. Completely chilled. 2-0 up in this semi-final. Yep, yep. Uh, pretty dominating, but again, to give some credit for that last game, just strategically, the build orders did not work out. Ragnarok did not get the scouts. Uh, did gamble, certainly to an extent. I mean, against anything besides double Banshee, throw out some uh, alternatives, even double battle cruisers, they would have been taken so long yeah. that maybe the attacks that would have hit with enough time to do damage. Uh, if we're talking about two Banshees, you know, a normal 1-1-1 one, one, one build, again, either their damage output isn't quite enough or they're somewhere else before they come back home. Uh, of course, any amount of third CC into barracks, you just don't have enough units. It works against a lot, is what I'm trying to say here. It can work yeah. against a lot, but I think against that in particular, never. I think Ragnarok showed great poise in that game despite it. Ling run by was good. Good attempt with the Roach Ravager shove. Just wasn't quite able to have the numbers to make it work or the surprise. Either one of those would have worked, but I think we are seeing improvement from game one to game two. The problem is this is a best of five and you've used up all your spare lives. Now you've got to win three games in a row. Maru, of course, is going to be more free and loose than ever. And I got to say, Zombie Grub, these are the points where I feel like Maru likes to build proxy barracks or Reaper rushes. You know, two racks Reaper into one of his four racks builds. Yeah. Just proxy two racks out there. I think there's so many dynamic things that Ragnarok has to worry about. It's going to be hard for him to pick his build order. No, that's exactly the problem. You have to worry about what the other guy is also capable of doing now that he has two lives in his pocket. But you also move on, I believe, to Maru's map choice. So uh, just going from bad to worse here. In the bottom right, now up 2-0. Again, looking to be the first Terran in a global championship final in uh, six years. That does not sound cool, uh, but that's what it is, guys. In the bottom right, as the red Terran, he is Maru. And in the top left side, he is a massive underdog in this series, playing for Alpha X for the last few years and really coming to his own in the last year or two. He's made a GSL Finals. He's now here in the top four of the World Championship. Give your energy to this man. It is Ragnarok. Oh, you said it, Pig. You did say it, and here we have it. Mara gonna go for the two racks Reaper opener. Not severely proxied, of course, not totally all in, but still gonna provide that pressure. Absolutely, and he does like his 3cc follow-up, but very well could also just be going for the uh, the 4 Rex build that we talked about, the Stim Shields push. And he's just gonna be moving forwards with that Reaper pressure to open up. Ragnarok going for a confident hatchery first. No drone scout, no safety precautions. I like it. I like that Ragnarok's confident enough to just do a standard opening. He's not playing too paranoid. And uh, as a, a big fan of the underdog, I always just want to see him step up in this moment of pressure. It's so hard. It's so easy to give up in this moment. But I really don't think that's the sort of stuff that Ragnarok's made of. No, he definitely has to be uh, mentally resilient at the very least. Certainly resilient in this game to defend against the early Reaper harassment. Now, it's not going to be that very dedicated three racks either. Uh, that can also be at home. It should be maybe even just three Reapers, three to five. And then into uh, the Marine production. It's a follow-up that can be very tricky for the Zergs to uh, both find out and then, yes, deal with. So that's more so what I am concerned for. That's what Ragnarok should be concerned for. If he lets these initial Reapers start to snowball, then yeah, uh, it might not end the game right then and there, but it will definitely point in the direction of a Maru victory. And it's a good spawn for Maru as well, because his add-ons will be on the inside of his wall-in. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a few players have them on the outside, and it make them struggle. That Beyond vs. Serral game on Ancient Cistern going to be something that, of course, haunts Beyond's and most Terran players' dreams. Uh, with the add-ons getting sniped and siege tanks getting stuck and all sorts of stuff on this position, Maru feels so comfortable. He's just like, there's no way Sim gets sniped. Super safe against any sort of bust. And I'm blocking the third base here to start things yeah. off. And the other third as well. Both of them? Oh, that's massive. I really like this choice from Maru. I think that it was all too tempting to go for a couple of drone kills initially. But I think if you just block the third hatch, 
treachery for the Zerg. I think it tilts them so much. It puts them in a bad position again for more so the follow up, not just for the three Reapers initially, which are never going to kill you. They could get a couple drones or they could block both your hatcheries and both are painful, but I think blocking both hatcheries is the most painful. Well, and he's built eight Zerglings as well. That's even less drones. If you're on two base, but at least you're full of drones on those two bases, it's not too bad. You can do things from there, but Ragnarok stuck building extra queens and lings. He's really got this pressure piling onto him behind it. Maru's like, yep, third CC, Stim, Factory. He is chilled out and progressing forwards. Ragnarok finally going to get his third base down. About a minute delayed, and he is definitely not having a comfortable series here. Maru just showing his comfort on this stage. No. Yes, that's exactly what he's doing. Maru is so comfortable. Ragnarok is trying to be comfortable. You pointed out, like, at least he's not trying to just, you know, pull first and be super paranoid all the time. But if it, it feels like even when things could line up well for him to at least give us a decent macro game, uh, well, they do not. So this is certainly the shining example of that. Just early on, getting denied his hatcheries for so long. Unable to do anything in return as well because you wall off, of course, those two barracks, the two supply depots. It's not like, like you can even try and get a counterattack in. So Maro just gets to do what he wants. He's got consistent scouting because he has the Reapers. He's going to follow up with a lot of pressure too, going to the 2 one, one basically kind of follow up here, and he'll be out in the map again very soon with a bunch of marines there's some nasty tank spots on this i've seen maru uh utilize for instance against lambo in the group stage he uh he definitely is very capable of delaying his third command center in this scenario and after the double medevac just following it up with tanks and marines rallying across the map and really creating just constant engagement stress and pressure for the zerg something which is hard for you to stand up against now double engineering bait does go down behind this for maru and that is pre-third command center right what? No. Oh, no, no. He did go three third CC before. Sorry, I forgot about that. All well, right. I was kind of laughing at the Marines not meaning to go out. <laughs> so I was like totally distracted. Um, no, they're supposed to yeah. be uh, plugging up the wall, waiting for their medivacs to arrive. Anything beforehand is just unnecessary. Could it have surprised Ragnarok and even killed him? Yeah, if Marines just show up on your base and you have nothing, but much safer to wait for the medivacs. And yeah, third CC will be coming down. Ragnarok trying to recover, uh, currently only up about 12 workers. I feel particularly great. Bailing this will be done. You don't really necessarily want to have to build bailings to defend only 16 Marines and two medevacs, but if it's anything more than that, okay, yeah, it's just going to be that. Then then you'd want them. So obviously they're very important for the next stage of this TVZ. Ragnarok's army supply is actually very high right now. Uh, Maru, of course, cut a lot of production to get that third command center so early. The Reapers finally are going to be getting shut down. Well. Even then, even, seriously, okay. uh, yeah. just leave, man. <laughs> How much like vision are you going to get from this? <laughs> he was going to leave, and he was like, no, you can have this. <laughs> it's, it's for you. You're welcome. I'm not just going to kill you 3-0 like that. Uh, but it's still very possible that he does, of course, 3-0. Maru, 16 Marines. Again, oh. not, they should not be capable of ending this game. They are not looking to end this game, but they are looking to deny creep, grab queens, kill lings that are not being controlled correctly, and then help take care uh, of the follow-up as well, in which Maru, well, that will be the real test for Rag. Ragnarok, whenever Maru gets some tanks, some Buddha mines across the field. Uh, Ragnarok way overbuilt army here, though. Yeah. He's just got so many Zerglings and so few drones, and Maru's like, oh, that was a poke. That's all that was, a light poke. I'm happy. I'm fine to not do damage here. You've already put yourself behind economically. How do you ever to secure this fourth base and make use of it? Like, you can defend it for now, but the thing is, Maru able to come in, take a trade, pick up, save those Marines. He's creating pressure, and Ragnarok is just behind on the economy. Yeah. And that means, of course, with all those barracks finishing up, Maru's production is going to explode. Yeah, going up to eight barracks here. I think uh, a lot of a lot of expectations for this map, uh, perhaps even just the general map pools, that we would see some more eight raxes. And I think this is just going to be such a brutal follow-up considering how the game has gone. It would be difficult to hold, even if Ragnarok had a really good early game. Uh, now, I, I, I do feel like it's impossible. You just can't help but be so sided with Maru with how the series has gone as a whole. And this game, Ragnarok's got to pull a rabbit out of his hat. Good surrounds can always make it happen, Zombie Grub. A good, good, beautiful flank, and I believe in the power of that. But you're absolutely right. Ragnarok's coming in it from behind. Definitely at a disadvantage. I like the micro, though. The queens do push it back. And those marines are starting to clear more creep on both sides. Remember, the central tank position on this map is so deadly. And that push will be moving out in the near future. Now that the eight barracks are up, the, the tanks are on sieging. Maru is probably going to be moving through the center. He hasn't started 2-2 just yet because the armory's not there, but he will be doing that behind. And for now, 12 Marines, one siege tank, 
And of course, there'll be Medivax rallying in behind it as well. And he is going to be wedging tanks in this forward angle and branching into the Zerg territory. Ragnarok tries to run out there, but he's not ready for this at all. No, he is not. The creep is going to be denied even further. Just one more scan necessary. Which maybe he's waiting on, actually, because <laughs> it probably should happen. A bit of a run by or a surround attempt is being set up, but it has been seen, but noticed by Maru, who's going to let his reinforcements take care of that one. Yep, the Lings go past, but they will get cleaned up. The SCVs on the third are there. Maru still continuing to push into the front at the same time. Didn't actually pull his SCVs off his third base, though. Maru with a little bit of a mistake, but his rally gets over. At the end of the day, only nine SCVs go down. These siege tanks all oh, forcing a fight. The Banelings get hit, but not on clumped up Marines. Maru is at 93 army supply versus just 71. And he is forcing Ragnarok to defend this base. Ragnarok's queens are out of energy. He's going to have to pull the trigger. He tried to go for a surround, but it was as Maru's reinforcements were coming forward. So off creep, the Banelings were actually found. Uh, to turn into a very good engagement for Maru, who's looking to pile on the pressure, looking to end this game, end this series right here, right now. Ragnarok got to make the decision to let that hatchery go, but what does he really have behind this? Another Ling run by attempting to do some extreme damage. It does look that like they'll have a bit more success this time, but will that actually be enough? Maru is just so consistent with applying the pressure. Now the fourth is down. He'll focus a little more on gathering his forces and he'll branch out down to the right side of the map. He knows that Ragnarok losing that fourth is going to be popping a new one up in the top right. And Maru says, no worries. Let's keep building SCVs. Drop my own fourth command center. Oh, and at the same time, there is a giant army going towards that new four. Yeah, uh, it's not that you're so all in. You can't go ahead and build another command center with his eight racks. The only downside really from this position is that Maru doesn't have double factory production. Uh, and that eventually will probably be fixed. He could also just go into a very biocentric style, something he says he likes to do, especially if he's feeling it that day. Uh, it's a quote, not me. And he might just go ahead and, you know, feel that anything will work at this point, as the momentum is undeniably on his side. Ragnarok has lived, but it's not exactly thriving. Those Marines baiting him into big tank volleys right now. A beautiful siege position across these bridges, up on these high grounds. And I feel on this map, pool, the Terrans are so good at putting those tanks nice and far back and then just stimming in and out and baiting the opponent in. The Medivacs are low on juice, though. So Maru is definitely overcommitting if he stims again, which he does. Ooh. Those Marines are so deep in the red, the Hydras can one-tap him. Yeah. He needs to take a bit of a breather on this one. There's no reason to keep pushing in here, but Maru says, I'm so far ahead, I'm just going to force the fight. I do think that backing off with those Marines and taking time is the correct call. On the other hand, Ragnarok is so low on army, it feels like any aggression is just forcing him into bad situations. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what's happening. He managed to find a run by that killed 19 SCDs, I believe. Oh, the Evo zombie grunt. That, that popped up for a second. But yes, the Evolution Chambers are unfortunately at this base. The oh. army focus fired down at the cost of a couple of Marines, but certainly worth it there for Maru. Yeah, Maru may have lost those SCVs and it definitely wounded his economy, but he's rebuilding, floating out of fourth. He's got plus three attack on the way. He's on 2-2 upgrades. And of course, Ragnarok's 2-2 was just denied. Ragnarok behind in the upgrades. He's down in the worker count, down in the army count, and now down in the base count. This is not a good position. Zerg is meant to be ahead in pretty much all of those numbers except army supply. And yet Ragnarok finds himself with no advantages. You were talking about pulling a rabbit out of the hat right now. He better be wearing a, a big old wizard's hat, uh, you know, having some, <laughs> some magic wands and, and tricks up his sleeve because he's got to pull out some absolute madness. And against Maru, the guy who is looking like he is set to potentially get his first world championship. I mean, this is so huge. He's been so dominant. Nice surround for Ragnarok. Good angle. I just don't know if he has the numbers. He doesn't. He actually doesn't. That is too much Terran right there. Ragnarok tries his best. He wanted to perform for the audience and get to those finals for Katowice, but once again, it'll be Maru ending his run. And it, for Maru, this means he will get to the finals. He knows it. Ragnar, of course, just smiling, realizing what's going on. Maru is going to get there. The drone pool, because you're on your last life. It's your last appearance here on the stage, but Maru has definitely got it. Yeah, that laughter is what comes out of a man who appreciates greatness and knows exactly what he's up against in this match and sees that, look, this is just ridiculous. The power, the onslaught coming my way. What a, an impossible match it is to play against Maru when he's performing at this level in this form. Really brilliant play from Maru and Ragnarok is forced to tap out. GG, well played. Ragnarok did give it his all. He has made 
A uh, historic moment for him, getting top four in Katowice, nothing to sneeze at. But Maru just in dominating form, having no trouble on his side of the bracket. A little bit of trouble in the group, to be fair, but no trouble on his side of the bracket so far. Continue dominance in this matchup. Little fist pump for the crowd. Again, first finalist is as Taryn goes in quite some time. And now he can actually say that he has a chance to lift that trophy uh, in Europe for the global champion. That would be such a momentous moment in this young man's career. He's been at the top of the game for a long time. He's been up on this stage many times before, but to be there in the grand finals will be a very special moment in his career. Yeah, that's what he's been looking for. The only trophy that is missing from his cabinets and it's looking tastier than ever. Of course, he will have to wait to know who his opponent is. This was the first semifinals, but uh, what a dominating series there. The last Zerg also taken out of the equation, a first in many, many years. Zerg has appeared in the last six or so Global Championship Finals. Indeed, and you know what? A lot of people will be out there getting overly excited, but this man is just waiting for the finish line. You know, I like how calm he's been throughout because he is just very much saving the energy up for the Grand Finals. He knows it's a long day, it's a marathon, not a sprint today. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we've got the players there just kind of going, my God, look at that <laughs> brilliant, you know? Even the pro gamers are absolutely stunned watching back those replays and looking at what went on. Admirable play there from Ragnarok and a great performance for him. Um, for now, let's go over to the guys on the desk with Kolaris. Thank you, guys. An absolute slaughter. Let's be real about this here. Maru looking impervious to damage and looking brilliant in victory. Joining me, Wardy, uh, as well as Tasteless here for this one. I, Wardy, what do you say about this? This was an outclassing. We kind of expected it. You know, we made something for this, James. It's this card. This yeah. card just explains the entire... That one. <laughs> this just explains the series. Maru's at a 96 and Diva's just better today. There's not much else to say, man. Like, he did builds, which we kind of expect Maru to do. He mixed it up. He looked like he had a bit of fun. He didn't need to do anything else, right? Like, it was kind of easy yeah. for him. You know, it's it's funny. Um, Ragnarok has improved so much. And it, it, he's good at killing other Zergs, okay? Uh, he's proven that, that he, even the other best Zergs in the world, uh, you know, Ragnarok can overpower them. But the problem is, you know, eventually you get deep enough into a tournament, and guess who's still around? It's Maru. Mm -hmm. And Mario easily has the best TVZ of all time. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say other than that, you know, as long as Mario is, is competing um, in GSLs or in IEMs, uh, Ragnarok will never be a champion until he can also master TVZ or ZVT I mean, and not just ZVZ. The, the, the unfortunate thing for Ragnarok on this series as well as what he is that it felt like Maru's greatest strength, his defense, was never even really tested. Never never the metal was hit against the wall and tried to, you know, batter it down. That did not occur in the series. I mean, the one time Ragnarok tries to be a bit more aggressive, Maru's like, double poor Banshee, <laughs> yeah. uh, how's life? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. It, it, nothing went right. Like, not only did Maru just have an easy time straight up and was kind of the better player, like, even the things like within the game just went a little bit wrong for Ragnarok to make it, you know, even emphasize that further, yeah. so. Yeah. You know, crazy, we don't have a Zerg in the finals of Katowice for the first time in since a Terran player run it back in 2017 or so. It's, it's a been long time. that long. Yes. Um, but just, yeah, I mean, Naru looks like he's in absolutely top form. He's not messing around anymore. And he has put himself in a position, an opportunity tasteless, where this is his best shot ever to win the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. And it's it's been years and years in the making, and Maru is now in the final. Yeah, he's so close. He's almost to the point of touching that trophy. He just has to go through that next final step. Uh, TVZ, I mean, this guy has proven that despite Zerg always being so uh, dominant, I mean, let's just face it, they do get more championships. Morrow does not seem to be weak in the matchup at all. No. Definitely not, and now he has no more to face. That was the last hurdle when it came to Zerg. Now he's going to face down either a Terran or a Protoss in the grand final here. And I don't know how that's going to go. I mean, of course, like with the early days yet here, as we still have that two play out, but Maru rounding this out, barely broke a sweat, Wardy. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's the right way to phrase it. I mean, I don't know how many more times you want to say, say that he got look, beat look. up, James. Like, I mean, look, do you want to throw his card away? Is that look. what you're building up to? Yeah. <laughs> Dead. Dead. Again, kind of grim. Sorry, I apologize. That's how we start this segment. <laughs> That's how we end this segment. I mean, no more Zergs. It feels really weird, actually, for Katowice. No more Zergs. Not in the final. But anyway, I'm getting word that the interview is ready now. So let's hear from Maru. Moving on into the grand final here of the World Championship.
Thank you very much, guys, and congratulations to Maru, who has made the grand finals here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Maru, when I spoke to you earlier, you shared with us how Katowice wasn't full of great memories for you because you hadn't been able to make the grand finals before, but today you have finally done it. You are through to the grand finals. How does it feel to do so? 네, 조성 주선수 너무 축하드리고요. 어, 아까 얘기했을 때는 어, 카토비치에 좋은 안 좋은 기억이 <웃음> 있다고 결승전 못 가서 이렇게 얘기를 했었는데 드디어 결승전 진출한 소감 한 마디만 해 주세요. 어, 맨날 4강에서 미끄러졌는데 이번에 결승 오게서 너무 좋고 결승 한번 가 보고 싶었는데 이렇게 오늘 가게 되어서 너무 좋습니다. Uh, he says, yes, uh, I, I always just made it to the round of four and then I would just slip out of the tournament. Uh, so I'm so happy I'm able to make it. I, I really, really wanted to make the grand finals, guys. So uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy that I was finally able to do so. And now... <laughs> You took down Ragnarok uh, in very convincing fashion. When we spoke to him, he talked about how he's been able to ride this momentum of getting revenge on so many different players who have been defeating him in the past. And were you worried that that momentum would continue in his series with you? That 신인범 선수와 전 인터뷰했을 때 이번 대회에서 전에 패배를 당했던 선수들한테 많은 복수를 했다고 이렇게 얘기를 했어요. 그래서 조승주 선수한테 작년에 GS 결승전에서 4대0으로 졌지만 이번 기회로 혹시 이 기세를 타서 어, 복수하고 싶다라고 얘기를 했었는데 그 기세가 이 경기 이, 이 4강에 영향이 있을까 생각을 혹시 걱정이나 했나요? 어, 딱히 걱정은 안 했고 저는 지금 제가 제일 잘한다고 생각하기 때문에 그냥 저만 잘하면 다 이길 수 있다고 생각. Love it. He said, uh, no, no, I wasn't too concerned. You know why? Uh, it's because I definitely think I'm the best in the world right now. So as long as I play to, to my ability, uh, I knew that I would be absolutely fine. And on that note, I'm personally curious. I know you had mentioned you wanted to play Cyril. How did you feel when you saw that he wasn't going to be your opponent? Was there any sense of relief considering Cyril is such a great player? Or were you actually sad because you really wanted to face him? 이제 세라 선수가 떨어지는 걸 봤을 때 어, 기분이 혹시 좋았나요? <웃음> 아니면 어, 좀 아쉬웠나요? 어, 그 어느 때보다 카토비치에서 제 지금 상태가 좋았다고 생각해가지고 한번 해보고 싶었는데 뭐 떨어진 건 아쉽지만 저는 결승 왔으니까 <웃음> 결과론적으로는 좋은 것 같습니다. Uh, he says. My condition at this Katowice is the best it's ever been at, at any Katowice. So honestly, I am disappointed I, I wasn't able to play him because I would have really liked to. Uh, but that being said, the end result is I'm in the grand finals. So I, I think things worked out fine. <laughs> Now, last but not least, in order to make it to the Grand Finals, it's potentially two players. It's either Oliveira or Hero. Oliveira mentioned that he actually practices with you quite a bit. And Hero is a player that you played back at the GSL round of four, where you were able to take him down last October. What are your thoughts on those two? The first Oliveira or Hero, Kim Juno, will 올리베라 선수께서는 이제 같이 연습도 한다고 했었고 김준호 선수는 10월 달에 GS 4강에서 이겼었잖아요. 그래서 그두 선수 대해서 어떻게 생각하는지, 생각하는지 얘기해 주세요. 솔직히 변수 많은 태태전보다는 그냥 준호 형이랑 재밌게 한번 해 보고 싶어요. Uh, rather than a TBT that can really switch and go either way, I'd really just like to play hero. So, I like to play hero. <laughs> For now, congratulations once again. Maru makes it to the grand finals here at the Intel Extreme Masters of Katowice for the very first time.
Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to SGDQ, StarCraft Games Done Quick, as we have had ourselves two very rapid three zeros from back to back, as Hero and Mara are apparently not mucking about. But now we have our round of four to conclude things off before we get into that final and to my left-hand side to talk about it all. Oh, it's Artie. It's Loki. Loco. I just wanted to, to Loki kind of is sound okay. near. Loki, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll good. go with that. Yeah. Uh, and here in the ESL Cinematic Universe, the one hero that we do need is looking crisp and primed to do well. And he's going up against Oliveira Time, who shocked us all here, Artosis. It's been an amazing run so far. It's it's definitely been the best tournament of Time's life. He's awesome. had some deep runs in the past. We've always kind of had him on the radar as a very strong player, but we don't get to see him as much, right? He's from the Chinese scene. Here he is, he's doing so fantastically. I, I, like, it, what what a crazy series he had against Rayner. And if you can do that against Rayner, and honestly, it like could have been a 4-1, considering the one Baneling, right? Yeah, so yeah. Yes. just madness, he's playing out of his mind. He has, apparently his practice partners are the best players in the world. Yeah. You can't say he doesn't have a shot. No, that's for sure. I mean, if you were to ask me to do predictions for today, I mean, they've been all over the place, right? I've been <laughs> thinking in my head, okay, who will likely win this matchup? Who will probably win that quarterfinals? All the Zergs are gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I did definitely not predict this particular <laughs> outcome. I do still feel that Hero is the favorite, but I mean, Oliveira has been playing out of his mind here, so we'll see. Yeah, he really has. And I guess, I think as well, is not only that, yes, he's an extremely skilled player, his time, he's been really punching up as well. Mm -hmm. It's a concept mm -hmm. we've been talking about here during the day and watching him go up against Reyna and watching the defense that he was able to put. I know it's a different match, but I know, but the fact that he, you watch it and I'm like, that kind of looks like Maru. He just doesn't die. He yeah. just doesn't yeah. die. And that's so impressive to see, but going up against Hero, he's a killer in this matchup. Yeah, Hero Hero is insanely aggressive against Terran. In fact, he beat Maru in a GSL Finals, yeah, right? So, yeah. like, that's, I mean, that's all you really need to say about him. But, the, I mean, Oliviera is actually a bit dangerous here, I think. Uh, his TBT, his TBZ we've seen are incredibly strong. And he did lose to Neeb 2-1 to one in the he group did. stage. So that's that things. Mm -hmm. Neeb actually almost squeezed his way out of that group. But yeah. yeah. Need plays very differently from Hero. So I'm just wondering, maybe his style will match up better against the aggression from Hero. Mm. Final thoughts, Loki? Lo Loki. <laughs> I'm stuck with the Loki. You can call me Loki, that's fine. Final thoughts, that's Loki. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really hope Oliveira can make a, a good series out of this one. I think yeah. Hero has been, well, incredibly good for a long time now, right? And I think he is the favorite going into this particular series, but I really, it would be really cool to see one of the Chinese players in the finals. I know that the Chinese fans in general are incredibly passionate, yes, so yes. seeing one of their players go this far already is amazing, but if he can go into the finals, that would be so sick. It's already monumental, but yeah. if you go into the final, it will be absolutely unprecedented. It will be beyond a lot of what we've seen here in StarCraft II, for, especially for the Chinese scene. Mm -hmm. But it is now time to head over to the stage. It's our last round of four before we get into that grand final. Let's get to it. Maru currently sits patiently awaiting in the grand finals as he awaits who will be facing him. Will it be the Chinese Zerg who is having a career high performance here at Katowice? Or will it be our Korean Protoss who has a chance to make it to the grand finals here for the very first time? Please welcome on stage, it's Oliveira and Hero. <laughs> Terran versus Protoss in this semi-final matchup of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice 2023. Oliveira versus Hero. Maybe not the one a lot of people expected to see in the semi-finals today. 
but we think it's going to be an absolute banger on him. Absolutely, mate. I mean, Hero, I don't think it's all that surprising, even though not everyone thought that a Protoss player could actually make it into the semi-finals. Because I'll be honest, buddy, I travel to Poland each and every single year with the hopes and dreams of seeing some damn lasers in my semi-finals, and I haven't seen them a whole lot. But Hero has made it, and a lot of people did look at him in the beginning of this tournament as a top contender. There's a reason why the other pros rated him so highly as well on these cool player cards. But this man, if you talk about popping off, he's been popping off this tournament. We knew he was good, but this good? I didn't see that coming. Yeah, he, he's just putting runs on games together, which, you know, we've seen glimpses of, but to do it back to back to back. And, you know, it's unlikely he beats Hero, but it's so doable, you know, especially if he's feeling the momentum, he's feeling it, if he can just get rid of any of the nerves on stage and just say, hey, I'm already further than I was meant to be, even in my own estimations. Let's just have fun. I feel like that makes time for Oliveira real dangerous. Today we've had a lot of highlights already. Of course, in the game, you think of some of the crazy moments we've seen with that single bailing or just the entire best of five of the of that time played. But honestly, my highlight that I will definitely take away from today for a long time was that speech afterwards of time, yeah. man. It's like, time, how do you mentally recover after being down 0-2? And I just absolutely love everything he said. He is like, well, I love StarCraft. I love this game. I love this community. And I thought, just go ahead and enjoy it and play the best StarCraft you can. And the way that he said it, man i loved it i got a little bit emotional backstage i was like that's one hell of a speech and that's the kind of stuff we love to see from these dudes that have been doing it for so long of course hero was gone for a while he came back time Oliveira. we're gonna call him both throughout the series guys because he's still signing autographs right now in t-shirts <laughs> as time he's completely okay with it but he too has been around for a while we often so often talked about that series of aces rog that's kind of the first time that he showed the world he's like hey guys if you let me play at offline events where I don't have to deal with the ping that I get when I compete in online tournaments when I play from China. I'm really good, okay? I am literally one of the very best players in the world outside of South Korea. And we're like, you know what? You are. But this was still a run that very few people saw coming. And he's been around for so long. It's just amazing to see him already having the crowning achievement of his career. But can he make it any better? Let's see if he can in the top right-hand side. From Kaizy Gaming, he is on a run of a lifetime. Let's see if he can make it go one more time, one step further. It's Oliveira! Once more, Altitude has our first game here in the semi-finals, just like uh, Oliveira had in his quarter-finals run. In the bottom left side, long have we waited for some lasers into the semi-finals of a world championship, but he's here and he's gonna give it to us. This is Dragon Phoenix Gaming's hero. Long team name. Long team name when you say <laughs> it out loud, yeah. I know we can go with the DPG, but... Uh, Yeah, okay, the crowd's getting it into it. <laughs> Hero getting some love, getting some excitement, getting some chance going. I mean, these guys have also waited for a long time for some lasers, man. Like, imagine you come to Katowice as a Protoss player every single year, and you're like, yeah! All right, yeah. well, these Zerg and Thermosbury also do, yeah! <laughs> no, every year, the dream often ended in the quarterfinals, sometimes even before it, but not this time. Hero had to go up against his teammate, Dark felt like uh, that happened a while ago, but honestly, it was one of the more one-sided series we've seen today. He just looked better, but that is not going to help him here. PvT is a funny matchup where obviously mind games are going to be very important and momentum is a real thing. Uh, if Oliveira is able to go into like one of these cloaked widow mines once relatively early, you know, a couple hellions into some cloaked mind drops, and if Hero is not ready for it because he's stuck on Twilight Council tech for a while, that kind of stuff can really get the ball rolling for our Terran player. But I don't know if he's willing to take too many risks in the first game. He might just be like, you know what? I know you're very aggressive. Why don't I just try to defend and see how I do? Let's see if I can stabilize and I can weather the onslaught that I know you're going to bring. Absolutely. This map, big one as well, especially to get us started here. So that's going to come into play quite heavily. 
That's just our first Reaper coming across. It is very standard to start off with. No one's going to pull the trigger on any crazies just yet. We're waiting for that first tech choice, of course, from Hero Expect, and probably a Twilight Council. Mm -hmm. There it is going down, and the Adept here to fend off the Reaper initially, which, of course, would still love to jump in and get the confirmation that this is a Twilight. You know what's funny? Like I was talking a little bit with Clem about this upcoming series. Obviously, I wanted to hear his thoughts going into such a big semi-final, and I, uh, he's like, hmm, hmm. I was like, I kind of believe a little bit for Olivera, man. He's really on a roll. Momentum is a real thing. And, and Clem is like, oh, I hope so. But Hero's just so good. And he's like, he's amazing in PvT. I was like, what makes him amazing? And he couldn't quite pinpoint it. It's not like one specific thing. It's just that Hero is incredibly good at winning games. And it sounds really stupid, but he just finds different ways to win games. I think his crisis management and the ability to analyze every unique scenario that he finds himself in so quickly and then make the correct calls is what makes him such a dangerous player in this matchup. No, absolutely. He's just able to take situations that you don't see often. And I mean, how often do we see in a you know hero attack? And we're like, well, this is crazy. What's yeah, why doing? are you attacking here? You can't do much. Yeah, never mind. He wins. Yeah, what? exactly. And that is like such a defining statement of hero's play. Yeah. And, and that's what makes him great, because if he can do that and others can't, it's hard to play against him because you're playing the unexpected. And what's cool as well is I think maybe a way to describe Hero is fearless, right? He could see something heading towards his main base, but if he believes that he's going to deal more damage on the other side of the map than he will take at home, he will just gladly take that damage. He'll be like, all right, I know it's happening. That is going to hurt, but I'll be even more successful on the other side of the map. And that is not a call a lot of Protoss players make very often, right? We see something heading our way, we're like, okay, we kind of got to focus on the defense. Hero just sees opportunities in offense all the time, and that is what makes him the best Protoss player in the world. In this case, he sees exactly what's coming his way as he gets in. He sees the second barracks. He saw the stim pack started already, so first Adept gets the information. Oliveira lost his scout in Reaper, so he never got to confirm. He's playing a little bit blind. He can't play with perfect information here, and that means he's going to be maybe not quite as prepped as he'd like to be against this upcoming blink pressure. You know, I was thinking as well, if Oliveira does get the job done, he gets a TBT in the Grand Finals. And that's the one matchup where he has truly shined this event, even though the performance against Reyna was perhaps the most impressive of all of them. And Maru is obviously known as the best TBT player in the world. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because Hero wants to give us some more lasers. We've got the gateways, we've got our warp prism. And even though he's warping in a pylon on the other side of the map as well, that could be one of these just-in-case pylons, right? A, it could be a scout, right? Imagine if Oliveira sends out the Raven now or a Medivac, there is a chance that it still flies over this pylon. But on top of that, if he does something crazy with the prism, and God forbid, but he loses the warp prism, he could still be aggressive with slower warpings. Absolutely. He's taking his extra gases behind this, by the way, as he sets up to follow up with even further tech. And obviously, a later third base with how much pressure he wants to apply. He has the observer to help him pick a fight as well as the stalkers get ready over to the right, it seems, towards the main base. Yep, decent amount of surface area to be active, but not as much as in some of the other maps in this map pool. And even though, like, Hero took these gases, that gives us the idea that he just wants to poke, he wants to find a little bit of damage and get further ahead as he's dropping some tech as well. I think this is one of these moments where Hero is waiting to see if an opportunity presents itself, right? If he's being dropped, he's like, hey, that means you've invested in this drop, that means less units at home, let's go for it. But if he sees nothing heading his way, he's like, okay, I gotta slow down my roll a little bit, because clearly you have been expecting this, you've been keeping every single unit that you've produced at home, I gotta slow my roll, still find a couple SUVs if I can, but, I, but he knows that he cannot possibly win the game here. No, absolutely. He's uh, just going to be having a few more stalkers. I was, I love this, right? Just very yeah. casually into the natural, get some damage. Now the prism in the main base. More SCVs that can go down. Oliveira has absolutely nothing here. He's chasing out in the front, and he is going to start chasing these stalkers down. But boy, does he need to get something done because the damage in the main base is adding up already. Yeah, it's so smart of Hero to warp in stalkers off the slope island while still being able to get some value out of his warp prism. He has warped in a couple of slow zealots. Normally not the greatest unit, but hey, it can soak up a couple of these shots of the Marines and the Marauders, and even that tank. 16 SCVs is a tremendous amount of damage in this phase of the game. And at this point, only Varen knows, man, that all of these units that are right now making their way to the bottom side of the map, they need to get something done. But I don't know how you can get a whole lot done. Maybe he can get a cancel on the third base, right? But I think that's about as good as it's ever going to be. But he's going to stim into the natural with no regard for all these stalkers and the overcharts. And he gets a lot of stalkers. But Big Daddy Colossus is here to save the day. But Hero's going to have to micro that Colossus. He is indeed, Ronnie, because there's not a lot 
lot left, and now he's going to start taking a lot of probe damage, and Oliveira's got a choice to make. No. He splits some units to the Colossus. What? The Colossus goes down. Oliveira on the counterattack, and he's up into Hero's main base, and we have got a bit of an upset to start this series. Hero is looking like he's about to admit defeat, Ronnie. He's got nothing left. Everything got unpowered, and time with these fist bombs that we've seen throughout the entire event takes the one own lead in this semi-finals. In a game that didn't really look all that hot for him because he was taking too much damage off that War Prism, and that's normally where things just don't end well for the turn player. He stimped and he said, no, I don't want to get a cancel on the third base. I feel I can fight this army of stalkers and sentries only. That was obviously correct, but normally the Colossus is there, or an overcharge is there to save the day. Time was incredibly decisive, but Hero absolutely messed up a little bit with the Colossus Micro. It was being tough targeted and he moved it forward mm -hmm. into the Terran army. Maybe that's because he had no extended thermal lens and he wanted to right click on Marines specifically where he's like, I don't want my Colossus to shoot at Marauders. I wanted to shoot at Marines, but a Colossus without a battery or any protection is going to fall rather quickly. What I'm amazed about is the fact that this wasn't like overly greedy at home from here either, right? He was tacking up off of two bases initially. He didn't like rush a third base during all of this and skip and delay the tack. And it just wasn't all there ready to go. He should have not died there. He knows it. And I think that's why you could see the facial expressions as well, where he's like, that was not supposed to happen. Because you're right, right? If he's playing a low gas style, but he's exploding up to four bases, double forge, and then this kind of stuff happens where you're like, oh, okay, I underestimated the firepower of that army. But it felt that he just never expected time to actually steam all the way up that ramp. He thought, Time is going to chase my army, he's going to try to get a couple of units, but the moment he has to go up the ramp into a Guardian Shield or Force Field or a Battery Overcharge, he's going to disengage. I am I'm quite <laughs> certain that he, that is what he expected. But Oliveira said, nope, I've taken enough damage at home, I feel like this is my best opportunity. And he went for it, and Hero is clutch and decisive, but so has Oliveira been throughout this tournament. Decisive was exactly the word I wanted to use, because he didn't turn around to defend no, as well, no. right? He was committed to going across the other side, and now he's rewarded with a 1-0 lead, looking to try and get to the grand final from Kaizy Game and make some noise for Oliveira! The run of a life. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps for I this know. guy. This is just amazing. It really feels like you're watching somebody's dreams come true. And he's not there yet, of course, but he is just playing an absolutely fantastic tournament. So is this man. And I think one map loss does not mean that he's out of this at all. In the bottom right side of Dragon Scales, it felt that everything went right for him until it didn't. Can he turn things around? This is our Korean Brodos hero. What a map to just go across the map on as well. Yes. Like it does not, you don't just get across there real quickly, right? You know, maybe if it was Dragon Skills, you can walk across, I'm like, okay, sure, but Altitude? And like, if that was ever going to work, I feel like most of the time it works because the Protoss makes an obvious mistake. They're not paying attention to the Stalkers on the left side. Like, they blink them away and then they stop running because they think the Terran army turned around. And then suddenly the Terran army stims on top of it. They get a few more Stalkers than they're supposed to. Then you can see it working. But I don't even think that Hero in his retreat really messed up. The only point where he started to mess up was in the natural, but just all kudos to Taiman for being as decisive as he was. I believe that the Terran players like to say he stimmed to win and he never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> he did stim to win, didn't he? As this probe wants to just be as in much of an annoyance as possible and perhaps try and delay the command center by a few moments. Is Marine first, which is something the probe would love to pick up on while keeping itself alive. Obviously, try and figure out that time in the next few moments as this is now officially a delayed natural. Yep. Hero will obviously know that he's going to have to clean things up a little bit. A lot of things were going well. We could see some of that trademark great aggressive hero play where even against a Terran that didn't invest in a Medivac drop or Raven Harass or Liberator Harass, he found damage. Like, that's kind of crazy. The moment that Oliveira felt it was the right moment, moment to move out, he was able to find some damage and things were looking quite good for Hero. We know that he is no stranger to the Stargate, and he's definitely willing to play a little bit of Phoenix Colossus once in a blue moon. And there is our first Stargate. Could also be, of course, an Oracle into Twilight play. That's also something that Hero likes, but wouldn't be too surprised to see a little Phoenix Colossus coming out of Hero in this series. Very safe, very defensive, maybe see a bit of a, a longer game here where I get actually up into those tech units and then be able to put those into play and try and find those, you know, aggressive offensive attacks that you are so well known for. So, yeah, I am with you. I feel like Phoenix is a very valid option here. And specifically, like you say, Phoenix into Colossi. Mm -hmm. I like that probe being on patrol on the left side. And that probe 
Actually, I guess maybe the idea that it's probably Phoenix, but we're about to find out. Is it Phoenix? Is it Oracle? Both are obviously perfectly fine choices. But if he would go for Phoenix, it makes sense. The rally point is suggesting Oracle, though. So he is going to open things up with an Oracle. And now that Probe is actually going to build a pylon already, Hero will come up with waves of aggression that don't make sense. But if he's doing it, everything seems to make sense when he plays Protoss. Yeah, just going Oracle into basic gateway units. So units that do not benefit from charge of a Twilight Council or a blink of the Twilight Council. That's a bit weird. Yeah. But it is going to be like a, basically a three-gate Oracle opener with a slightly later Twilight. Which is very, very interesting, right? I mean, it just saw that maybe the thing that Hero does sometimes that no one else really does. And it's that little bit random and you don't mm. quite know exactly what you're up against. He takes another gateway, Roddy, so yeah, really then, adding this up. Then it should be four gate Blink Stalker, right? That's yeah. the only thing that really makes sense. So he's going to make it seem, okay, this Oracle, by the way, is flying into the main base. I have the feeling that the Cyclone is not even moving yet. I think for a split second, maybe Olivera thought it was fake or something. Oh, you know? he's going to... No. no! The lock-on gets broken, but that was awfully close. <laughs> Hero knows that he dodges a little bullet there. But this is annoying for Hero, because this Oracle is important for various reasons. Not just the ability to activate Pulsar Beam and pick off SCVs or help out in the fight. But that Oracle needs to make its way to this latch that our observer is showing, because Hero wants to blink into the main base. And if you don't have that Oracle there, you've got no high ground vision. So taking that much damage on the Oracle is already a problem. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be extremely difficult to maintain this attack, basically. And that's going to put Hero in, like you say, an odd spot, a tougher spot than he would like to be in. And all because that cycle is really stretched to stay stuck onto it as long as possible. Starport about to finish up here as well. We'll have that to add some further tech into play. And we do have our first medivac coming out. The stim's about to be done, man. I'm not sure we can do anything with Blink. Yeah, no, I like the builds that Olivera has gone for, because it's a lot of units. I have the feeling when Hero shines the most in this matchup, it's against the Terrans. It's like, oh, Reaper, Halley, and a little Widowmind drop. But then eight stocks blink into the main base, and you've got nothing. But I think with the openings that Olivera has gone for so far, he just very quickly has a lot of firepower. Now, I don't think he should be moving out, but obviously <laughs> he found a lot of success with it in the previous game. I think that Hero's probably a little bit surprised by this as well. Blink is not quite done yet. I wouldn't hate a second pylon in the front hero. I think that's kind of mandatory because you don't want to see the shield better be uh, unpowered. The stock is still being walked in on the other side of the map. Oracle's going to town on the SVs. Wadi, all hell is breaking loose here in the semifinals. Can Hero defend the army this time around? Let's find out. I'm a little bit worried if these tanks get set up, man, onto the natural. It feels like then we're going to have a tough time as Hero, but he's doing a good job of buying time. The stalkers have forced an early warp, and he's got the other stalkers ready to flank as well. And of course, now Oliveira has no retreat possible. So here we go. These stalkers are just going to get one more Marine for a moment, but. Yeah, I feel as though we're cutting off reinforcements, and with that, Oliveira's not gone soon enough. How can Oliveira ever get home, man? There are stalkers everywhere. He is going to try. Hero will not let these tanks go home <laughs> easily as he blinks forward, tries to get the medevac. Marine Stim one more time. Where are the other stalkers, Hero? There they are. They blink from the bottom of our screen on top of this army, and Hero will clean this up in the end. But economically, this is still not all that bad. The biggest problem is right now there are 15 stalkers against six Marines. The Oliveira truly needed these these tanks at home to stabilize and we know that hero will never give you time to stabilize if you need it the most and we go with the blink and this one should be just a contract that's already signed ggs hero is going to tie it one to one but these quick aggressive games go either way in the first two yeah i uh I have to question Oliveira's decision to move out there in the first place. Like, you have to know who you're dealing with, right? If you're going up against, let's say, Stats in his prime, you know that he's going to just crank out as many probes as possible. He's going to go up to three bases. He might poke you a little bit to slow you down. But that's where you know you can punish your greedy protos. But Hero is the guy that's going to attack you. So if you, instead of just focus on defending with a bunker and the immediate reinforcements and the SCVs around, uh, just sit back, you're going to have an advantage. But the moment you're attacking into the dude that's going to attack you, he will pretty much be ready because he's already making a lot of units because it's hero. Yeah, no, I, I'm 100% with you. It's it's just not quite logical, right? And I think you've got to think as well, what is he doing? I've seen one oracle and nothing else. No yeah. second oracle or anything. So he's going into something and 
But yeah, he just got overwhelmed too quickly. I mean, if he could have maybe got across slightly faster, but Hero was just so well set up. He did everything he had to to buy time and mm -hmm. shut it down. Maybe Oliver was hoping that be Oracle into like a couple of Phoenixes hiding yeah. at home or something, yeah. right? Because if it would be Oracle into Phoenix Colossus, then yeah, the two tanks and a bunch of Marines could actually be very frustrating for Hero to deal with. But we know that Hero loves his blink play. We know how aggressive he loves to be. Like how often do we sit here and cast a Hero PVT where he goes up to three bases and 60 plus pros before he starts making battle units like that's just not who he is you need the information when you play against hero if you're gonna make moves like that you've got to have the reasoning behind it it just wasn't there this time and we end up tied up in this semi-final Oliveira and hero so far so good with a lot of fun in the first two games one absolutely amazing move by heroes even when he saw the move out coming he still walked in four stalkers on the other side of the map and these stalkers were cash money right they sniped the medevac they sniped a couple of marines and they also made it impossible for the terran to retreat because he was surrounded by stalkers he really was the crowd wants us to get going roddy usually it's the observer that's spinning around to get us going in the bottom left from kaisi gaming give it up for Oliveira. In the top right side, we are looking at the main base of our Protoss player tying things up after making a lot of stalkers in the previous game. This is our Korean Protoss spawning in the blue, Hero. Hero looks very cool, by the way, in his Dragon Phoenix gaming jacket. He really suits <laughs> I like he wears it with style. My, yeah, I just want to get off my chest, man. He looks super cool. <laughs> <laughs> does look like a champion, but... Very, very cool as well. How about this with some cool fast second gateway across the map? Or okay. do you think maybe something else? No, no, I think you're spot on there because we already have a pilot and a gate at home. Hero perhaps taking a little note out of the Max Pax playbook, even though that's obviously the original Max Pax build is very different, right? That was the mm -hmm. pylon into another pylon into a gateway. But this is something that we have seen Protoss players use occasionally, especially if they feel that they go up against Terran players that play rather blind. But make no mistake, this kind of stuff is a pretty big investment. But while I'm saying that, I've also been absolutely stunned by the ability of world-class Protoss players to spend all these resources on this kind of stuff and then still sometimes turn it into a relatively normal game where it's like, no, now I can expand, now I can drop my tech. I always feel like if you open up like this, like, you're all in. This, by the way, is best case scenario for Hero. This is absolutely what he's hoping for. Reaper into CC on the low ground. Things could not play out better here in the early game for Hero. Yep, this is going to be very difficult for Oliveira to turn around, and obviously, especially without taking any amount of damage, CC is going to get delayed from building for a long time. There is a Marine at least coming after that Reaper. Yeah, and, and Oliver is a world-class Terran player, as we've seen throughout this entire tournament. He has to know that the timing of that Nexus is not totally correct, right? There's not enough HP on that Nexus, so he immediately knows something is up. He's going to send this Reaper to the left side. He sees the pile and sees the gateway, but how do you, how do you keep the CC alive? He's going to try to oh pull a God. lot of SCVs immediately. I love this man because it's better to overreact than to underreact, but this can also fall completely flat on its face. Maybe it would have been sick to hide it. Yes, if he's actually yeah. imagine if he could surround the adept, but getting the bunker up is definitely the first way to stabilize. Yep, if the bunker gets up, then this becomes a lot easier. And of course, during this, the big thing is you are keeping that CC building. These SCVs not mining is 100% made up for the fact that this bunk, uh, command yes. center gets to finish easily. Wow, this was great, man. I love how serious Oliveira took this. He obviously got the scout off. Hero needs to get something done. He definitely want to raise the depots. Can't even find the one SCV that was still building the uh, orbiter. He's like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to get at least one SCV for my trouble. I got to say, this is picture perfect defense by a Chinese Terran so far. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's no damage being taken at all. These adepts just kind of get stuck here while hitting the depot, so the Reaper will pop out and keep on pinging that one down. Just make sure your shields don't regen so you can potentially get a kill on this. And yeah, just some cool micro between the two is obviously this is the highest level of play in the world, Roddy. Yep, Reaper is going to get one more oh. shot off. Gets the adept and it does not die. We're going to relocate the uh, command center real quick. Hero's like, hey, can I block it? Nope, too late. Adept's too slow. Twilight Council has already been built on the other side of the map. And I do believe that that Reaper finds Finally went down and at this point hero just has one mission and that is just make sure that this goes on for as long as possible try to pick up any SCVs that get built on the low ground like that one and yeah just try to buy some time for his Twilight Council to kick in as he fires up blink on the other side of the map and he's got a little way to go until blink as the cyclone out obviously really does put an end to this adept harassment 
in the end, there was four, uh, what, five Adepts built, I guess. He's lost two already, so quite the investment from here in terms of units. Yep. His Adepts will not commit here. Obviously, that's just a death sentence with so many units at this point. Any potential for Oliveira to get going before Blink's done, do we think? Or are we just sitting back? Mm, since he's once more investing in very quick steam, I almost would say that that's not necessary. But perhaps, I mean, economically, it's not looking all that bad. Hero does go up to three bases, by the way. Four minutes and 20 seconds. And now I just want to mention that eventually the Reaper did go down, right? The Reaper got a little bit too greedy one time leaving the bunker. The Adept once shot at it. Now it would be so sweet for Oliveira if that Reaper was still alive, because you could bring it back into the main base, hop it to the low ground, and then send it to the other side of the map. Because this is the kind of information that's really hard to get as a Terran player. Player. But Reapers are great scouting units, so losing that one after he already picked up the first Adept is actually very unfortunate. I have, I have one question for you, by the way, Wadi. Why do you think Hero did not open up with the Zealot? Because I feel most of the time when we see guys at this level go for the proxy second gateway and the pilot on the other side of the map, they always open up with the Zealot from home that they rally to the other side of the map. He did start the Zealot, right, as well. I'm sure I saw it in production and then, you're right, I never, <laughs> never showed up. Yeah, I don't really know. Maybe just something with being able to get the Nexus down faster if you skip the Zealot and... Yeah, I, that, that's pretty much my only assumption and then you just don't feel like the Zealot was going to do enough. Because normally the Zealot is there to buy some time, right? Because it mm -hmm. can go for the SCV. Will it get any kills? No, but it can stop the SCV from building the bunker. It can stop the SCV from building the command center. And while you get those couple of very precious seconds, that's when the Adept shows up and that's when the Adept starts killing stuff. But without the Zealot, it obviously became a little bit easier for Oliveira to get all of these buildings finished. Maybe just the timing to get across the map on this one. It's a great question, actually, because it is very odd compared to what we usually see. Mm -hmm. As we do have our stalkers obviously getting ready to be aggressive talking about Hero and this is obviously very Ooh. normal for him as the Adepts got through and obviously high ground vision is a big thing here for the stalkers. Uh, yep, Hero does have a robotics facility as well as he's got a war prism and he's got an observer in the main base as well I believe. And his graphics observer just got picked off by the way so now these Adepts if they could shade into the main base one more time would indeed be absolutely fantastic. Hero really switching uh, up by the way obviously going up to three bases quickly exploding with gateways on the other side of the map. Charge is already on the way this time around but once more, I don't hate where this game is going for Oliveira at all. But obviously, he's going to have to win a fight eventually. And I do think it's possible to win a fight once the medevacs are out, plus one weapons kicks in for the bio units. But he's going to need a slightly bigger army if he wants to run to the other side of the map. Because Zealots are incredibly good against small Terran armies, but they really fall off the bigger the bio ball gets. He's out of position right now, going for that gateway. So Hero will know that he might be able to strike if this is something he's wanting to do. The Adept will commit into the natural for the first time. Looking for some kills. Haven't really found any yet. Just now getting to two SCVs. Can we make it a third? Yes. Yes, we can. The Stalkers decide not to commit. They are just going to stand steady out big scout. the base. Very big scout here. One brave little Marine from time on the other side of the map saw the third base. And on top of that, it sees no gases in the natural. So time at this point knows, like, wait a minute, you've got no upgrades. Doesn't seem like you are going tech heavy and I don't have to worry about any Colossus. I have to worry about a lot of Protoss units as the Cyclone gets the lock on the War Prism. Oh, 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 oh. That would be massive for Oliver and he gets the Prism the without really taking a whole lot of damage. The Stalkers try to go at the but the tank's defended as well, so that's not going to get anywhere. Four SCVs, but this entire attack of hero is more or less shut down already. This is not what he's looking for, man, and he is going to get out of grid in all sorts here. And this is where the army supply starts looking like maybe it's time for the Terran to start getting adventurous, right? Because Hero clearly wanted to get pretty far ahead with a lot of Stalkers and Zealots, and then he transitions. But the attack got stopped before it ever truly got going, and now Hero's going to have to deal with a pretty big Terran army. We're looking close at 80 army supply with pure Zealots and Stalkers that are 0-0. Zero, zero. Even if your name is Hero, this is going to be a very difficult defense. It absolutely is. We've We've got like a lone immortal, a sentry to try and give us some hope, but it is going to be tough. These dogs will do everything they can. A couple of Zelds are going to go either flank, flank or counterattack. Yeah. That's smart that Hero's already thinking about this stuff. Oliveira is also thinking about it, so he once more sends an individual Marine forward. Hero remade another prism. I think at this point it's not so much about prism, more about battle units. A Templar Archives is done, one Archon is on the way, but one Archon not necessarily for Tesuke. Hero will go for it, immediately activates Guardian Shield. He thinks he's got enough Zealots, Wadi. He does indeed, this bio runs through the tanks, using them as a choke point, the Blast Tank going through, and it is going to fall down now. The Stalkers took a lot of damage from those tanks, with all the Zealots gone, the bio looking kind of scary still. Mm -hmm. The upgrades are obviously massive for Oliveira in these fights, being just up plus one even is big for him. Saving that Marauder there is big as well, right? Now the Medivacs can do that thing, and Hero really needs to have something going his oh. way. Oliveira, despite the fact that he's got three bases, right? I'm not kidding. 
Am I crazy? He's got triple orbital. Can we go ahead and confirm this real quick? Three orbitals. He's still going to pull the SCVs because he knows that SCVs are fantastic against Zealot. They can create the force field that Terran players dream of. And he wants to hit before Storm. And I think he's doing it, man. What a read by Oliveira. Oh, what a read. Liberators are sieging up the probes. Berlin as we have a worker fight on the front lines. But Oliveira cleaves through that one. Yeah, and he's going to stop Storm. No splash damage apart from a single Archon. <laughs> and it's going to be kind of sad here as it runs to the left side. We can start another as well. The Liberators are already setting up for that part. The gateways are being unpowered and Oliveira with 1-1 one, one is looking great here, Roddy. Oliveira with a soul read on this game. He knew that this was the moment to pull the bars. Now the Bi army is a little bit overstimmed and there are a couple of Immortals on the left, but Liberators are making sure that there is Terran Justice in this part of the semi-finals as well. Hero has lost 41 probes, lost the army on the left side. That Nexus has like 10 HP. There is pulling the bars and there is pulling the bars at the greatest moment to ever do it. And this was the moment for Oliveira. What a call, cool, Roddy. I mean, like you say, he's set up for the macro game and he just realizes, I've got a killing move right here. He does not hesitate and it was perfect because he stops that storm. <laughs> the one thing that could have stopped him, the Nexus falls, the Stalkers are going down and I think we're saying goodbye to Hero for <laughs> game number three as Oliveira is going to have a lead once again in the semi-final. Another cancel on units and this is it. GG. Wow. Oliveira is a match away from the grand final. <laughs> What a call and what a read by this man. Did he have to pull the SCVs? Was he in a bad spot? No, he could have played a normal game. But after that initial skirmish where he picked up all the Zealots, was able to save the majority of his bio armies, like, Wait a moment, this is pure gamer units against bio units. This is where SCVs are better than in any other scenario. And despite the fact that he's got triple orbital, he grabs the boys, makes the Terran voice field, gets on top of the Templar archives as well. And obviously some people will be wondering, why on earth did Hero drop his Templar archives at the third base? Well guys, sometimes as a Protoss, you just do stuff. You just click buttons. There really isn't a great reason to ever do it. It's supposed to be in a safer spot, but Hero probably thought this game is gonna go on for a while and this is not all that important. I don't know if Storm finishing up would have made a difference, because I don't think we had any High Templars ready to Storm, but he did have an Archon later on, and one or two Storms, if you saw how low on HP that Terran army was, maybe it could have made the difference. We'll never know, I guess, unless we resume it from replay or something, but what a call from Oliveira, man. Oh my goodness, I'm getting goosebumps. What is this? that this man is on actually just world-class level decision making right just i mean you have the world championship you gotta play like this if you're gonna win it if you're gonna keep going on Oliveira needs one more map here against Hero to make that grand final. Hero wants to bring it back, but he's constantly playing from behind in this series. We'll see if he can get it done as we go on to what has been the best map of the tournament in terms of game quality. Grezvan is up next. I was like, wait a minute, we already played Altitude. <laughs> Why are you, you know, loving this map? Eh? I heard you talk about it in the, the green room as well. You said that this map has just delivered nonstop. Yeah, it really hasn't. For me, it was special because like, I doubted this map of it coming in. Yeah. It's been really good, so here we are, up 2-1. to one, Our Red Terran play from Kaizy Game. He's a map away from getting it done. It's Oliveira. In the bottom right side, the man who has won multiple IEM championships in the early days of StarCraft II. Those were not held in Katowice, but he knows what it feels like to make it to a final of IEM tournament. He needs to win two games in a row to get there again. This is Hero. I gotta say, the defense of Oliveira as well against that first Stalker Zealot poke, right? How many times haven't we seen Hero just straight up kill a Terran yeah. player? Where he's like, ah, relatively easy game. Haha, <laughs> it's not because I'm Hero and I will find a way to pick the Terran apart. But the Cyclone Micro around the Zealots that got hopped or that got unloaded from the War Prism, the immediate scan, so we didn't have that moment like, oh, is he going to get the War Prism? No, he was always gonna get the War Prism. Oliveira is just so clutch this tournament. We've seen it in TVT. Then he blew us away with the performance against Rainer. And now he's doing it again in the semifinals, taking the 2 1 lead. Just one more win for Oliveira. I'm sure that you've had the question as well before the tournament, uh, Wadi, where people are like, who are you, which is the dark horse? You know, who do you think is going to go very far that you don't necessarily think people are going to go very far? And I'm not going to say that nobody said Oliveira or Time, because there's always someone out there that's like, ah, I actually really believe in Oliveira, but this is the dark horse of StarCraft II history almost, man. On, on this stage, such a run, absolutely wild. 
It says you. <laughs> what did it say? I am Rotterdam's number one fan. He was giving a good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his fan as well. You know that man is from Birmingham. I, I, know, I know very well who he is. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, they call him the Birmingham Banger. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> Reaper gets the probe here. Is going to be able to knock that one out. And that's obviously just less information for Hero. And obviously nice for, you know, Oliveira to know it's not on the map proxy or something for the moment. All right. I'm off track now. <laughs> Let's yeah, yeah. go ahead and get back into this hype TVP. Man, these games, these storylines, this tournament, why they like. Obviously, we always have high hopes when we go into the final day of a StarCraft 2 World Championship, but I feel like you could have asked so many StarCraft 2 fans to predict this bracket, and I highly doubt that anybody would have guessed it correctly. No, there's no way, right? It's There's just been too many twists, too many turns. Oliveira coming in here and just going to sit behind the mineral line. And obviously, if the Adept comes here to chase it off, he can jump in the main, perhaps. So, giving himself options early on. We have that second barracks on the way. Oh, move the Reaper! No, you cannot lose a Reaper this early, but it will barely escape. The Adept just needed one more hit. If an Adept is able to fire twice at the Reaper, that's kind of when you know as a Protoss that you have it, if the Shade is available, because the Shade will obviously be able to catch up with the Reaper. And in the end, Olivera dodges a bullet there. It's Phoenix, by the way, straight up Phoenix. We were talking a little bit about the Phoenix in Dragon Skills. And this is the first time that Hero will play Phoenix. I gotta say, there's an odd battery in the main base, right? I don't know if we addressed it or you've addressed it. No. Never really seen that battery. I don't think it really interferes a whole lot with the mining, but this is one of these batteries, though, that if there's ever a Widowmine drop in this game, which I know is hard against Phoenix, but if there would be, you better pull your probes, otherwise you lose the absolute maximum amount. Because of the battery, the probes actually clump up a lot more than they otherwise would. Do you like the Phoenix, considering Oliveira's consistently going for fast second racks and stem. Uh, I guess if you just want to play Phoenix Colossus on two base, it's always kind of safe, right? Isn't that like, you know, it can be yeah. hard against certain tank pushes, but I'm with you. Like, technically, the way that Hero has been playing with Blink Stalkers, and that's the unit that he loves the most, that is not bad against the stuff that Oliveira is doing. Like, yep. Blink Stalkers are probably indeed, in theory, on paper, better than the Phoenix build here, but maybe Hero just feels like he needs something else because he's not feeling it and he feels like he's not making the correct calls in the heat of the moment like he normally does. So yeah, maybe just to flip the script here and change the tempo a little bit. But I, I absolutely understand what you're saying because technically, <laughs> if you would ever tell Protoss like, hey, this is the build that the Terran is doing, there are very few Protoss players out there that'd be like, you know what, Phoenix, that's what yeah. I want as my opening. Yeah, it's definitely uh, an interesting one. There is that Robo base, so we're going to really try and get to the proper Phoenix Colossus stage this time. We've been denied there in previous maps. Mm -hmm. There's obviously Hero getting his numbers up. Obviously, we'll need a battery on this natural and just needs to make sure he doesn't skip gateway units if there is going to be a push is coming his way. I find the third base now pretty ambitious, by the way, man. Because mm -hmm. there is indeed no battery in the natural. It's not that Oliveira pushes with Marines only. You know, everybody's yes. familiar with what we call a 2 one one where it's 60 Marines and Stims or a straight-up 3 Rex. No, he's been pushing out with tanks, right? I think we have Cyclone into tank. Do we have tanks this time around? No. Okay, well, then it actually works out in a uh, 300 yeah. IQ manner for Hero. Because that is the one unit that Oliveira absolutely needs here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, we'll see what he does. First two medivacs coming up, and obviously we'll line up that plus one in combat shield very shortly as well. So Oliveira will be looking for something, at least when those upgrades are finished. There's no way he's going to sit back forever. Hero, everything on the way for him. Third base, Colossus, mm -hmm. plus one. It's just a matter of can he truly get there safely. Well, let's see. Right. That's where you know a Terran player is dialed in and in the zone when an observer is in range. They throw down the scan immediately. Phoenixes do show up. They're going to lift a couple of SCVs. Four SCVs is decent. Very important for Hero that the Phoenix survives as Phoenix are very expensive units. And Oliveira, after picking up the observer and knowing where the Phoenixes are, Picks up 60 Marines immediately. He's gonna try to unload them in the main base, but Hero has a spotting unit at the bottom side of the map. I don't know what that is, but this Adept could very well be the MVP if this Adept can spot the double drop. Because if all these Marines unload in the main base, Hero is in all sorts of trouble, Wadi. This Adept needs to see these Medivacs, and I think he moved it a little bit. Yeah, he moved it north, man. It's, it's currently not in path to see these Medivacs at all, but maybe the Phoenix realized that perhaps there wasn't enough units around. They are starting to head back down to the bottom side, so maybe the Phoenix 
can help. As the Medvac is going to see this, the Medvac on hook in the bottom of the map, so this should be at oh. least a chance to deny this a little bit. The boost comes in from Oliver. He's heading for the main, but so is Hero. The immediate recall, MVP, but we need a little more because if all the units unload, four Phoenixes cannot fight this hero as he loses one of the Phoenix immediately. That stalker was brought in on the wrong side, and the guys are stimming for it. They're going to try to get on top of this overcharge battery immediately. That's a lot of pros falling. Where is the Colossus when you need it the most? It's showing up way too late, Roddy. 12 workers already down. We killed a few Phoenix. We killed some Stalkers. The Colossus is off and away because there's an attack on the right side. Hero's third base is under fire, and Oliveira's all over him. A Colossus and a dead. What are you going to do? You can't save this base, and Widowmines are going to blow stuff up as well, and Oliveira's on fire, Roddy. Starcraft 2 history. Our Terran player from China seems to be doing it. We've already called him the best player from China ever to be produced, but this right here is an unprecedented run. He's all over Hero. He's found a crazy amount of damage. He's not there yet, but I'm with you. That went even better than I think Oliveira could have dreamed it would go for us. He gets another lock on, throws down the scan as well. Hero needs to take a little moment for himself. He's running around the map right now in the center. Why are we here? Do we need to be here? No. He's trying to punish, I guess, a, a little minor overextension, but Hero, this is not the kind of army where you normally end games with, mate. You don't have any Phoenixes anymore. Hero feels that he has taken too much damage and he wants to end it, but how does he ever end it with this army? I, I don't think he does, Roddy. Not with Oliveira pulling back. He realizes, man, hey, you're coming at me. You haven't rebuilt your base. Widowmines are just killing units as they come. Oliveira's gonna get ready to defend this natural and potentially advance to the grand finals. SZV's pre-pull. What do you do as Hero? Well, he's gonna try. He's gonna try to bust down this bunker and micro the hell out of that one immortal, one colossus. He queues up a disrupt and now it feels a little bit disoriented. It's all over the place. We're warping in slow zealots, but Oliver's army is big. It's powerful. Hero needs the best whoppers and micro of all time and a couple of great force builds, but not even that is going to the save The prism! Him. The prism goes down! There's no more reinforcements! The Vikings are gonna go for the colossus! Oliver is gonna take down the army! Hero doesn't have anything left! His his army's gone! Oliveira wipes him out! One more Colossus to chase, and Oliveira is booking himself a ticket to the Grand Finals! It's StarCraft 2 history for Oliveira, it's StarCraft 2 history for the Chinese scene, I cannot believe it, but Oliveira is doing it! He is going to give us the TVT Grand Finals at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. We saw his TVT was great in the beginning of this tournament, he blew us away with the TVZ skills, but against Protoss Wadi, this man also knows what he's doing as he's gonna split one more time but history is in the making it's Oliveira's time super battery keeps the disruptor alive hero is gonna hang on to any hope he possibly can but the supplies just are not there for him he's got one disruptor that's on cooldown super battery is about to fade here comes a colossus to try and be the hero of the day but hero needs more than a hero for himself right now there's just no way surely we dive on in the colossus is gonna go down but the disruptor doesn't get it because Oliveira is still watching he is gonna lift up hero keeps on warping in but there's just not enough. Even if you push this back, you're down 40 army supply. Get ready for one of the most emotional pop-offs you've ever seen of a StarCraft 2 player because Oliver has been feeling it throughout this tournament, but this is so big for this man. I cannot believe what we just saw, but Oliver makes it into the grand finals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice 2023. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. You cannot believe it. It felt destined to become Maru versus Hero when we saw this bracket continuing to play out and other upsets happen. And Oliveira says, no way. I am going to come on in here, keep this run alive. And boy, he looked really good doing it. He looked good throughout the entire best of five. That SCB call on Asian, that has to be one of the greatest SCB pools we've seen in history. Because was it normally the right moment to, to do it? Was it necessary? No, but he knew it was the right call. He went for it. The man is clutch. The man has made it into the grand finals. Unbelievable stuff for StarCraft 2 in China. Let's hear what Kolaris, Artosis and Loco have to say about that amazing performance. Oh my god. I opened up this tournament on day one with the line here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice, the improbable becomes probable and the impossible becomes possible. And time here on this stage has made it happen. He is in the grand final after taking down Hero. I have got chills right now. Artosis Loco, not Loki, joining me here to talk about this series. Time is in the grand finals of Katowice Artosis. Unreal. 
unreal. We've seen a few deep runs from him in the past. We've known he's good. He has leveled up so substantially. Like every single person he beat, we were kind of surprised, right? Yes. Like yeah. every Each single every time, every every round, it was like, oh wow, he's doing really good. Oh my gosh, he's probably going to get out of that group. Look at that. Oh, he yeah. did make it. And then everyone's like, well, he can't be Hero Marine, right? Like, and then oh, you know, he can't be Rainer for God's sake. But exactly. here he is. Yeah. And to even add on top of that, I think initially it was like, okay, Terran versus Terran seems to be his specialty right now. He's doing very well <laughs> against, for example, Clem. He won against Cure. He won against Hero Marine. That's sweet. But what about a Zerg player like Raynor? Then he goes ahead. He beats Time Raynor. The reality it's Terran versus Zerg. Yeah. Apparently also amazing. <laughs> now he faces off against a Protoss player. Shuts down Hero 3 to 1. I mean, this is the tournament run of a lifetime. If you would have asked me before this tournament began who's going to win this, the odds of me saying Oliveira were very small, I'll be honest with you. At this series as well, I didn't think he was going to bring this pace to Hero. Usually, mm. Artos, Artos is in this matchup, I'm thinking to myself, Hero's a killer. Hero's yeah. going to be dictating the pace. He is going to be gunning for you. But it felt like Oliveira in this series <laughs> had a lot of control. He really did, and his decision making was out of this world. Like even that hold that we see on screen right now, bringing that many SCVs. We yeah, saw yeah. the second gate, brilliant. That SCV pull as well that Roddy was talking about. Yeah, unreal. He just he nailed everything. Oliveira is the real deal. Like this, Sorry. this is. I'm having like cognitive dissonance right now <laughs> yeah. because yes. normally I have what? like this rank of Terrans in my head where I'm like, you know, coming into the tournament, <laughs> in my head it was Maru is the best, and then Bunny, and then it's like everyone else is kind of screaming like, yeah, Kieran, like Beyond, Beyond and Kieran, yeah, Hero Marine, Hero Marine and Clem, exactly. And <laughs> now Oliveira. I got to be like, okay, legitimately. Oliveira, without any question, is better than all those other Terrans. He just is. We've seen it. On this stage, he has proved his worth. This has been absolutely miraculous. Guys, let's not delay any more here at the desk. Let's head over once again to another interview to hear from the man moving into that grand finals. It's time or Oliveira. Thank you very much, Calaris. Oliveira, the dream is alive, and not only is it alive, you are through to the grand finals in Katowice for the first time in your career. But this is so special because this is also history for China. You are representing your country and making history, making it to the World Championship Grand Finals. What does this mean for you? I mean, it's, it's like a miracle, you know? Like, <laughs> like, like who can who can know? Uh, and I will be a grand final. Like, and I want to say like so many people say like never give up your dream, just keep harder, just keep keep practice, keep harder. I think what you're doing is what every single player who who loves this game wants to do, dreams to do. It's amazing to get to witness it in person. And I'm curious because when I spoke to Hero, he said you're his practice partner, and that has to make it difficult to prepare against him when you know each other so well and there's mind games. Uh, how, what was your preparation process like? Because your strategies look so good. I mean, like we practice a lot, uh, we practice a lot, and like I always lose. Like we, we like we play like 20 games, and maybe I just win five or six games. But today, uh, I'm not. Uh, like, I don't know what happened even now. <laughs> I want to quickly ask just about one of the maps on map one. There was a moment where you were very brave and you stimmed up the ramp. I think even Hero was surprised because he missed, he, uh, he missed the force field. Were you sure that you were going to be okay? Were you confident in, in moving into his base? Yeah, like, I mean, I talked to my Chinese partner, Kafi, and like, nice, and we, we talk a lot, and like, we 100% seeing the hero the first game will Stargate. Oh. <laughs> so, I, so I just play like counter, counter build. And when I see Stalker, I think maybe I have one chance, uh, 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 like I have a chance to, to win the game, so I just go. Just go indeed, and now you're just going into the grand finals. And now it's really difficult because you're playing a five-time GSL champion, Maru. But I know that he's actually a player that you practice with. 
How have those games gone? I mean, yeah, I, I still lose a lot. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but who can knows? I'm in grand final and TVT I beat Hero Marine, TVZ I beat Renor, and TVP I beat Hero. And we always talk about the Maru is the fourth race. So it's a challenge and I want the dream continue. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. And like, uh, I want to say some to my Chinese friend because you guys know like Chinese server is off because Blizzard and like so many people, so many Ch Chinese people they are very sad about that. And I want to say some Chinese, uh, like use Chinese to my people is fine. Uh, like, uh, yeah, uh, 非常，我首先感就是感谢大家有现场来观看的观众，谢谢大家。然后谁谁知道有这一天呢？我也能进到决赛。然后我也知道国内现在有很多的人在熬夜看我的比赛。然后这一路走来真的太难了，我不知道花了多久的时间。然后是呃，我会决赛我也不会放弃的，我会继续打下去。You say it's a miracle, but you are inspiring so many fans and players out there. Congratulations once again as Oliveira moves forward to the grand finals here at the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Maybe. Ah! Ah, good. Well, I have no clue, but <laughs> looking at the tile set, maybe uh, Dracon scales. Nice. Actually, I'm not sure this has exactly look like Dracon scales. <laughs> <laughs> Map? Neon by the scale? Ah! 이거 보고 맵을 맞추는 거라고요? 로, 로얄 블러드? 아... Maybe... 밥, 밥이요? 어? 아, 이거는 쉽지. 로얄 블러드. 왜 이거 보고 맞추는 건가요? 드, 드래곤... 국력 같은데? 근데 플레임을 몰라가지고... 드래곤 스케일스? 베이빌론? 드래곤 스케... 아, 드래곤 스케일스? From the current map, right? Is this royal blood? No, this is dragon scales. <laughs> Damn, well, this is very hard. Chris <laughs> Van. Ah, ah. Neo Human City. You don't maybe look at what you Ah, you will do your washing in there. Do your blood. Wow, you're going to change the motor years of much of a day. Ah, you're going to do your blood. <웃음> 여기에 끝에 금멀티가 보여요. 로, 로, 로얄 블러드. 로얄 블러드? 로얄 블러드. 아, is, is this new humanity? 오케이. <웃음> well, seems like I'm gonna be zero for whatever on this one. Which one could it be? Um, I think uh, it's... Crash one? 음, mm, Crash one. 와 어렵다 모르겠는데 음 에디튜 그리즈반 음아 이건 어렵다 아 이, 이거 자연이 있는 거 보니까 풀풀 풀 있는 거는 금액밖에 없는데 바빌론 아 여기 어디지 그리즈반 아 와요 모르겠는데요 어디지 그리즈반 네오 휴머니 Oh god, what is this? Is it Neo Humanity? I feel like I'm wrong. I don't even know what it is to be honest. God damn it.
Who are us, Dad? Huh? Start to win it, matter. Oh, ah, I know. I know. It is. It's maybe a. Sounds like a. Zerk unit. It's like a. Maybe ruler. Probe. 버전이 버전마다 그 언어마다 약간 소리가 달라가지고 저그 유닛인 것 같긴 한데 이런, 이런 소리가 나면 바, 바이퍼 아닌가? 울트라 리스크 옵저버 <웃음> 너무 쉬운데 프로 프로브 탐사정 탐사정인가 프로브 저그 유닛 같은데 오, 오버로드 오버로드 That sounds like a probe. What probe? A probe? <laughs> pro 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 pro? <laughs> ah, hi. 아닌 것 같은데. 약간 뭐 이렇게 조작한 거 아니에요? Probe? 뭐지? Is that a trick question? Katowice is in Poland, so I'm not sure where exactly in Poland. I'm going to put it here. Poland, Katowice, Poland. Ah, I know. France, Italy. Katowice, Poland. Yeah. Here, I'm just kidding. Oh my gosh, it's here. Can you find embarrass myself? I think this is Polish, right? <laughs> I remember I come from here and... That's maybe here. Karolice is, of course, in... Poland. Okay. Katowice? It's... Uh, where is Poland here? And maybe here. Africa. I knew it before, but I'm not really sure. Probably it's one of them here. I will make myself look very dumb right now, but I'm just trying to think which one is Poland. Is it this one then? It's not right. Here? Is it that one? Really? It seems like a guitar or something. Wow, it's really hard. This feels like a blade. Not entirely sure though. It's a bit weird, but it's got a leg. So these are the legs. So this dude is standing. <laughs> I know what this is. I'm thinking those are the legs, probably. There's a leg on the other side. I don't know. What is this? I know what it is. It's a leg. 뭐 총이고 Is there fire coming out of a, out of a gun maybe? Oh, this is very hard actually. <laughs> I really did have no idea about it. I think that there might be some legs and there might be a, a gun. Ah, I, I, I know this uh, position. This is the marine I would say, right? Yeah, I'm gonna go with the marine here. 불곰? 불곰. 아, 이거 해병이다. 해병이요. 마린. 정답 마린. Maybe mm, Dark Templar. Is it a marine? Is more other? I'm gonna say it's like a a marine or Jim Rainer or something like that. Marine? High Templar? I think this is just a marine. Just a simple marine. I wanna say marine. I think this is the gun here. Hopefully. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, of course. Yes, okay. Ah, uh, Hyepyeong, you know? He was. Nice. It's a marine. It's the tip of the gun. I couldn't figure out what that was. It's a marine with a with a knife on the on the edge. A smarry? Oh, it's it's really hard. I can't I can't guess. Ah, oh, marine. That was pretty easy because I, I managed to touch the legs, so that made it easy. Ah, this pancamaki가 그 미사일 쏘는 거 있는데 그 이름이 기억이 안 나네. 이게 뭐야? 진짜 모르겠는데 찍자면은. 어, 그러면 배터리인가? 배터리? That's a easy one. It's seeker missile. 레이븐 레이븐 미사일. 스캔? 레이븐. The missile. The yeah, I think. 최종 미사일인 것 같은데. Secret missile from the Raven. 최장관 미사일. 미사일? 아그 스킬 이름이 뭐지? Raven Raven skill. 미사일 Raven 미사일 스킬. 방가막이 그 Raven이 쏘는. Not scan, but secret missile. Secret 미사일? 아 Raven. 아 맞다 맞다 그러네. <웃음> 88 I have 88. 88? Yes. Oh, I'm 87. <laughs> I have 77 <laughs> offense. Yeah, I agree about it. I have 81. Right, so you, what was your defense score? 91. 91? 91. 91? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Do you think it helped that you gave yourself 10 on everything? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. All right, so offense 77, defense 91, versatility 76. Multitasking 83, mechanics 85, and speed 77. I think it's pretty accurate for the most part. Like I'm a defensive player, I don't mix it up too much. So yeah, I think maybe speed, honestly, I feel like a bit low. Like I know I'm a protest, but you know, <laughs> I'm not that slow. Other than that, yeah, it's, a, it's accurate, I think. So I got an overall rating of 78, offense 81, defense 75, versatility 78, multitasking 77, mechanics 79, speed 76. I think it's relatively accurate. I think the numbers are, should be a little bit further apart. So for example, I think my offense should be a little bit higher because that's my biggest strength. And then strategy is not really here, but maybe versatility could be higher, maybe for prepared tournaments. Other than that, I think it's relatively accurate. I think speed and multitasking is pretty much the same. I would like to have a little bit higher on that. Uh, other than that, I think it's about right. My is like 80, 87, 75, 70, 70, 83. Uh, 78 and 84. I think everything for me is fine. I'm more, I'm more happy. <laughs> You're happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> for me okay, for me, I have 88 offense and 82 on defense, 81 on versatility, and 85 on multitasking, 83 on mechanics, and 80, uh, 85 on speed. Yeah. I, I feel like I always feel like I'm more defensive players compared to other players, but I, I got a little surprised that I got 80 on, on offense. But the other things I feel like, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty normal, so. And I overall, it's very, 
I'm heist on here, so I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was our card review here. Um, I think overall we agree with most of the things. I think some of us would like to be a little bit faster than we are on the cards, and I'm not sure how Mints we got 88 on offense. But other than that, you guys can let us know what you think and if you agree with everything, and that's it for us. <laughs> wow, what's that? Huh? <laughs> Stats really matter. <laughs> oh, ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it is, it's maybe a. Sounds like a. Is there a key on it? It's like a. Maybe a pro lord. <laughs> pro? 버전이 버전마다 그 언어마다 약간 소리가 달라가지고 저그 유닛인 것 같긴 한데 이런, 이런 소리가 나면 바, 바이퍼 아닌가요? 울트라 리스크 옵저버 <웃음> 너무 쉬운데 프로 프로브 탐사정 탐사정인가 프로브 저그 유닛 같은데 오, 오버로드 오버로드 that sounds like a probe. What probe? A probe? <laughs> pro 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 pro? <laughs> ah, hi. 아닌 것 같은데. 약간 뭐 이렇게 조작한 거 아니에요? Probe? 뭐지?
Share your passion wherever, whenever. Gaming is a lifestyle. Get your merch at shop.eslgaming.com. Intel Extreme Masters Katowice is brought to you by. Blizzard Entertainment, Monster Energy, and Intel. On one hand, you have a man that was destined to win the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice, a five-time GSL champion, won everything else, and when his hands touch the keyboard and mouse, it turns to gold. And on the opposite side of it, you have the Dream Run, a man that has had the her hearts in the palm of his hand across the last couple of series and now he looks to do the impossible he's 99 percent of the way through that dream run but that last one percent is extremely extremely difficult to attain joining me here for the grand final we have zombie grub as well as rotterdam and this is ridiculous i don't even know where to begin rotterdam but what we have witnessed especially over the course of today never mind anything else here in the tournament has been magical and now we're at tvt finals with maru and of course time yep i mean we often say things are history esports history one of the most historic things we've ever seen but i think almost any starcraft fan will tell you that this is one of the craziest runs in the very rich history of starcraft 2. we knew that Oliveira was good coming into this tournament we saw that little cute segment as well where he got his player card right 80 he's like oh i'm pretty happy with that yeah. because we didn't necessarily put him on the same level as the top tier favorites coming into this tournament but this run is amazing man i feel like every starcraft 2 fan is buzzing whenever i talk to some of them here at the venue everyone's like oh my goodness did you expect it i was like no mate no one really did i don't <laughs> yes. think time did but it's been an absolutely amazing beautiful story well now let's see if we can get the job done against the best tvt player on the planet the roads have kind of been crazy as well here zg yes they have Oliveira actually taking out uh, so many fantastic players one of every race leading up to mm -hmm. this terran versus terran finals totally unprecedented for any global championship by the way 
BlizzCon or Katowice. Never been a TVT in the past five years. It's included Zerg, of course. So this really is history being made. Guys, I have news. I have the update for you as far as the player card as well. Oh. I'm going to go ahead and fix it for everyone who wanted it to be fixed. This was Time's player card. You know, it's it's okay. He said he was happy with it, but you yeah. know what you get now. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Look at what he's done. Look at how he has shown his skill. It, was, it wasn't easy by any means. Perseverance, attitude, moving through to this grand final here, Roddy. It was a, a pleasure to watch. He showed some great mental strength as well. Of course, he's been amazing in the games. Otherwise, you cannot get here. The win over Gabe was impressive, but I was like, yeah, I can see that. But after that, it was supposed to get so much more difficult. Arena was on fire, and he was down 0-2. And you would think like, okay, how do you possibly turn that around? But he did. Uh, and that is something that I think he's really going to need against Maru as well. Yeah, yeah. Because so many players have tried in the past to defeat Maru in TVT, tried to break him. Maru feels unbreakable and can even feel hopeless when you play TVT against him because it feels everything you throw at him, it just seems to bounce back and it comes back at you. So time is probably going to face a lot of adversity in this series. But if you can stay mentally strong yeah. and just take every game one by one, there is obviously hope because momentum is a very real thing. And and I don't think I've ever seen anybody with as much momentum <laughs> as Oliveira has at the moment. Absolutely. Look, yeah. Uh, ZG, you have any more on Oliveira for now? Well, I just want to emphasize, yeah, he has the most momentum. And I also wanted to bring up, you know, we always talk about the TVD for Maru. Obviously, mm -hmm. here, Marine did take him out uh, in that matchup in the group stage. People are going to say that's a fluke. There has been at least one player throughout Maru's career as a dominant TVT player that has tripped him up, though. Mm -hmm. I think most recently it was Bunny who would consistently do that. There yeah. is a chance, absolutely. I wouldn't say that we just look at that here, Marine upset as a chance for someone else to upset Maru. Yeah, Maru is a crushing force, a crushing presence that exists here in StarCraft 2 that you've got to be very wary of in a finals like this. Guys, before we actually head over to the stage, let's get some predictions. This is this is tough considering that this tournament has been anything but predictable. Rotterdam, I'm going to start with you. 4-0 Oliveira. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I just I don't want to make a prediction because I you feel know? like we win regardless, right? If Maru wins it, he is widely considered to be one of the best StarCraft 2 players of all time. In the eyes of many diehard fans, Maru is already the GOAT. So for Maru to get his name on that beautiful IEM trophy that has the likes of Roke on that name, we have Sue, of course, Rainer, Serral, Todd. Yeah. Let's not forget about him. Okay. So for Maru to win it, that would be absolutely <laughs> fantastic. But if Oliveira gets the job done, uh, that truly is watching a man's dream come true. So I don't want to make an official prediction. I just hope it's going to be good and a lot of sense at Taoist Kolaris. ZG? I just want to also throw out that this is another chance for the Koreans to actually lose out in the Global Championship, right? Like, we always talk about the Europeans versus the Koreans, so we always go with that narrative. Of course, Time Oliveira, he is Chinese. It could actually be the third time in a row that a non-Korean wins IM Katowice in a Global Championship. I'm going to hype for it. I'm going to go ahead and say that I believe it. I got to stick to my 100 for this one. I'm going to say that Oliveira takes a 4-2 victory. Oh my, oh my. All right, the, the heart <laughs> agrees, but if you ask me really from a professional point of view analysis, I think Maru wins the series 4-1 or 4-2, but obviously I hope I'm wrong and I hope it goes to all seven games and then I think whoever wins is going to be amazing, but the heart or the mind prediction is Maru 4-2. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, guys. It's time to head over to the stage. It is with great pleasure we introduce this grand final. Will it be destiny or will it be the dream? Let's find out. Thank you very much, James. It is finally time. Katowice, are you ready? This Grand Finals is truly unprecedented. As for our Chinese Terran, history has already been made. On a personal note, this is his first time making the top two in his entire StarCraft II career, while also repping China in the World Championship Grand Finals for the very first time. But this will be the most difficult opponent for him yet in one of the best StarCraft II players in the history of the game. He has more GSL titles under his belt than anybody else. Katowice, give it up for your grand finalists. It's Maru and Oliveira. <laughs> Thank you.
It's time for the Intel Extreme Masters Grand Finals. I'm Tasteless, with me is Artosis, and man, what an incredible match we have for us. Oh my God, we have the greatest Terran player ever, the five-time GSL Code S champion, Maru, finally making it to the World Finals, something he has not been able to do in the past, and of course, going up against the greatest Chinese player that we've ever had in StarCraft in Oliveira. This has been such an interesting journey for Oliveira. Obviously, we all knew he was good. China's always had an extremely strong StarCraft scene, but this was such a stacked tournament. Yes. He is truly the biggest Dark Horse uh, ever in ever. Kind of, say history. You are right about that. We have never seen anyone come up so unexpectedly and get to the finals beating the very best players right in a row. He beat the best Protoss, maybe the best Zerg right before that. Uh, many of the best Terran players as well throughout the tournament. It's just an unbelievable dream run. There's no other way to say it. If he could win this here, it will truly be a Cinderella story. But going up against the likes of Maru, you really couldn't ask for a tougher opponent. Maru is a five-time GSL uh, champion, a, a player who has really shown the entire world how to play the Terran race at times when Terran wasn't always winning. And interestingly enough, no Zerg in this finals. That's right. We've had a lot of Zergs in the finals before. They've won a lot of the world championships in recent years, but that's not going to be the case this time. We are giving that trophy back to Terrans and it is going to be a crazy final to see who is going to raise that at the end of the night. Yeah, I think anybody who would be uh, a betting man would say, I mean, Maru has to be the guy that takes this. But the fact that Oliveira has already come so far in this tournament, and the games were clearly ones where he was a superior player. He may have really found his fitting, and he's going to be moving forward here. And if he can do this, this might be the craziest Intel Extreme Masters to date. Well, that would be the biggest surprise we could ever have in this tournament. There's just, there's nothing else that would come close. He really doesn't have anything that stands out on his resume as a player that could do something like this. Everyone else that we were thinking about, they've won multiple world-class tournaments before. Oliveira? Never even in the finals. It was funny, too, because when he was interviewed, he was he said, um, I almost can't believe it myself. He was a little bit stunned that he's made it this far. But if you can beat all the people that he's already beaten, I don't see why he wouldn't be able to do it here with Morrow. Really, if you look at his games so far in this tournament and you cover up the player name, you might think it's Maru. He just, he will not be eliminated. He takes all sorts of damage and just perseveres. His attacks are amazing. He has insane killer instinct. The decision-making, Maru level as well. I mean, this might be the birth of a new best Terran. It's very possible, Artosis. It's also important to remember that this tournament is a little bit different for Maro here. Maro's used to winning GSLs, right? He's he's used to having weeks to prepare for, mm -hmm. you know, a, a few best of threes or a best of five. This has been a marathon. Same is true uh, for Oliveira. This has been such a tiring journey. Mm -hmm. Game after game after game. Think of all the different uh, opponents you've had, all the matchups on all the maps. Does he have enough strategies in his back pocket <laughs> to now go against what I think everybody agrees is the strongest Terran ever in StarCraft II. Yeah, not just strategy amount, but as you mentioned, stamina. Very, very important here. It has been a long five days in Katowice. These guys flew from the other end of the world. So, you know, you get tired from that, you get your jet lag, but that makes them even. They're both Terran players that had to play a lot of long matches. They both came from Asia, and here they are going up against each other. I mean, this is the moment. This is where you prove what you're made of. It's going to be interesting as well, as, as Maro really is a player that never really struggled with TVT. Even when we had players like Innovation and TY in Korea playing so well, mm -hmm. he still managed to basically dominate in that. And it looks like we're now ready to start the grand finals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice 2023 with Maru versus Oliveira.
So it's all going to come down to this moment. They've had to prep their builds. They've had to go over exactly how they're going to approach each map. Will there be cheese? Will it be a macro game? But it's now or never, Artosis. Yep, the map is loading up. We're going to go to Dragon Scales first. A very important game number one in this best of seven. Let's get it started. Down here in the bottom right, in the red, he is Maru! And his opponent in the upper left, in the blue, from China, he is Oliveira! Right now, right here, game number one. This is where you set the pace for how you are going to approach this match. I feel like it is a very important game for Oliveira because Maru has so much experience in Grand Finals, right? He's won so many top tier tournaments. For Oliveira, like, he hasn't done that, but he's beaten the players who have. He has played completely solidly. He has mixed in a lot of tricky stuff as well. What are we going to see from him? What does he do in the most important match, literally, that you can ever have in StarCraft II? It's going to be so interesting to see. And I think you're 100% right, Artos. Is I don't think that Maru's heart rate changes at all as he walks onto the big stage yeah. uh, in one of the most important moments in his StarCraft career. But for Oliveira, you know, obviously he's a player who comes into tournaments like this, I think with the best attitude you can have, which is, I'm going to get as far as I can, right? Mm -hmm. Well, he's gotten farther than pretty much anybody else. He's now here with Maru, <laughs> the last two players left. Yeah, and how do, you, how do you hold in your excitement? How do you keep those nerves steady? Well, he's done it so far. He's come from behind against the best players in the world, world champions, giant tournament champions, without any problem. So I don't know what it is about Oliveira that has changed, but it feels like he is up to the task. So we've got the two players scouting each other out right now. Nothing too crazy so far as, far as far as builds. We didn't have any proxies. We didn't have any super greedy expansion plays. But for now, we're just going to see both players tech up to the factory. That's right. A quicker reactor here for Maru. So going to give a little boost to his production while Oliveira just continues to make Reapers one at a time. Command centers on the way at exactly the same time as well. Very, very similar builds, but not 100% the same. And there are many different branches from this point here in the build that they can go into. So we're going to wait uh, a little bit more and then kind of see what direction this game is going to go. We have both players taking a command center. That's very standard. Um, but TVT over the last couple of years has proven to have some very interesting and sometimes very scrappy two-base uh, two fights. Yeah, and in fact, we could see something like that here. For instance, if we just keep going on the production of Hellion Reaper for Maru, then that reactor will kick in, and he'll actually have more Reapers than Oliveira. That might be a time that he wants to attack. As the game goes on here, the Reapers are going to be gathered up over here at the entrance. Same thing uh, over here for Maru as well. Now, we have had a game at this tournament. I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was, where both players literally went by each other on the map. <laughs> the way this map is shaped, uh, moving from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom, uh, it's occasionally you can end up with one player on one side, the other on the other. So we want to watch for that here because the builds are so far similar enough, they may end up uh, having a similar timing uh, attack here. Yeah, that definitely could occur. Now, we have a Cyclone coming out for Oliveira, a little bit more standard. He does have that mine at the front as well, just in case any attacks come up. Maru, on the other hand, getting that medevac very quickly as well as a siege tank. So we do see a little bit of deviation in both sides, and it seems like Maru is going to be the first one that really tries to either attack or harass his opponent. Yeah, I'm not too surprised to see him being the first one that might be active on the map here. We do have a Raven for Oliveira about halfway to completion here. Pretty standard uh, stuff as the medevac is going to pick up for Maru. Headed northbound Ooh. over here. Meanwhile, the rest of his forces are going to be probably coming out to the ramp uh, over at the entrance, uh, <gasps> Oliveira's base. There's a blind, or I should say there was a blind spot up in wow. the main, but he's going to go over here. He will be able to see that. 
Uh, it looks like the intentions here are for Mario to try to elevate our units up into the main like this. He does get the tank now uh, up inside the medevac and then dropped off over here within range of the starport. Ooh, this is going to be tough to break. Does he wait for a Raven spell? He sieges up a tank here. Oliveira starting to take a bit of damage on his buildings. Maru going around the outside of his base. So far, so good here for Maru. He's splitting pretty nicely. This tank is still alive. Time may be falling apart already. Oh man, Maru getting the kill on the Siege Tank as well as a lot of units, healing up a lot with this medevac as well. Maru's first attack looking so strong. And auto turret's gonna go down here as the SCVs are pulled. The tank goes down, the Hellions now being pushed up against the wall, but it's still so much damage. Eight SCVs have been taken out so far. This is an incredible amount of damage put on from Maru to kill that many SCVs. He is way up in workers, plus 10 in that regard. There are are some things going for Olivier like he has a couple Ravens but this attack isn't even done yet this is not supposed to do this much damage already more SCVs are going down the tank and the Marine are gonna come in here and try to chase this out but the workers keep getting picked off oh man and already GG is called Maru takes game number one about as quickly as you can in this matchup okay so I think that could have gone better for um, for Oliveira, but you could see there were some small errors in the execution. Uh, Idea-wise, he was prepared for the possibility of a drop. It's funny, because when we yeah. were casting it, we had uh, turned off vision of, of each player for a second. It looked like it was gonna be a drop up in the main, and then maybe a, a push into the natural mm, mm. to try to kill all the workers. Um, but then as we got vision again, we realized he's gonna go what we call is like an elevator strat, or yeah. you know the ferrying strat, where you take uh, fill up the medevac, dump units in the main, and then fill it up again and do it. And it seemed like even though um, Oliveira was ready, as, as in he was looking for this, he didn't have the right unit comp to also deal with a tank if it was planted there. The tank was actually the special unit in that rush that made everything fall apart because the tank was kept alive, mm -hmm. he protected it well, siege tank shots, a couple of those accumulating over time, and you're going to be in a lot of trouble, Artosis. Yeah, let's not forget as well, after a single Reaper, he went for that reactor. That allowed him to get out two more Reapers and then also a bunch of Marines. Those four Marines in the initial medevac, definitely helping damage-wise, definitely helping to tank damage as well. So it was a very teched out rush from Maru, one that honestly didn't have a ton of danger in it for him either. And that has to be very sad for Oliveira. You know, that that is a very quick loss, a disappointing one. He opened pretty standard, but just got completely outplayed. This is a little scary for Oliveira right now, because let's keep in mind, you know, um, not all losses feel the same, Artosis. No. You can have losses that uh, in a tournament that almost feel good because you realize you're playing very well. Mm -hmm. um, he fell apart so quickly. Uh, and that's going to be a very tilting, very psychologically traumatic experience to lose that fast and lose like that. So he's going to have to pull it back together. Uh, otherwise, Morrow's going to keep stacking these wins and taking that trophy home. Well, hopefully Oliveira has it in him to fight back right here, right now. It is a best of seven, so he's got some wiggle room. He's got some time to adjust. But if you let Maru go up too many maps in a row, it's going to feel overwhelming. Game two starts now with Maru versus Oliveira. Right now, Maru up with a one to zero lead. In the upper left, in the red, he is Maru. <laughs> and in the bottom right, in the blue, he is Oliveira. So we are now on Gresvon. Let's see what these openers are going to be. It looks like Maru does want to do a double barracks proxy opener. So he is sending out two early SCVs, going to make a couple barracks. Is this going to be Reaper? I mean, we have seen some craziness like proxy Marauder builds from, from Hero Marine, but I bet you this will just be a lot of Reaper pressure. Could be. Um, we did see the Observer hinting to us that maybe he could land it up there, like a liftoff. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, we do want to talk about the fact that Morrow has this long history of proxying more than, um, at times in StarCraft II's history, more than all the other Terrans. There were, I think the year that he actually won, like several GSLs in a row, <laughs> was mostly off the back of proxies. Yes. Um, another indicator of, of, of uh, 
you know, this being such a Maru-esque move is a lot of players proxy after they've lost a game. <laughs> yes, this, that's he, true. He's the kind of guy that wins a game and then will cheese you out in game two. Yeah, yeah. Well, he did a, a pretty quick attack in the last game, right? It was still a macro opener, but he attacked very quickly, and he's going to attack again here. Now, that right there is a very quick reactor. Is that going to hurt Oliveira, or is that going to help him? Being able to produce a couple of Reapers at a time, very, very good, but having none to start, that's a bit scary. Yeah, I mean, you know, the reactor, it takes a long time to make. Um, the Terran is, defense-wise, a bit naked here. And as we all know, when Reapers come out, you just need a couple of them to stay alive and keep dealing damage, and the game can snowball very quickly. Well, right now, Maru is waiting for that second Reaper. You never go in with the first one because it gives away what you're doing. You need that second one in case your opponent has a Reaper as well. So here comes Maru's second Reaper. It's time to jump up there, but the Reapers are only halfway done for Oliveira right now. He's going to come in here. He can maybe deny. No, he does not deny the factory from finishing, but he gets that first SCB. Uh, looks like the second SCB is going to be killed. He comes in, but he can't quite reach those Reapers. A third SCB is going to be dropped, as this is getting so bad for Oliveira. It really, really is. The Reapers are popping out. So he has two now against three, which is a little bit better, but taking a lot of damage on his SCVs. Five falling already. He's going to have some more Reapers coming up. The Hellion is going to come out and greatly help him with this attack. He does manage to escape and only drops one. The regen's going to kick in momentarily, and those Reapers are soon going to heal. So right now, it's 21 SCVs against 18. So it's a 3 to 4 SCV advantage for Maru. That's pretty significant, but Oliveira already has his command center doing pretty well. well. That SCV does get picked off. Can Oliveira cover his main and get that command center built? This is quite the dilemma because with the command center uh, being made, oh, he's going to actually come out here and Whoa. chase this. This is a pretty crazy move here by Oliveira. Uh, is this actually an overextension? He's going to retreat back over here to where the rest of the barracks are. He needs a few more Reapers if he's going to take the fight. That was a wild move because it, of course, would be possible for Maru to just run up into the main and start killing everything up there. So, yeah, it's definitely a possibility, but it looks like Oliveira going to guard that area. Uh, for now and it did push him back. All right, I mean, if you're gonna push him back and get your command center done, I guess we have to give it to him. It was a good move. Yeah, um, definitely a bit of a roll of the dice there, uh, but he pulls it off. He, he, he got in there, he did that damage. Very cool to see. Uh, he is going to send one Hellion up here, luckily. Um, <laughs> Oliveira was able to actually lift the, uh, the defos up and make sure that did not get inside and get any scouting done. Um, but I have to say, Oliveira has basically survived the rush. He really has, and he lost some SCVs for sure, but his command center is quite a bit quicker, so that is going to help him to catch up as far as that income goes. You can see definitely Maru ahead at this moment, but that is going to change around a little bit. This barracks going around trying to get a scout as to what's happening, and really, I mean, Oliveira, I think, did a pretty good job defending all set. Yeah, and so now this game goes into basically a macro game. Uh, as is standard, and Marlo really is the guy, by the way, that, that, that figured this part of the game out. When you proxy with two barrackses, you send one back home and then you use the other one to scout. Uh, the year he won several GSLs in a row, we always saw him doing that. So it's a, it's a smart approach because this way you force your way in with the barracks. You look around and you identify, yeah. okay, you're not like making another command center, are you? <laughs> or anything else. You're not, you're not switching into mech, are you? And so he comes in here and gets that confirmed. Well, one thing to mention is the barracks did not see that a medevac came out. So he might be a little bit surprised by this. Maru has one of his own. He's going to go ahead and do a seven Reaper drop as if that's something very common. But yeah, that's going to be kind of cool. This is a huge attack coming from Oliveira, though. And with Maru having a lot of units across the map, he's going to take a lot of damage. Look at this. Right now, running up that ramp, he's got to close that oh. deep wall. Oh, it doesn't work. He gets up. There are double Cyclones here, though. Oh, but he manages to lock the rest of the units up inside the main. But there's so many. The Cyclone looks like it might be taken out. He's kiting it so well so far. Oh, my gosh. And in that picture in picture right now, you see that Maru as well getting a ton of damage with his Reapers picking off tech units as well. The Siege Tank and Marines of Oliveira breaking through the wall. This is insane damage on both sides. We can see Oliveira right now. 
uh, continuing to get right into the heart of Maru's base. He's got a Banshee out. He's repaired the Cyclones, but uh, does he have enough to actually take this on? Yeah, hard to say. The Cyclones come up and try oh. to snipe that medevac. They just barely don't get it. The Banshee trying to get some damage on the very few Marines that act as anti-air here. They don't quite get it. A lock on from that Cyclone backs up, but gets targeted down. Maru taps out. GG as Oliveira ties it up one to one. Oh man, what a move from Oliveira. He blocks the proxy barracks play. He gets his expansion up and he does a massive attack. Maru, a king of base trades, ends up not doing enough damage himself, not being able to hold on to that very vicious attack from Oliveira. And it is now tied up one to one. Very cool game to see, and what a different experience that was. I've never seen anybody rush out and try to chase down the Reapers that he knows are basically camping outside yeah. of his main. Uh, but it worked. He chased him away. It forced the barracks to supplant. And we had a situation that I don't know about you, Artosis, but I can't remember a game that quite looked like that mm. because Maru had suddenly seven Reapers um that weren't lost in a fight right yeah. so he loads them up into a medevac uh and you were even saying artosis like that's a thing <laughs> uh, sends it across the map uh they unload they start to uh fight and take out the scvs but of course seven reapers with with just your production in your main and using your scvs you're going to lose a lot but you can take the fight on the other hand Oliveira comes out he pushes across the map uh, gets the siege tank set up in the main. It looked like for a second, um, Maru thought maybe he could like trap that and uh, the other units in the main and try to win the fight that way. Um, he uh, Maru messes up with the cyclone targeting. The medevac stays alive, and ultimately Oliveira uh, is in an un. Um, I mean, there's no way that he can be stopped. He's on top mm -hmm. of production. Uh, in the early game of a TVT, and he takes that and ties it up one to one. Yeah, just too many high quality units there for Oliveira. And Maru maybe thrown a little bit for a loop. We saw his good friend Ryung there, also a master of Terran versus Terran, maybe uh, giving him a little pep chat there. Whereas Oliveira just going to maybe wipe the sweat off his brow. You know, a lot of pressure here uh, on Oliveira to deliver, but already. I mean, 1-1 one, one in the first two games, that's gigantic. Yeah, and, and what action-packed games these have been yeah. uh, so far here. You know, I, I, TVT is, people have become so good at it, especially these two, where um, what was historically, at, you know, especially at the starting point of StarCraft One, considered a slow and sometimes dull matchup by some viewers. StarCraft Two TVT in 2023 is insane and action-packed. It really is. There is a lot going on, a lot of positioning and running around and trying to do counterattacks and whatnot, which is what we've seen here really so far. Uh, you know, it, this is one thing I'm starting to think about here, Tasteless. The only matchup that Maru said in an interview on the first day that he was afraid of was Terran versus Terran. He realized there's a lot of Terran players right now that are very good at the matchup. He wasn't afraid of Zergs. He wasn't afraid of Protosses, but Terrans can be tough. And I know he's the best Terran versus Terran out there, but Oliveira making a case otherwise. And I'll tell you what, Artos, is Oliveira is starting to do it here too. Every phase of this tournament, we'd watch him. He had some shaky moments, but he would always come back, uh, fight his way through, uh, and, and, and come out with a win. And, you know, as dominated as Mara was in game number one, Oliveira takes that win. And uh, let's see if, we can, if he can keep going. All right, we are going to go into game number three. It's going to be on Neo Humanity. Let's get it going. All right, guys, I want to hear some noise in the audience, in the upper left, in the red. He is Maru. <laughs> and in the bottom right, in the blue, he is Oliveira. Earlier on the desk segment, Zombie Grub brought something up that I, I really uh, appreciated her saying, which was that this is uh, another moment where Korea's position is under <laughs> threat, and this time it's not from European Zergs. Yeah. It's from a Chinese Terran right now. And it's important to remind everybody that China has had a very long history of amazing good StarCraft players. 
They, they certainly have, but in more recent years, it's dwindled a little bit, right? Like, it, really, Oliveira is the only super well-known Chinese pro at this point. Like, he is, the, he is the hope of the country. And for him to come up that strong in a situation where not that many of his countrymen are really pro gamers is even more impressive. Yeah, I mean, it's it, if he wins here, the uh, impact that will have is going to be massive mm -hmm. because Chinese fans are super loyal. They're super supportive. And um, I mean, I'm sure he's already right now a big inspiration to a lot of people in his home country. Oh, absolutely. I think he's a big inspiration to people all over the place to see him go on a run like this after not having the results that he probably dreamed of for many, many years. It's just it's such a wonderful story. Now, he does poke up the ramp there, and he gets a scout. Maru started that command center on the high ground, maybe hoping that Oliveira wouldn't end up seeing it. But he sees it. It's not on location, so Oliveira will get, like, a slight jump ahead in this economy. But Maru does have that much faster factory. Yeah, Maru, a little bit more conservative this game with that command center up in his main. Um, and, and, again, this is all... Pretty standard stuff here as far as builds go. So we're going to have to have a little bit more time pass before this game can really unpack itself and we know exactly what kind of strategies these people are going to do. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's going to be any sort of uh, very fast attack, especially not like the last game. Even, even from game one, which was a little bit more delayed, it doesn't look or feel like we'll really get an attack like that again from Maru. So Maru this time around... Um, you know, going with a very, very different opening. He did try his proxy. Um, I think, you know, with Oliveira having that unique handling of actually barreling down the ramp and trying to take a fight uh, and forcing the barracks to lift off, Maro doesn't seem to be interested in trying that again this yeah. time around. Um, but, you know, the thing about Maro that is so scary is that he has by far some of the best rushes out of all the players in all three of the races, mm -hmm. but he also has maybe the best end game ever <laughs> you know. you're right about that yeah yeah positionally he's number one macro wise he's number one well i mean everyone saw he has the highest rated player card overall the pros respect him more than everybody as far as his base skills go okay guns that down the crowd yeah. goes wild <laughs> <laughs> well as soon as Oliveira gets a unit you're like all right it's a real game let's <laughs> <It's> go <a> sign. <laughs> but yeah that was that was kind of just a sacrifice from Maru you know the the Reapers don't really stay with a lot of power as the Terran versus Terran gets longer into it they don't fight anything particularly well so to jump it up get that scout see what's going on that he's flipping it around to a, a tech lab on the starport it's good information for Maru yeah certainly uh, we've got the medevac inbound here as a third command center is being uh, processed here for Oliveira. Um, we have to watch right now and see what production decisions are going to be made here from Maru. But if he starts to make more barracks, um, this would be a game where Oliveira is going to be expanding and Maru will have yeah. an opportunity to attack in and maybe do some damage. Well, Maru actually boosting into the main base here, and he is going to go ahead and drop a mine out immediately. Uh, burrows that mine, unburrows for a moment, lets it tank a little bit of damage, and we'll see what he lets it target. Oh, it actually hits that SCB, I think. Not so good. Oliveira cleaning that drop up beautifully. Yeah, Maru had some pretty crafty micro work there, but ultimately, Oliveira just smashed that attack, and... You know, whenever you have a drop like that, if it doesn't do any damage at all, then it completely backfired. And even the medevac was picked off, that's huge. That is that is really gigantic. Like, the, the fact that he lost three units total this game is pretty crazy. Oliveira having just perfect defense. And so, if Mara was going to be aggressive, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to pull off over here. Um, he might have to wait. Stim has started. Uh, whereas for Oliveira, the stim is way ahead. So Oliveira is probably going to be a player who may try to activate on the map first. Maro really actually holding off on getting stim for quite a while to get up other tech. Yeah, like that drop, for instance, but doesn't really do too much for him. Both sides getting their engineering bays around the same time. Mara's command center not that far behind Oliveira's, but Oliveira already does have the orbital ready. So we're going to go ahead and see him get that third base landed and really start pumping out the mules, really start getting the SCDs going. 
Yeah. Uh, we have Maru sending the Raven out across the map. It's going to be going northbound, probably to try to chuck some auto turrets down and get some SCV kills. You never want to let that Raven energy go to waste. Certainly not. He did throw down that one auto turret, but Oliveira trying to chase down the Raven, and he does get a lock on here. Can he actually oh. get the kill? Oh, my <laughs> God. Oliveira so on top of every aspect of this game. He just scanned at the last second to make sure that was actually taken out. Uh, and you know, the Raven, it's, it really is like the Swiss army knife of the Terran army. Yes. There's so many things you can do with it from throwing auto turrets down to disabling enemy units. Um, and it, all of that is gone. That Raven is out of the picture. It got no value. Whatever is going to come out of the starport is extremely important because medevacs, uh, me, are, you know, do so much in TVT, but at the same time, banshees are strong. But you have to have medevacs for your army. So actually taking that out is mm -hmm. huge. It really is. It's like the most important early game tech unit. It does so much for you. In fact, as Oliveira moves across, we may see some disables. Yeah. We may see him try to bust in here. All right, he scans. He sees the placement of three siege tanks, decides to go in a different direction. Oh, my gosh, he's splitting his entire oh. army. He is getting ready, possibly for a bust. He has to scan. He's going to come oh. in here. There's a counterattack here from Morrow. It's going to be hitting all these SCVs. Meanwhile, Morrow retreats. He's going to lift the command center. The tanks are running back. The disables come down. Wow, that's two huge disables. And Oliveira going to town with his Marines stimming forward so strongly into Morrow's position. He's going to take out the Marines. He's going to take out the tanks as well. He's going to keep moving forward here. Morrow's going to be in a lot of trouble, Artosis. He really is. His third has been pushed away. Oliveira getting into the natural and now Maru with a drop into the main base he already eliminated that third base mining situation and now pick off a lot of SCVs but Oliveira has enough to push him out and some of the production facilities right now are down over at this area two barracks with reactors on them as Marines get gunned down as they come out oh man Maru still with so few Marines trying to get some damage done here and Oliveira has lost a lot of SCVs but at the same time Oliveira pummeling this natural expansion that one siege tank being repaired beautifully and he does have to pull back a bit but his siege tanks still shelling this base combat shields about to finish maru has to get rid of this push the tanks continue to shell the command center oh he lifts it up maru right now only mining on one base taking so much damage Oliveira up 30 supply this is just unreal. Meanwhile, it looks like the third command center for Oliveira has been landed. Maru going to go for a Hail Mary play, a huge counterattack across the map. <gasps> He's got two medevacs full of units coming out now. Oliveira decides to back up and regroup. Oh, no, excuse me. He's going to push back up. This is such a chaotic game. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this is really interesting. Oliveira actually pulled very, very far back here and then went back up a little bit. So it seems like he knows something's happening. A scan goes down from Maru, decides better of dropping off in the natural, instead boosting into that main base. He needs to get some damage done here. He's going to try to unload over here. I don't think there's enough Marines for Oliveira. He's going to stem. He's going to try to come in. Uh, the SCVs are being mowed down. It looks like there might just barely be enough Marines here. He's going to pull the SCVs as well. Maru picks up and is chased out. All right, he got six SCVs there, but still a pretty good lead for Oliveira. Oliveira re-maneuvering his siege tanks here, but Maru brings the Liberator, a key unit from Katowice this week in Terran versus Terran, and he will push those back. All right, the Marines are going to come stim in here. He is going to be able to target down that tank. Uh, and it just barely is killed in the nick of time. But, you know, things are not getting better right now for Maru. Uh, Oliveira is actually uh, continuing to shell into this main base. Yeah, he's trying to get a lot of damage, but really that Liberator is being a hero unit. A lot of the Marines die for Oliveira. Now Maru coming up with the rest of his units in the main base and finally ends Oliveira's attack. But after all of this, Oliveira is up 14 SCVs. He's up a good 30 supply and still has that strong advantage with 2-2 two, two, almost done. Maru is now going to try to push out. This is pretty crazy. I think he's his, his game plan is basically that Oliveira is, is desperate to finish the game. And so what he wants to do is basically go for a counterattack. But 
I mean, this is a mammoth army here for Oliveira. He has so much. Can you afford to have some of your army out on the map as Maru right now? I think you can't afford not to, Tasis. He has to make something happen. He's so far behind. Oliveira, though, with the counterattack, very quickly kills the third base. Maru going to try to do the same. He's going under this command center. I don't see any way that he can save that. Meanwhile, Oliveira's going to come in here. He takes out the tank. He's going to dive into the natural. Oh, my God. He has so many Marines here stimming with those. 2-2 two, two upgrades, down goes that command center as well. GG, Oliveira takes the lead, 2-1. to one. What is going on? What is going on? What is happening? I'll tell you what's happening, Tasteless. The birth of possibly a new best player in the world. He's halfway there. Two wins. All you need is four. Maru, um... I mean, here's the thing too, Artosis. He's not playing poorly. No. He looks very strong. <laughs> yeah. We've had finals, we've casted before where, you know, one player is just kind of falling apart, whether it's nerves or exhaustion, um, or their play style just isn't working. That's not what's happening here. This yeah. is Maru playing at his very best. Yeah, oh. Maru, Maru really is peaking right now. Like, he is in great shape. He won GSL Code S season three in 2022. And here he is getting to the finals relatively easily. Like he had some road bumps, but he got right up here. He's been confident, but Oliveira is just on another level here in Katowice. We're gonna go to a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna go to game number four in the grand finals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice.
We are back here in the StarCraft II Grand Finals of the Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. Artosis, this could not be a crazier finals. Really, already, I feel like this is one of the best finals that we've ever had. With Oliveira losing the first map in a pretty dominating fashion and coming back 2-0 against Maru? It's strange because that first game from Maru was such a smashing. Yes. He completely dominated Oliveira. And I personally, in my mind, and I'm sure in the mind of a lot of people watching, you go, uh-oh, this does not look good. Yep. But we couldn't have been more wrong as now Oliveira is in the lead. In the upper left, in the red, from Korea, he is Maru. In the bottom right, in the blue, from China, he is Oliveira. Oliveira gaining a lot of new fans here this week, no doubt about that. Tasis, what happens if he starts to gain a lead in game number four against Maru? Do, can Maru keep his mentality solid? I don't know what's going to happen. If, if Oliveira wins the next game, I'm going to look at you and realize, like, oh my God, our toes is we're in the wrong timeline. Get in the DeLorean. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so wild. I didn't think I would ever see something like this, like someone rise from kind of a middle of the road pro gamer, you know, someone that's, he's good, he'll be at the tournament, but you don't think about him, to challenging Maru, to being ahead of Maru in the world championships. Yeah, I mean, this is truly the greatest dark story, uh, dark horse story, excuse me, uh, ever in the Intel Extreme Masters. And um, look, like I said before the break, he's done it twice. He's already halfway there. Yeah. He just needs to win two more. Um, so what I'm looking for as we go into this game is how exactly is Maro going to play? There are not very many best of sevens where Maro gets behind and stays behind. No, certainly you're right about that. Uh, and one thing to mention about Maru, like I think that he's going to be mentally fine, at least for now. Like, yeah, he lost those two games, but he has won so many championships. Things go wrong on those paths. And, you know, he's definitely got the skills to come back. We should mention as well, uh, Oliveira is, uh, his ID before was time. Many yes. of you who've been watching StarCraft in years past may be wondering, who is this guy? This is time, same player, just a new ID. Um, and yeah, I mean, right now he's playing extremely well. These games, by the way, are almost impossible to recreate. They're very yeah. specific uh, things that are happening in these games where there's a lot of moving parts mm -hmm. um, and each one St on, stands on its own as a very unique experience. You know, some games, somebody just gets a build order win. Mm -hmm. uh, other games, it's kind of your standard back and forth, late game, macro game. These are some real cutthroat, rough TVTs where we're basically finishing the game right at mid game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> maybe even before, right? Yeah. Like they're attacking each other so early and so often. Like the unit sets that they're fighting each other with are almost random. It's like, okay, this is what I have that survived, and that's what you you made to try to hold me off, and now you're counterattacking with that. And it's just, it's not the standard stuff you'd normally see in a Terran versus Terran. Will it continue that way? Or are we going to get any of the long positional macro games? Maybe that is a place where Maru can outplay Oliveira. Yeah, but that would require Maru to be very inactive on the map, right? He'd have to be in a very defensive position, and... You know, map control and TVT is extremely important. Um, so we have Oliveira now out on the map. He's positioned so that he has three Reapers over here, um, just to the right of Maro's main base, and a heli in the spot at the bottom. Uh, this doesn't mean he's going to try to attack in here, but it could simply be to try to catch any units that might move out. We've got the first medevac. Is this going to be a drop? It is. And look at this, a tank. Reapers moving out, Marines inside the medevac. Ooh, Oliveira actually catches those Reapers, so he knows something is going on, and it's actually a very similar attack to what we saw in game number one here from Maru. He's bringing the tank, he's bringing the Marines, but some of his units got caught on the way there. So let's see if Oliveira has time to stop this. He goes ahead, gets a lock on, on this medevac. If he kills the medevac, it is huge, and the medevac goes down immediately. And that means the tank and the Marines are isolated over here. He 
targets it down. Oh my god, in the meantime, his own Reapers in the main base getting some damage there as well. Amaru with a <laughs> smirk on his face because Oliveira not only shuts down his attack, but gets more damage with less units on the other side it, of the map. It's doubly bad right now for Amaru, <laughs> losing workers. The rush was shut down and Medivac now out of the picture, <laughs> but it seems like he's going to double down. It's actually very interesting having Maru show uh, emotion on his face. Yeah. He, he's almost always expressionless. Well, I mean, he's in a little bit of shock here because literally everything is going wrong for him and everything is going right for Oliveira. It's, it's wild. Uh, right now, Maru, like, he keeps coming across the map, but everything gets held off. Oliveira has plenty of units to defend. So... I think Maru has to take a few risks here. You see him building a third command center on the expansion instead of the main base. He's got to start optimizing to try to catch up and maybe get ahead later on. We're having a Reaper come in here and try to peek and see what's happening. Um, I, I could not believe how well that fight went. Even the Cyclone living? Yes. Out of all the things, like, it, it literally could not have gone better for Oliveira. Now, again, uh, uh, Maru is very good when up against the ropes here, but... Um, Right, right now, I can't imagine a game going better right now here for our Chinese player. Oh, you're you're definitely right about that. Like, so far, this is the perfect opening. Uh, but, you know, Maru's actually, I think what Maru's doing here is very, very intelligent. Okay, so he went third command center right away, and he's going mostly Vikings and tanks. He slowed down his own stim. He's slowing down marine production. And he's just going to try to get these units that scale very well. The longer the game gets, the better Vikings and siege tanks are. And he's just going to try to get there. But Oliveira is coming in. He might be going for a kill move. All right, he's going to come in here, probably try to disable any tank he can. Uh, he saves it, actually. He's got another disable oh already. God. The Vikings are going to be shot down. He throws down some auto turrets here in a tank. All right, those auto turrets going to have been enough. Siege is up. There was a disable there. One of his tanks lands his own Vikings. And GG Oliveira is up three to one. <laughs> oh, my God. This is insane. This, this is might insane. be the biggest upset finals in StarCraft II history. <laughs> I've never seen anyone have such a good time while playing the final match at the World Championships. Oliveira is getting into it. He is dominating. This is insane. I can't believe this. And these are fast, action-packed TVTs. That was a masterful takedown of the drop and the excellent split-second decision-making to send the Reaper in to kill the SCVs. And for the first time, I think in my career, I've seen Maru looking broken. Yeah, yeah, like the look on his face you see there, he's thinking, he's, he maybe doesn't know what to do, which is never the case because he's considered the smartest Terran in the world. Dude, that's a whole other side of this. Let's not forget, Oliveira is playing out of his mind and making this dream come true, but everyone agrees that Maru is, like, the player that doesn't have a world championship that should. Like, he's the guy, right, that, that everyone's just kind of waiting. It's like, well, you're going to win one eventually, and this year seemed to be lining up for him. But now Oliveira is on match point for the rest of the night. There's no more mistakes allowed here for Maru. He has to win every single game. If he drops one, it's over, and Oliveira is the Intel Extreme Masters world champion. <sighs> that is wild to think about. Maru still seems to be trying to figure out how do I approach this next game. His life is on the line for the rest of the night. If he wants to be the world champion this year, he must go three and zero. It's time for that comeback as we now go into our next game. All right, Katowice, say let's make some noise. Down here in the bottom left from Korea, he is Maru. His opponent in the upper right, in the blue, from China, he is Oliveira. Tasteless, you can see that the crowd is absolutely packed. So many StarCraft fans coming together here in Katowice. You guys are fantastic.
Yeah, it's so good to be down here and casting these games to you guys. Uh, and what a hell of a finals. Yeah. So, um, going into this next game, we have to remember that Maru does not have the luxury of trying uh, any kind of weird all-ins or throwaway builds. Mm -hmm. One thing about a best of seven is the bigger range you get in score. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say that, uh, you know, you're up... 3-0, right? And you just have to win one more game to yes. win that best of seven. Well, then you can start doing really weird all-ins. Mm -hmm. You can throw a couple in because even if it doesn't work, okay, fine, then I'll go back and I'll play a macro game in the next game. But when, you ha when you're down one to three, you have to basically make every perfect decision for how you're going to open up. Yes, yes. And that's so tough, right? Uh, you can't actually account for everything. If your opponent is willing to take a couple risks, there's just, there's an area where you're going to be weak and they might be able to find that out. Now, as of right now, looks like we are just gonna have a Reaper expansion coming down here from Oliveira, whereas it is a Reaper into factory here on Maru. Remember that these games have been extremely explosive. Um, oftentimes with Maru actually the first to act, like yes. That last game that we saw back there, the um, the, the, the tank uh, tucked into the medevac along with a couple of Marines and moving out, that's not a normal build. We don't see that in all the TVTs. This seems to be something new he's been tinkering with. And in one of the games, that was how he actually beat Oliveira. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, where does Morrow want to take a game like this now? Um, I, I, you know, TVT, it does seem like you can't really be too passive in it. You have to be fairly active on the map. Uh, Counterattacks are so dangerous because Stim Marines in small numbers are so deadly and medevacs make them so mobile. Also, if your opponent gets a strong position on you, if you're just kind of sitting there and they run up and siege near a command center, you're going to lose that area. Like you're just, you're not going to be able to break an equal amount of units that are already positioned. So that does make it so that there's a lot of roaming about a lot of little scuffles where you try to gain that edge, keep your opponent off your back, and maybe sneak into their side of the map. For now, it looks like Morrow's just going to go for a 1-1-1, just about to finish up his starport as the factory's producing Hellions and the barracks is producing Marines. Um, Morrow is going to just take a peek up here with the Reaper. Oliveira is ready to swat that away. Mm -hmm. Doing a good job so far. He's got that bunker in the front. He was blocking the Reaper jump in. Maru just gets a little bit of information, but doesn't know too much about exactly what's going on in Oliveira's base. So the first tank comes out. The medevac is almost done. I'm curious if Maru is going to go on the move again um, and, and if he's going to try to be aggressive. He doesn't have to, right? But a lot of yeah. times with the first medevac, you see players do something. It's the same build. It same is. build as before. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's really liking this build. It, 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 you know, it, very similar builds at least going one and one so far. But with his life on the line, he's decided, let's do this again. This is really interesting. You don't normally see Maro stick with the same build uh, unless it's, you know, proxy racks a couple of games in a yeah, row. Yeah, sure, um, sure. So I guess he wants to try to hit the main. Okay, but you see Oliveira's already ready. He's got mm. a siege tank up there. Not the just a siege tank, a Viking Tasteless to help push away that medevac. And as Maro sees it, he boosts out of there. But look, he didn't lose a lot of units. He no, lost no. like a Reaper, so it's not the end of the world what just happened there. This is fine. This is totally fine because he manages to keep the medevac alive. It's still, it can be used later on. A Raven's being made. He might try to incorporate that with the next little jab sure. in. Yeah, Maru is bringing all of his units to the front there. Once again, going to siege up on this bunker. So, you know, that's a little bit annoying for Oliver. He's going to go ahead, unload the bunker. Maybe he'll sell it as well. Uh, but Maru, like, are you going to get real damage right there? I don't think so. He's just, he's rotating around. He's trying to apply some pressure here to his opponent. And one thing to note is that, you know, that might have looked kind of like a little, like a bit of a weird skirmish, like he sieged up, shot the bunker, and backed up. He's actually taken a third base. So, you know, he's generating the illusion of threats. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he's going to pull back. And, yeah, it's a it, smart way to play, right? Absolutely. Medivac going to come in here now. I believe there's one Hellion in here. <laughs> I think that's probably more for scouting yeah, than anything else. Uh, he does get to see basically what's going on. He sees that additional command center being built. So some good information here for Maru. He's traded a few units here and there to, to learn these things, and that's why he is down in supply a bit. But I don't think it's a big issue this game. This, this doesn't feel like the other the last three games that we saw. It's not like he's super far behind or anything. 
Yeah, and I actually think this is so far the best game we've seen from Morrow, but we need to see, you know, now that it's Oliveira's turn, you know, with his later expansion, he's going to have an opportunity to attack. How is Morrow going to handle it? Most of Morrow's losses have been backfired, uh, you know, aggression. This is a totally different situation. And he's coming up right now. Oliveira is for that same type of attack that he wants to make, but when he scans here, I don't think he's going to go in. Like, it's basically the same units from Morrow that Oliveira has. So again, to attack into something like that is incredibly difficult. He's chasing that Cyclone, which is going to be pulling around here. Again, you want to watch those Ravens. They could try to shut down the tanks. Both players have that opportunity on either side. Oliveira unseiges again. Morrow looks like he's going to try to set up a line of defense over here. Oliveira doesn't have to try to come in, but it looks like he might try to tiptoe these tanks forward. Yeah, it sets up a little siege right here. That's going to be a little bit annoying. It looks like he's hitting the command center uh, when he does get vision of it, right? So the tanks can shoot a little bit further than, th than they can see, which is an important thing to keep in mind. That's why Vikings become so powerful. That Raven takes quite a bit of damage. Oliveira unseaging, deciding to go forward. He throws down the auto turrets. I don't know if this is going to end up working, but he does go forward. Maru pulling his SCVs, going forward with those Marines immediately. And will Oliveira actually be able to hold this position? Yeah, the target firing there from Maru was just too good. He, he realized what's happening with the auto turrets and just target fired over the top. But you know what? These tanks are starting to get a little bit lower here, Artosis. Yeah, Oliveira landing those Vikings down. They do deal a lot of damage to siege tanks, but somehow Maru keeps three tanks at very low health alive. That is a net win to Maru, I would say. Oh, huge win there. Had he lost the tanks, it would have been more of a trade, but good juggling there with the medevacs. It's interesting to see that, you know, uh, Oliveira has an alternative approach to trying to break certain siege tank lines where he does use the auto turrets <laughs> over the disable. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that the burden then becomes on the defending player to manually target with the siege tanks over. Mm. Just let the, um, uh, you know, the, the the game, the tank default into whatever is going to sure. be closest to them. Well, right now, Maru deciding it's time to move out across the map. He probably is feeling pretty good about his position right now. He's been mining from that third base a little bit longer than Oliveira has had his. He's got those siege tanks as well that stayed alive during the fight. So here we go. He's going to move up. He scans. No tanks here. This is a problem for Oliveira. Yeah, Oliveira is looking pretty weak right now. The bunker is taken out. I see one siege tank on the low ground, and that's not going to be there for very long. Oh, man. Actually, Maru kind of overcommits with his Marines there, I want to say. that Diving in on those tanks, he did deal a lot of damage to them, but he didn't quite kill them off. He lost a lot of Marines. And I think he has to back up. Yeah, that was a bit of a lackluster attack. It didn't seem like there was much, you know, to, to much follow up with that. He's going to try to pick off this one tank. Now, he could target the Vikings. Vikings are very slow at running away on the ground. But Maru is just overextending here, Artosis. It feels like he tried to lay a trap there with that one tank. The Vikings yeah. landed. He stimmed up to try to get them. But Oliveira was pretty quick. He stimmed down, fought those Marines off a little bit, and saved a couple Vikings. So probably a good trade for him there. So I would say Oliveira, you know, not in a great spot this game, but Morrow hasn't really been able to leverage his position. Uh, and honestly, there were some pretty, uh, pretty bad moves, pretty bad plays tactically sure. there from Morrow outside of Oliveira's base. Uh, it looks like Morrow's going to come around here and try to hit over here at the third. He's going to stim in now. I see three siege Ooh. tanks here for Oliveira. Let's see what Morrow can get done. He targets one of them down immediately. Oh, my gosh. Stimming forward here. He gets another one. He will have to pull back the rest of his Marines here. A lot of them end up dying. Oliveira going with a counterattack towards that third base. Morrow sees it coming, and he lifts off. He's trying to run out, but a lot of SCVs going down. He's taken out so many. He's now going to try to fight those Marines, and he does manage to take them out as well. A big interruption Ooh. here for the income of Maru. Oh, Maru comes down with his SCVs to fight with some Marines as well. Vikings pushing back the medevac, but loses quite a few SCVs. He does drop down below Oliveira's economy for now. The tanks are now going to be pulled back. Uh, big victory there for a very small attack from Oliveira. 16 SCVs have been killed. Yeah. Oh, man. This game definitely a lot closer than the others, though. Maru right now setting up that fourth base location with a planetary so that it's going to be able to defend itself a little bit. Now we're watching the first person view here of Maru spreading out his siege tanks, sieging them up, trying to keep an eye on anywhere that Oliveira could attack him.
Yeah, you can see he's so fast, so efficient. He is ahead in a, in a base, by the way. Um, so that's very comfortable for him. He's got an extra income. Um, Oliveira is actually backed off. You know, he uh, needs to continue to try to keep growing here uh, and moving out on the map. Because if you're on three bases versus four and you stay on three bases, either you need to be attacking and winning or you need to be double expanding yourself. I think Oliveira may have just taken his own fourth base there. We saw a sensor tower go up. Maru saw that as well. Uh, so trying to catch up. Uh, looks like Maru kind of roaming the map here once again. Yeah, there is that fourth command center. It's not done quite yet, but very, very close. With the sensor towers there, though, it's very hard to attack. Your opponent will see you coming. There is a blind spot for both players here in the middle of the map. It looks like Oliveira may end up having an encounter here with Maru, stimming and coming in, but a flank over here on the side from Maru. Reinforcements for Oliveira coming down the ramp. Now Oliveira stimming up. He has a ton of Marines here, and in fact, he will start to beat the Marines, but the siege tanks adding so much firepower here. Oliveira loses a lot of Marines, but so does Maru. Quite the exchange there. Maru decides to go back and lick his wounds. Some more tanks are going to unseage over here as well. Oliveira, yeah, unsure of where to go now. He, uh, he certainly doesn't want to try to push in any further. Uh, I think that would have been a pretty egregious overextension. One thing I do want to mention, Oliveira actually getting his 3-3 Marine upgrades before Maru does. So that's something that will, you know, help him out quite a bit when he gets them. If you're up in upgrades, your Marines will fight far, far better. But of course, siege tanks going to be a key element of those attacks as well. Both sides are doing a great job with keeping up with their tech. Upgrades are getting pretty crazy. The tank count overall is actually a lot better for Maru. Um, now, that being said, you know, tanks are, are pretty brittle versus Marines if they ever get, uh, you know, exposed in a spot mm -hmm. um, where the Marines can gun them down. So if Oliveira is going to try to, you know, come out ahead, we want to watch and see if he can get any good tank snipes. That being said, it looks like Maru is <laughs> actually gearing up for a push. Yeah. Trying to come up and hit this base over here right now. That's really scary. That's a huge army from Maru. He is up in army supply by about 20 right now. And Oliveira has a little group of Marines to the sides. That is not going to be too useful in this fight right now. Yeah, he's not. Oh, I see what he's doing. He's going to unseat these tanks over here. He's going to go around up onto the high ground and start to shell this base. Now we can see these Marines over here in the picture in picture. They do take out this command center. Yeah, but Maru is shelling a lot over here as well. Oliveira, though, clearing those tanks with a double medevac drop. Very well done on defense. And suddenly, the game looks pretty even. Yeah. Um, you know, it is a funny thing. Sometimes the much smaller counterattack does way more damage than the, than the big heavy push. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those moments. Um, I, I think Maru lost a decent amount of tanks. Is it possible that the tank count is actually ahead here for Oliveira? It is 10 Ooh. to 6. He is in the lead. That's that is huge. a big deal. That is a big deal. Six tanks will still do a good job defensively, and they're going to have to because Oliveira looks to be getting ready to attack. He's coming down. Maru backs up down a ramp. That is a very choked off area, so it would be hard for Oliveira to attack there. Okay, he's going to try to come up onto the high ground. He scans again. And Oliveira, I think, is being pretty smart. He doesn't want to be in a position where he can ever uh, overextend. So he backs up. And Maru also pulls away as well, I think wisely so. Yeah, there is a lot of heavy army movement right now around the map. If you lose track of where your opponent's Marines and tanks are, you can die very, very quickly. That's why we're seeing these scans over and over, just double checking. Are you sitting there sieged? Are you moving around? Which direction are you going into? These are incredibly important things that they must keep track of. Command Center going to be planted over here at 12 o'clock. Uh, we're about to get to uh, the fifth base up here for Oliveira, but Maro has plans to try to deny that. He's sieging up here on the low ground and scanning and hitting Oliveira's tanks. Yeah, that's a very good siege there from Maru, picking off a couple tanks almost for free. Still roaming, looking like he wants to deny the space, but I don't think that he he can, right? Like, Oliveira has a lot of tanks on the high ground. His Marine Force, very strong as well. In fact, both sides are maxed out with three, three upgrades on their Marines and plus two attack on their tanks. Yeah, both players are basically growing up into the upper left corner of the map. Uh, Oliveira's position is a little bit more of a, a triangle here in the top right, where it seems like Maro is kind of 
going more up into a straight line. But as I say that, he also expands down into <laughs> 6 o'clock. And let's not forget, Maru is very scary when it comes to these huge, intense macro games. He's mm -hmm. very good at growing, pushing, and continuing to have good production. He's incredibly fast, so that is definitely the case. Now, a little double medevac drop here. Picks off a few of those tanks, going to kill a couple turrets and whatnot. Gets rid of the sensor tower. Uh, an okay move there from Maru. Just trying to keep pressure on once again. Maru with a big attack over here. The tank is gunned down immediately. Is he going to try to shove in? No, he backs up and relocates, suffering very little losses. I love these moves that we're seeing from Maru. He's actually starting to spend some of his Marine force. He's sending them in on these little missions that he knows that they're going to get destroyed during. And that's allowing him to tech towards the end game. You can see now a lot of starports are up. He's making a lot of Ravens. He's getting more Vikings. He's adding more starports. Because these, as the game gets longer, become more and more important. He's going to shell down these rocks over here, trying to make the map a little bit more open so he can maybe have some more opportunities to hit. But I got to tell you, man, uh, Maro is getting very scary as far as growth. We're having four, um, excuse me, four Liberators at a time now come out here for Oliveira. That's pretty wild. Yeah, a Liberator range as well. So Oliveira is going to try to break some tank lines, but will he have more Vikings? He's got 15 to 10. That's a big deal. Maru's Raven usage is going to have to be very strong if he wants to hold this incoming push. Okay, he scans over here. And this is going to be a hard position to push into, Artosis. He does gun down the first Viking. Um, we have some great armor shreds going down. The Vikings going to town on each other. But right now, Oliveira does have more. Bringing forward those very important liberators we were talking about. He's going to force some of these tanks to unsiege and move back. Yeah, between the tanks and the Liberators, he can start to leapfrog forward here and try to crack open this position for Marl. We're seeing a lot of tanks get gunned down, Artosis. We really are. The Liberators so great at breaking these positions. Still, he has to keep more Vikings. The Viking count very close on both sides. Maru trying to hold on right now as Oliveira tries to push forward, kills another tank with the Liberators, going after another one as well. The tanks continue to come down. It seems to be working. I think Morrow's going to lose his base. More Marines come in here, and they stem to break in. Oh, he's going to be able to pick that off so quickly. An armor strike goes down on his Marines, but he continues to fight, chasing Maru back. One base goes down, but Maru has so many more. He's now expanding over into the very far bottom right. He has 6 o'clock, as we can see over here. Um, where does he try to go? Maro has to try to remake his tanks. He has to get some kind of unit composition to address the threats that Oliveira is creating. Maru only has two tanks right now, Tasis, and only two factories. This is a terrible situation. He must keep those tanks alive. Oliveira continues to push him back, controlling the pace of this game. He's going to try to come in again. He does gun down some of those Vikings. The Vikings trying to pick off the um, medevacs if they can. There's a planetary here, SCVs can repair, but they need to stay behind. Yeah, this is really rough though. With that many siege tanks, he's going to lose the planetary as well. Maru massing up outside of his natural. He's lost control of these two bases. That's very painful, but he's still got a lot of supply. He's got a lot of SCVs, he's got a big army. He still has a chance in this game. Maro's going to try to come down and engage with this army that's over here. A big pickup. He's going to go into the main. He's going to dive on the infrastructure. Meanwhile, Maro does get the disables in, inches in with the tanks, and starts to pick off the position Oliveira has. Oh, I love this drop from Oliveira, though. Nothing in here for Maro. He does bring up a couple siege tanks, but a lot of his reactors getting picked off, and then Oliveira gets out of the area. <laughs> He's just hurting the production of Maro. The SCVs that fled the 6 o'clock position are now mining over here in the very far bottom right, but this base is going to go down as well. Oliveira continuing to grow. He's actually expanded just one screenshot north of where we were a second ago. Oh my gosh, yeah, Oliveira getting more bases at this point, still controlling the map, still shelling down Maru bases. I think right now he feels it. He's getting closer and closer to being the world champion. Yeah, the command center's getting so low. A big push here in the middle of the map. Morrow trying to fight back. I don't see very Marines to defend. I think oh. Morrow might be able to break into this position. You might be right about that. Oh, but it looks like Oliveira coming back at the side with his army. Gets a great arm, <laughs> armor shred off. And here we go. Disables on all these tanks. Maru breaking through. 
He's coming through. He's just destroying this position right on top of these starports. Another siege tank comes up. Morrow's going to have to try to move his tanks in a little bit further. But if he missteps, Oliveira can dive in and take those all out. That's right. Look at these Vikings of Oliveira. He's trying to fight right now. And in fact, he does have more Vikings. The armor strike goes down, but I don't know that that will be enough. I think he's going to win this air battle, and Maru may have to flee once again. Yeah, I think even with the weakened Vikings, you just have too many. It's just a game of math right now. And without those Vikings, uh, you know, it's very hard to spot for your own tanks. Not just that, as soon as he won the Viking battle, four more Liberators. He's going to use those to push those tanks back. But in the meantime, Maru rotating his army to the side will kill off another base. He tries to come in and dive on that tank, but there's too many Marines. He might be able to protect it. More tanks coming up right now here for Oliveira. Oh, some great disables go down. Picks off a couple more siege tanks as well. The Liberators come forward, but Maru so quick with his unsiege, backing up. And now he's going to do to Oliveira what Oliveira did to him. He can pick off even more bases. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much of the map that Oliveira has right now. He actually didn't know that base was taken, Tasos. Oh he could have killed that. He doesn't even realize how behind he is right now. Oh, no. Bad news for Maru. Yeah, he doesn't know about this base over here in the bottom right as well. Well, he's going to go somewhere. Let's see if he checks. He stims some Marines up. He sees the planetary. This is certainly something that Maru can attack. Yeah, Oliveira is going to go for a counterattack here. You know, when you're ahead uh, in bases, sometimes the counterattack with everything can be a little bit stronger because the person who's doing the initial attack just has more mm. locations they have to try to wipe out. Yeah, that does occur. Oh, <laughs> a quick pickoff right there from Oliveira. He's doing a massive counterattack. He's going He's to the main. main base. He's going to go in here and kill all the factories and barracks. This is really bad news for Maru as these tanks come up for Oliveira. He sets up some beautiful Liberators as well, saying, no, you can't siege there. Maru has to walk all the way around. But is this breakable? He has all the tanks disabled here. The Marines are going to come down and fight. They're all going to get thinned out. And now the tanks get destroyed in an insane oh, moment. That is perhaps the best break I have ever seen from an invincible position. Maru making some magic, keeping himself in the game, but just barely so. Now Maru's supply is way down right now. Uh, Oliveira basically lost his main army. He's really hurting. Um, but again, the income is so high, he can start to try to remake that. But Artosis, I'm blown away the, at the skill that Morrow exhibited there. I thought that was going to be the neck-breaking yes, move yes. to get in the main with those siege tanks, but he handled it perfectly. I don't think anyone else in the world could have lived through that. That yeah. was the most beautiful positional play I've ever seen. But Oliveira uh, continues to have an advantage, way, way more supply. Maru moving up through the map. It's hard to even keep track of how many bases they have at this point. There are command centers going up and going down everywhere as these two just pummel each other. It looks like already Oliveira has managed to remake most of his army. The tank count is certainly going to be lower, though. And so we're going to need to see, you know, how he tries to handle this. For the time being, though, um, it looks like... Uh, you know, Maru growing into the bottom center. He's looking pretty healthy. Oliveira's actually taken the very upper left corner. Uh, I feel like I don't even remember when that base was taken out, but now, <laughs> now he's got it. So yeah. they, they traded spots. There's actually been so much action happening on the map. Yeah, a lot of back and forth with these expansions. The Liberator's being used for some harassment as well. Maru is going to clean that up. Uh, and Maru is really focusing very, very heavily on this Raven production. His Raven spellcasting is going to be so key, both in defense and in breaking other locations. Oliveira. <gasps> oh, Hold on, those tanks, tanks, they went the wrong way, and Oliveira instantly jumps on them. Oh my god, they're trying to get back, but they can't, and so many are picked off. Siege mode is up. Does he have enough? Medivac's covering most of this fight. It's hard to say even what's going on here, but Oliveira! Takes it! Oliveira is the world champion! Ganovice, give it up for Oliveira! He is your Intel Extreme Masters world champion!
woke a dream. Well, you are not waking up because I have to tell you something. You are the Intel Extreme Masters World Champion. I mean, like, like so much, like many people sometimes tell me, like, you should finish StarCraft 2, you should retire, and maybe, and it, like, you should give up. But look at me now. Truly, such an inspiration. You have fought so hard. This is the best run that we have ever seen. You were two and three in the group stage. You said it yourself that you did not expect to even make it out of groups. And then you went on to make the playoffs for the very first time. You had to take down Rainer. And then you had to take down Hero. And now you just took down a five-time GSL champion to become the world champion. What does this mean for you? I mean, I mean, I just, I just want to tell, I just want to tell us like, you don't need GSL champion, you don't need, you don't need like ESL champion. I, I think I'm just a like normal man, and and yeah, I mean, I just practice very hard this time. Like every day, twelve, like twelve, twelve hours, fifteen hours, so much time and. You know, like I played, I play StarCraft to programmer is already it's already nine, eight years, right? Uh, I think so. And I never thought I can be a world champion. And I, and and even now, I'm afraid. Maybe tomorrow I wake up. It's like a dream, and I'm. <laughs> I think we can all agree this is why we love esports and this is why we love StarCraft 2. I'm gonna ask one quick question about the games because when I talked to you about Maru uh, and you said, yeah, I do play and practice with him a lot and I lose a lot, but I also lost a lot against Hero in practice and look what I did. Maybe a miracle can happen. How did you prepare? against Maru, especially considering you practice against him so much. Is there something specific you plan for every map? Like, I mean, when Star Quarter Final, I just tell me, I just tell myself, it's, it, it doesn't matter, like you're world champion or maybe not world champion. I just love Star Wars 2, and I enjoy this game. And, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying our stage, play Star Wars 2, I love eSport. And thank you everyone for coming for watch. And like, who knows, I can be a world champion. I mean, I don't know how to say, I'm so happy. Time, I, I wanna give you one last opportunity to say anything you want to your family, your friends, your fans watching online, the fans here in Poland, anything you want to say. So I wanna thank, uh, thank you for everyone. Like you guys show me, the StarCraft 2 is not that game. I mean, there's so many people, there's so many people to watch, and I complete my dream. I mean, even I still feel not truth. But I want to see my, I want to see my family and use English and use Chinese, and I want to see, uh, use Chinese, uh, use English first. I want to thank my dad, like. Like last time, I lose ESL Atlanta, like zero three, uh, like zero six, like no one win, uh, like like no one give one. And my father just tell me, don't give up. Like you are always the best player in my in my heart. And yeah. And I want to see you guys. Thank you so much for watching. My uh, my English is not very well, but uh, thank you so much. And I want to say some Chinese. I want to say some Chinese to my Chinese fans, I, because now uh, so, so many Chinese people are still watching. It's already 5 a.m. I think so. Oh, I want to. Now, the audience is watching. Oh, I want to say some Chinese to my Chinese fans, because so many Chinese people are still watching. It's already 5 a.m. I think so.
其实没有什么事情是不可能的。我都拿到世界冠军了，真的没有事情是什么事情不可能的。我觉得我等到这个世界冠军太久了。呃，去年去年真的很难。我上次零杠六输的时候，我觉得心里的骂对我来说已经结束了。但是从上一次我一直谈，我告诉我自己，我可以再多练习，我可以再多练习。如果有一天真的拿到世界冠军了，或许可以证明。证明证明给大家 ，and I want to say English to our to everyone like even you still are normal people, you still can be world champion, and no one trusts you. Katowice, give it up one last time for your Intel Extreme Masters World Champion. He is Oliveira. I don't even know where to begin. 4-1 in the grand finals here for Oliveira for time. The card rated him 80, but he is 100 here as he has now been able to become the world champion. Joining me here, he got us all. <laughs> he got us all. Joining me here at the desk, ZG Rotterdam. This, and I think I speak for all of us here, is the craziest, most insane thing that has happened actually in StarCraft II history. Nobody expected this result. Roddy. This is the craziest thing that has ever happened in StarCraft, James. Like, where do you begin? We can talk about TVT, we can talk about all the things he did great, but none of that matters. Oliveira just literally did the impossible. The reason why we love StarCraft II is because the skill ceiling in this game is so damn high. Yeah. Coming into this tournament, we don't know who's going to win, but it's supposed to be a select group of individuals because that is pretty much what has always happened in history. Nobody's supposed to make the jump from, yeah, you're good to, you can win the biggest tournament of the year. And he just did it. Like, it's actually the wildest thing that I've seen in 12 years of StarCraft 2. No one saw this coming. I don't think he saw this coming. But holy smoke, it's so beautiful. It's actually so wild, so crazy. And I still don't believe it's real. The entire story of Oliveira is actually extremely amazing, emotional, it's touching. He was the youngest Chinese player to reach Grandmaster on the Korean server in Heart of the Swarm. He's been playing since then, trying to get the results that I guess he wanted to live up to. He's 22 years old. He is so young, and he was able to not just come in here and deliver this performance, beating some of the best players of StarCraft II to get here. Hero Marine, Rainer, Hero, and Maru. He was able to do all of that under all the pressure that you can expect from a global championship and then to be so kind and just honest right with the audience and it's just an absolutely beautiful story yeah it is and how like again when we when we look at how the i don't even know what to ask anymore when when we look at the final yeah. going up it, it's picture perfect because it's maru on the other side of that screen it's the guy that we all look at as the very best the very very best and it's not like time gimmicked it to this win he did not gimmick this it was just sheer tenacity some maru might have had some slips but time Oliveira, just brilliant
Uh, they say just play like Maru, and he did. And he did even better. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's unbelievable, as Zombie Grub just said. And it wasn't a gimmick because he defeated Raynor as well, in the eyes by many the best Zerg player in the world. He defeated <sighs> Hero, the best Protoss in the world, and then he tops it all off by defeating Maru. And not a best of three, not a best of five, and a best of seven. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. You can see it. All of it, James. This is so <laughs> wild, man. Like, sometimes it's after, unreal. If we are here for like four or five days, you start dreaming about StarCraft, obviously, because we have have long days and this generally feels like one of these ways where you're like oh my goodness i overslept my alarm clock is going soon let's actually get ready for the final day yeah no one would have predicted this like there's no, no matter how much of a Oliveira fan you are you cannot see this coming. Like, I love big sports movies or like historic events. We've got the miracle on ice in 1980 when the USA <laughs> won the gold medal in the Olympics. You had Greece winning the Euro Championships in 2004. For me, this is just as crazy. Like it's one of the wildest things that we've ever seen in esports. I think no, nobody would have pegged this. Nobody would have pegged. StarCraft 2 is so figured out now. Of course, we have a patch and things like that. But right. the hierarchy of players felt pretty figured out and he just absolutely dashed that to the side zg he, and smashed him he obliterated it he came here as uh what number 21 <clears throat> in the standings for uh, ept points yeah you know like that that is amazing but you know it's <laughs> mapu pointed this out shout to Mop, mapu sue had the same kind of start in katavica before he won right, it right. he almost got knocked out in groups Oliveira comes through group a with a two three series score something that is typically just not even possible and makes the full gambit to get victory against maru four one occasionally you could even say dominating but the kicker about that is that at the time sue was considered one of the best yes. in the world that's true like we've had big moments in starcraft 2 we had historic events we had Serral winning BlizzCon in 2018, and that was, of course, a big moment. Yeah. But we saw that coming. We knew how good we did. Serral was. Serral was winning pretty much every single other event he participated in. So it was absolutely big, but we knew it was possible. Very, very possible. Yeah. Oliveira did not make it to the short list of the 10 most likely players to win this tournament. Like, this is a whole nother dimension of craziness and wildness and unpredictable and I guess still everything that makes StarCraft 2 the most beautiful game in this world because apparently even though we think we know it all so well these things are still possible yeah definitely it's it's it, the road is amazing Th this tournament has had so many bumps and turns and twists and and things I thought Hamaru was beaten by Hero Marine it's gonna be Hero Marines here you know you see as Rainer and Serral fall out in the round of eight here and I, honestly, I'm kind of waffling. I it really don't like, know what to ask you. It almost <laughs> feels that every other re uh, result of this tournament is irrelevant. It feels mm -hmm. like, oh, we had a good day, and normally we focus yeah. on the positive, the storyline. All of it is completely overshadowed by the fact that Oliveira is the world champion of StarCraft II in the year 2023. Nobody saw it coming. Let that sink in, guys. We nope. have a Chinese world champion in StarCraft II. Yeah. It's... Wow. <laughs> Just wait for a second. <laughs> ZG, yeah. thoughts, I, final yeah. thoughts, I suppose. I th we I, eventually need to wrap yeah, up, I, I guess. Know, right? No, we don't. Um, I, we just keep talking about <laughs> how amazing this is. Forever. Guys, when, like, when this was, we came to the desk, we were getting prepared because we saw it kind of coming, but we still didn't really believe it. All, Maro actually taps out. The first thing that Roddy does is go and like hug James, actually. like We you, were yes. all so excited about this. We were, we were losing so our emotional minds. in the green room as well. It's a completely crazy story. Something that only happens, you know, like once in a decade, apparently, maybe even once in 13 years. The greatest underdog story ever told in Star Starcraft 2, completely amazing. What makes it even better, I love the way that Oliveira put it. He's like, a normal person could do this. <laughs> like, that yes, is yes. so fantastic. You can be a hero too, if you just try your hardest. And he's so charismatic. The interviews, yeah. like the speech after the quarterfinals where he was down 0-2 and he's like, oh, but I just love this game and I love the community and I'm just gonna sit down and I'm gonna play my best. It is like, it's too wholesome for it to actually be true. Like, nothing is supposed to be this wholesome. I mean, it wasn't just here, Zombie Grub. In the green room, We've done a lot of events with you guys. We've done a lot of events with the other casters. I don't think there's ever been a final where people were that invested in the games and the storyline and the outcome and where we were going nuts over a cyclone getting picked off. Because, yes, you know at one point it's almost possible, but you still refuse to believe that this is actually going to happen. You're just waiting for this moment where Maru turns it around and he shows why he is the GOAT or considered to be the GOAT until like the final, final, final moment. Yeah, you, yeah. He's like, it's actually happening. He's doing it. The mad lad from China is actually doing it. The impossible actually became possible with Oliveira, with time, with everything he's done at this tournament. I, amazing.
Like, there's people that are gonna wake up. They're gonna open the internet. <laughs> and they're gonna see like, oh, let's <laughs> see right. who won Katowice. Was it Maro? What, did Sarah win again? Did Hero? Was it Rainer? Like, they're gonna refresh their browser like 27 times. They're yeah. like, yeah. all right, who's trolling? Who hacked Liquipedia or something? Like, yeah. this is so crazy. I, we, we have to end. Thank you very much, guys. We could keep talking, honestly, we could keep talking but about this for half an hour. Can we just say that this was actually the most memorable Katowice ever? Of all time, uh, of all easily. Time. Yeah. yeah, this tops everything. 11 Katowice's and this tops everything. Yeah, yes. definitely. All right, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, to ES, don't, don't go yet, by the way. Don't go yet. Thank you very much to the sponsors, as we have, of course, Intel, Monster, ESL Shop, Katowice, Face It, and one more, I always do this. Blizzard, of course. I forgot them last time and I forgot them this time. I'm so sorry, Blizzard. I do appreciate you, of course, during all of this. But most importantly, and this is extremely important, StarCraft II will continue in 2023. We can't announce too much, of course, but watch. Keep your eyes on the horizon and you'll know more pretty soon. Thank you very much for tuning in to Intel Extreme Masters Katowice and congratulations to our new world champion, Oliveira. Shadows, I've come to make a name. Ready for battle, cause I got a thing to claim. Think that I'll crumble, I'll show you in slay. Where you see me coming, better run for cover. Cause I'm not so under, I'm never going under. I survived the pain, I know it made me stronger. Still be on my feet, forget all of my fears Cause I know my destiny, I feel a champion Waking inside of me It's an emotion, the legend's broken This is my moment Can't break my focus, know where I'm going This is my moment
Yeah. <laughs>